The last dungeon with monsters was successfully cleared by the team of heroes chosen for this mission. The dungeon was starting to slowly collapse, so one of the chosen heroes called out to everyone to get out. He urged everyone to keep moving continuously without stopping, otherwise they would die and their mission would be useless. From the gradually collapsing dungeon, demons that wanted to kill the heroes began to run out and crawl out. The heroes ran and looked back, slowly realizing that they were outnumbered and could not escape the mob of demons. Suddenly, one of the heroes stopped running, turned towards the demons and blocked his comrades. His comrades also stopped and tried to dissuade him from sacrificing himself, but he was undeterred. Turning to them, he bestowed a final smile on each of his comrades and said his last words. Without thinking long, he asked those who survived this dangerous mission to write his biography as a hero who sacrificed himself. Before this mission, people lived in peace and tranquility, not realizing that they were not the only ones in the world. They coexisted peacefully with each other, not even aware of the horrible neighbors that lived among them. Facing shoulder to shoulder with an unfamiliar figure in a trench coat, a random guy off the street was shocked that someone would run him down like that. Turning to the person who hit him, he immediately started lashing out at the person who hit him and demanding an apology. Before he finished speaking, he fell into a stupor at the sight before him of a horrible creature that was not human. It was a demon, a member of a race that lived underground, and they had nothing in common with what was on the surface. At one point, they got tired of living cooped up and started to surface to establish their dictatorship there. At first, people were terrified trying to escape and get their feet away, but they were everywhere and merciless. Unable to fight back, humanity was as close to annihilation as it had ever been. Mankind tried to fight back, but no firearms or technology worked against the demons. The reason for this was that demons possessed an art previously unknown to mankind. Magic. It was because of a skill like magic that the demons managed to stay intact, and they fended off any attack from the humans. However, this could not last forever, and soon the same skill began to appear in humans as well, allowing for retaliatory attacks. It was those who were endowed with magic by an unknown force who became superhumans whose capabilities were beyond human. Having acquired such incredible and previously unknown to human skills, superhumans were able to unite and repel the attack of demons. The demons lived in dungeons that the superhumans gradually cleaned out one by one, giving the demons no hope of escape. Finally, at one point, there was only one last dungeon left, and humanity would triumph. It was then, in the spring of 2005, that the seven strongest superhumans gathered to end the tyranny of the demons. They went down to the main demon lair, the last dungeon gate, and cleared it of all the demons that dwelled there. They put an end to the continuous war between humans and demons and saved humanity, for which people nicknamed them the Seven Saviors. After defeating the demons and mopping up the gate, the Seven Saviors gained great wealth and fame and became celebrities. But also, war is not without casualties, and this is reminded by the fact that one of the Seven Rescuers never returned from the battlefield. It was the leader of the Seven Saviors, William, the only one who did not return to enjoy the rewards and glory. At a time when all the survivors of the last dungeon sweep had become celebrities and were basking in wealth and fame, William, thanks to whom this war was successfully ended, became a legend and a huge monument was erected in his honor. Seventeen years after the Seven Saviors ended the war, there was a sports match between France and South Korea. The French team attacked, but the South Korean team, for unknown reasons, could not keep the strike in any way. Mike was a major favorite in this match. He played for the French team looked beautiful and played great. His skills allowed him to do such things on the field that he would blow the South Korean team to smithereens on their own turf. He was such an incredible player that he could single-handedly pick up six kills in a row, which the commentators picked up on. The commentators were torn by what they saw and bewildered by the fact that such a player had never been seen in the international league. They also implied that if he continues to play at this level and above, he risks becoming one of the top three players in history. Of all the players on the South Korean team, only Mari, a skillful whip player whose skills were also at their best, survived. Because her entire team was beaten literally dry, she had very little chance of winning, but she's not the type to just give up. Without a second's hesitation, she confidently went on the offensive against Mike, using her trademark whip as a weapon. As she drew closer, she delivered a precise blow to Mike's chest. 
after which there was a sepulchral silence in the stands from the anticipation of the outcome. Since she was the daughter of one of the seven saviors, everyone had high hopes for her, but she missed out. Mike deftly dodged her blow, starting a quick movement behind her back, putting her at a disadvantage. He swept that she was a strong player, but her team dragged her down, whereupon he gave her the final blow and ended the game. The commentators were ecstatic that Mike was so strong that the whole team wasn't enough to stop him. The audience sat in utter disappointment and bewilderment at the fact that Korea used to have many talented superhumans, but they lost so badly. The head coach of the South Korean team also recalled how they successfully smashed the demons, but they are not the same now. It was a total disgrace to him and to the nation that produced two of the seven saviors of mankind. The commentators confidently agreed that the French were very good, but because of the Korean defeat, their people are now having a hard time. Social media was already bursting with angry and frustrated posts about how such a great nation could lose so badly. The disappointment in the stands was already running out, and anger and rage was beginning to emerge over their failure in an international match. Mason, one of seven saves and also the head coach of Team Korea, was disappointed with himself and his third consecutive failure. Mike and the audience were right. Marie was indeed a very strong player with great potential, but she was being dragged down by the team. Yes, indeed, Korean superhumans used to be said to be the strongest and toughest, but that's all in the past. Mason walked down the hallway and couldn't get his team's failure out of his mind, repeating in his head that everyone who was any good at anything had gone overseas. He also took a second to remember the second superhuman from Korea, the deceased William, and summarized that not only were they gone, they were also dead. After walking down the hallway some more and into the coach room, he stopped in front of the picture of the seven saviors and began to look at it closely. He said hello to William, who was pictured next to him, and sadly added that it was a shame he wasn't with them right now. Suddenly there was a knock on the door and a guy peeked out from behind it, informing Mason that everything was ready for his interview with him. Turning to him, Mason didn't dignify him with a response, but merely remained silent, sighed a couple of times, and continued to hover in the clouds. After standing for a bit longer, he started walking towards the exit of the room, muttering aloud that he needed to make a public apology. He also added that the team is going through the worst time under his coaching, and he needs to resign as coach. The guy tried to talk him out of it, but Mason was adamant, and only said once again that he would announce his departure in an interview. He also added that if he can make a difference, it's if William comes back from the other side of the world and he'd better quit for the sake of the team's reputation. While the guy was trying to change his mind, Mason was involuntarily rejoicing in his thoughts that he was finally going to quit this job. Suddenly the phone rang in the front pocket of his jacket and the sound snapped him out of the deep thoughts he was immersed in. When he retrieved the phone from his jacket pocket, he was very much surprised as he was receiving a call from the president of the association himself. Picking up the phone, he heard the voice of the president, who didn't even say hello to him, but immediately asked if he had watched the news. With a disgruntled sigh, Mason said he is aware that the head coach has humiliated the entire country as he is. Mason was both surprised and displeased that the president interrupted him, saying that's not what he was trying to say at all. After listening carefully to the president's message, he was taken aback by what he heard and asked the president to repeat it again. At the very spot in the city where they had erected a monument to the fallen hero of the seven saviors, lightning struck in the sky. Something fell from the sky right next to the monument, creating clouds of dust at which people began to look around frightened. Gradually, a huge crowd began to gather in the center of the city at the foot of the monument to the hero of the war between humans and demons. They were all gawking at the body of a man who had fallen from heaven, the superhuman and war hero William, who had died 17 years ago. Mason continued to stand in a stupor, pulling the phone away from his ear, from which came the indignant shouts of the principal. First the incomprehensible flash of lightning, then the fall. It could all mean only one thing. William had come back from the other side alive. William was surrounded by monsters, locked away from the outside world, and there was nothing else to do but stand to the last man. Demons attacked him from the front, from the sides, from the back, and you could never guess which side they would attack him from next. There were thousands, hundreds, millions of them, and they were all crawling on the ground, floating in the air. But they had something in common. They all wanted to kill William. 
Even though William was exhausted and alone, he didn't give up, only confidently grabbed his sword stuck in the ground after the blow. The demons, who were preparing for another attack, were staring at him viciously, waiting for the next moment to attack. William chopped down the demons without mercy or fatigue until he could say with certainty that the gate to the dungeon was sealed. After sealing the gate, he dropped to one knee with fatigue, leaning on his sword, and the remnants of the demons immediately pounced on him. William stood up and gripped his weapon again, blocking the demon's path to the exit of the dungeon. Already swinging his sword, he realized that they were unlikely to end before his death, but he clearly understood that he would fight to the end. Suddenly, William opened his eyes abruptly and rose up on the bed, trying to balance the rhythm of his breathing and slow the pounding of his heart. Slowly realizing that he was not in a dungeon, he began to ask himself the next question. Where was he then? Suddenly, his attention was caught by the voice of a nurse who entered the room and was pleasantly surprised that he was awake. Glaring angrily at her, William let all the enthusiastic phrases pass his ears and demanded an answer to the question of where he was now. Ignoring his question, the nurse asked how he was feeling and then replied that he was in the hospital now, which was pretty obvious. William couldn't connect the events in his head. Just a minute ago, he was locked in a dungeon, and now he was in a hospital. A scream involuntarily burst out of him when he heard that it wasn't 2005 but 2022 outside, causing him to be slightly shocked. The nurse tried to calm him down, but she herself did not fully understand how to properly explain to him what was happening. Suddenly, an ingenious solution came to her mind, and grabbing the remote that was lying beside her, she turned on the news channel on the television. Pointing at the screen, she tried to somehow explain what was happening outside by relying on the newscast going on there. There was news on TV that the superhuman who had gone missing 17 years ago had returned and was currently in the hospital. The presenter also clarified that according to witnesses, William fell just at the foot of his own statue. Another detail mentioned was that he was in his armor at the time of the fall and had not changed in appearance one bit in those 17 years. The outcome was the expert's opinion, which was that the reason for William's return was a temporary anomaly. Still sitting in bewilderment, William couldn't believe that 17 years had passed since he had gone into the dungeon. The nurse once again confirmed that everything said on TV was true, otherwise the horror outside the hospital windows would not be happening. Looking out the window, William saw the crowds of cars and journalists who were literally guarding him, waiting for the moment when he would come out. An angry grimace immediately appeared on his face at the realization that everything changes over the years, except journalists. Pushing those unpleasant thoughts aside, he turned to the nurse next to him for help and asked her to bring him a mirror. After a couple minutes, she found and brought him a mirror, looking into which he was convinced that he hadn't grown up one bit in that time. Thinking that he certainly couldn't be this young at 47, he too concluded that it could be a temporary anomaly. Suddenly, an insight came into his head, and he frantically turned to the nurse to ask what had been done with his money. The answer came instantly, as if prearranged. His entire monetary fortune had been donated to the support fund. They made a museum out of his house, for the reason that it was the house of a dead celebrity, and now it is a public place, not his house. Hoping for something, he also asked about what had been done to his car, but it too had managed to be sold at a charity auction. Sitting in a stupor, William stubbornly tried to come to terms with the fact that in this world, although he was a hero, he was in fact a bum. The realization that he was homeless made him bend down in frustration, and he said that if he had known about the situation, he would have put some money aside. The nurse tried to calm him down again. He was a hero after all, so he was not destined to stay in poverty, and he had friends. She also added that his friend was due to arrive soon, and she had to leave, so if he needed anything, he'd have to press the call button. As soon as the nurse left the room, anxious thoughts swept over William again, giving him absolutely no peace. Yes, things were indeed different outside the window, and the news and other factors proved that the future was outside, but he still couldn't believe it. After thinking about everything some more, he came to the conclusion that he would ask Mason about everything, but now he needed to do some introspection. Tensing slightly, he applied his analyzing gaze ability, whereupon his eyes began to glow. William's ability, analyzing gaze, allowed him to visualize and analyze the abilities and talents of living beings. The main advantage of this ability wasn't just that it did skill and talent analysis in the current time. It also allowed you to see the potential of the chosen creature and analyze its skills and talents in the future. 
It was this ability that allowed William to evolve much faster than the superhumans around him. Soon, due to his incredible skills and this ability, his fame spread all over the world and he became the commander of the sweep team. Also because of his ability he saw potential in Mason, who asked to be his apprentice, for William was a very strong superhuman. After analyzing his skills, William realized that Mason was not actually a loser, but a talented superhuman with simply enormous potential. Looking over his skills, talents, and potential once more, William was convinced that he had this ability for a reason and agreed to take Mason. Sitting in the hospital and reviewing his vitals, William didn't notice anything strange at first. Everything was the same as it was. At one point, however, his attention was drawn to one line that stood out among the rest. Willpower with a value of 110. He was shocked, as he remembered well that willpower was a parameter that couldn't be raised higher than a hundred units, but here it was a hundred and ten. He also noticed a new ability he didn't have before. Looking closely at it, he saw its name, Immortality. He sat there even more perplexed, contemplating the new ability, as he definitely hadn't noticed it before. William thought some more, and came up with a theory that such an incredible ability was given to him for that battle in the dungeon. He was abruptly distracted from his thoughts by a noise in the corridor and voices, and after a while a knock on the door, so it was definitely him. In the doorway stood at first glance a man he did not recognize, but the more he looked into him, the more familiar features he noticed. Realizing who he saw in front of him, he still couldn't quite believe that Mason, his old friend, could have changed so drastically. Mason, in turn, looked at him with a mixed feeling of joy and surprise that almost made him burst into tears. Upon finally accepting the fact that his old friend William was indeed alive and well, Mason did cry, looking at him with joy. William grinned in response and even laughed a little, noting that Mason had become very sentimental over the years for a superhuman. Taking a handkerchief out of his jacket and wiping away his tears, Mason smiled happily saying that it was okay to cry because it was peacetime. They got dressed and went out on the roof, despite the fact that it was already dark, because everything was illuminated by the lanterns of the glowing city, and continued to stand there, drinking coffee. William prodded Mason with a question about whether he was done crying, and he only replied that as the years go by, you get more tears in you than you used to. Picking up on the cheerful mood, William tossed back a phrase about how he was a long way from realizing the phrase because he was still young. He also asked Mason if he had fulfilled his promise, to which Mason asked in surprise what promise he was referring to. Grinning back, William reminded Mason of his promise to write his biography when they emerged from that dungeon where they had fought. Mason, however, replied that he had hired a ghostwriter, a famous writer of fantasy novels, specifically for this purpose and it turned out to be a very good biography tale. He also added that in addition to the biography, a documentary and a feature film have also been made, and there everything looks like mythology. Suddenly, sad thoughts swept over William again, and he began to worry again about what he should do now. Standing on the rooftop, he went over the information he had received about the current world in his head, still marveling at how much was new here. Deciding to defuse the tense situation and break the silence, he decided to joke to himself that he was a hero, but homeless and unemployed. Placing a hand on his shoulder, Mason assured him that he somehow had him, his friend, to help him in any trouble. William marveled at how much Mason had matured in the time he had been away and asked about how he was doing with money. Mason, on the other hand, replied that he had money from the raids as well as bonuses, and he had naturally made some investments for his future. William stood in bewilderment at the fact that the business still hadn't collapsed considering a knucklehead like Mason was at the helm. Mason grinned nervously, shivered, and confessed that it was because of his own ineptitude that he had entrusted the whole matter to a professional. In response, William rejoiced and poked Mason in the side, saying that they were both unemployed, a fact that made him very happy for some reason. After hesitating a bit, Mason hesitantly said that he had another job much to William's surprise, and he asked about what that job was. From the look on Mason's face, he regretted saying it, so he was silent for a long time. But eventually he did quietly reply that he was working as a coach for the national team. William asked him again, as the very quiet answer and the noise of the street made it impossible to hear anything at all, but Mason was rummaging through his phone. After digging into his phone some more, he held it out to William 
and he saw a sign on the screen that read, European Cybersports Championship Finals. William scrutinized the flickering pictures on the screen, and with each second of viewing he had more and more questions. He noticed that it showed the dungeons they had cleaned up 17 years ago, and was also puzzled because he thought they had been destroyed. Mason explained that this was a virtual reality, Battle of the Superhumans, where the dungeons were the battle arena, but his surprise still remained. He also explained to him that it was a kind of business that had always been afloat, but had gained rabid popularity after their victory. It was obvious from the look on William's face that he was slightly disappointed, and he also added that he thought it was just childish. For his part, Mason tried to change William's mind, saying that high-level players are comparable in strength to the seven saves. William began to chew on his pipe, keeping his eyes on the game, responding to Mason's phrase with a standard, I see. As he continued to watch the match, he finally asked the most obvious question in the situation, but most unwelcome by Mason, about Korea's standing. Not waiting for an answer, William turned his head grudgingly to Mason, asking him about the state of his hearing, and repeated his question. Not waiting for an answer the second time, he asked his question again, and he also saw a trash can at the other end of the roof and decided to try to get into it. William had also picked up on the fact that despite the small population, they had quite a few talented superhumans, so they definitely weren't last. Swallowing nervously after that sentence and hesitating a bit, Mason hesitantly told the truth he hadn't wanted to voice to him for a long time. After Mason said South Korea was the latest, William's hand shook and he swiped the cup past the trash can. He continued to stand there, trying to figure out if what Mason had just said was a joke, or if it was really true. After standing like that for a while longer, William gathered his thoughts and turned to Mason with a mixture of surprise and indignation on his face. They stood on the roof for a while longer and then went downstairs, got into Mason's car, and drove down the night street. Mason tried to justify with abstruse thoughts why Korea was losing to everyone, and William only hummed unhappily. Mason gave a few more morals and ended his by saying that this is why their country is the weakest in the sport. William slightly resented the bluntness of those words, but stared out the window at Mason's speech about how the authorities thought the Koreans were too dangerous, and that was the reason. Mason went on to say that because of their own fear, the authorities have limited what the Koreans, and even him, can do. William agreed with Mason this time and pointed out that even in his time, the strongest superhumans went overseas. Mason only grinned nervously in response, and William added that he should have broken their kneecaps back when this was starting. Mason also pointed out that William was slinging a lot of mud at the president and politician at the time, so their actions are natural. He followed that up by bringing it up to the original topic of conversation. These riots were the reason they got their wings clipped and the level of players dropped. Mason ventured a suggestion to William already beginning to speak a sentence, but the latter in turn cut him short with a refusal, without letting him say three words. Mason resented the fact that William didn't want to go into sports and just wanted to sit in one place. William in turn became indignant and said that he no longer wanted to live as a superhuman and left everything in that cave, but wanted to live as a human being. He also added that he is clearly not the kind of person who will fight for others, so regarding the sport, he refuses. In flashbacks to his childhood, William talks about how he struggled to survive and gain respect in the place where he was raised after gaining superpowers. He decided to end his little monologue with the thought that at this point in time, he wanted to live for himself. And that wasn't a bad thing. Suddenly, he remembered another detail and reminded Mason that the reporters were giving him a hard time as it was, and that if he went into sports, Mason decided to make a joke and asked if the thought of battles made his blood run cold, to which William only laughed. Mason turned away, leaned back in his chair, and began to look at the road again, saying he really should put thoughts of sports aside for now. Suddenly, William broke the silence with the statement that Korean superhumans are not the losers the media and Mason describe them as. In response to Mason's questioning look, he pointed to a billboard outside the window that showed a girl with a nice figure. He noticed that she had a pretty figure and eyes, and she was very pretty, so everything was fine with superhumans. Mason sighed heavily and told William what he had just said about his daughter, in response to which William choked with surprise. William stated that she had recently been six years old, to which Mason reminded him that 17 years had passed and she was now 23. William tried to defuse the situation by trying to play off his words as a joke, paying awkward compliments to his daughter. 
Mason cut him short, stopping the horror that was coming out of his mouth by asking William to be quiet for a moment, after which he apologized. It was in this kind of silence that they continued to drive down the night street, and the road was lit by purple lights, creating a pleasant atmosphere. After a while, they pulled up to a large and substantial house, and when they stopped near the gate, the navigator told them they had arrived. A grown girl came out of the house, but she had such joy on her face at the sight of William that it seemed as if she were about twenty. Without removing the smile from her face, she said she was very happy to see William, as she hadn't seen him in a very long time, and it was nice to see the deceased alive. William said that he in turn had seen her a week ago, and she replied to him that she had managed to age a lot in that week. Turning to Mason, she thanked him for visiting William and bringing him to them, but he replied that it was the least he could do. Watching their happy faces and listening to their heartfelt conversations, William truly realized that he had come back to life. He had returned to life, to a life whose being had no struggle for survival and no wars, only calm and serenity. After talking some more, they went into the house, where they changed William into normal clothes, gave him some food, and he sat down to watch TV. Suddenly, he jumped up on the couch in shock as the very drama he hadn't had time to watch before he died began to broadcast. He bent in half with happiness, and he was overwhelmed with emotion. He realized that this was the moment worth coming back to life for. It was for this moment that he had put death away from him. And it was for moments like this that life in general was worth living. That was his opinion. William stocked up on chips, got comfortable on the couch, and all he could do was happily say he was going to stare at the TV non-stop. The face of a passing Mason was horrified when he heard that William would be reviewing all the dramas from 2005 through 2022. Running up to William, he shockedly began to resent the fact that he was going to watch TV for days on end and tried to talk him out of it. In reply, he merely said that Mason had promised to leave the subject of sports for the time being, so he was deservedly entitled to a vacation. A few days later, Mason approached William again, but not about sports, but about problems with the reporters that were guarding the house. Looking through the curtains at the mayhem going on under Mason's windows, William only crinkled his nose and muttered a few curses. A whole crowd of reporters and journalists with cars and cameras piled up under Mason's house waiting for William to show himself. William, in turn, was not going to leave the house and only beat his forehead at the fact that these journalists had gotten to him without even talking to him. After looking out the window from the couch some more and thinking for a while, William rose from the couch, preparing to say something. When Mason looked at him in surprise, he told him he was going to end it all tomorrow and answer all their questions once. Toward the end, he added that he wasn't planning on doing any more meetings, so he would make sure they got off his back once and for all. The next day, everything was ready. Thousands of cameras were pointed at just one place, where William was now. Everyone was extremely surprised to see him so soon, as they thought they would have to stand under the doors for at least another month. Everyone was also surprised that he was acting quite reserved, although he had a disgruntled look. But here he was, out and ready to start the conference. Taking the microphone in his hands, he hesitantly began his speech about how he himself was surprised to be back and knew no more than the rest of them. As he gave his speech to reporters, Mason was surprised at how low-key and cultured he was trying to sound. At a certain point, however, things came to a head with a phrase in which William said not to let anyone else approach him after this conference. Though short-lived, Mason's hope for a normal interview was dashed, though he wasn't surprised by such a statement. William said that everyone had the right to ask one question, to each of which he would give an answer, and hands immediately began to fly into the air. At one point, one of the reporters raised his hand, and when Mason asked him, he started asking a very uncomfortable question. He began his question by asking William if he had heard from Mason about a game like Battle of the Superhumans, to which the answer was yes. After receiving an affirmative answer, he decided to add the one question Mason most didn't want to hear whether William would go into cybersports. After this question was uttered, the crowd immediately became excited. Everyone began to exchange glances, for this was of concern to all present. Mason had already resigned himself to the fact that there was going to be utter mayhem going on here, and there were going to be tons of uncomfortable questions like this. William responded to this question by briefly stating that he has no desire to go into cybersports at this point in time. The journalist kept up with him and kept pressing on, demanding not just a refusal from William, but also the reasons for that refusal. 
William was starting to get bored with this pesky old geezer journalist, so he flippantly replied to him that he didn't think it was necessary. The old man tried to go the other way. He tried to take him at his weakest, stating that he felt incapable of doing so. William was not foolish enough to buy such a cheap provocation, so he replied that he would think so if he were an old man with bald spots. As a bottom line, he stated that he doesn't like the sport and it's off the table, and in turn, he's not a clown to do what others want him to do. To somehow appear decent, he stepped up to the microphone and tried to summarize the conversation, adding that he had tried to satisfy everyone. When William had already turned around and was about to leave, he was called out of the crowd by the last journalist, whom he ignored and gave no response. He said that a certain James Walker spoke of him, and said that the head of Seven Saves was long past and asked what he thought about it. William was surprised to hear the name, for he had hoped never to hear it again, and asked the reporter again. The journalist confirmed that he was talking specifically about James Walker, an American cyber athlete who has been called America's best tank. William was even more surprised and asked the reporter about whether he was really one of the best. The journalist said he is not, and the top three are Michael Bernard, France, Jack Mayer, Ireland, and Daniel Manske, Germany. He said James Walker is America's outstanding player, but he's certainly not one of the top three. William rubbed his forehead in frustration, annoyed that even after all these years he was still bugging him. He thought for a moment and confidently gave the reporter the answer that if he wasn't even in the top three, he wouldn't talk to him. William also said that if he wanted to fight him, he wouldn't do it in a game and let him come and say it to his face. He looked angrily into the camera and added that he would bury James Walker with his own hands in the vegetable garden. Somewhere far away, this program was being watched by others who were grinning, admiring the courage of the recently returned William. The president of the Korean Cybersport Agency grinned as he looked at the TV, anticipating how James would deal with him. James Walker himself, after seeing what he saw, clenched the phone in his fist in a rage, from which it cracked and fell apart into small pieces. He called Wood, his agent, and notified him that he urgently needed tickets to Korea. The next day, Mason's house was buzzing from early morning because of a call from the Korea Cybersports Association. Mason was notified that they would have a Premier League with the United States, but William was only prevented from watching television by this talk. He told him to go talk on the phone somewhere else, and Mason only grudgingly shut his eyes from the two-way conversation. When Mason finished talking on the phone, William asked him about what had been the reason for keeping him from watching television. When he heard there was going to be a Premier League with the USA, he didn't react in any way and went back to the TV and Mason rebuked him that it was his fault. After Mason blamed William for this, the latter became indignant and asked what he had done to be so guilty. Mason sighed and reminded William of how he had publicly dispatched a major US player in a recent conference call with reporters. He also added that most likely after such a high-profile statement on television, the latter would be beyond furious. Mason also added that claiming he wasn't in the top three was too loud a statement, which is what triggered him. As a result, he added that James couldn't fight him so he would take his anger out on the team, but William only sent him off once more. Mason clutched his head from the sudden onslaught of problems, and William wished him luck and said he'd be here while he was gone. Mason looked at William as if he were a traitor, but the latter was no longer paying attention to him because he was interested in another matter. He turned to Mason and asked if Marie was coming, because he had said earlier that she was a player on the Korean national team. After a while, I heard doors banging, rustling in the hallway, and then a woman's voice called out very loudly for my mom. William jerked in surprise, lying back on the couch and quietly resented how loud they could be. Mason's wife stood in the hallway and cheerfully greeted Marie's arrival, but was surprised that she had arrived so early. Marie only smiled in response to her mother's surprised question and replied that she had only come so early because of William. After looking around the room, she did not see William anywhere and asked her mother where he was, whereupon she was immediately taken into the living room. When they entered the room, William cheerfully greeted Marie, who froze in the doorway from the couch. After a few moments, her face began to change and was already spreading into a happy, full-mouthed smile. Still smiling happily, Marie sprawled out and jumped on William, wrapping her arms around him and flopping him on his back, causing him to wheeze. William pulled himself up and rebuked Marie that she wasn't a little girl anymore and she shouldn't do that anymore, but she didn't listen to him. After grumbling some more, William smiled too and said he was happy to see her too, 
but thought she had forgotten him by now. In response to his statement, she said he was always playing with her and giving her sweets, so there was no way she could forget him. William laughed and said that children grow up very fast, to which Marie proudly declared that she was 23. He asked her if she had only come here because of the Premier League, to which she replied that the main purpose of the visit was him, and then the league. They laughed some more, but suddenly Marie's expression changed, and looking into his eyes, she turned to him with a question. She asked if William really wasn't interested in cybersports without taking her gaze away from his eyes, but did so cautiously. William only sighed heavily in response and wondered if Mason had put her up to talking him into doing it. In response to the ensuing question as to why he was refusing, William jabbed his finger at the television screen. Marie looked frustrated at William, took his hand, and asked if he would agree if she asked him to. When she got a negative answer, she looked at him resentfully and told him he wasn't the same as he used to be. William reacted to this statement with outrage and said that they were the ones who had all changed here, not him. Marie turned away resentfully, saying that he had always honored her requests before, but William reminded her that it was only for sweets. After sitting like that for a bit longer, Marie turned to William again with another request, to go with her to the avatar test at the association. William was again not thrilled with the idea, so also the TV was now broadcasting the finale of that drama he was watching. Marie, despite his displeased face, looked at him with a pleading look, which helped coax him out after all. William, though grudgingly, agreed to go with her to the Avatar test. Plus, Mason was busy, so there was no one else to go. Rising from the couch, he asked where the association was, to which Marie replied that he would soon find out for himself. The association was a large building that towered among the other mid-rise high-rises and also had a distinctive design. Inside the association, William and Marie were greeted by an employee, a middle-aged man with glasses, and asked to follow him. He said he would help Marie do some testing on her avatar and walked her to the chair needed for the dive. Marie sat back in her chair, put on her helmet, and looked contentedly at William while the final steps of preparation were carried out. When the preparations were over, Marie's image was displayed on a large screen in front of William and the association officer. Marie was in the dungeon on full alert and testing how freely she could move around. She asked for some sort of opponent to be created for her, and after a bit of fiddling around, the employee created a huge monster for her. Watching the employee skillfully recreate previously real monsters, William marveled at how humans had learned how to do it all. A staff member explained that this game is virtual reality, and they use technology to create real images of monsters and dungeons. He also added that players who join the association for the first time are encouraged to create their own avatar. After processing the information a bit, he turned to the screen again with a desire to see what Mari was capable of. Marie sprawled and leaped over the monster's head, and with a swing of her whip, she wrapped it around its huge neck. Pulling on the whip, she struck the monster at high speed with the sword in her second hand and severed its head. After a little more work at the control panel, the employee informed Marie that the synchronization was successful and she could leave. As soon as Marie came out of virtual reality, she immediately ran to William to ask his opinion on her skills. William smiled and teased her, telling her that her skills weren't bad for a six-year-old girl and she had a lot of potential. She again offered him a tryout, but to his refusal to play in the league, she reiterated that he only had to try out and would not play. Marie also added that she just really wanted to see him in action, as she had heard so much about his skills from Mason. She grew up, but because William died, she never got to see the skills she heard about from her father's stories. Unable to resist any longer, William exhaled irritably and gave his consent to try out the Avatar. Marie couldn't believe her ears at first, then looked happily at William, who reminded her that it would only be a one-time thing. An employee standing nearby listening to their dialogue clarified whether William really wanted to test the game. He said that they usually do the ability testing first before they create the Avatar. After a disgruntled look from William, he added that since he wasn't going to compete, there was no need for testing. William looked around at the chairs in the room and wondered if he should sit in them, or if things would be different. The officer pointed to two co-workers who were struggling to carry a weapon and said he needed to take it, or he would be unarmed. When the staff reached the weapon, they collapsed without strength, and William picked it up with ease, noting that it was quite light. The employee said it was as similar as possible to the weapon he had, to which William said it was fine and threw away the shield. He said he'd be fine without a shield, and he's also running out of patience, so he needs to speed up. 
Sitting down in his chair, helmet on and weapon in hand, William decided it was still worth it to see what the game was all about. A blue glow shone in front of William while his body was being analysed and scanned in the background. Soon he was in a spacious blue room, and a staff member told him he was in a virtual training room. Examining his body, William realised that the sensation was very similar to that of entering the dungeon gates. Suddenly a small screen appeared next to his head out of nowhere, and he saw a cheerful Marie and a co-worker nearby. After walking around a bit and stretching his body, William asked to have an opponent created for him like the one created for Marie. The employee accepted his request and began typing something on the keyboard, and as a result, a monster appeared in front of William. The monster was flying above William and looked like a stingray, and after looking a little closer, William recognized it as a solar bean. He said that it was unlike any he had seen, and the staff member told him that it was a special individual and could only be wounded by an aura. The collaborator also added that this individual was generated according to the strongest Solarbane individual in existence. After a bit of thinking and processing the information he had received, William exhaled with frustration and threw the spear away as unnecessary. He extended his hand towards Salaban and snapped his fingers, whereupon a huge stream of energy literally wiped him out of reality. The employee looked at the monitor and couldn't believe what he was seeing, and Marie just said it was unbelievable. She said in surprise that he had killed him with a snap of his fingers, and William was indignant, saying there was nothing special about it. The staff member countered that although Solarbane wasn't the strongest of monsters, it was impossible to kill him with a snap of the finger. William sighed again in frustration and asked the employee to stop messing around and generate a stronger monster for him. While the employee looked for the right monster for him, he continued to examine himself and realised he felt no difference between life and this place. He turned to the staff member again and said that even though it was the strongest Sularban, he couldn't stretch properly. Suddenly his attention was diverted by a voice that said it was unrealistic for Sularban to compete with the strongest of the superhumans. Suddenly the system failed and the employee tried to do something, but the infiltration from the outside was no longer interrupted. It was an attempt to connect to this virtual world from an outside source, and unfortunately, it was completely successful. An avatar unfamiliar to William from earlier generated in the air not far from William and began to fall to the ground, shouting something. It was James Walker who was plugged in from the outside, and as he fell he looked angrily at William and asked if his offer was still on the table. He got into a fighting stance, expecting an attack, but William completely ignored his presence and looked somewhere off to the side. He turned to William again, asking why he was so surprised, since he had called for him himself, or was he so badly frightened? From William completely ignoring him, he finally became furious, and saying that he would prove that William's strength was worthless, he attacked first. He pushed himself off the ground and lunged towards William, who didn't even make an attempt to defend himself, and wished him dead. As he struck, he made a hole in the floor, but William was unhurt by the blow, and William himself disappeared somewhere, much to James' surprise. Suddenly, William's voice came from behind James's back, making him cringe and saying that there was definitely no way he could have scared him. William abruptly appeared at James Walker's back and reiterated once again that there was no way it could be that he would be afraid to fight him. He added that he was just thinking really hard about an idea and how to pull it off in a fight with James. James stood in front of William and scrutinized him, not understanding where he got such strength and confidence from. Marie and the employee still stood in incomprehension at how James Walker had managed to get inside their system. Suddenly, the door behind their backs opened and three people entered the room. Mason, the director of the Korea Cybersports Association, and Walker's manager. The association director grinned and waved his hand, telling them not to worry, for this fight was being held with his permission. Now Marie and the employee sat in even more shock as Mason said he was busy and now standing here, so with the principal. Director George explained that everything had been talked about and agreed to in advance. They just forgot to be informed. After explaining everything, he turned to Ella's manager, James Walker's manager, and asked if she was okay with everything. She said they are grateful and satisfied as this fight was a very difficult request for Korea. George recalled how William had once found himself up to his eyeballs in debt to him so he wouldn't be able to refuse anything later. He also added that he is very grateful to Ella and James, as because of this incident it is likely that they will be able to get William interested in cybersports. So far, William and James were fighting almost on equal footing. 
William saw all his moves and repelled his attacks with ease. In an instant, James jumped away from William, and William recognized to himself that he was better than he had realized all along. For the reason that James was stronger than expected, William decided to apply his analyzing eye. With a twinkle in his eyes, William brought out a spreadsheet of James Walker's characteristics in front of him and began to scrutinize. The first thing that caught the eye were two indicators at once, strength and endurance, which reached their 100% value. William stood there and continued to analyze James, and the latter became indignant and asked why he was just standing there looking at him. William ignored him again and finished his analysis, coming to the conclusion that he wasn't just a talker, but a worthwhile fighter with potential. After he finished analyzing James, he remembered the ability he had discovered when he was in the hospital. Throwing himself into the attack, he thought it would be even better to test it on James than on Sullerbane. As soon as he saw James take a swing, he stopped and stared at him, waiting for the blow. James did not fail, and with a powerful blow, William was thrown to the other end of the room, causing fatal damage to the man. On the other side of the screen, everyone sat in utter shock that William had just allowed himself to be mortally wounded. James Walker himself also stood no less shocked at the wow that William had allowed this attack to be launched at him and hit himself. Suddenly, William's voice made him turn around in the direction he had flown off to and stand in a stupor again at the fact that he was still alive. James barely had time to dodge the object that flew toward him out of the puffs of smoke at breakneck speed. Turning back to the wall, he saw that it was William's spear he had thrown, and that created even more questions. Turning again to where there were still puffs of smoke from William's fall, he had no way of knowing how he had managed to survive. A cough was heard from the smoke, followed by William's indignant voice asking why so much smoke had been poured in here. As soon as the smoke cleared, James saw William sitting on the ground unharmed, but with his jacket cut open. Smirking, William looked at James and said that he was talking about showing him something unusual. James stood in a stupor, having no idea how William had managed to survive such a strong attack. William said he got this superpower after a bad date with death, so now he's immortal. Examining himself once more, he noted that his ability healed wounds quickly, but this way their duel would not be fair. William thought for a moment and called out to the employee who was still sitting in shock near the game control panel. He told him that for the moment he was immortal, an ability he had gained after gaining a second life. Adding that this ability makes the fight unfair, he asked if there was any way to disable this ability for the duration of the fight. While the employee disabled his new ability, James stood there unable to believe that William was immortal. William turned to James and told him that he was immortal, but would not give him a chance to justify his defeat with his immortality. James only grinned in response and said that he really was a show-off, as they say, and should check to see if the rumors were true. William replied to him that rumors are rumors because the real experience of fighting him cannot be conveyed in any words. James said he was tired of the pointless chatter and told William to get up and finally start fighting him. William, on the other hand, was in no hurry to get up and stated that he should have defeated the three strongest first before this fight. Listening to the taunts that he wasn't even in the top three, James began to slowly lose his temper. Without waiting for William to get up, he tore towards him, but the man only grinned, realizing he'd hit a sore spot. William managed to get up before James would have reached him and they crossed their weapons, but William only smiled. Suddenly the same situation as at the beginning was repeated. James's axe was in the ground and William had disappeared somewhere. Just as suddenly as he had disappeared, just as suddenly as he had reappeared, William's mocking voice echoed behind James's back. Turning around, he saw that William was standing with his back to him. But his spear, which he used to strike from behind his back, was already centimeters from his face. Gathering all his strength, James was able to react and jump back, to which William only smirked satisfactorily. In his mind, William condescendingly praised James's reaction, but he also noted that it wasn't enough. He had had enough of all of this, so he picked up his spear, and with thoughts of it being time to call it a day, prepared to throw. Calculating the trajectory of the spear, William added some of his strength to the throw and hurled it toward James. When the spear reached James, it struck his shield, knocking him backwards with such force that he could barely stand on his feet. James stood there, not fully realizing where he was as he had been hit very hard by the blast wave, and his thoughts were confused. He realized that William was specifically aiming at the shield as his spear had purposely changed its trajectory, which was a very high level of magic. 
William stood in front of James and cheerfully informed him that he had won and had no plans to continue the battle. James retorted indignantly, saying that the spear had gone off at a tangent and he was still able to continue their duel. William replied to him that he left him alive on purpose, as James would never defeat him with such a huge shield. He continued his admonition by saying that just because James is big doesn't mean you have to take an equally big shield. He said that because of the large shield, his view is limited, and James has a very poor view of what's going on around him. Toward the end, William added that he was 100% sure that James had been penalized for his tunnel vision since childhood. William said that was probably why he had chosen such a large shield, to block blows and have time to look around. He also added that this wouldn't fly with strong opponents, reminding him of how he easily went behind his back. As a bottom line, William told James that he should change his large shield to a smaller one, and with his level of agility it would be a wise decision. James asked if he was lying, to which William replied that he wouldn't, since even taking his advice would still be a head shorter than him. After receiving this answer, James couldn't make up his mind for a long time, but in the end he said that he would try to do so. Mason at this point on the other side of the screen was standing on the other side of the screen in mild shock that William was schooling an already very strong opponent. After receiving a satisfactory answer, William said he was done here and would go on to watch his TV series. Abruptly remembering one thing, he turned to James and said that there was a fee to be paid for counselling. James replied to him that he would pay on the condition that he gets another duel with James in the Premier League in a week's time. William replied to him that he wasn't going to play any battle as he has a whole bunch of other dramas and TV series at home. James abruptly grabbed William and began begging him to fight him in the league and even offered him money for such a thing. He continued to lash out at William, claiming that with his abilities he should be fighting, not sitting endlessly on the couch. Everyone in the room stared at the monitor in a stupor, as there was no way they expected James to do such a thing. Only one person was not standing there in shock, George, the director of the association. He was smiling realizing that this was his chance. A few days after the battle, William was still also lying on the couch watching a drama that was on TV. Suddenly, however, the broadcast was interrupted on the pretext of an important message, causing William to squirm on the couch. Instead of the drama, they turned on a news channel with a message about William and his career in cybersports. The presenter said that after the duel with James Walker, there were hopes that William would reconsider his decision after all. Toward the end, the announcer said the big news was that William had agreed to participate in the league on the condition that America beat Korea dry. After this message, it took William a long time to realize what he had heard, and then he jumped with indignation. It had been literally dozens of minutes, and he was already in George's office, venting all his anger on him. While he was indignant and trying to get some information and explanation out of George, the latter sat with his back to him and remained silent. He demanded to be told who had spread the information and said he would strangle that person with his own hands. He was also interested in where the video of James's proposal, which cut out William's rejection, came from online. As he continued to speak, George stood up and abruptly made a bow to him, apologizing to him several times then silencing him. George said that Walker was too influential internationally so he couldn't turn him down. William was a little confused by such revelations and tried to get the conversation back on track but no one was listening. George interrupted him without letting him say a word and assured William that everything would be fine and he'd handled the situation. He told William that he had set impossible conditions, an American victory over Korea to dry. 11-0. George added that everyone agreed as he said that William was only interested in a strong team and so he had no need to worry. William abruptly interrupted the headmaster's monologue, shouting that he didn't care about their squabbles and wasn't interested in battles. George once again assured William that his condition was unenforceable, so there was no need for him to worry so much. On top of that, he decided to push pity and said that they had known each other for a long time and William could help him for once. As a bottom line, he said he would donate all profits to William's favorite foundations, where he often gave money. William, however, stood and endured it all repeating to himself that if it weren't for the deeds of the past, he would have nailed him long ago. Eventually, his patience broke and he gave his consent, while clarifying that it was only for one time, no more. George was so relieved by his answer that he was about to kiss him, but William managed to pull him away from him, 
William once again quizzed George about the conditions. They have to kill at least one American in the match and that's it. George cheerfully confirmed that he had gotten it right and he should trust him as everything would be fine. George, on account of the fact that they were already packed, suggested that they go out to dinner together in honor of the deal. William clarified just in case if the principal was treating them, to which he received an affirmative answer, so he agreed. Leaving the office, George silently apologized to William as he looked at the completed forms with the score between the teams. For the next few days, the TV was bursting with news about William, which gave him a headache, and there were no dramas on. Once again, he regretted contacting George and realized that he should have cut all ties with him from the start. Deciding to take his mind off the endless newscasts, he turned off the TV and walked to the glass door, looking out into the courtyard. Suddenly, some noise distracted him from his thoughts, and turning his head, William saw Mason and Marie practicing in the yard. Mason coached Marie and developed speed and agility in her, making her move quickly from side to side. At one point, Mason tossed a ball into the air, which Marie instantly saw and grabbed with a whip. Mason said Marie had really good speed this time around, but needs to accelerate even more because she's a support player. Standing at their backs and listening to Mason trying to teach Marie how to be supportive, William noted that it was a waste of energy. Not to just chill, William decided to analyze Marie's skills and used his skill of analysis. He noted that she had pretty good speed, but her agility had already reached its limits. William has also implied that her agility and speed maxes won't compare to Mason's, so she can't live up to his expectations. He still couldn't believe that Marie had been given a supporting role, since at least this kind of approach worked with Mason. Marie was a different case. Marie sank to the grass, voicing that she needed a break, while William leisurely approached her and Mason. As he got closer, Marie noticed him, but he was still immersed in thoughts of how bad things were if the team's ace was in this shape. Marie asked him if he had seen her training, to which he replied that he had, and also that she didn't have to emphasize agility. Mason tried to object, saying that Marie was a little short, but William interrupted him. He told Mason that Marie wasn't him and needed a completely different approach to her from the one he had for him. William said to stop developing speed and agility as she would not be able to become like him before. He also added that Marie has already reached her peak in agility and in wielding the whip, so we need to emphasize the other. He said Mason decided to make her an endorsement because of the fact that their abilities are similar, but they are completely different. William turned to Marie, asking her a question about what she would do after grabbing her opponent with a whip. After Marie replied that she would have just dragged him to the team, William immediately rebuked her for being wrong. He said she had to take out her own opponents, so she should emphasize strength and swordsmanship. He walked over and took Marie's whip and sword, saying he was about to show everything, but only once so you had to watch carefully. Swinging the whip, he struck the training doll, wrapping the whip around it, then drew his sword more comfortably. A moment later, he pulled the whip, which drew the doll to him, and chopped it into two even pieces with his sword. Finished, he put the sword and whip aside, asking Marie if she understood the example he had just shown her. Without receiving a reply, he continued the lecture, saying that you can't kill an opponent with a whip, so you have to develop swordsmanship. After finishing his explanation and instruction, William announced that Marie needed to make 500 approaches. Mason and Marie went into a stupor after William named such a huge number of approaches needed. Seeing that they still hadn't moved after his words, William began to urge them to speed up and start doing. He said there are 14 days until the league game, so they have very little time at this point. At the same time, John, James Walker's manager, marveled at how his abilities had grown in such a short time. James himself, too, listened in amazement at the reports of the changes in his vital and physical signs. John picked up on the fact that James has gotten much better as a fighter after changing his approach to defense. He also added that his weaknesses are no longer the same at this point, so he could be a top three player in the near future. He naturally picked up on the fact that somehow it takes long and hard training for significant results, since he still struggles. John then said that they could make a huge profit in such an arrangement, and James asked for clarification in money. After thinking and making a few calculations, John announced to James the amount they could get, about $10 million. James thought about it, $10 million was a lot of money, and it wasn't something that was offered every day. When he finished thinking, he looked at the television where they were broadcasting a program about William and declared that all that money should be sent to him. 
The manager went into a stupor and then started appealing for common sense, but James was relentless. According to him, it was consulting money. Stopping, he looked into the space in front of him and shouted that he swore he would drag William into the arena. A certain amount of time has passed, and the match between the Korean and US national teams finally took place. The commentators said that in all probability, all their viewers were looking forward to the meeting of these two teams with great anticipation. They also mentioned that they will soon find out how the confrontation between William and James Walker will end. They said it would be exciting, but now they needed to introduce the members of each team. After introducing the Korean team first, they moved on to introduce the team from the United States, whose players were serious. Marie was the commander and leader of her team this time so she was honored with a separate place in the performance. On the US side, the leader was James Walker, which was not surprising with his potential and determination. William, on the other hand, sat watching it all through the screen and prayed in his mind that they would show a good result. The dungeon they will fight in is an old underworld castle called Martha Borney's Palace. There are only three floors in this dungeon, and each floor will have a different boss, with hordes of skeletons blocking the way for teams. On the first floor, teams will face the boss Skeleton Warrior, a huge monster that crushes everything in its path. On the next floor, the main obstacle for both teams will be a boss that goes by the name of Death Knight. Well, and as the final boss on the third floor will be two whole monsters, Bone Dragon and Lich. The commentators also picked up on the fact that many were watching them for the first time that day, so they felt it necessary to remind viewers of the rules. Well, Finally, the teams were given the opportunity to come out and walk to their seats, and the audience cheered them on. Finally, as the teams took their seats, the commentators announced that the match was finally starting. Team USA immediately met the skeletons on the first floor, and the commentators marveled at their polished moves. Team USA dealt with the crowds of skeletons very quickly, mopping up the dungeon rooms one by one. They marveled at how quickly and swiftly the US national team handled such a huge number of skeletons. Commentators picked up on the fact that even though their movements were slow, but their punches were accurate and well-timed. The commentators then switched to the Korean national team, as it was interesting to see what they were doing at that moment. Watching the movements of the Korean national team, they marveled at the incredible speed with which they moved. After watching them for a while, they realized that the Korean national team didn't kill the monsters, but just ran through them. They didn't kill any of the skeletons in one room or the other, but just kept running forward, ignoring their existence. Mason stood watching their movements, and in his mind, he encouraged them in the hope that everything would go clearly as planned. The commentators reminded us that the Korean national team was known for their prolonged play, but now they have a clear goal to kill the boss. They have also subverted that this tactic has a very high level of risk, but if successful, they will get a lot of points right away. If you kill the main boss of a floor, it will be closed for a while, which is what the Korean national team wants to take advantage of in this game. This would give them a very strong head start over players from the US, so they ran through all the rooms and got to the boss very quickly. The commentators in the stands were simply tearing up as the Korean national team approached the first boss in this dungeon, Skeleton Warrior. Switching back to the American national team, they were puzzled as James Walker just stood there waiting for something. One member of Team USA was ambushed in the boss room waiting for something, much to the surprise of the commentators. Players from the US national team mocked the stupidity of the Korean players and offered to go to the second floor, but Walker refused. He said they needed to enter the room with the boss, and a member of his team said he would lend Walker his power. The Korean team was almost done beating the boss at this point, and Mari lunged forward to give the skeleton one last blow. Suddenly, right before the moment she was supposed to finish off the boss, James Walker flew out of cover and shot her down right in flight. Mari's entire team stood in a stupor without being able to move, because he flew out so suddenly that no one even noticed. Mason realized that he had used the power of his hurricane member, which was the reason he was able to move so quickly. Due to this amplification and strong push, Marie was thrown aside and upon hitting the wall, she was instantly killed. James said that beating the boss right away was a good idea, but in this game, only winning is important. That's the main reason they lost. After his words, absolutely the entire American national team flew out from behind his back and began attacking the already weakened skeleton warrior. After running literally several attacks on him, 
They finished him off, and the system alerted that the floor would be closed in 10 minutes. Despite this head start, James Walker decided that everything needed to end right there and gave the order to attack the Korean team members. Team America mercilessly pounced on Team Korea and began to maul them left and right, giving them no chance to escape. The commentators commented that the Korean national team was very much weakened after the boss fight, so their situation is quite deplorable. Standing in front of the last living member of the Korean national team, James Walker swung around and said they were done for this time. After he said that phrase, he swung harder and chopped the last player, ending the first round. The commentators solemnly announced the fact that Team USA had beaten Korea dry, and the second round would begin after a full recovery. Marie walked down the hallway, thinking about how they had failed again, and lost again with a rout. She was also very upset about William putting so much effort into it, but they were all in vain. Walking into the room where their team was resting, she stood on the threshold in surprise as William sat inside and was already mentoring their team. He said he wept bloody tears as he watched them play and their national team should heed his advice. Someone on the national team tried to object, saying their coach was Mason, but William only ordered him to shut his mouth, after which all questions fell away. William said he had no desire to get involved in this situation and this game, but he decided to feel sorry for them. He said that their plan to kill the boss quickly was really good, but the Americans were stronger than them in every way. Also, William added that no matter how many times they fight the US team, the chances of winning will always be zero. Afterward, he said that he had come here for a reason after all, and if they listened to him carefully now, they could kill Walker. William said that Martha Borney's palace was one of the dungeons he went through with the president of the association. He assured them that it was a very easy location. Only the third floor would pose any danger to them. However, the problem was that with their skill level, even such an easy dungeon would be a big challenge. He also said that they had a pretty good plan, but it would be nice if their plan also worked on top of that. Their main problem was their lack of intelligence. They rushed straight to the boss without even following up on the enemy team's actions. He went on to rebuke them for lacking the ability to think ahead. They wouldn't be able to fight the US even if they killed the boss. He summarized that the Korean national team deservedly suffered a defeat because they overlooked the elementary basics. William slapped his forehead in frustration at the national team's level of play and also felt sorry for Mason, who coaches them. After standing in that pose for a while longer, he announced that there was no way to change the past, so the conversation about the first round was over. William once again asked for silence and said that now we could get to the point, and he would tell them how they should proceed. The second round began the next day, and commentators immediately picked up on the fact that Team USA was moving around more than usual. They suggested that they were purposely using the tactic of splitting into two groups to quickly defeat the Korean national team. Commentators notice that this tactic suits the ace of the U.S. national team, the team's tank James Walker, better than others. They were about to bury the hope of a Korean victory, but Marie's sudden action left the stands and commentators frozen in shock. Marie, having barely appeared on the battlefield, immediately rushed forward, once again starting to be more active than she had done before. The commentators were surprised that the national team used to play from defense, but now Marie has changed her position and acts completely differently. William sat contentedly watching the actions of the Korean team this time, as everything so far was going clearly according to his plan. He also remarked that if they do everything in clarity according to him, they will have a small chance of winning. Mary, on the other hand, after the conversation and training she had done, ran through the dungeon with full confidence that they would win this round. The U.S. national team scout was standing in cover like last time, but he informed James that he could not see the Korean national team players. Walker told him to keep him and a few other members of his team in the ambush, as there was only one way in. Suddenly, while James was already anticipating a fight with William, the wall behind his back began to shake, and a noise began to come from there. Turning at the noise, he saw part of the wall behind him begin to crumble, and a bright light appear from behind the rifts. A few moments later, the wall finally collapsed, revealing to James a secret passage from which members of the Korean national team began to run out. William told them that the first step to beating Walker is successful scouting, as you need to find out the number of players near Walker. He said that this time, the Korean national team will not have the goal of beating monsters or killing the skeleton warrior, as that is the wrong way to win. 
William told them that the players of Battle of the Superhumans only knew of one passage to the palace, as they weren't in the actual dungeon. He told them that there is also a secret passage here that connects the sides of the Korean and U.S. national teams. The passage is hidden in the wall, but it will help Marie with her search. It will help them find out what their opposing team is planning. Next, after scouting, all 11 players on the Korean national team will go down a secret passage, split up, and attack the U.S. national team. As a result, William cheered them up before the game, wishing them good luck and saying that they can definitely beat the U.S. team this time. Also, before the game, William approached Marie and gave her advice on how to kill Walker. She needs to kick him in the legs. Marie was surprised, as James Walker is a close-range fighter, and the legs clearly can't be a weak point for such a strong player. William explained to her that on his advice, Walker had changed his shield, but still wasn't used to it not protecting his legs due to its small size. He said that after the win, they were under pressure not to give them a single point, so they would be watching all sides. William asked to trust him, and if they did as he said, they would have a good chance of winning because of the surprise attack. As she flew out of the secret passage, Marie noticed that Team America really didn't realize it and thanked William. The commentators were tearing up, not having time to comment on the Korean national team's sudden sneak attack on the US team. A support player on Marie's team put a fire concentration effect on her to make it easier for her to kill opponents. Fire concentration is an aura effect that has the ability to make opponents around the wearer weaker. Though the offense was sudden, James Walker quickly adapted and prepared to repel the sudden onslaught of the Korean national team. As he looked around, he saw his team members falling one by one, and his confidence in victory became much weaker. While he stood and watched his team, Marie had already managed to score a few points on two kills. Suddenly, he noticed the support players who decided to attack him from behind, but managed to react and earn a third kill. After adapting a bit, he shouted to his entire team that everyone needed to gather here as the situation was critical. However, it was a little too late. They were already surrounded by eight Korean national team players, and they were only three men themselves. The Korean players did not stand still and attacked them, while the US players were no longer as fast and accurate in repelling their attacks. James Walker wasn't going to give up and started fighting back pretty hard, earning another kill by throwing his weapon. After he threw his weapon, only his shield remained in his hand, and it was at that moment that he felt Mari at his back. When he turned around, he didn't see her behind him and went into a stupor, since he was pretty sure she had been there a second ago. Mari unleashed a crushing attack on Walker, running out from behind his shield where she was in a blind spot for him. Mari's attack did a lot of damage to James, but she had already gotten behind his back, halting her advance for a second. Just when James thought he had been given a second chance, he felt the lash on his leg and realized that this was the end for him. Marie pulled hard on the whip and James Walker fell on his back, unable to defend or resist any longer. Looking around, he saw the rest of his team had already been killed, getting points for it, and resigned himself to the fact that they had lost this fight. James continued to lie on his back and watched as Marie slowly but determinedly shortened the distance between them. As she moved closer, he wondered if William had given them a tip on how to do this round in a new way and win. Marie didn't answer, only pointing her sword at James, allowing him to say his last words before she killed him. James said nothing, only grinned at how cleverly they had outsmarted them and won this fight thanks to their new tactics. Mason stood in shock as he listened to the commentators announce that the Korean national team already had five kills and were pulling away. William, who was lying on the couch next to Mason, only grinned when he said he told him that he told him they were going to mess with Walker. The second round was coming to an end, and the commentators couldn't settle down, marveling at how the Korean team had managed to surprise everyone. Yes, the match ended in a win for the US team, but they still had a performance that they have never had before. The Korean team was defeated only because they were attacked by the second half of the US team at a time when they had almost no energy left. Still, despite the loss, the Korean team was able to slaughter five opponents and make more noise than the US victory. They also showed a replay of the wall blowing up, making a secret passage hidden. That moment was the highlight of tonight's game, and at the center of all the attention was a player, Korea's national team captain, Mari, who personally had four of the five kills. She stood happily and accepted all the praise and enthusiastic shouts, realizing that morally they had definitely won this match. 
Mason, as the head coach of the Korean national team, stood on the stage, and newly arrived reporters were already interviewing him. The reporter said that his charges were able to show a completely different level in this round, and asked about his impressions regarding this. Mason responded that he, as well as his team, thought it was a great experience and they weren't going to stop there. The reporter also noted that their team used a secret move in this round, which is impressive, and asked if they had thought of it themselves. Mason smiled, confirming that many were indeed surprised by such a move, for no one had even suspected the passage. He also said that the game was in a specific location, so before the second round, they requested special assistance. As he said this, he looked toward William, who was sitting off to the side on a bench watching the interview process. Seeing the look in his eyes, William turned away irritably, realizing that he was up to something cyber sports related again. Next, the interview was with Marie, who was still radiant with joy, and introduced herself to the reporter with the same attitude. After saying hello back, the reporter remarked that she had performed well and asked if her approach to training was new. Marie replied that she had practiced very long and hard with William and that the secret passage had been his idea. Listening to what Marie was saying to the reporter, William sighed irritably and realized that he would not be allowed to live peacefully. He also asked a rhetorical question about why on earth they are forever mentioning him in their conversations in various interviews. Suddenly, he heard a familiar voice behind him answer his question that they were simply telling the truth, nothing more. Seeing the director of the association at his back, William irritably replied to him that he needed to give an interview, not chat with him. The director, on the other hand, responded by saying that he was too old for an interview, so there was no need to chase him away from where he was doing well. In response to William's question about why he hangs around him, George replied that he doesn't need an excuse to be around him. George asked if it was his idea to use the secret passage, to which William nodded, clarifying that it was probably for nothing, as it was only sport. As a result, he was outraged, saying it was the only normal decision as the level of the team was very low. The principal let his words pass his ears and asked if he had trained Mari since she had completely adopted his fighting style. William got up from the bench and said that he didn't have much desire to teach Marie, but George said he had talent after all. In response to the last phrase, William spread his arms proudly and confirmed his words by saying that he was indeed magnificent. The principal decided to try his luck one last time and suggested that William try to find a better use for his skills. William was indignant because he had already won the argument between them, so he didn't have to participate in any competitions or games. The director said that this was his final offer and he would not pester again, but asked to hear him out. He said that a new season is about to start, a major league where the best players in the world will compete in the battle of the superhumans. Upon hearing this, William skeptically asked if the principal was going to offer him a chance to compete in this big league. The principal objected, saying it would be impertinent of him, but wished William would just join the team. He looked down sadly, realizing that he would likely be turned down just as he had been the last few times while William had told him he would think about it. Not immediately realizing the answer he had received, George asked William to repeat his words, to which he asked if he was deaf from old age. George was still standing there, unable to believe that William had agreed to think about his proposal, for he had continually refused. William said it was exciting to watch Marie fight, but even more exciting to be a participant. At the end, he added that the real dungeons were gone anyway, so he could only try his hand at the Battle of the Superhumans. Overjoyed, George grabbed William, grabbing him and starting to stroke his head, telling him that he had voiced his decision very well. He also added, showing William his phone screen, that the video of their national team had racked up several million views in just an hour. The comments under the video were bursting with delighted and happy comments praising William and Marie. Breaking free of the headmaster's grip, William said that he seemed to be old, but he didn't lack strength, to which he replied that he was just glad. William countered that, actually, he'd only said he'd think about it, and George shouldn't get his hopes up too high since the odds were 50-50. Contrary to William's expectations, the association director only glowered even more and said that there was no problem and let William think hard. William queried whether the big leagues were really not long away, as George had told him. When he received an affirmative answer, he wondered after all, the best of the best are chosen for such events. After some more thought, he approached the director of the association, saying that even if he agreed, he had a few conditions. The director looked at him with surprise, but did not object, as it would be dangerous for the decision. 
and asked him what his conditions were. He also added that he was willing to do anything William just asked, as he needed to get him on the team by any means necessary. William grinned happily when he heard the agreement, clearly planning some very interesting idea that promised to be fun. The next day, Mason stood in the garden across from William and didn't understand how he should even react to what he had just heard from him. In response to Mason's indignant exclamation, William said he seemed to have explained everything very clearly and accessibly to him. He said George promised to fulfill his every wish if he agreed to do battle with high-level teams. William also added that he was starting a new life because of this, even though he wanted to spend it on the couch in front of the TV. He also explained that since he had taken on such a serious endeavor, everything had to be done perfectly and properly. William said he didn't think he needed the workouts, but given the caliber of players on his team, he'd have to drag everyone along. Mason apologized for not training them well and said he understood his motivation, but didn't understand what he was doing in the midst of his plans. William lazily explained that after Marie, he's the next person who's any good, and other than William, no one can kill him. Mason was indignant that William couldn't kill him, to which the latter replied to him that he hadn't held a gun in 17 years, so who knows? William also added that such a great coach will not scare him, but he will try to get him back to normal form during this time. Mason clarified, just in case, whether William understood the fact that he wasn't as strong as he used to be. He was already 48 after all. After analyzing it with his ability, William actually saw that over the years all of his characteristics had dropped in their values. After a little thought, he came to the conclusion that it was possible and not that difficult to return all his characteristics to their previous level. With a mocking smile, he asked Mason if he realized that starting tomorrow, all hell was breaking loose for him. Remembering how hellish William's training had been, Mason realized that starting tomorrow, he would be finished. Sitting in his office, George went over William's terms in his mind. He would be teamed up with Marie, and Mason would be involved as well. He also imagined the magnitude of the event, and how many sponsors would show up when two of the seven saviors were on the same team. The association's director broke the news that Mason and William would be on the same team, which instantly went viral on the internet. The news that Mason, Marie, and William would be fighting on the same team in the big leagues was already buzzing around all the newspapers and media sites. Mason was standing in his yard listening to remarks from William, who asked him if he remembered what he had taught him. The answer is that if your technique is lame, you need to move faster than your opponent, whereupon William resented him for remembering everything but not doing it. Mason said he understood and would try it faster, then began to concentrate and prepare to attack. After a brief pause, he made a dash and lunged toward William, who stood opposite him with his shield. As soon as he shortened the distance between them, he swung around and took a swipe at the shield William had put out in front of him. After the punch, Mason stepped away from William and asked if he was happy with the result this time or not. When William told him that he used to be able to throw more punches, Mason asked him to discount his age. He also bent down and complained to William that at his age it was very difficult for him to endure such workouts. In response, William only told him not to whine, as he would have called such a workout a light warm-up before. In response to the claim that they were already stuck here for eight hours, William replied that the show was about to start, so they should hurry up. Mason objected and said the shows would have to wait as they needed to go to one place today. They arrived at the Korea Cybersports Association building, where they were met at the entrance by a familiar staff member, Ethan, who turned out to be the administrator. William was also introduced to the person who was next to the administrator, Brown Turner, a member of the Worldwide Battles organization. William found himself uncomfortable with the situation, as he remembered that he had already had his avatar tested not too long ago. It was explained to him that this was only a test version, and for a complete and accurate avatar creation, several tests are required. Ethan also explained that despite the fight with James Walker, their entire test only touched on William's physical abilities. They need to gather all the stats and data to make the character match William from reality as closely as possible. They also clarified that there were no problems with full synchronization, but it's always better to copy data from reality. In response to William's questioning look, Ethan explained that full synchronization is possible where the avatar is you, only in the virtual world. He also added that the Avatar can reveal skills that have yet to appear in reality, which changed William's view of technology. When William marveled at the level of technology, Ethan said it was a secret development, with employees scattered all over the world. 
William was suspicious of this information, suggesting that the program might be based on a power that replicates the real world. He further clarified if they don't know how things work, as the creators may have some other goals other than cybersports. Putting sad thoughts aside, William said that even if the monsters attacked, he would be able to interrupt them all. William was taken to a special testing room and told that they would need to test his speed, strength, and aura. First, there was a test of strength, which was done with a machine where you had to pull a knob. After waiting a bit, William pulled the handle and applied a fair amount of force, but it was tight even for him. After the machine calculated the force applied for the jerk, William was asked to jerk the handle a few more times. When William finished his strength test, Ethan and the others picked up on the fact that the strength numbers weren't that great for a hero. The next test was dexterity. He needed to press both switches at different ends of the room. When William proceeded to perform the agility test, everyone was shocked that Tank was able to move so fast. After the system alerted William that the test was complete, he stopped and asked about the result. He was not satisfied with the result he got, so he took the test again, scoring the coveted 971 points. He approached the receptionist, asking about the maximum score on the agility test. When he was told that the highest score, 1,007 points, went to Mike Burner, he recognized the name from the videos he watched. William also said that there's talk of this Mike Burner guy being as fast as Mason was when he was younger, but he doubts it. William enjoyed scoring on this test, so he concentrated for his next attempt. He felt he was in great form just today, so he would be able to score above his previous scores. Finishing his concentration, he sprinted out and touched the two switches as fast as he could. Watching his movements and then the test results, those present could not believe the numbers that burned on the screen. On the screen of the testing machine, the number 1007 was burning, which said that William had the speed of the fastest player in the world. William reflected on the fact that he didn't have the maximum agility score, but he was able to match the fastest superhumans. Thinking that perhaps he could go beyond his own capabilities, he asked for another power test. Pulling the handle of the familiar apparatus, William thought about the fact that the most important thing was concentration, and it was concentration that solved everything. Everyone present just watched in utter shock as the numbers went up with each test performed. William stood and analyzed himself, coming to the conclusion that he had already reached his limit in both strength and agility, but he needed more. He thought about the fact that such a rapid increase in performance couldn't simply be due to concentration, but must be something else. He remembered that he had felt this way once before, when he had fought in the very last dungeon from which he had come here. William remembered that it was at that moment, on the brink of death, that he was able to exaggerate his performance and raise his willpower above the maximum. It was followed by quite logical thoughts. And then why fight at all, if with immortality and willpower he would defeat anyone? It was beginning to look very suspicious to him. Everything indicated that someone wanted his participation in the battle and his crushing victory. This was followed by an aura check, for which an obscure white sphere was placed in front of William. In order to check the aura, he was told to touch it, after which he remarked that there were no such accurate methods of measuring auras before. He remembered how he had practiced hard to raise his aura level to a hundred, but in vain, because the aura level was very difficult to change. As soon as he began to infuse his aura into the sphere, everyone fell back into a stupor as it only increased with each passing second. The moment William began to infuse aura into the sphere, he was 100% sure that his aura was now at its maximum. When he asked about the result, he was announced in a trembling voice that he had just set a new record for the highest aura level in human history. William was not the least bit embarrassed by this, and he only confirmed it with a satisfied look, saying that it was a couple of trifles to him. He was told he broke a pre-existing record that belonged to one of the seven saves, Charlotte. William was surprised that she had such a score, but guessed that despite her lack of strength, she was going forward due to her self-confidence. The administrator notified William that all checks had been successfully completed, but he needed to clarify one point. He told William that he would not be allowed to use his newly acquired ability, Immortal, during the game. William wasn't surprised or upset by this fact, as it made sense that it would be too strong an ability in this type of game. A few days later, a certain cult began to rage again, singing the honors of William and his accomplishments. They believed that because of their faith, William would lead them to the light, and they would find salvation, and the world would be made whole.
They believed that the world was about to collapse, but they believed only in William's strength, and the foremost among them raised William's picture above their heads. He told everyone that it was because of their faith that William heard them and rose from the dead to save the world. Also, he again appealed to the faith of others and said that if they continued to believe, the time of salvation would soon come. William and Mason were in the yard when the noise of the cult members filled the entire street and prevented them from practicing. William didn't realize what this huge crowd of cloaked men were doing nothing but shouting his name. They continued to stand at the fence and shout his name, but their phrases sometimes still included Our Savior and We Believe in You. William asked Mason if they were journalists, and he told him that they were the William community who considered him their God. Hearing the name of this congregation, William began to go over in his mind the times he might have seen them before. Suddenly, an epiphany came over William, and he wondered if these were the guys he had mistaken for reporters when he was in the hospital. Mason confirmed what he said and said that they thought the world was about to collapse, and William just thought they were a bunch of idiots. Mason said the only reason they continue to believe in him is because he literally rose from the dead, which William didn't like. William said he would teach them a lesson and headed in their direction, and Mason's shouts and pleas could no longer stop him. Abruptly jumping onto the fence, he towered over the crowd of cloaked men and loudly told them to shut their mouths. After a little silence, they continued to shout their phrases, and William again asked them to shut their mouths. After he asked them a second time to be quiet, they listened to him, and William tried to reach some sort of compromise. When he started talking to them, they kept sporadically spouting their phrases so his patience broke. William rudely sent them all away, adding that if they followed him again, he would kill them. He also called them a bunch of lunatics who just want to follow some person around all day. People in the crowd began to whisper, gradually coming to the conclusion that William was thus testing their faith in him. They suddenly surrounded him, looking him in the eye and chanting his name non-stop, pushing him closer and closer to the fence. William recoiled as he hadn't expected such an onslaught from them considering he had promised to kill them all if he did. Mason, who had been standing watching from the sidelines, realized what was about to happen and involuntarily backed away. William began to boil and quietly, but so that everyone could hear, said that if they didn't leave in ten seconds, he would kill them all. Literally ten seconds later, William was already sitting on a mountain of bodies. However, he did not kill them, but only knocked them out, as there were even children among them. He turned to the boy, the last one left conscious, and asked if he would follow him or not. After the frightened boy replied that he wouldn't follow him anymore, William smiled and let him go. Walking down to Mason, William stretched and lazily announced that they could safely continue practicing again. Mason told William that he was just crazy, to which William didn't respond in any way and asked for more information about the cult. Mason didn't dignify him with an answer, only saying that they had to go as the crowds of reporters would be here soon. When William offered to interrupt them as well, Mason was indignant and said they would draw more attention to themselves that way. While they were standing and talking quietly, an obscure cloaked silhouette watched them from the roof of a tall building. Feeling the stare of the stranger, William turned that way and Mason asked what was wrong. Seeing no one in the direction William felt threatened from, he reassured Mason and said he was just imagining things. A few days later, James Walker's agent and an agent of the Superhuman Battle Association of the United States arrived at the local Korean airport. Oliver, that was the agent's name, said he was glad to be in Korea again and hoped that the era of superhumans would return to this beautiful country again. His companion said he was already able to take a bunch of superhumans from here to the US, but Oliver said he couldn't take the best ones. She told him that the Seven Saviors had never been interested in the battle. Only Charlotte had been interested, but had lost interest due to restrictions. Oliver said that even though he missed out on talented superhumans before, he won't miss out now, and William will belong to him. Suddenly, a man arriving at the airport caused them to interrupt their dialogue and stare in surprise at his arrival. An older man, clearly very familiar but clearly unwelcome to the US agents, was entering the airport. It was Jake Rand. He was an agent of the Battle of the Superhumans Association of Europe, and his presence meant no good. He slowly approached the agents from America and mockingly said hello, pretending he didn't recognize them at first. He wished this battle was fair, to which Oliver snorted indignantly, thinking it was easy for him to say. 
While Oliver and Jake stood and aggressively exchanged glances, the reporters had already turned their attention from them to the other arrivals. Also arriving at the airport were the Moreau brothers, owners of the Lumiere Club in Paris, to whom William had ruined the dungeon business. They fantasized that they should get his autograph or better yet, get him to sign a contract to work with them. All these famous people stood and looked at each other in silence, realizing that they had all come to get their hands on William. Suddenly there was silence in the airport, and the clacking of the heels of the woman who had just arrived was heard. Charlotte, the youngest of the seven saviors, walked into the airport and asked where her baby brother was now. William marveled at how many people had gathered on the day of the match, where he would make his first appearance as a battle player. He also joked that it was a good thing the population was down after the Demon War, for which he got a reprimand from Mason. Mason, to top it all off, asked William to keep his cool for once, but he didn't get an affirmative answer. William simply ignored his question and walked forward on the red carpet, realizing that a lot of fun was about to be had. As they walked down the red carpet to the entrance, crowds of reporters began to pile in on them, and Mason asked what it was all about. William only smiled and turned to him and told him that he needed to protect him more carefully from this crowd of curious reporters. And the crowd of curious reporters itself was already on its way to both of them, right on the move, shouting and demanding at least some kind of interview from them. Mason found the best way out of the situation, and pushing William into the thick of the reporters, quickly slipped out of there. As William carelessly answered questions from the surging crowd, he mentally cursed Mason and imagined what he would do to him next. Reporters asked meaningless questions along the lines of, What's your state of mind? How do you feel before your first game? However, the last question about whether he knew that Charlotte had also come here caught his attention, and he asked if it was true. When he heard back that she had come here to visit her little brother, he cringed at being called that. Barely free of the pesky reporters, William aggressively began opening hundreds of doors in search of his own. As he made his way around the rooms, he could still hear discussions about his subject by the edges of his ears, and it was starting to get annoying. When he did find Mason and Marie, he didn't make a move on them, but asked if they knew Charlotte had come here. Hearing this, Mason didn't react in any way, and Marie was even happy to see her at this game. Mason walked over to William and warned him not to run into reporters ready to eat him. William responded by asking for a reminder of who dumped him and left him for reporters to completely and mercilessly tear apart. Mason said he'd better get ready to meet Charlotte, and William hoped she wasn't here for revenge. Charlotte was the youngest of the Seven Saviors, hailing from China, and had immense and impressive strength. She was born and raised in a wealthy family as an only daughter and developed her abilities from childhood. In her then 17 years, she felt like a queen and hated William, who was bringing her down to earth. He constantly scolded her, pointed out her mistakes and treated her harshly because of her arrogant character and little willpower. William was constantly yelling at her, reprimanding her for the slightest miscalculations, which quickly began to piss her off. She also constantly heard him say to her that there was nothing else useful about her besides her immense strength. Thinking back on it all, Marie and Mason advised William to buy a tuxedo since a funeral was coming up soon. After discussing the subject some more, Mason put the unnecessary thoughts out of his head and said they had better things to do than Charlotte. He turned to the entire crew that had gradually gathered around them during their little dialogue about Charlotte. Mason's main task at this point was to gain the player's trust in him. Otherwise, he would be a very bad captain. He mentioned that many people knew the rules of these games, but due to the fact that there were new players among them, he would explain everything again. Athletes are divided into Team Love and Team Hope, and then play a charity game. The Love team is made up of national team players, and the Hope team is made up of all rookies except Marie. Mason declared himself the team leader, the captain, as he has so much experience in preparing and organizing teams. He then indicated that William would be participating in this game, after which William lazily said hello to those present. Mason also mentioned that he hasn't held a gun in a while, so he's hopeful for everyone in attendance. He was approached by the deputy leader of the team with the phrase that they would not let him down and hoped he would lead them to victory. William stood and listened to Mason's address, admiring his ability to make speeches, convinced that he was indeed fit to be captain. Applying his analyzing eye to scan Mason and Marie, William became convinced that the three of them would make a great team. The other thing was the rest of the people present, in whom William could not see anything particularly useful. Suddenly, though, 
the high scores of one kid who, along with the rest of them, were enthralled to Mason still caught his eye. This guy's abilities proved to be quite immediate as well, and utilizing them could be of great benefit. William also noticed that he had a very high strength limit of 90, so he had a lot of potential. William thought that if he was trained, he could be a pretty good tank, so he called him over to him. The guy stepped forward and introduced himself with the name Charlie and named his position, the main player who does the damage. William was shocked that a melee player was contributing major damage and asked again, but the guy couldn't string together a few words out of excitement. William asked him for the third time if he was a tank, to which Charlie replied clearly that he was not, but that he had always dreamed of being a tank like William. William notes with annoyance that he doesn't even know about his second power, and the reason for this is his poor choice of his position. He assumed that he was given such a strange role because of his appearance, because how could such a thin guy be a tank on the team? William sighed and asked Marie to bring him a shield, to which Charlie reacted with excitement, for he didn't know what they were going to do. He held out the shield to Charlie and then took his own, but he still didn't understand why he was given a shield, since it was an attribute of tanks. William ignored his questions and began to show Charlie the basics of using the shield, since there wasn't much time. Charlie tried to object, saying that his role was to do damage, but William told him he was an idiot and his role was to tank. Talk began to go around in the crowd that William was really nuts to change a player's role less than a day before the game. Charlie was frightened and tried to call for help from the captain, Mason, but the latter only shook his head, as William would know better what to do. After hearing William's rantings to the end, Mason approved Charlie's new role, having already announced the new allocation of players to roles. Charlie stood in shock at how quickly his position had been reversed and how much he was being ignored. William tried on the armor and noted that it was very sturdy but also unusually light, and Mason only confirmed this. The look on Mason's face wasn't particularly cheerful, but he attributed it to the fact that he never thought he would have to wear this uniform. Remembering something, Mason turned to William, informing him that there would be no problem with the weapon, and he had prepared something for him. After a few minutes of waiting, William accepted a spear from Mason that was exactly like the one he had fought with in the dungeons. Mason also warned William that even though he was strong, he had only fought monsters but not fought humans. He noted that because the others had only fought humans, they would have more experience than the two of them combined. William smiled, saying there was nothing to worry about and called Mason Captain in jest. Continuing to smile, William looked intently at Mason and offered to show a great game to his big sis. Before the match started, the stands were bursting with the number of people and screams as the presence of the two saviors was sensationalized. William noticed that even by appearance it was clear where the national team was, as the characteristics were different from them. Their performance averaged 70 points, and their average was 60, giving them superiority. William asked Mason what guided him in recruiting players, and was told that it was important to him that the stats were roughly equal. It was a standard type of selection selecting players so as not to recruit too strong or too weak to the team. Suddenly, William's attention was taken by a cocky-looking player who didn't seem to care at all about what was going on. William noted that despite having zero interest, he has pretty good parameters, but mental strength is a complete bottom. As he thought about the fact that he already had a small limit and he hadn't even developed half of it, the guy started to feel a little uneasy. He tore William from his musings by not very politely asking what he was staring at him for, whereupon William questioned if he was saying it to him. He replied that he had told him, remembering how he did annoy him for a different set of different reasons. He remembered seeing him at the previous match when Korea competed against the US team, where he acted like an arrogant idiot. While he was thinking and insulting William in his mind, William decided to switch places with his teammate to be closer to the kid. Switching seats, William immediately asks where this guy is from, as he can see how much he dislikes him. He confirmed that he doesn't like William as he was acting very arrogant at the A match, which is hardly something anyone would like. He also added that this arrogance was so nasty from the fact that he had never been in a battle before that incident, but William only laughed. Seeing how, despite his arguments, he was still being laughed at, the boy wanted to be indignant, but William interrupted him with a question. William asked with a smile who the kid's father was, to which the kid replied that his father was the vice president of the association. They were distracted from their conversation by an announcer's voice over the speakers above their heads, asking them to enter the arena. 
When William was about to go, the boy called out to him, asking him what he meant by that question and what he knew about his father. William lazily tossed over his shoulder that it wasn't a big deal. He was just wondering who and how he could raise such an idiot. While the lad pouted with indignation, William added that he found it difficult to breathe the same air with such, and he also hated arrogant ones. He did thank him towards the end, though, as he made William want to win this battle and put the kid down. When the commentator announced William's entrance into the arena, the stands began to erupt with renewed vigor and volume, which was no surprise. As he walked to his seat, commentators noted that the day had finally come when they would see William in a superhuman battle. Even though the match was a charity match, you could see many people in the stands. James Walker, Jake, Oliver, and other famous people. Also in the stands were the Moreau brothers and Charlotte, who was particularly keen to watch William play. After announcing the start of the game, the commentators narrated that the first match will be played in Ajas's Spiral Cave. The Ajas Cave itself was three circles, in the center of which there is a secret path that leads to the dungeon. The love team represented the Korean national team, and the members of the Seven Saviors played for the Hope team. Shortly before kickoff, Mason gathered his entire team and began a briefing to discuss tactics, play action, and more. He said both teams will start moving at the same time. Each from a different point, Hope starts at the fifth, Love at the first. These zones are opposite each other, so they will start hunting in Zone 5, 1, and work their way up to Zone 5, 2. Afterward, Mason said William would walk alone into the Zone 5, 3, and kill the Zone boss, bringing the team extra points. It was also agreed that they might cross paths with the opposing team at one stage, but Mason, William, and Marie would deal with them. Mason assured the team just in case, that it didn't matter how many opponents there were, the three of them would take down any number of them. Listening to this, William didn't understand why they couldn't just go wall to wall and win, and why Mason was so insecure in his abilities. However, after some more thought, William pushed those thoughts aside, as this was a good chance for him to sort out the battle and stretch himself. In Sector 5, 1, the starting point of the Hope Team, Players had already appeared, and Mason immediately told everyone to line up and get into position. Mari was again the main source of damage dealing, as her abilities allowed her to do so more easily than the others. The supporting player was Mason, as he had done in the days when he and William had mopped up dungeon after dungeon. William and Charlie acted as the tanks, as they had unique innate abilities and talents for the role. Looking around the dungeon, a strange but slightly pleasant feeling of dungeon nostalgia came over William. It was especially nice to see, as William put it, black turds with paws again, as it was a sheer pleasure to kill them. In Sector 1, 1, the starting point of the love team, things were not as smooth and coordinated as the hope team. The captain of the love team reminded Thomas, the guy William was talking to, to hit the spiders, but the guy only snapped back. Thomas was the main player doing the damage, but at the moment his thoughts were cluttered with the wrong things. He couldn't get William's mocking face out of his head and was literally burning to get back at him in this game. He kept thinking about him and revenge on him every second, and even as the huge spiders ran at him, he kept cursing William. Frustrated by such thoughts, Thomas nearly burned half his crew, but he didn't notice it, only vowing to kill William with his own hands. At this point... Hope's team was successfully mopping up the premises, and William set up Mason's shield to launch him into the air. Spreading out and bouncing off the shield William had set up for him, Mason flew into the thick of the monsters at high speed. After reaching his destination point, he bared his sword and started killing monsters left and right without knowing fatigue. When he realized there were too many monsters, he signaled to William and the latter covered him with his shield, giving him a chance to move away. Commentators at the time marveled at their teamwork, calling it a true duo of seven saves. After a while, they successfully mopped up the first zone with a combined effort, but without much force. Looking around, William and Mason noticed that there was only one side left, and without hesitation they rushed straight there. Watching how easily and masterfully they mop up the zones, Charlie has noticed that this match is going easier than their usual arena matches. He also admired William's amazing skills, not realizing if he had always been this good or if he had recently made a leap in skill level. After William made a seemingly ordinary lunge but did a great deal of damage, Charlie realized that he had witnessed William's famous move. Charlie realized that he shouldn't get a chill and began filling the shield with aura. 
noting that it was unusual for him to do so. He too rushed into battle with the spiders, but always kept in his mind that he now had to concentrate his aura on both his sword and shield. It was very hard for him at first, as he hadn't used a shield at all before, and now he also had to fill it with aura when defending. Watching Charlie from the sidelines, William marveled at how big a leap he had made in his tank skills and aura concentration. After watching for a bit longer, William also decided that chilling out was too boring and began to look out for new monsters. After eyeing a huge spider, he rushed towards it, and when it decided to attack him, he immediately covered himself with his shield. As soon as the spider bumped into the shield, William again used the same technique Charlie had seen, killing the spider instantly. The brothers that watched from the bleachers squealed with joy that they had seen the signature move, the meter attack, and turned to Charlotte for clarification. Charlotte confirmed that it was indeed a meter attack that does appear to be a normal spear strike. Meter attack is an attack that makes the spear follow its target at a very high speed, hitting targets within a meter radius. It is his super strength and honed technique that creates an ultra-fast attack that is almost impossible to dodge. Despite the complexity of the technique, William is always calm and relaxed when performing, which is what makes the technique so seamless. Charlotte said it's a technique you can't go wrong with, but he applies it playfully, now or 17 years ago. Without noticing the last remaining monster, William informed his team that he was clear. Hearing a rustle behind him, William turned sharply and sent the monster flying with another use of the technique. Seeing that the monster was still alive and trying to escape, William concentrated and prepared to throw his spear. After accurately calculating the distance to the target, he threw the spear and it flew towards the monster, cutting through the airspace. When the spear reached its target and finally finished off that monster, William smiled happily and said that no monster could escape from him. The area was completely cleared, so Mason gathered his entire team around him to praise and announce the next plan of action. When he got to the point where it said to go to the next section, he realized that William wasn't around and started looking for him with his eyes. Charlie stepped forward and said that after killing the spider, he went farther out, into the five, three zone, and told us to pull up to him as fast as possible. Mason exhaled irritably, saying that it was the right decision on his part as he was acting with calculation. With a bit of figuring out how the situation might play out, Mason waved goodbye and led his team onward to the five. Two section. William in turn had successfully made it to the five. Three zone and was facing the area boss, a huge and ruthless serpent. Standing in front of it, he didn't even know where he should start, so he decided to say hello to such a huge behemoth for starters and decency. Still not moving from his seat, William added that he had wanted to fight him for a very long time, and the serpent was already starting to get aggressive. Ignoring his sudden movements, William closed his eyes and began to concentrate in order to defeat him faster. After standing like that for a moment longer, William opened his eyes, got into a defensive stance, gripping his weapon more comfortably, and shouted to the serpent to attack. It didn't take long for the serpent to rush to attack William, first hissing throughout the entire dungeon space. William deftly dodged the serpent's first attack, sliding across the floor beneath its huge body, reacting to the attack with ease. Once under his head, William decided to use his technique again, so he gathered all his strength into his spear hand. As soon as he felt it was time, he sliced his spear right through the serpent's neck, causing him to hiss loudly in pain throughout the dungeon. William held the spear tightly in his hands and did not let go of it, while clearly realizing that he had won this battle. After a while, his entire team reached the dungeon, where William had apparently grown tired of waiting for them. They stood and stared at him in silence while William told them he thought they would need more time to mop up. William himself was sitting on the body of a defeated serpent, so the stupor and silence of his team was understandable. William realized that the more monsters you kill, the stronger you get, and you can only see the changes after a round. It was the realization of this fact that motivated William to give everything else to his team and do other things himself. He turned to Mason and Marie and told them to head after him, to which they nodded affirmatively in response. Looking at them carefully once more, William said he had just the perfect plan, and a smile lit up his face. Leaving the destruction of the smaller monsters to the other fighters, the three main players of Team Hope set out to hunt down Team Love. William flew forward and thought about the fact that he was able to defeat the serpent with almost one hit, which was a strong result. 
He also kept in his mind the fact that through killing monsters, he would be able to increase his strength in the battle. The main problem was that his current aura was at too low a level, which was extremely displeasing to William. He was distracted from his thoughts by Mason, who said they would be out on the love team soon, so why William had no plan. William replied that he'd seen a kid like Charlotte on their team. He was also strong physically, but clearly not mentally. He added that he doesn't know if he'll be among the players in attendance that they're going out on, but as a last resort, he'll figure something out. The captain of the love team announced that they would split up. Six people would go to Sector 11 and five would go to Sector 9. After they finally finished mopping up the current sector, they followed the captain's order and quickly split up. As they quietly mopped up their sector, Thomas was once again sloppy with his power, as his thoughts were once again occupied with not playing the game. He made sure that thanks to the hunting points, his aura was already yellow in color, which meant that he would definitely be able to resist William. Thomas was so immersed in his thoughts about fighting William that he was already even ignoring his team captain's orders. He checked his aura once more, deciding to himself that with that aura he would easily crush him, and his tank barely had time to protect him from the spear. The spear bounced off the shield and still grazed Thomas a bit, causing him to go into a stupor as he didn't feel William at all. After recovering from the initial shock, they sounded the alarm that they had been attacked by another team. The second part of their squad already wanted to stop mopping up and go to their aid, but the second part of Hope's team came to them. Charlie was at the head of the incoming squad, and their job was to at least delay, if not eliminate, this part of the love team. Charlie stood and was slightly nervous, as this was his first time leading a squad, and he had never acted as a leader before, but it was too late to back down. He remembered William telling them about this plan, that after defeating the Serpentine, they should help them with their attack on the love team. William made the point that time that they were the national team, so it wouldn't be easy, but they could beat them all to a pulp. Remembering those words, Charlie stood, keeping another of William's phrases in his head that when they were done, he would come and help them. At this point, William jokingly wondered how they were able to block such a strong spear throw, but Mason didn't get the joke and objected. Tensing up, William prepared to throw the shielded Mason into the thick of the enemies and deal with them quickly. Concentrating, he took a leap, launching Mason into the air towards the clustered love team squad. After launching Mason towards them, he decided to throw a spear at them in addition, but this time the throw wouldn't be weak. Concentrating again, William threw his spear with catastrophic force, which flew faster than a bullet towards the opposing team. Barely able to trace the trajectory of the throws, the love team thought they had chosen Thomas as their primary target, given the conversation before the game. Thomas himself continued to stand in a stupor, unable to move, and watched as Mason rapidly approached him. Suddenly, at the very last moment, Mason used his teleportation ability and attacked the tank closest to him. The other who stood at his back was still shocked, but found the strength to take a tentative swing. Mason, in turn, barely had time to react before he was blown away by William's spear, which hit the second tank perfectly. As he sat there, the remaining members of the enemy team said that they needed to defeat him before his teleporter recharged. Suddenly, Marie joined the fight as well, leaping high into the air and wrapping a whip around Mason's body to pull him out. She smiled cheerfully because it was the first time she was in a battle with her relatives and could really help them. She tugged on the whip and pulled Mason away from the enemy team so he could safely and quietly move away. Mason made it to William safely thanks to Marie's help and used teleportation on Marie to transport her to them as well. William taunted Mason by calling him an old man, to which the latter reacted as violently as his panting allowed. William only laughed in response and stated the fact that they had successfully dealt with the tanks. If they are left three against three, the only option left is to have a three-on-three -three duel between the remaining players. Thomas and his team stood in shock, looking at how confidently William and his partners dealt with the three members of the love team. William continued to joyfully and solemnly announce plans for further action, saying that they would split into pairs. Thomas was very frightened at his decisive actions, as he had not expected them to attack so suddenly and successfully. The commentators in turn were quite happy with the situation, as they will be able to see duels between some of the strongest players. They marveled at the splendid decision that William's squad pretended to attack Thomas, but attacked all the tanks. Commentators have also picked up on how striking it is, how gracefully William controls his punching power and speed. 
After discussing William's actions some more, they decided to switch back to the action of the match currently in progress. Thomas still stood in a stupor and watched as William's partners quickly ran past him and attacked his teammates. His partners sprinkled like a house of cards from Mason and Marie's sharp and powerful attacks, so he was left alone from the squad. Watching how quickly his teammates lost, he said it was impossible, but William, who had already approached, thought otherwise. After telling Thomas that nothing was impossible here, he gave him a crushing blow with his shield, sending him away from the game. As Thomas flew into the ground from the impact, William shouted at him that he should finally stop whining or it was getting tiresome. Also, William, while he watched Thomas's avatar leave the battlefield, still called him a stupid major with anger. While William and his squad slowly dismantled Thomas, Charlie's squad listened in amazement at the announcement of the murders. Whoever was in charge of the squad Charlie encountered resented the fact that they had managed to put down so many of their players. Without a moment's thought, he rushed into battle, urging the others to follow his example, for if they won now, victory would be theirs. He chose Charlie as his target, as this player's new position angered and offended him. The tank. Charlie, standing in front of the player attacking him, remembered William's instruction on how to properly handle his shield and sword. When he was finally attacked, he remembered that the first step was to defend against the blow, followed by a counter-attack. When he realized that he had successfully blocked the blows of the player attacking him, he removed his shield and attacked him with the sword in his second hand. The player whose attacks he had successfully repelled stood and looked at him indignantly, not understanding where he got such good defense skills from. He also added that Charlie doesn't have even the slightest idea of how to tank properly and attacked him again. After this attack, Charlie realized he should move faster and stumbled back, but the announcer announced that William was racking up his third kill. William arrived in time to help him as promised, adding that Charlie had done well, but the rest should be left to them. He smiled in the face of the remaining squad and said they would be done with them in five minutes and move on to the next stage. After the game, the commentators announced that Mason was the best player of the round. In a designated team room, the entire team congratulated Mason on his accomplishment after a long hiatus. Listening to the cheers of admiration, Mason thought it wasn't easy to come back at his age, but the experience was worth it. Turning to William, who sat silently on the side, Mason thought that this had all happened only because of him. Seeing the looks directed in his direction, William paid no attention to them as he was busy with other business. In the series he had been watching so diligently, a crucial moment was coming that left him stunned. The commentators announced that round two is about to begin, and they will announce a new location, a challenging dungeon with altered gravity. The Maze of Death is a dungeon in which staircase rooms weave in and out from front to back, and gravity presses down on players with ten times the force. They also clarified that William had cleaned out this dungeon before, but a great many superhumans had died here before him. Toward the end, commenters added that it will be very interesting to see the first Eliminator back in action. After glaring angrily at William again, Thomas went forward with his thoughts on why he was surrounded by so many idiots after waking up. He started going over in his head the list of those idiots he'd met earlier, James Walker, and the cult that had investigated following him around. William has also implied that besides the cult and James Walker, he is surrounded by other idiots like Thomas. As he sat down in his seat, he pushed aside thoughts of these idiots and said he was determined to show them the real game. Putting on his helmet, William was already ready and anticipating the fight he was about to show everyone in this dungeon. Also, when he connected to the game, he added that although this fight will be great, it's much scarier than they could have imagined. As the entire team loaded into the death maze, Mason decided to do a quick interview before the game started. Mason had already started to give his speech, starting by saying that the death maze was a very difficult location, but William interrupted him. When Mason asked William what was the matter, William told him that he would go ahead on his own, and they would catch up with him later. After that sentence, Mason asked William if he remembered how the labyrinth was set up from back in the raid days, to which he received an affirmative answer. While Mason was once again reminded that it had only been 17 years for William, he asked him if the dungeon itself had been altered in the game. Mason answered William's question by saying that the dungeons had not been altered and he could go, just let him not do anything stupid. Jokingly calling Mason a grandpa, William said it would be okay since he promised the show and they should just wait. Roughly remembering the layout of the dungeon, he realized where the love team was starting now 
and rushed that way with all his might. Marie asked Mason if he was sure William could be let go alone against the entire opposing team at this point. Mason assured her that even though William looked like a slacker, he had tremendous combat experience and was responsible and had a plan. Saying the last sentence, he remembered William's temper and once again prayed unbeknownst to anyone that William would have a plan this time after all. While he stood there worrying about having a plan, William in turn dissected the dungeon at breakneck speed. The monsters and main opponents of both teams in this location were skeletons designed in the style of mummies from old tombs. Stopping in front of the first bunch of such monsters, he smiled as he saw that it was the same as when he was defending this dungeon. After looking at these monsters for a bit longer, William rushed towards them, shouting happily that he hadn't seen them in a while. William moved between groups of monsters very quickly, not leaving a single living one behind his back. His spear was cutting through the space of this dungeon very quickly, and even the altered gravity couldn't slow down its strikes. The shield was not idle either, and served him very well to fight his way through the crowds of enemies. He used his shield to break through the crowd of monsters and then scatter them all in different directions. His last obstacle before the path he had chosen was two skeletons, which he also easily dealt with. As he jumped into the huge pit, he thought that if a year had passed for him, it had been 18 years for the others since this dungeon had been cleared. William was once again convinced that gravity was still increased tenfold, and it would be difficult for a newcomer to get used to it. Falling down, William calculated the distance and threw the spear to catch it and avoid falling. He also pointed out that if you know this dungeon very well and are used to gravity, you can take a pretty good shortcut. Thanks to the shortened path, it literally took him a couple minutes to reach the location of the love team. When they saw William, they were in a stupor, as at first the game hadn't even been ten minutes and he had already found them. Seeing the surprise on their faces, William explained to them that even in the first round, he realized how they would act in the second. After telling them this, he turned to them and told them that they were already dead since he had read their actions. The captain of the love team came out of his stupor and ordered everyone to gather together to attack William now. He also added that William obviously couldn't have come here alone, so they should split into groups, surround him and attack. Looking at their fidgeting, William thought that they were obviously rushing to judgment, for he was indeed alone. He also implied that regrouping in this situation wasn't a bad solution, but he'd outnumber them all anyway. Deciding to play with them a bit, he activated his analyzing sight ability to assess the enemy's strength. He started going through the players from the opposing team with his ability, but there was no way he could find the right one. At one point, he still found a player that suited him and instantly killed him with a spear throw. While the entire team stared in shock at the departing ally, an announcer in the background announced that William had already earned one kill. William in turn looked merrily at their surprise, scoffing, for there was no way the player would have stood up to his blow as he had low dexterity. William regretted wasting one spear, but decided that the remaining three would be enough for him and began searching the enemy team with his eyes. Unable to find them with his eyes, William realized they were hidden and realized he would have to go upstairs after all. While he went upstairs, the retreating enemy team gathered at one point to discuss tactics. The team, along with the captain, wondered how he found them so quickly as it ruins absolutely all of their plans for this game. When told that he was alone, the captain objected that perhaps his partners were hiding somewhere nearby and it was such a plan to distract them and attack. Commentators discussed the fact that after such active movements, William froze in one place and did not move. William realized that given their speed and time to escape, they were probably just hiding and lurking somewhere. He found with his eyes the point he would hit, but he figured the odds were 50-50, though you never knew until you tested it. After standing for a bit longer and calculating the distance, William swung his spear, filling it with his aura for the throw. Shouting into the void that love must return, William hurled his spear with all his might at the previously chosen point. The love team was able to spot the spearman flying towards them in the form of a small flash just before the approach itself. As they watched in amazement as the spear pierced their ally, William was glad he had correctly deduced their position. The captain and the rest of the love team stood staring at the spear, not understanding how William was able to find them and hit them. The commentators, too, sat in a state of shock and a little in a stupor at how accurately William was able to calculate the location and hit. After the background announcer called out that William had racked up his second kill, 
William was satisfied that he had guessed his opponent's position. William also added that they had already mentioned that everyone would be treated to the most exciting match in the history of the Korean Battle of the Superhumans that day. While the commentators were praising William, the love team was still standing in the middle of the court, looking at the spot where their ally had been earlier. Thomas immediately lost his temper, saying that he should have attacked right away and he could defeat one. But what would happen if two attacked him at once? As Thomas continued to get hysterical, the captain asked him to settle down, telling him that he was continuing to track them down while they stood still. He also added that they could split up and go scouting, but it would be too little too late for them, to which Thomas again resented. While they were standing there arguing, William had already walked up to them and watched them fight amongst themselves. Thomas was able to notice William's presence, but didn't let it slip, saying he hated his entire team and could straighten William out himself. When the captain contradicted him again, telling him that he should conserve his aura and then team up and attack all at once, he became furious again. Thomas said that everyone on this team forbids him everything, and he's sick of it, so he'll take care of William himself, and threw a fireball at him. Thomas stood and watched with pleasure as a huge flame now blazed where William had once stood. He stood and taunted William, saying he wasn't the smartest, and he read him, figuring out that he would appear behind him. Suddenly, William's voice interrupted Thomas's taunts, making him stand in shock that William had survived his attack on him. William asked Thomas if he really believed he had disarmed him himself, for if he really wanted to hide, he would never have noticed him. After saying a few more insulting remarks to Thomas, William suddenly disappeared, and the love team lost him from their sight. Thomas was still standing in a stupor from the fact that William had blocked his punch with such ease without even dodging it. The captain noticed that Thomas's strength and aura were at a high level even for the major leagues, so they put him in the position of the main damage-dealing player. Told Thomas that he had to catch William, so they would split into two groups, of which one would hunt monsters. He said the second group would pretend like they were going north, and when he followed them, they would kill him. The captain also added that with the points gained from the second squad's hunt, they would surely be able to put William down. Commentators have gushed that the love team have started the hunt for William, but it's unlikely to give them as easy as they think. They added that they only thought so for the reason that only the chief of the seven saviors knows the maze of death best. William stood watching them from cover at this time, but became frustrated with the speed at which they were making decisions and attacked them. The commentators had no time to comment on William's actions and shouted that he had spotted the love team and was preparing to attack the three fighters. William landed right in the center of the small group of three, causing them all to scatter in different directions. Looking around, William smiled and said that they had a pretty good idea, but their plan was still a long way from perfect. Playfully chopping up the space next to all three of them, he noticed that all three of them were the main players who were dealing damage. Looking at them once more, William asked them if they were as weak as the rest of the love team or not. Receiving no answer to his questions, William decided to get down to business and took a swing at one of them. The player he swung at had no time to react in any way to his movement, and soon the announcer in the background announced that William was already racking up his third kill. After William had taken out the third player in his path, he looked around to pick the next target to attack. Preparing his meter throw technique, he stabbed another player before the announcer in the background announced a fourth kill. After the fourth kill, William turned to the last player from the trio he had attacked and said it was now his turn. Hearing that it was now his turn to be eliminated from the game, the player didn't want that and started to back away in fear. He tried to run away from William, but the spear the latter threw at him caught up with him, and the announcer in the background announced the fifth murder. As the announcer continued to repeat William's kill count, he counted that there were only six of the love team left. The fact that he had so easily interrupted as many as five of the love team, literally half of them, gave him motivation to finish off the rest. The spectators who were sitting in the stands watching the match at that moment couldn't believe he was their compatriot because of his strength. Everyone sat in shock, including James Walker and those who had come here to get William for their team. Commentators have picked up on the fact that many players are anxious and excited about the outcome of the confrontation between William and the professional players. It's also been said that it would be interesting to know what the outcome would have been in a match between William and James Walker. Charlotte sat in shock and watched how strong William was as a player and realized that he was indeed back. 
Mason contacted William and asked him when he had time to put five men down, and he said it was as if he didn't like something. He also asked William where he was, as they would likely be done soon and could join him. William said it was unlikely they would need that information, as he would be done by the time they got there, and ended the connection. He moved very quickly between dungeons and literally instantly found himself in front of the last squad of the love team. He asked if they had waited for him, and also said that he had promised to come early, and he had kept his promise. The captain of the love team gave the command to assemble, and told everyone to work according to a predetermined plan. As they began to regroup, William was surprised to find that they were pretty well prepared to meet him. Moments later, William found himself surrounded by three groups of two, the result of the last squad splitting up. William grinned at their tactics and thought it likely they would attack him with the whole crowd in an attempt to tank him. After he realized their simple strategy, he decided for himself that no matter how hard they tried, he would deal with all of them, starting with the closest. Suddenly, his opponent accelerated sharply and threw a punch, which was quite unexpected to William until he saw his ability. Despite the surprise, William was able to block the blow noting that his ability was pretty good. William noted that this is the only opponent of his that can accelerate that much, but doesn't understand why he's doing so poorly. Striking him, William was pleasantly surprised that he was able to dodge his first attack, which was quite fast. William also added that even though he is fast, he still can't avoid defeat because he doesn't calculate actions ahead. William stabbed him and sent him flying while the announcer in the background announced the sixth murder William had already committed. The love team player fearfully turned to Thomas and ordered him to use his fire blast to stop William. Thomas didn't take umbrage in any way, but only used his ability by throwing several fireballs at William. Running out of the smoke, the love team player shouted to Thomas to help him locate William as he was nowhere to be seen. Finding William nowhere to be found, this player screamed with helplessness and ran into the smoke created from Thomas's fireballs. After he ran into the smoke, there was silence on the court as absolutely nothing could be heard, neither the player nor William. After a few more moments, the smoke cleared and the body of the already dead player flew out of there, illuminating William's silhouette with a flash. As the announcer in the background announced William's seventh kill already, the team captain and Thomas stood there and couldn't believe their eyes. William only stood and glared at them, making it clear that he would give none of them any mercy in this game. As they stood there and continued to watch him easily scatter all of their team members, he managed to earn himself two more kills. After he finished dealing with the rest of the love team, there were only two left, the captain and Thomas. William turned to them and cheerfully asked the rhetorical question of whether they were going to attack two on one. They did not answer his question in any way as they stood shocked that even in the match against the French, the situation was not so dire. While they stood there, unable to figure out what to do, William analyzed their abilities with his analyzing sight ability. He noticed that the captain's stats weren't bad, but his superpower was poor for the reason that a lot of people had much bigger auras than he did. The captain had already run out of strategies he could use to defeat William, so he turned to Thomas for advice. William was outraged that the captain had shown him such disrespect by turning his back on him and chopped him down with one swing. Thomas stood in a stupor next to where his captain used to be, while the announcer in the background announced the tenth kill already. Thomas continued to stand in a stupor as William turned to him mockingly, continuing to humiliate him with each of his phrases. When Thomas regained his ability to move, he began to stagger backward, counting on some unknown force and salvation. As he continued to beg William to stop, he had already swung his shield over his head and offered him death. Thomas's face lost its natural shape from the force of the blow that William put into that swing with his shield. The remains of Thomas's body adorned the dungeon wall magnificently after William's swing, while the announcer in the background announced the eleventh kill already. The commentators couldn't believe their eyes as just now. For the first time in the history of the superhuman battle, a team was destroyed by a single player. The reactions from the amazed viewers immediately began to break all over social media as everyone was thrilled with the result that was shown. Also, while William and the rest of his team were walking near the bleachers, commentators said that saying William needed time to adjust was nonsense. As he and Mason walked past the bleachers, William noticed the drone that had been flying above them the whole time and asked what it was. Mason explained to William that it was a camera that made it possible to shoot a scene from different angles at any height. As soon as William heard that this camera was streaming live to the big screen, 
he immediately pointed his middle finger at it. Mason immediately jumped on him and tried to get him to put his hands down, but William told him it was just a lot of fun. Mason silently dragged him along, and when William asked him where he was dragging him, he said they were going to do an interview. When they got to the bleachers, the presenter was already waiting there for them, and when they approached, she introduced herself. Mason also introduced himself back to her as a Hope team player, and William only nodded since everyone already knows him. The reporter said they had an incredible performance and she would ask him some questions about the game first. When she asked if they had guessed it would be over so quickly, Mason said they couldn't even guess. He said that during the match he just decided to put his full trust in William's skills, which paid off. After he answered a few more questions, the reporter switched to William, saying she had a few questions for him as well. She said he already surprised everyone in the first round, but in the second round he shocked everyone and could he have anticipated that he could do it all by himself? William replied that of course for in the first round he drew his gun and the excitement awoke in him, and in the second he enjoyed himself to the full. After that question, William thought about it and started going over in his head all the mistakes the love team had made. Deciding to tease Mason, he said they have a problem in a coach who doesn't see the potential of their abilities and can't place the positions. When asked by a reporter to say something for the players, William replied that as long as their skills are at rock bottom, then you can't expect results either. But he also added that everything can be achieved with money these days, hinting that he should have been hired in the role of a coach for money. When William and Mason were already seated and riding in the car, William asked why they weren't going home, but somewhere else. When Mason replied to him that they were on their way to celebrate, William became indignant, as he had plans to finish watching another episode of the show tonight. Mason replied to him that he could finish the show online, but they were having a party today, so he had to be present. He also asked William why he said about the change, because he wasn't interested in the battle, so the meaning of the phrase was unclear. William replied that he was just giving advice, and then became outraged at how such players could be put in such absurd positions, and where the coach was looking. Mason responded by telling him that he should take a look at himself, because after saving humanity, he signed up to be a coach. He also remembered that despite everything, one of the seven saviors took William's advice and became a great coach. When William said that people in this country just don't understand how to teach, Mason suggested that he start teaching others himself. William replied to him that although today he was doing it for free, the next times would be if only he was paid well for it. When Mason became indignant, William thought a little and offered not money for coaching, but a small favor from him. William's first condition was that Charlie should be put in the main tank position as it would be fair. He also added that the player against him had poor control of his speed, so should be used as an element of surprise. And then William voiced his final condition. He asked Mason to remove Thomas from the team for good. Mason specifically disagreed with William's last condition and said there was no way he could just kick him out. When William asked if he was afraid of the deputy president, Mason became indignant and reminded him that he was one of the seven saviors. He said that there are simply very few outstanding superhumans in Korea and Thomas is just one of those. When he said that he had a strong aura, William replied to him that he had very little willpower and that was the main reason for their defeat. When Mason tried to object, William put a stop to the conversation by saying that mental strength comes first, then physical strength. William then set the record straight, saying that this was his final decision and would have to be given to a deputy. Soon they pulled up to a huge and gleaming hotel, inside of which a huge number of people were already staying. Marie, as soon as she saw them arrive, immediately started running towards them from across the hall with a happy smile all over her face. When she ran up, she said there was an incredible bar with really good vodka, much to William's surprise. While Mason irritably headed for the chairman, Marie was arguing with William about whether or not she could or could not drink vodka. She was eventually able to cajole William, but when he loudly said it was time to get drunk, reporters immediately spotted him. They started whispering amongst themselves, talking about the fact that they should talk to him and interview him. Oliver was about to go and start talking to William, but his companion stopped him from that decision, saying there were too many reporters. She also added that he was unlikely to agree to sign the contract right away, and they needed to be careful. But while they were loitering already, another approached him. The one ahead of Oliver was Jake. He walked up to William and immediately drew his attention to himself. When he approached, William was surprised that he had arrived here and now wanted to talk to him about something. 
As they stood and discussed various topics, Oliver stood back and was angry at the fact that Jake had managed to beat him to it. After a little thought and consideration of the situation, Oliver realized that there was no way Jake could take William back to his place. Oliver took into account the fact that William is not like the other players, and if he can't understand William's feelings, Jake can't either. Jake was finishing his conversation with William at this point, and finally held out his business card, under the pretense of calling him. Marie was surprised that William knew English, as he had only run around in various dungeons since he was 13. When she said she thought they both didn't know English, William started laughing at her, calling her a silly little girl. When Oliver was sure that Jake had gotten away from William, he decided he was going to talk to him and headed in his direction. Oliver was already heading in his direction and even called out to William, but he was beaten to it again, this time by the two brothers who ran the club. They happily ran up to William and asked if they could have a conversation between them in English. When William sighed tiredly and answered them that he also knew French very well, they rejoiced at the fact. When he asked if they owned any club, Marie explained to him that they owned the best club in the world. She also said that Mike Bernard is also a member of their club, and by the way, he is one of the top three players in the world. When William realized what was up, he asked the two brothers if they were going to invite him to their club since they had come to see him. When they said they weren't going to invite William to their club, he was surprised, and they explained that they knew he would say no. They said it would certainly be a great honor to have him join their club, but they were only here for Marie. William was glad that they weren't going to invite him to their club and asked Marie if she was going to join their club. She immediately started cheering and thanking them in several languages, so William asked her to calm down. Just in case, William asked them again if they were really here to get just her and not him, but they said they wouldn't lie to a hero. They said they weren't interested in a support role, but she was able to unleash her talents when she took over as the main player doing damage. They also added that they think Marie will be a great addition to the team after a few practices. They also mentioned, just in case, that if William moves to them as well, it would be just great and make a dream team. William didn't upset them and said he would think about their offer. In return, they promised him the best contract possible. When he was surprised that they had such thick wallets, they told him there was no reason not to spend on such a player. They also clarified that they are longtime fans of his and wanted to give him a gun, and if he was okay with that, and William didn't say no. They thanked him for agreeing to talk to them and think about their proposal, and dared not distract him any further. They ran away as fast as they had come, and after they were gone, William remarked that they were devils. William said he was very tired of these conversations and would rather go home, but Marie was very much interested in what they had told him. He ignored her and said they'd have a few drinks before they drove home, and Marie was still trying to get an answer out of him. When William heard a voice behind him, he reacted very annoyed as he was very tired of talking. He turned around, uncultured and rude to whoever had called him, and asked who dared to distract him. The distracted man introduced himself as the secretary of the Blue House, and William wondered what the Blue House wanted from him. When he asked William if he knew about the merit system, William clarified if it was the system that was supposed to provide superhumans after the war was over. When he said it was a complete lie, he was told that it wasn't a lie, and since it had been 17 years, he was assigned level 1. When William asked what the fun was, he told him that he had to pay off everything for the 17 years he had been gone. After that, he did some calculations and announced to William that if specific numbers were to be named, it was two and a half billion one. After this conversation, William stood and replayed the conversation in his head one more time, thinking about where to spend the money. He also took into account the money that James Walker had transferred to him, and Marie asked him what he was doing. William heard footsteps behind him again and prepared himself for another conversation he really didn't want to have. The man who approached him introduced himself as Oliver Pellman. He was an agent of the Superhuman Association from the United States. William quickly realized where this was going and said he didn't want to work anywhere and wouldn't accept any offers to do so. Oliver tried to wriggle out of the situation and said that he only wanted to suggest one thing and William needed to hear it. He told him that he didn't fully understand the world that was new to him and though he had saved it once, it had been a whole 17 years since then. After this sentence, he told William that the matter could be settled in the future, and William asked him what he meant. He said that soon William will realize his place here, meet new people, define his goals in life, and become part of the new world.
Oliver also added that he shouldn't worry too much, and if everything happens according to his words, he would be happy for him to give him a call. After he said goodbye to William, he asked his companion if he had said nonsense, and she told him that in places he had. Looking at the business card Oliver had given him, William thought he was rather odd and a little silly looking. Marie said that Oliver is one of the top agents in the US who work with superhumans, and he's called the Money Ghost. After she told him that he took a lot of Korean superhumans with him, William said there was not one word about money. She also said that Oliver once proposed to her dad and there's a lot of money rolling around. The announcer soon announced the start of a charity dinner in honor of the recent game. He also asked for an introduction of the person who was in charge of fundraising and who donated the largest amount. After the presenter announced his name, William was in a bit of shock as he himself didn't expect to have donated the most. Despite his surprise, the announcer persisted in inviting him to come up on stage to give a speech. William wasn't sure where to start, so he spent a long time deciding where to start the appeal and began counting how much money he had. That man who approached him recently today prompted him that he has a fortune of over one and a half trillion won. He also told William that he had already transferred all the funds to both his and Mason's personal accounts as promised. Finding himself a bit in shock at having named the full amount in front of everyone, William spoke slightly unsure. He explained his uncertainty by saying that he had only heard about the two and a half billion payout, and his joy is slightly surprising. He decided to lighten things up by saying that maybe he was happy for the reason that this money finally belonged to him. After that, he took a short pause again, wondering what to say in front of so many people. He began by saying that it had been 17 years since his victory, and a lot had changed in that time while he was gone. He also said that everyone says he saved the world, and many believe he made a great sacrifice with his act. However, William said that he fought not at all for universal recognition or to save the world, but for fun. William also said that if they didn't destroy the evil completely, he wanted to keep fighting it by mopping up the dungeons. He also cited this as a reason for his lack of joy in those moments when everyone is thanking him for his salvation. What William was specifically proud of was the fact that the children he could help with that money had a chance to grow up. He said that the possibility of these children becoming decent human beings is more precious to him than saving the world, and there will be fewer unhappy children. As William came down from the stage, the presenter thanked him for his speech and was already switching to the next stage. As William walked off the stage, he heard a familiar voice say that he had bent things up pretty badly in his speech. George asked William if he was trying to compensate for his behavior with money, to which he replied that it's just the way life is. George replied to him that it was no excuse and he was just born a problem child. After William asked what he wanted, George asked him if it was necessary to treat the national team so harshly. He also added that it was just awful to behave like that at a charity game and now the Korean Battlefield Major League has become a playground. When William asked what the big deal was, George freaked out and asked who was the reason the government thought superhumans were monsters in human form. When William asked if he was the reason for all this, George confirmed his words by recalling the situation with the reporters. He also said that William caused the reputation of all superhumans to be ruined, but William said that everyone started first. George calmed down a bit and said he didn't come just for that, and there was another problem. William might join the national team as a coach. After George said money wouldn't be a problem either, William politely declined his offer. As a reason for his refusal, William said he now had other things to do besides coaching the Korean national team. As they rode with Mason in the car, he asked William why he had turned down George's offer after all. William replied that he now wanted to own a separate club on his own and coach them. As the reason for this choice, he said that the Korean national team is impossible to look at without tears, so he will assemble his own team. When Mason told him that more than 20 billion would have to be paid for such a thing, William was fine with it. He also asked Mason if there would be more money spinning when they moved to the second league, which angered Mason. Mason became indignant and asked if he was doing all this just to enrich himself, to which William asked if it hadn't been obvious all along. After they arrived at Mason's house and got out of the car, a woman caught William's attention. Across the street, he saw a woman in a dark coat moving quickly and swiftly apparently in their direction. In this woman, he recognized Charlotte, the youngest of the seven rescuers and the one he clearly didn't want to deal with. Mason immediately beamed at Charlotte and asked what she was doing here, but she ignored him, replying that she had business to attend to. William looked at her and didn't understand what she was thinking. 
Even though she had it written all over her face before and it was obvious, he decided to use his analyzing gaze to scan her abilities and noticed that her stats were pretty good. He also noticed that she had a new superpower called Location and marveled that she had become so strong. Without giving any sign, he asked her what she was doing here and if she wanted to kill him. She replied that she'd had that thought, but he's immortal so she didn't come for that, to which William reacted skeptically. He said that she had failed at killing him, and whether she had come here because of old grudges, and let her not forget that she was only alive because of him. Charlotte replied that she had no grudges against him, and he had suffered enough in his life, she thought. William was surprised that she had appeared out of his life and asked what she wanted then. Hearing back that she only wanted to make sure he was really back, he was surprised, as that was clearly not what he expected to hear. After she said she was sure and said goodbye and left, he continued to stand there in shock, not realizing what was happening. He continued to wonder why on earth she had come to him, even when she disappeared from his sight, as it wasn't like her. She looked back at William one last time and remembered her activities at Seven Saviors. She remembered William scolding her, reprimanding her, asking if she was ready to respond if everything fell apart because of her. She sat there, crying complaining that she was tired, saying she wanted to go home and she'd had enough. As she sat there whimpering, she didn't notice the huge monster coming up behind her and ready to deliver the killing blow. Charlotte thought about using the extinguishing ray, but clearly didn't have time to use it. She couldn't concentrate, so running away was already useless, so she just accepted her death. When she closed her eyes, a few moments later she heard William's voice saying that she wasn't even capable of doing that. William held her in his arms, and the defeated monster fell behind his back as he just looked at her. Charlotte was simply struck by William's beauty as he tried to get her to answer the question of whether she was in one piece. It was for that reason that she had fallen in love with him at that moment, that she had come that evening to see that he was indeed back. After William checked his account the next day, he was already immediately thinking about which club he would buy. Mason asked if he has already learned how to use online banking and if he really wants to be an owner. William confirmed that he wants to be an owner and says he thinks it would be fun and profitable. Mason also added that if he needs anything, he can help out, and whether he needs help buying a club out of the QB1 league. William asked what's the point of something like this if he has enough of his own money, and what kind of QB1 league is this anyway? Mason explained that there are seven players in the QB7, and in the long run, it's better to take the QB7. William asked if there were fewer players, and Mason replied that it was easier to manage 7 than 11 because it was much more difficult. Afterward, William said he would just buy himself a QB2 right then, and Mason asked him if he wanted to read more about the clubs. William turned with a pleased face toward him and asked why he should read about them if he would just ask George. When William called George, the phone was literally bursting in his hands from the volume of his screams. When William asked him what his options were, George explained that there were three teams that he could potentially sell to him. When George said he could have them even right now, William didn't believe him at first, and then asked where he could look at them. William went to the arena where a match was currently being played between the team he was buying and another national team. The fans in the stands were cheering for the wrong team that William was going to buy, and apparently they were doing it justice. Many onlookers looked questioningly at William, who had wrapped himself in everything he could for the sake of not being recognized. William paid no attention to the fact that people would start dropping off of him because he had his eye on the team he was buying. When they started calling the teams that were going to play, the team that was going to buy William was clearly unsure. He noticed that one of the guys had some pretty good specs, but he was kind of too lethargic. After the audience screamed non-stop for go, 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 William began to resent the fact that they wouldn't stop doing it. Then another guy was drawn to him from the team he was buying, and he analyzed him with his analyzing eye ability. William wondered how, with his physical attributes, he was placed in the position of support player. Looking at his super strength that allowed him to put up a protective barrier, he thought it was probably because of her. But then he looked at his stats and noted that because of their high edge, he could be a pretty good damage contributor. He obviously didn't think he'd see something like this here, as he just needs to be trained properly and can be released into battle. Then his attention was caught by another player whose strength and willpower stats were close to 90, which was high. Noting his super strength, which allowed for increased speed, strength and agility, William noted that this could be useful as well. 
Looking at the rest of the team, he realized that no one else stood out in any way, and only these two could be used in any way. When he looked at the bench where the replacement players were sitting and looked at the stats, he wondered how one of them was even there. His attention was caught by a red-haired girl who was just standing there cheering for her team, and her stats were clearly higher than some of her teammates. Her strength was at its maximum, but her agility and speed had very high values that were almost at their maximum. After that, William noticed her super strength, which allowed her to leap forward 20 meters and compared her to flee. After that, he thought that it wasn't the worst ability, but in unskilled hands, this ability could even be harmful. After the match was over, William thought he hadn't seen such losers in a long time. However, after a little thought, he took off his glasses and thought it would be even more interesting to coach a team of such idiots. After the match, George called him and asked if he had already picked a team, to which William replied that he was picking lawless men. Two days later, the sale of the lawless club to William was made at the Korean Superhuman Battle Association. The former team owner wished William luck and said he would believe in him and support him to the end. After the purchase of this club, information about it went all over the internet and flooded the news. In the comments, people were disgruntled and asked why he didn't just become a player and didn't think he was suited for a coaching job at all. After George congratulated William on his purchase, he said it was funny because he was happy to dump the whole thing on him too. When told by the director that he had agreed to it himself and it was all non-refundable, William said he had no intention of turning down the job. George asked him if he had figured out how to run the team, and William said it was the same as always. Just look at the players. And then the director said he was done with projects, so he had to leave, and then saw William's new purchase. William said he will have to drive to different places a lot now and doesn't want to yank Mason to drive him around. After getting on his new motorcycle, William also added that a club owner should be able to spend money properly, and he is doing a good job with that. William on his motorcycle could cross town very quickly on the Kenbu Expressway. Many drivers were unhappy with the fact that he rode his motorcycle on high-speed roads without a helmet. They also resented calling him an asshole or an idiot thanks to the fact that he still rode the expressways on a motorcycle and without a helmet. However, things changed after the drivers saw it was William, which is why he didn't wear a helmet, so he wouldn't be subject to any claims. When the drivers saw William driving the motorcycle, they assumed it was okay since he was immortal, and it's understandable why he rides without a helmet. They also added that taking off his helmet also allowed them to recognize him, and it shows that he can make very good decisions. When William arrived at the clubhouse of the lawless men, he was not particularly thrilled with what he saw. He had noticed that the building was grey and dreary, and the whole place was just as dreary. Suddenly he heard a voice behind him tell him that outsiders were not allowed to enter here, and he was surprised at such insolence. The person who approached him apologized as he didn't recognize him and didn't think he'd stop by so late, and introduced himself as the coach of the Mayhem team. After analyzing his abilities, William realized that he would be a pretty good sapper, but he's sitting on a coaching role for some reason. This decision was prompted by his stats, as well as his two abilities that allowed him to restore life and inspire his allies. William grinned and asked him how old he was, and he was surprised at the question and replied that he was 43. William said he was born four years earlier and therefore four years older, and the man didn't understand what he was saying. When he asked William what was the matter, William replied that he appeared to be older, and he agreed. William then said that he would call him brother, and he would call him senior, and asked here to show him around. His newfound bro was tentative about showing him around, but detailed everything, including the dining hall, office, gym, and dormitory. When he said there were 14 players in the club, William said he didn't understand why so many, but at least there was equipment, albeit old. The last thing his new bro had shown him was the training room where 11 modules stood. William looked around and noted that it was quite nice and spacious, but the downside was that there were fewer modules than players. When he asked his brother why this was the case, he said that the equipment was very expensive and they didn't have much money. William made the point that there are some things he doesn't like about the club and there are things to work on here but he will manage as the main problem is the players. Turning to his brother, he asked him to show him the fighters right away, to which he was very surprised. William said he saw no point in not rushing things, and so ordered him to call everyone currently in the dormitory. Turning to those who came, he asked if they were aware that he was William, the new owner of the club in question. Mia, the girl he had seen in stock, replied to him that she was very happy to meet him 
and introduced herself in return. Noticing for himself that she did indeed look something like a flea, William asked if she was practicing with a bow. After his question, she jumped aside in surprise and asked how he understood, to which he replied that for him to determine such things was nothing. William then said that she was unlikely to fit the position of a damage contributor, to which she only sadly agreed with his words. He also noticed that it didn't have much that stood out in terms of features either, but he decided for himself that he would do things differently. When he told her he would make her the team's main character, she looked at him in surprise, not believing her ears. When she asked him again what he meant, he told her that she would be their angel. It didn't give any more information. He voiced to her that her new task was to morally destroy the enemy by stealthily stripping them of their minds. After a few more minutes of conversation, he questioned the fact that no matter how much she practiced, there was no improvement. To this question, she thought a little and sadly replied that it was true, for no matter how hard she looked, she was hopeless. William heard these words and cheerfully said that she was, so she was fired and had to leave the team. Turns out it was all her thoughts, and she thought that if she admitted her weakness, those thoughts would become a bitter reality. However, when she heard that William was not kicking her out, she was very much surprised and delighted at the same time, not believing her ears. When she looked questioningly at William, he told her that he had already told her that she would be the main character of the team. When she asked if it was a joke, he said he was serious, and she had a special talent, and it showed. She then asked him if he meant archery, and he answered her in a brusque manner that anyone was capable of wielding an ordinary bow. He then explained that he saw another talent in her, a talent for running, and she is a very good runner, which can be utilized very properly. She was surprised that he had chosen that particular talent, as she herself was unaware of it, and he said she needed to focus on it. He gave her an example that she would gallop like a goat, shoot archery and make a fuss, such as getting monsters instead of opponents. He also added that because of her super strength, when her opponent starts to catch her, she will be able to use her skills to get away with it. When she asked him if he meant that she would need to make a feint, he said she did. William also added that she will hold the position, and it won't go unnoticed during the fight, but it won't be possible to catch her. As a result, William said her main goal is to make the other team sweat when they catch her. She hesitantly asked him about the fact that if she did things this way, she could really take the lead. When William replied that if she tried hard enough, she might be a member of the national team, she got very excited. Mia immediately rushed to him asking if it was a joke, if he was lying and if it was true, to which he gave her his assent. She immediately rose in spirits, going over in her head that she would be in a leadership position as well as a member of the national team. She jumped up on the spot and thanked William very profusely and said she would work hard, and he remarked that she was definitely a flea. When he called for the next one, he didn't come into the room right away, and it was a little annoying from the start. The person who entered introduced himself as Henry, and told William that he was playing a support position. William remarked that this was the first time he'd seen such a jerk among superhumans, and here were some unique individuals that made him want to laugh at the sight of them. When Henry said that he was told that he had been told that he had called for him, but did not specify on what matter, but that William had said that he was no longer in support. After saying this, Henry was very surprised and started trying to change William's mind that he had been playing the support position all his life. William irritably replied to him that he was now not a supporting player, and the latter again objected that it was probably some kind of mistake. Henry stood there wondering what was going on. He had suddenly summoned him and was taking him out of position without warning as to what he wanted him to do. William at this point was going over his characteristics to make sure he was exactly the right fit for the position he wanted. When he told him that he would henceforth play the position of a damage contributor, Henry was literally stunned by what he heard. In response to his surprised look, William told him that he had a talent for wielding weapons, and it wasn't just empty words. After uttering the phrase, Henry hesitantly asked William if he had ever watched him play. William didn't want to admit that he passed out during their match and said who would even take the team without finding out everything about them. Henry told him that he had a low strength and agility score, and William replied that it was because he was used to retreating and defending himself. When he asked if that's how a sapport should behave, William exploded and ordered the man to stop arguing as he certainly didn't know any better. William remarked that he couldn't stand support players, as 9 out of 10 such players usually don't fight, but just stand behind. 
Afterward, William remarks that one out of ten isn't like that after all, and Henry is somehow that one. He told him that he would have at least two superpowers, and when players like that have their backs to the rear, their potential is increasingly revealed. He asked Henry if his superpower was a defense, and Henry responded by confirming William's words. William said that this was his first weapon, and he would give him a second one on his own to improve his skills. When Henry asked him if he was going to make him a sapperter who could not only stand behind him but also fight, William finally exploded. He grabbed Henry by the collar and told him he was going to be the main damage contributor who had super sappert powers and he was just dumb. William then asked Henry why he was so caught up in this support, and if he was afraid to just pick up a gun and go into battle in the front lines. He told him not to make that kind of approach the basis of everything, and if he wanted to succeed, let him listen to what he told him. Henry then asked if everything would work out if he followed William's advice, and William replied that what mattered was how much effort he himself put in. After that, as a bottom line, William asked if he wanted to stay as a sapper or if he wanted to change things, but he could stay and all would be lost. He asked him what he would ultimately choose and if he liked just being part of a team that ranked last in the league. Or Henry wants to step up, change his life for the better, and take a new position for himself to improve his skills. After that, Henry thought for a while, swallowed nervously, and shook William's hand, saying that he would be the main player doing the damage. After William left the dorm, his bro asked him if he was done getting to know the players. William approached him and asked if he could find another trainer as they needed a good swordsman. When William said he needed someone to teach Henry how to handle a sword, the bro tried to argue that he was in a sapport position. When William said he was now the main damage contributor, bro was shocked and William said he had to get things ready for Mia too. William added that the guys in the first group need to improve their stamina, as he noticed that during the matches their opponents did something and pumped their own. William then asked if he could go, and after receiving a satisfactory answer, went to the motorcycle, but then he remembered something else. He turned to his newfound bro and asked if they could change the name of the team he owned. The next day, William sat and puzzled over what to do next, as he was completely at a loss as to which decision to make. Mason walked over and told him he didn't look good and asked what was wrong, to which William asked him to back off. Mason said he's worried for that reason because he doesn't even watch his own dramas, and isn't it because of the lawless people? Mason also said that William told him about there being 14 players and whether he would be expanding the roster. Mason wanted to say a few more words, but William jumped up abruptly startling him a little. William silently headed for the exit, and when Mason asked him what he was going to do, he said he was going to do some recruiting. Walking over to the window and looking outside, William said he would have to cast the new contestants. Also, he's made the point that a bunch of reporters under his windows could get him very hooked on the task. He dialed his new bro on the phone and told him he needed help, and he needed to revamp the team a bit, which surprised him again. When the latter asked if William was serious about changing the lineup, William said he was, and if he had any concerns. After telling William that it would cost a lot of money, William asked him to stop complaining. William was a little angry at his assistant's stupidity, but in the end they agreed on everything. William thought he needed to impress the new players somehow, so he told his brother that recruitment for their club would be open for three days. When he asked if three days wouldn't be enough since they usually last a month, and William said three days would be enough. When he went outside and said hello to the reporters, they looked in his direction in surprise, clearly not expecting to see him here. They asked him if he would be willing to give them an interview if he came out, and he told them he would, but on one condition. He said he would answer all questions, provided they did some necessary favor for him. After this sentence, a reporter in the crowd raised his hand and asked what William needed so they could get answers. William told them that recruitment for his team would be open for three days, and they needed to post a message about it online. After that, word of his club's player recruitment immediately spread across the internet, and millions of applications immediately flew to him. The next day, the bro dialed William and said he had gotten tons of applications, and William asked if there were even a few thousand. The man only replied to him that it had gone over 70,000 at this point, and he didn't understand where so many were coming from. But William told him to calm down. He told William that he was concerned because it wasn't even the season, and there were so many applications. But William asked him to stay calm. When he got to his head office, his bro dumped a huge stack of paper on his desk and said it was all superhuman resumes. William immediately started reviewing them and said he'd sort them out real quick. 
and then he'd do an interview right afterward. All superhumans, after awakening their powers, are physically tested by their country's association, just as William was in his time. William was going through all these resumes, resenting that everyone here was kind of dead, someone didn't have enough power, and a whole lot of other reasons. He was very much annoyed that through the paper, he could not analyze them with his ability, analyzing I and understand the potential. After a bit of angst, he decided that he should review all the applications after all, and maybe something worthwhile would be found. At one point, his eyes fell on the resume of a young guy named Lucas, who worked for a delivery service as a courier. He noted that his strength and agility are barely one and a half times that of an Olympic gold medalist, and it's almost worthless. However, William pointed out that this guy's superpower, visual telepathy, it can transmit not only objects but also show others what he sees himself. Realizing that this ability could be used very competently, he decided he was interested in this guy and put his resume aside. They conducted an interview that same day, and their first client was a young guy who immediately said he was a longtime fan of William's. William turned to him and asked if he had participated in matches when he was a senior in high school, and he said he had, but soon stopped. William didn't understand the meaning of his phrase and asked again if he had changed his mind right now since he had applied to join the team. The guy started making excuses and said he just really wanted to see William in person and ask for an autograph, which made him very angry. After William started kicking him out of his office in a rude manner, he asked why he was being so mean to the fan. William was indignant and struck him, after which he added to be sure to tell everyone that William had sent him and was very cruel. After William's bro asked him to hold back, he ignored him and asked him to bring the next candidate into the office. After the guy was carried in his arms out of the office, the other candidate stood in a bit of surprise that he came out of there looking like that. Next, a guy named Lucas, the one whose resume had interested William earlier, was called into the office. He hesitantly entered the office and introduced himself to William and his brother seated before him. Bro immediately started reviewing his resume and asked him why he came in with such low scores. When he turned to ask William why he had come here in the first place, he saw that William was very interested in him and was surprised by it. William applied his gaze-analyzing ability and began reviewing the guy's characteristics to make sure he hadn't miscalculated anywhere. He also noticed that the guy had as many as three superpowers, which would be a very huge benefit if he could unlock them. He also picked up that one of the superpowers was Aura Transmission, and it's a very useful, commanding superpower with great potential for use. He reviewed the resume one more time to see if the guy didn't know about this ability and if he'd listed anything else of interest. He asked his brother if Lucas was really born in 2002, and he said that was correct, and he and Mia were the same age. After his bro told William this information, William looked at Lucas interestedly and realized it was fate. After some more thought, he turned to Lucas and drew his attention back to himself, preparing to ask a few more questions. He asked Lucas if he had any experience fighting in battle, since he only indicated a delivery service, and he replied that he had no experience. William then asked why he was sending in an application in that case, because he has very low stats, so he doesn't qualify as a player. Lucas said he knows it well and understands it all, but since he was a kid, his dream has been to get into the battle as a player, and this is his chance. He also added that maybe others see him as just that weak and worthless, but he is absolutely serious and confident in submitting this application. William also said there were a few other things he was interested in, and asked how far away Lucas's telekinesis worked. Lucas replied that it was about two and a half kilometers, and he could use his aura to get an approximate location. He also added that he can find another player within the aura's operation, but you have to search manually as it doesn't work on autopilot. William smirked because he could use his ability to detect, and things were much better than he'd anticipated. He said he'd finally found a nun to work with as their team angel, and Bro didn't know what he was even talking about. William asked Lucas's name once more, and he repeated it back to him, not realizing what he was now facing. William paused dramatically, and after a few seconds of silence, joyfully announced to Lucas that he had been accepted onto the team. After Lucas happily couldn't believe his happiness, his bro jumped out of his seat and asked William if he meant it. William explained to him that he would make a great partner for Mia, to which the bureau was even more surprised. William explained to him that the build could not fail, and that the team's strategies would be based on the work of these two. That same evening, the players and the rest of the Borderless Club decided to celebrate William becoming an owner. Everyone celebrated, drank, 
ate what they made themselves and asked for everyone's love and pity on this holiday. William said that despite the anxiety, the atmosphere in the team was normal, and afterwards one of the players said hello to him. As he turned around, he saw the player he had noted at the match after Henry, and he introduced himself as the captain of that team. Taking a closer look at him, William remembered that he had indeed seen him earlier in the competition, but he wasn't particularly interested in him. He wasn't interested in him for the reason that it's a standard tack that's nothing special, but he's too good for a team like this. He said he wants to thank William for investing in their team and will do everything in his power not to disappoint him. He also asked William to take care of them and said he hoped for mutual cooperation between the two. As he was leaving, William remarked that he was open and sincere, so he was the perfect captain for the team. Turning back around, he noticed that Mia and Lucas were already getting along great from the start and were having a pleasant conversation. After thinking for a bit, he beckoned the two to him, whereupon they ran up to him happily, waiting for what he would tell them. William announced to them that they were the new members of the second group and they would fight the battle as one, so he asked them to live amicably. He said that while the angelic girl is extracting information and praying for forgiveness for her soul, a grey nun is playing the whole game behind her back. He then added that Lucas would be playing the role of the nun, which again really surprised them both. When he finished telling them, he said that they would discuss everything later and they should just relax and have fun now. When they moved away from him in a bit of confusion, he was convinced and relieved that the team was now at least minimally staffed. The last thing he had to do was change the name of the club, which he disliked very much and was itching to change it. After thinking about the new name for a bit longer, William shouted across the court, calling everyone's attention to himself. He chose YSM as the new name of the club, and under that name they played their first match three months later. The commentators who have been commentating on this game have announced that tonight's game will be a test of their new strategy. William looked at his players and wished them to do everything they did in practice and not do anything extra. When he asked Lucas if he'd figured out what to do, he asked William if it was really all right, and he told him not to sweat it. William gathered everyone around him and announced that the day had come when they would show everything they had learned in three months of training and have a lot of fun. The first round of the Battle of Superhumans match between William's new team and another team from Korea was successfully declared open. Mason's wife thanked him for William inviting her to the first match of his new team. When she asked why Mason himself hadn't come, he said he was just waiting for something and didn't dare to come. When she asked if he was working with his boys using a different methodology, William told her that she could rest assured that he was. He smiled and asked to be allowed to show her the incredibly exciting battle he was putting together personally. The dungeon of the first round was Wizard's Canyon, a picturesque place not to be found in reality. Earlier in training, Mia had covered a hundred meters in three seconds and didn't even pant while doing so or lose her breath. William had picked up on the fact that she had an incredible talent for running, and Lucas was also much faster and tougher than he had been before. The running coach told William that Mia was a real treasure in that regard, and he also heard that Lucas had no experience in battle. William didn't give the appearance of saying that their progress wasn't much different, but really he just realized it with an ability. His coach told him his instincts were astounding, but such a thing was to be expected because William was the one who discovered Mason's talent in his day. The coach also said that once they work out Mia's style of play, they will get good results and be able to get her into the actual game. It had been a full 40 days of training, and there were 50 days left before the competition, and Mia was still training hard. Her teammates wondered how she could be caught considering she moved so fast and bounced around so much. Observing the results of her training, William said they could definitely employ a containment strategy now. When William asked the team how the experience was, he was told that it felt like the tackle rate was half what it normally is. Afterward, William asked what had pissed them off the most. When he got the answer that there was a great dynamic, he praised Mia. After he praised her, she answered him with a smile, but there was still excitement in her soul. She still thought their principal was the best person because he said he would make a heroine out of a player who wasn't even on the team. She also recalled that he had said she could make the national team if she practiced, which was hard to believe. Mia also picked up on the fact that her nerves were already on edge and whether she had done well, but then a voice brought her out of her thoughts. When the voice of her team captain brought her out of her worries, she jumped up in surprise and asked who was calling her. When the captain asked if she was worried, she immediately waved her hands and said she wasn't worried one bit. 
He calmed her down by telling her that she didn't have to pretend, and since it was her first game, the fact that she was nervous was completely normal. The team's players behind him confirmed his words, with one saying that when he first stepped on the field, he even threw up. As a bottom line, the team captain said she could be nervous all she wanted, but she shouldn't doubt her abilities at all. He also said that the leader of the Seven Saviors himself believes in them, and she will become the best game stealer in history. After his words, Mia stopped worrying, became inspired and replied with confidence that this was how it would be, and they could win. The captain said they are a team assembled and coached by national heroes, so they should fight honorably so they don't embarrass him. He put his hand up and said they wouldn't do everything as agreed, and the team backed him up with cheers. When the players on the new team split up and started moving, the commentators suggested it was a 4-4-3 strategy. After that, they swept one team of three across the dungeons, ignoring the monsters, and it's a deterrent from the start. This group of three moved quickly through the dungeon, ignoring monsters and jumping from native aerial objects to others. Suddenly, having reached a certain distance, they stopped just after such a rapid forward movement and began to wait for something. Lucas told them to wait a bit, picked up a rock from the ground, and began using telekinesis to track the location of the enemy team. He combined telekinesis abilities with aura transmission, allowing him to act as a scout and calculate the location of the enemy. After guiding the stone between the different air islands, he finally found the enemy team that was moving to one side of the dungeon. He said that all four were moving in one group and showed the direction they would need to travel. Mia sat on the ground and prepared to jump to instantly catch up with the enemy team in seconds. Pushing off from the ground, she soared into the air as far as the next air island, which was tens of meters above them. She performed incredible and beautiful aerial movements, jumping from one island to another, showing very high mobility skills. Finally, she was able to get to the enemy team and was a bit shocked at the magnitude of the dragon battle that was going on there. When she was sure the enemy team had not spotted her, she relayed the information to her team that she had reached the target. Seeing that there were no strong players nearby and the dragon already had very little life, she prepared to fire her bow to finish off the dragon. The enemy team still didn't notice her and were preparing for the final blow they were going to deliver to this dragon. The squad leader ordered them not to relax and told them that they had almost caught up to this dragon. They only had one last strike left to make. Suddenly, Mia's arrow split the air and finished off the dragon, leaving the enemy team no chance to get any experience out of it. They were upset that they lost points for the monster, and they were also annoyed that YSM was just busy stealing other people's monsters. The team captain ordered one of the players to deal with Mia, and he headed in her direction at great speed to eliminate her. Mia watched him swiftly approach her and was a little unsure if she could dodge, but she pulled herself together at the end. This player struck where Mia used to be, but she'd already managed to move to a completely different location. He was angry, thinking she was mocking him as she just jumped up and was instantly somewhere else. He tried a few more times to catch up with her, but she only taunted him and moved quickly from one place to another, leaving him no chance. This player was annoyed by the fact that he couldn't catch up with her, and he was also really pissed off by her bullying him. The commentators have picked up on the fact that Mia has slightly hyped up the opposing team's players, moving so fast that her opponent can't keep up with her. Also, commenters have picked up on the fact that Mia's supply of arrows is not endless, and sooner or later they will come to an end. Mia turned to Lucas to use his telekinesis power to hand her a new quiver of arrows. Lucas instantly used his ability, and Mia had a brand new quiver of arrows in her hands, fixing the only flaw. For his part, Lucas had already spread a blanket for himself in the shelter he was in and pulled out a manhwa to read. Settling down, he arranged his quivers of arrows comfortably and told Mia to turn to him if she needed anything. The commentators were shocked by the fact that Lucas just sprawled out in the middle of the match and started reading a manhwa. A few weeks before the match, when Mia was practicing for her upcoming match, everyone was trying to catch her, but they weren't having any luck. Watching her act, William has noticed that Mia has an innate talent for pissing people off and pissing them off. Also, he's picked up on the fact that the main sticking point is that Lucas needs a safe place to use his powers. William then made the decision to have Henry accompany Lucas while he searched for shelter, as his superpower would help defend himself against the monsters. Suddenly, William noticed that Lucas had found a hiding place and had laid out his quivers of arrows in front of him. After he handed the first quiver to Mia, William remarked to himself that it looked very pathetic. 
William's brother also noted that Lucas will stay in this hideout until no one comes to take him away. William had already voiced aloud to Bro this time that the way Lucas was doing his job looked pretty pathetic. Afterward, he said that if Lucas was being so cautious, he'd rather let it look clownish than somehow stupid and pathetic. It was for this reason that William made the decision that Lucas would just lie down and defiantly read the manhwa during the game. As he read the manhwa, shells flew over him, but he remained undetected as he continued to supply Mia with shells and resources. During this time, Henry defended him from several mobs of monsters, and commentators swept in to watch some truly spectacular fights. Henry was doing a great job, monsters were flying left and right, and he was successful in his new role. Well, while Henry continued to fight the monsters around him, Lucas continued to enjoy reading. The audience was shocked at what William's team was doing, and outraged at the clowning they were doing here. Suddenly, Lucas was asked by Mia to hand her more arrows, and taking the quiver in his hands, he handed it to her using telekinesis. Watching this match play out, William couldn't contain himself and just sat there and laughed at the top of his voice right in the stands. Mason's wife laughed and asked William if he told him to play it that way, and he said it was just funny. William said he has a knack for finding talent where no one else sees it, and he's even intimidated by how good he is at it. He also mentioned that Mason did nothing to remove Thomas from the team and put Charlie in the tank position. The wife at Mason said he mentioned that there was some controversy and strife going on right now, both mentioned and not mentioned. Mason sighed heavily and said that when problems arise, the coach needs to know how to address the issues with ferocity. Suddenly, the commentators announced that it was time for one other player to be distracted, and this immediately caught William's attention. The commentator said that two more players join the enemy team, and they start to make the situation very dangerous for Mia. Lucas closed his book and prepared for action, telling Mia to spin like a frying pan, because there was no turning back. Trying to take her at her wit's end as a joke, he asked her if she could hold out until help came. Mia confidently replied that she could, and rushed straight towards the enemy team, drawing their attention back to herself. Seeing the gleaming blade in front of her face, she thought it was the first time she was coming face to face with opposing players. But despite her struggles, she remembered William saying she would make the national team, and she also remembered the captain's words. Her memory still carved into her mind the words her captain had said about them being a team put together and coached by a national hero. She swore she would do her best and began running and dodging at double speed, luring the opposing team to her. She moved quickly from one place to another, and the opposing team didn't realize she was leading them and kept chasing her. They started discussing amongst themselves that they were moving too slowly, but there was no way they should miss her. They tried with all their might to catch her and ran after her, but Mia continued to run away stubbornly. After running a few more meters, she sprinted and jumped off the cliff down to the next island, figuring they wouldn't follow her. When she looked back, she saw that they were keeping up with her and jumped to follow her to the lower islands. They were almost close and were telling her to catch it faster because if they delayed, the difference in points would become very large. They finally cornered her, and as she stood on the edge of the cliff, she stared at the enemy team members in front of her. When she looked around, she realized she was standing on the edge of a cliff and there was nowhere else to run, which meant it was the end. When one of the black enemy team said she couldn't jump from that height, she cheerfully retorted and asked if that was true. When she started waving her arms cheerfully and started asking if she really had nowhere to run and they had stumped her, they didn't realize what was going on. As she continued her random ramblings, they started talking amongst themselves, asking if she was okay. While they were conversing, Mia's team had come to her rescue and were already descending the wall of the island behind her. William's team captain said they wouldn't miss them this time and they were finished. Mia, for her part, said behind their backs that if she wasn't okay, there was nothing to be done, we'd have to call for help. Mason's wife, who was sitting next to William, marveled at how exciting this match was. The commentators in turn burst into tears of admiration for the new team's tactics as they made the enemy team run out of time. At that moment, while they were commenting on all these actions, part of the enemy team had already been paralyzed and eliminated by William's team members. When they were almost done, the remaining enemy team fighters arrived on the scene, but it was too late as they ran out of time. The first round between William's team and another team from Korea ended with a score of 9-0, and it was their first win in a long time. The commentators announced that this was the first such interesting match in a long time, 
and tonight they discovered a new treasure. They further added that a mind-blowing union was born before their eyes, and they now have high hopes, and the viewers started praising them. Mia and Lucas stood in the center of the stage and just basked in the admiring cheers of the audience from the podium. Feeling William's gaze on her, Mia turned toward the podium he was sitting on and caught the look she felt. She read his lips that he was telling her that he was telling her that he'd said she was going to make it, and he was happy for her. Afterward, she remembered his words that he would make her the main character, and it made her heart blaze and her face glow. She looked at him happily, letting her whole visage know that she was grateful to the core of her being grateful to him for standing here and receiving these accolades. The commentators have already officially announced to the entire room that Team William wins the first round. The clean win in the first round was a complete surprise, and the result shocked everyone, including the opposing team. The opposing team was starting to get worried and angry, losing their temper, while William's team was only inspired to do better. Next, Mia and Lucas played a crazy game of containment in the second round too, leaving their opponents no chance. It is for this reason that they too had a simply incredible victory in the second round, defeating the opposing team in zero. Standing on stage after the match, Mia held a microphone and thanked the person who first discovered her potential and made her into a player. Immediately after this win, news about this duo went viral and just filled all media outlets. People in the comments were praising how annoying Mia's playstyle was and how good she was at it. People also wrote that this is the first time they've seen containment played so cool in their country and they're organizing fan clubs in their honor. People also commented that surely she couldn't have done anything without Lucas and he deserves his praise too. It was also mentioned that William strategized in advance for Mia and Lucas's union, and it paid off. A few days later, as William lay in his home, Mason tried to shake some information out of him about where he had found these children. William called him an old boar and said he would just reply to him that someone else had picked them, and he just agreed with him. When Mason said that either way these guys are talented, William backed that up by saying he has a talent for this kind of thing. When William asked about Charlie, Mason said that he had agreed to be a tank if he carried the national symbols, and there was a debate. Mason also added that other coaches in their country don't like him very much, and it is quite difficult to convince one or the other player for any action. William rose abruptly from his recumbent position and said it would be funny to watch them sing in front of the greatest coach ever, meaning himself. Mason said crossly they wouldn't say a word to William, and in his mind he realized he was seriously screwed. Suddenly, Mason heard the most unexpected question that could be heard from William. William asked Mason how much money he wanted to charge to sell him Charlie on the team. As time went on, the news broke about the uninterrupted winning streak of the YSM team, which has now racked up five consecutive wins. Bro. William was just thrilled and with a happy face showed him the news that they had five wins in a row. He even started crying and saying that there would finally be some celebration on their street too, which started to annoy William. William asked him to calm down, saying it's only five wins in a row and it's not some kind of record. Bro responded by telling him that they've never won that many in a row, and the internet community almost idolizes their Mia. William said it was because he was always right, and recalled how he was always whining, to which Bro apologized to him. William said it's too early to get excited because the foundation of their strategy is Lucas, and now all the teams know it. When he asked Bro what they should do, he told William that they would have to protect Lucas now anyway. William said he was smarter than he looked, which hurt him a lot, but he paid no attention and asked for water. When William felt an angry look in his direction, he turned to look at Bro, but he was no longer looking in his direction. William turned to Bro and asked that when the results of the training came out, would their players lose their fighting spirit and power? When Bro replied that they wouldn't lose, William said he liked his confidence, but he needed a 50% win rate. Bro was completely killed by this phrase, as before this their win rate for the season had been a maximum of 31%. The team captain sat and silently listened to their conversation, realizing it was a big number, but since the director was confident, it would be fine. He has also observed that William is like a sheep in his stubbornness, but he carefully considers every word and decision he makes. He also savvied that because of the lawlessness, he was able to battle, earn a scholarship, and become an individual in the community. He was also happy that finally, after all this time, he could finally repay the team for all they had done for him. 
William ended his conversation with his bro by asking him not to drip on his brain, as they were just going to rest and relax. Standing up on the bench, he drew everyone's attention to himself by shouting out that he wanted to tell everyone something very important. He announced that if their team wins half of all matches, he will personally invest in the team as they deserve it. When he asked if everyone was clear, the crew answered him with a joyful shout, much to William's delight. After some more time, William got up from the table and asked his bro not to see him off since he wasn't a girl. He thought about the problems that if the enemies ignored Mia and found Lucas, their entire strategy would fail. He also figured that without a containment game, their chances of winning would drop dramatically, and help was needed to diversify their tactics. William thought they had gotten sponsors and funding and needed to take advantage of that to bring someone good to the team. He was then distracted by the ringing of his cell phone, which vibrated in his pocket, notifying him of a message he had received. Checking the message that came in, he saw Mason had sent him a list of high school prospects. William decided it was a good chance to change the roster, even though the good guys had already signed contracts. He decided for himself that he would definitely find new talents and that the kids should just wait for him to come. William's team's winning streak was snapped on their sixth win, as other teams were expected to find a way to counter their strategy. Despite all this, the team captain stopped hesitating and focused completely on his team and proposed a new strategy. Toward the end of the season, YSM had 18 matches, of which they won 10 and lost 8, and their winning percentage was 55.5%. When summer came, William came to one high school to scout for new players there. After saying hello to the coach of one of the teams, he asked him to give him a brief tour of the school and students. He led him to the hall, to which William was very much surprised, for in spite of the questionable activities, everything here was of a high standard. Suddenly, William's attention was caught by one of the players who was practicing away from the others. After watching him move from side to side very quickly, he has picked up on the fact that this player is very good and promising. The coach implied that rumors will not hide anything from William, and this player is going to join the Phoenix team in the future. William took a closer look at his stats and realized they were too low and he had to come down to earth. With each player examined, William's hope of finding something normal on this team dwindled and his mood soured. William was getting tired of looking at all the players, and he was starting to get a little crazy, so he was thinking about leaving here. It frustrated him that all the guys here were like double fishing boats. They'd only be useful when paired with someone. As he was about to leave, his attention was caught by a tardy student who appeared in the doorway. While this student was apologizing to the coach for being late because of exams, William looked closely at him. When he saw William, he was very surprised to see him in this school and even a little pleased. After analyzing him with an analyzing eye, William began to ask him questions, starting by asking him if he was missing practice because of his studies. He told him that just because of his studies, he doesn't think he can become a professional player because he has very few statistics. He then added that he was a very big fan of William, to which William asked if he wanted to shake his hand. The student asked if it could be done because they say that when he hears someone is a fan of his, he hits that person. William calmed him down by telling him that it wouldn't happen to him, holding out his hand and offering to join his team by signing a contract. Upon hearing the contract offer, the guy couldn't believe his ears, as it was the last thing he expected to hear from William. William wasn't so much attracted to the guy's stats, which were average, as his shadow-walking ability, which was very strong. William's point was that at the Korean League level, this superpower is enough to survive and get big results. He decided he had to get him before anyone else found him, and once again invited him to join his team. The guy says he's grateful to William for his offer, but he doesn't even know his abilities and offers him a job. William thought it was worth it for him, just like everyone else, to make up some nonsense out of the category that he'd seen him at some competition. When he said he was watching TV and saw him on a channel about the Youth League, he got the response that the guy always sat in the reserves. Not knowing how to get out of this situation, he clarified if his name was Mark and said he was looking for him because he was curious. William also clarified that when he saw him, he immediately realized that Mark has a hidden talent. It's just that no one knows about it yet. Mark objected again and said that his stats left a lot to be desired, and most importantly, his superpower was so-so, and even with it, he was worse than the others. William took umbrage and asked if he was questioning his experience and said he was the one who found such outstanding players to play on his team. Afterward, he said that this guy also has an outstanding talent 
and it's his superpower that he just needs to use wisely. He said he's seen a lot of superhumans and understands such things at a glance, and right now it's completely unknown what Mark's abilities are. Mark listened carefully to his lecture and said that it was still very hard to believe such a thing at once. William then tried again and asked if he was aware that superpowers are a reflection of personality traits. When Mark agreed with him, William said that his superpower was perfect for him, and with effort, he could develop it. He also added that he knows for a fact that his superpower will be able to rise a few notches above its current level. When Mark didn't believe his words, he offered him a bet, but first he would need to join his team for two years. He also added that if the latter realizes that he has wasted his time in his team, he will pay him 300 million in cash. As Mark stood there in shock, and from that agreed, William immediately grabbed him and dragged him outside without further ado. They approached William's motorcycle in the parking lot, and he told Mark to hop on it. As they rode down the road, Mark was nearly blown off the bike, but William controlled everything so that he stayed seated. The contract was soon signed, and William was pleased with his attendance at this school today. While Mark stood there in shock at the trip and his mother was happy for him, William said that this contract was a good one to start with. He was excited to find a player at his first school and decided to see if he could get more players. As he drove forward on the expressway, he was gripped by what lay ahead and what kind of players he would get. When he arrived at the next school, he was told that all the kids had already signed contracts, so William was left with nothing. Standing in front of the gates of this school in a stupor, he thought that it was just bad luck and he would definitely be lucky at the next school because there are many schools. Having traveled to literally hundreds of schools in their city, he was turned down everywhere because all the talented kids had already signed their contracts. William was so unhappy with the situation that his face had already twisted beyond recognition. He was standing in front of the gates of the last school, where he would have a chance to find some talented player for his team. There was no need to describe William's degree of annoyance to realize how displeased he was that the only normal player didn't want to fight. He said that for him, Superhuman combat is just a hobby to have fun, and he has no plans to go pro. William's point is that his superpower is very good at identifying opponents' weaknesses and should not be overlooked. The coach of this school told William that it's useless, because this guy has gotten many offers, but refuses all of them because he's stubborn. William thought his superpowers and super strength were well-deserved and asked if his parents were okay with professional matches. The boy replied to William that his parents were in no way against such a thing, as they were paying money for it, and the reason was his affliction. He said he wanted to become a writer so he could create with his work and give people dreams and hopes through text. William was left even more annoyed after this speech, realizing that this student was specifically sick of art. An idea suddenly occurred to him, and he asked the guy if William, one of the seven saviors, was really sitting in front of him. When the latter asked why he was asking this, he told him that he could write his biography, and he could tell him different details. After that, he also added that he might even have a story that no one has heard yet, and it's about the last dungeon. After this speech, the guy jumped up from the table and asked where to sign the contract, and William was pleased with himself. After the guy agreed to the contract, William took him outside and soon they were done working with him. William replied that Mark cost him many times less than this guy, and apparently it's because this guy is in demand. The boy pulled William from his thoughts by turning to him, and William turned to him questioningly. Toth asked if he could ask William one thing, and William replied that he could call him Elder and could ask questions. He asked William how come he had no weaknesses at all. William marveled at this fact. He explained to William that this was the first time he had seen a man like him and he could not see a single weakness in him with his ability. He said he has had occasion to apply observations to players on the French national team, but no one there comes close to comparing to William. William asked what he wanted to say with that, and if he wanted to know if there were any other uniques like William in the world. When the man said that William could act as a player, William said that his plans did not include beating babies. After the boy nodded satisfactorily, William asked him if those were all the questions for the day. He then told him to go back and that their coach would contact him and that he should just wait for a call from him. And it's time for William to move on to the main event, he called Mason and asked if he was free. Toth asked if William had found any players worthwhile, and William replied that everyone had been sorted out a long time ago, to which Mason was not surprised. William said he had another player in mind and needed to visit a place, but didn't tell Mason where. 
When he arrived at the Spirit of Two Stars clubhouse, he was immediately surrounded by security, and William said he needed a team coach. They said he stated so cavalierly that they were worried because of a long-standing incident that occurred at the Blue House. In that case, William asked them to report his arrival, and said that while he waited, he would go for a walk. William walked around the club grounds and looked at what they had present there, stadiums, halls, houses and dormitories. He also made the point that it looks like the club is making a good income as everywhere you look. Things are significantly better than the rest of the club. He picked up on the fact that their lot had only one advantage. You could easily hike down into the mountains, but it wasn't the best fun. Suddenly, William heard a voice behind his back addressing him and turned toward him. The one who approached him asked permission to introduce himself and introduced himself as Logan, the director of the Two Stars Spirit Club. William was surprised that a director came to him and asked if he was responsible for player transfers and recruitment, to which he received an affirmative answer. William said it's pretty busy since he has a coach in charge of everything, to which he got the response that their coach is multitasking. Logan thought William was like a ticking time bomb. There was no telling when it would go off, and he had to be careful. He said he was reported to have sought out their coach and wants to talk to him about a player transferring to his team. William was surprised that they were aware of it, but when William advised the coach to change Charlie's position, the whole top brass found out. Logan thought that letting William and coach meet face to face would be a disaster, so he suggested they discuss things with him first. William said he shouldn't, as it would suck his tongue to repeat himself twice and should just go to the coach. When they entered the room and met with the coach, the latter was visibly unhappy with William's presence in the place. William introduced himself and said he was here on business and official business and asked if the coach of the Spirit of Two Stars Club was in front of him. He shook his hand uncertainly, confirming this information, and began to shake, much to William's surprise. Suddenly some kind of insight came over William and asked if they had met this coach somewhere before. He said he was suspiciously familiar with the man's face, and he only continued to shiver and look away from William's gaze. The guy behind the coach asked if William knew their coach, to which William asked who he even was. The guy introduced himself as the captain of the Two Star Spirit team, and William wondered what the team captain had forgotten at such a business meeting. The coach justified that since the conversation was about one of the players on the team, the captain had a right to know everything. William was clearly not satisfied with this information, and he was not sure of its veracity, but he agreed and continued to think further. When the coach asked William why he was looking at him so intently, he did not answer him, but only continued to glare at him. It appeared that William kept thinking about where they might have met the coach of the Spirit of Two Stars team earlier. The coach said it was the first time they were seeing each other, and he had mistaken him for someone else, but at this point was wiping his face sweaty with fear. William didn't believe him and told him that he had definitely seen him somewhere, to which he replied that it wasn't an important question and they had other topics. When William sighed unhappily, the coach of the Two Star Spirit Club twitched, but he continued to stand silent. William said he couldn't think with everything simmering in his head and needed to give him a minute to dig into his memory. The principal asked him not to dwell on it, but William ignored him, saying that it was obviously not a pleasant memory. Still not paying attention to the coach's words, William said that as much as he thought about it, it didn't seem like it was out of the realm of the everyday. Suddenly, William had an epiphany and glared aggressively at the coach, causing him to back away. When he uttered just one word, Dungeon, the coach went into a stupor as William hit the mark. He said he definitely remembered, and it's hard to completely forget the jerk who once got on his nerves during a raid. William gave the date as 1993, the place as the Temple of the Untamed Soul, and he said it was definitely him that day. He added that he was going to kill you after clearing the dungeon, but for some reason he didn't and already regrets it. He also made the point that the principal even grew a mustache so that the returning William wouldn't be able to recognize him, which hit the mark and put the coach in a stupor. As some of the strongest members of the superhumans gathered before the entrance to the still unclear dungeon, it was business as usual. William said that there are a lot of traps in this dungeon, so they won't be able to go fast, but that's also why they can't slow down much. Suddenly, a voice from the crowd interrupted him, which surprised William, but he decided to pay attention to such a brash person. It was just the coach of the Spirit of Two Stars Club, who at that time was very arrogant, egotistical, and self-righteous. He said that they could safely defend this dungeon by running through it, and William was only famous because he was good at killing monsters. 
He also added that there's no way that anyone could pass this dungeon, and he's talking about strategy first and foremost. After his words, William couldn't help himself and lunged towards him to smash his face in, but he was stopped by his comrade. He told William that work was more important, and he needed to finish explaining the plan, and then enter the dungeon. As he led William away, then William promised the coach to see him afterward, but the coach only grinned at William leaving. He said that William was a show-off, and it was unthinkable that some underage girl would organize and lead a raid, and he would sweep the dungeon better. The dungeon was just a mob of monsters that had no end to them, and they were climbing on the superhumans who entered in huge numbers. William said that it is not necessary to create a junkyard, and tanks should alternate and close in on the enemy to advance. Suddenly William almost fell over as some man flew past him and yelled at him to get William out of the way. It was the one who interrupted him and questioned his plan, and he said that if they delayed like this, they would never finish the raid. He also added that everyone should not listen to this pompous idiot, meaning William, and should follow him. He said that after this dungeon his era would begin but he suddenly stopped in front of the obstacle that abruptly appeared in front of him. He remembered William's words that there were many traps in this dungeon so they wouldn't be able to go fast, and he saw a hail of rocks in front of him. He had already prepared to die as he could not dodge, but William grabbed him by the collar and pulled him out from under the falling rocks. He sat and watched huge rocks fall in front of him, shattering into small pieces and not realizing how he had survived. When it was announced that the path was blocked with rocks, they said they would probably have to go back and stop the raid. It was also announced that it would take about six hours if one went around, whereupon William looked at the legend with a grim look. He said he would talk to him later, looking down at him cruelly, which put him in a stupor and made him twitch with fear. The coach stood and remembered how he almost died on that raid, and his bones still ached when he recalled the situation. The coach continued to pretend he didn't understand, and said he had mistaken him for someone else. William retorted that they should talk face to face and told him not to shake with fear. He also asked him what he thought about the fact that after all these years, he had come just to get revenge. William then added that since they were going to have a normal conversation, the captain and the principal had better leave the room. He also added that he didn't care if they stayed, but the coach asked them to remove themselves and wait outside. When it was just the two of them, William had already confirmed that he was the one who had ignored orders and was cracking madly about his ways of mopping up the dungeon. He also added that he was talking bullshit about the leader and the plan, and his mistake caused the raid to drag on for nine hours. Coach said he recalled such a thing and he was young and stupid, to which William said he was even younger than he was then. Coach said that the past should be left in the past, and when they left the dungeon, William beat him to a pulp altogether. He also added that they should definitely start over in that case, to which William replied that he was right and it would be unfair for him to retaliate. After that, he thought for a bit and said that the coach should be beaten up for the new mistake, which put him back in a stupor. William said that even though he'd already beaten the hell out of him in the past, he was now back to messing up again. He asked if he was ready for another round and told him to come closer, adding that he would hit more gently this time. The coach asked William to slow down and asked him what he had gotten wrong since he didn't understand anything. William explained to him that he knew what prompted Messina to make the changes to the team and he apparently has a very huge amount of courage since he's arguing. William also added that if they want to be done with it, the coach needs to stop running things the way they are and then he will be left with teeth. When the coach asked what William was doing on his phone, he said it was to please reporters he knew and tell them his story. He also added, then he will be finished because the whole country knows about it, and all William has to do is open his mouth. William, after the coach threatened him with a lawsuit, didn't take it seriously and said he wasn't going to win it. When the coach asked what William's conditions were, he told him that he had to give Charlie to his club. He also added that Charlie only has one year left on his contract, and in six months no one will be paying for him, and does the coach realize that? When Coach asked what the mayhem was going on, William replied that he was the one who started it all, and he should have initially made Charlie a tank. When William asked if he would resist changing his position just out of personal conviction, the coach angrily agreed. When he voiced to William that the price of this player was a billion and two hundred million one, William disagreed. He said when he walked here, he noticed that the equipment they have is excellent and the club has no money problems. 
He asked if this attempt to rob him because of personal problems was accomplished, and said to name a price, and if he was satisfied with it, the coach would live. As the coach stood in shock at the fact that his life was on the line, he marveled at how William still carried the earth with such character. When he quoted him a price of one billion, William was not satisfied with that either, with the fact that he had only dropped two hundred million. When he quoted him a price of eight hundred million, William said it didn't sound like a discount and was already starting to unclench his fists. After a few more tries, the coach literally cried and said he'd give Charlie away for a hundred million and wouldn't discount him again. They agreed on that price, and the coach said that in return, they would start fresh without any animosity or old grudges. William happily agreed with him, jokingly referring to him as Mr. Coach of the Two Star Spirit Club. After the successful transaction, he looked at William again and said that it was just the devil incarnate, and now it was over. A short time later, a few days later, Charlie arrived at William's team's clubhouse and William greeted him. He told him they were his team from that day forward and called him Charlie's Tank, which pleased Charlie himself. News broke that Charlie had moved to William's team, and the deal was the result of negotiations with the coach of William's team. William sat and reviewed the three contracts he had managed to get and was not satisfied with them. While he was thinking about where all the talented high schoolers had gone, Marie came home and said it was hot outside and she was home. When she saw William, she happily ran up to him and asked him what he was so busy doing lately, since it was almost impossible to catch him at home. He responded by saying that he was a long way from her, as Mason's wife recently complained that she had already started to forget what she looked like. Noticing the book Marie was holding, William asked her what it was. The book turned out to be a beginner's French textbook that allowed students to take their first steps in learning the language. William teased Marie by saying that today's kids have their heads full of crazy stuff and textbooks help sort it out just a little bit. She said French was very difficult and suggested he go to France with her since she was so stupid. When William heard about France, he was a little surprised and after a short pause asked what it was all about. Jake Rent did in his office and said that in Korea all the necessary procedures were completed and everything should be finalized in Paris. Marie thanked him for doing her a favor, and William looked at them incomprehensibly because he didn't understand what he was doing here. Jake remembered how the Moreau brothers from France had originally expressed interest in her, so Jake sent them a formal proposal. Jake then added that following this offer, Marie will sign with the club in Paris and begin his European League debut. William listened to this and realized that this was probably the reason for the French language fuss. Jake said that they were done talking to Marie and now he wanted to talk to William about one topic. William said he should start by explaining what had happened so badly that they had asked him to come. Jake explained that the brothers also wanted to invite William to Paris, and William wondered why they would want to do that. Jake replied that he would be a translator for Marie, and plus they wanted to get him a gift. Afterward, William remembered them telling him about wanting to give him a gun when they were dating. He said he recalled such an incident, that he was offered a gun then when they crossed paths. William said he is too busy right now for an overseas trip as he gets the team to the start of the second half of the season. Jake was surprised that his team was looking for new players and offered to help him find them. William said he could not make an inquiry through such an influential agent as his club does not have enough reputation. Jake then nodded understandingly and suggested he look for players in Paris, which again surprised William. Jake explained to him that the rules say that each team can have up to five foreign players and France has a lot of clubs and players. William thought about his proposal and eventually agreed as it sounded very interesting and promising. He said it was a very good idea and from that very day he began to pack and prepare to fly to France. A few days later they arrived in Paris at the international airport with Maria and her mom. They walked through the airport, breathing in the air of their new country and anticipating the fun that would follow. Marie's mom said she hadn't been to Paris in a long time and it would be great to fly Mason here, but he declined. William replied that there was nothing that could be done, since coaching jobs burned up a lot of time, and he told them to look at Marie's new house. William also said that from the minuses is only the fact that even here he is pestered by journalists who have already in the extreme frayed his nerves. Then he heard a familiar voice and saw one of the brothers waving at him and beckoning him over. William asked him if they were the reason there were so many photographers or reporters here, and if the principals were required to come here personally. He said that naturally, since he personally supervises the athletes, and wouldn't it be great if Marie got as much interest as possible. 
He also offered to give William a small interview for the sake of his niece, which William was not very happy about. William agreed, however, and within minutes he was speaking to a crowd of reporters who, as always, had tons of questions for him. When asked if he intends to become a Paris club player, he said his main concern right now is to support his niece. When asked if he planned to meet one of his former colleagues from the Seven Saves, William was surprised by the question. He said that he had given up the whole business and chosen a simple life, met a smart woman and was living well, so there was no need to bother him. William added, however, that he was not here for long. He had no time to look for him, but if he came to Paris himself, he would be glad to meet him. When he said this guy was a victim of scammers and he's sure he's homeless, the one they were talking about spit coffee out of his mouth. Spitting coffee out of his mouth was Eric, one of the seven rescuers who was currently unemployed and was the subject of discussion. Disregarding his coffee-covered collar, the man marveled that William had come to France so quickly. After which he reached the deck of the yacht with a few leaps, and without saying anything, jumped into the water like a professional swimmer. He shouted to the grey-haired man that he had an urgent business to attend to, so he was going back to France, but was told they were in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Meanwhile, William arrived at the Lumiere Clubhouse in Paris with Marie and her mother, who were sure to be welcomed. Two twin brothers in suits and sunglasses announced that this was the day Mr. William visited their club. They also added that since they did come here, it would be just fine to contract this gentleman. But the guy replied that his niece would be active instead, so let them take care of her, to which they immediately agreed. However, they still suggested he take a physical test too, since he hadn't done it in a while and they would measure everything without error. In addition, they have asked for a book signing of his biography for them, and they are planning a special event, and have asked him to attend. They relentlessly pelted the hero with all sorts of news and requests, causing his patience to break, and he stopped them. After a while, Mari had already changed into her uniform, picking up her dagger and small sword in preparation for the test. Through the screen, the girl was asked if she was comfortable, and if nothing was embarrassing her, but she assured that everything was perfectly fine. Wasting no time, they decided to start the test, while the girl had already gotten into the battle simulator of her opponents. While the phantom shadow-like monsters were being created, she was told that she had to defeat all the opponents that would appear in front of her. She had a time limit, only one minute, that had already started, and the shadows immediately tore towards her, however. Mari reacted to it. She was faster than them, and so she left them behind in one dash, immediately preparing to make a counterattack, counting on her speed. In the same abrupt motion, she approached them, swinging her sword, delivering one blow to each, which was enough. Half a minute later, the joyful girl took off her helmet, saying it had been fun, but it was a new record, 22 seconds. Immediately, she asked her mom and uncle how she had done, in response to which she was immediately praised, for she had become even stronger. The girl smiled, saying that she had been practicing hard all this time, when suddenly one of the brothers and offered to sign the contract. William thought that she was certainly doing well. After all, she was only 24, and that was the best period for superhuman development. Plus, he gave her pretty precise instructions, and the coaching staff here is much better, with all that she'll be able to push her skills to the limit. While the skills and aura are weak, a good superpower will make up for it, and it will be quite possible to take center stage here. And such a player cost only 400 million euros, after which he looked at the brothers, realizing that they are good at persuasion. But suddenly the lad turned his head and heard a voice not far away, asking if this was the right place, if Mr. William was here. Marie stared in surprise at the man she had seen before, while her mom remarked on how handsome he was. There was a guy standing in the doorway while the hero remembered that it wasn't about having a top three player. And they say he's as fast as his friend was when he was younger, though he could hardly outdo him with his agility score. Mike Bernard is a member of the Lumiere Club and is a top three player. On William never thought they would meet like this. And now this man stood not far from them and scrutinized them, bestowing each with a modeling smile. In 2005, after seven saviors including William mopped up the last dungeon, the war ended. Many superhumans laid down their arms and retired and began to live ordinary lives, and in the wake of this, a new sport was born. This state of affairs encouraged more and more superhumans to come forward, and then a heated debate began. They didn't know who to consider the strongest man after William's death, and it was the most discussed topic of the modern era. 
And while it was many superhumans who floated up and down in the rankings, there was one person who was invariably mentioned in every such debate. France national team ace, Paris Lumiere ace, who is in the top three teams in the whole world, and three years in a row this man was the best player. And today, he personally came to headquarters, even though he had the day off, to see Mr. William, of whom he had heard so much. They stared at each other for a few seconds, while the guy wondered if Mike was dyeing his hair and what he was staring at him for. The blonde then turned around and waved at Mari, saying that he wanted to greet his new co-worker that way as well. Not understanding anything, the girl only answered him with a smile and waved her hand, trying to greet him in French. In fact, the girl was worried, asking her mom what the guy was talking about. However, the woman didn't understand French either. While the girls were gazing at the jersey with rapt attention, someone turned to William, cheerfully stating that he was very pleased to meet them. Looking at the blonde guy, the hero thought that at least this guy had manners, but he still couldn't understand why he was staring at him like that. But he decided to put that point down. After all, this guy was going to cripple Marie, so he shouldn't think badly of him, as suddenly Mike stood up in the rack. The dumbfounded hero immediately reacted, thinking that he had decided to attack, but thought it was kind of weak. But the blonde only hugged him. A bewildered William listened to Micah's delight in welcoming him to Paris, and didn't understand why the devil he'd gone for a hug. After which the blonde man apologized, because he should have introduced himself first, but the hero said he knew him, and had seen footage of the competition. Mike replied that he was embarrassed to hear this from the man who has been his idol since he was a kid, but he is as far away from him as the moon. William thought that if you didn't praise someone like him, who deserved praise at all, while the blonde was glad to meet him in person. The hero then began to examine Mike's abilities, thinking that with the exception of stamina, his stats averaged over 90. When he uses the doppelganger ability, he's sort of met with not one tough fighter but two at once, double power. Not he still has room to grow, as not all characteristics have reached their maximum, but even at this level he outperforms his friend as well. In this scenario, the use of a doppelganger coupled with his combat skills provide limitless possibilities. Stamina is the least developed, but it's already over 80, so it's not a weakness. That's above average for tanks in Korea's first league, but if you think back to Walker, who has already smashed his potential, he had both his strength and stamina up to 100, and his agility potential was 96. If those two swept together, it would be a bomb. That's why people get excited about the battle of the people, because people always wonder who will win if this one and that one fight. As Mike suddenly asked if William had made up with Walker, because ever since the latter went to Korea, he just hasn't been preying on him. Not long ago, however, they seem to have been in a bit of an argument with each other. But William replied that the older one had simply given the younger one some advice. The blonde was surprised by that response, and the hero added that he was soft, and after they were done, he gave him a $10 million dollar tip. Mike asked that he'd made his final decision when Walker barged in on him, to which the hero agreed since it was in the news. The twins immediately said that the news didn't say who won, to which William replied that it didn't come down to murder, but he won. A dumbfounded Mike turned to Mr. William, asking if it was really possible to beat Walker one-on-one. -on -one. The hero looked at the blonde man with surprise, asking why not, after all he was human too, in the same way they were. The twin said he showed his abilities to a young lamb who doubted himself and even gave valuable advice. They wondered why Walker has gotten so good lately, make a stronger player who could be his own opponent in the future. Here is the act of a brave hero who saved the whole world. They immediately started praising William, who immediately asked them to settle down. And while the hero tried to placate the two bald men by asking them to plug in their charm, Mike reflected on this victory. After all, even he avoids fighting this guy one-on-one, -on -one, even though he is one of the strongest in France. And vision of tactics, he's already at a disadvantage in a fight against a tank, but he can't be sure of victory even under map selection conditions. He was thought to be dead, so he thought it was impossible to fight with him, but he is alive, and he is here, and so he wants to fight with him. But at the same time, the hero thought about Mike, that this Frenchman, apparently, walking down the street, we charm girls with his eyes. After that, the guy approached Marie, asking her to be careful with him because he looks like a womanizer, but the girl said that he is not her type. Suddenly, the girl's mom sneaked up on them unnoticed and smiled and asked who her type was then, if not Mike. Maria thought for a couple of seconds, then smiled and said that she liked bold, strong, and daring men. Whereupon, she glanced at William, 
blushing slightly, while the hero pondered her words on the subject of strong and bold, to which her mother replied that such people get into trouble, but Mari said that a person who gets into something is bound to do great things. The woman tried to persuade her that there are caring men like her father, but the girl replied that she would deal with her personal life on her own, whereupon Mom shot a glance in William's direction, who pondered there that it might be Walker, but it was unlikely. A little while later, Mari announced to her uncle that they were going shopping with her mom. He would get something too, asking him to wait. Mike also asked him not to worry, as he would personally accompany them, however, or the blonde man worried him the most. But the hero said he would survive because of this guy, because he wouldn't want to go shopping. And the twins bid him go into the workshop, for there was something they wished to present to Mr. William. Pleased with the gift, he headed after them, stepping inside the huge factory which the hero immediately began to inspect. It was a huge shop, with people of various ages laboring in it, but all of them were sturdily built for hard work. Looking at the workers, the hero thought that the owners of the workshop had come, but no one even paid attention. They then entered the gun room, and the two men said in one voice that all these weapons had been manufactured in their workshop. Looking through the showcases, the boy came across a sword that caught his eye, which he immediately took in his hand and appreciated to which he heard a question from the twins, felt the case of the period when the average quality of the outfit began to decline. Apparently the maintenance of their workshop cost a lot of money, and it wasn't particularly profitable until the battle of the superhumans came along. They just decided to take responsibility for the lives of their masters, and they didn't miss a beat. Hard times played right into their hands. But now they can give Mr. Williams something perfect that was created personally for him. The men were overjoyed that this wonderful day had arrived, whereupon one of them pressed a button, opening a separate display case. It contained neatly stacked metal pipes, below which were two belts to hold them. Holding out a pair of pipes to the hero, he immediately asked if the spear was his, to which one of the twins answered in the affirmative, and he could have it. Taking one of the tubes in his hands, the guy asked how it worked, because he didn't see any buttons there, which made the task a little more difficult. With one voice, the men replied to fill the spear with his aura, whereupon the hand and spear were surrounded by blue flames. A second later, the pipe transformed into a full-fledged spear, the length of a full human. The twin stated that the folding spears he had used so far were also very good, but this spear was made by their craftsmen. However, it will be less durable than his current weapon due to the large number of small parts, but a digital copy is used now anyway. William noticed that real dungeons were long gone, so no jobs where a real spear would come in handy. The men advised him to just take care of the spear, and it would last him a very long time. And boy did he like that. He then asked what they had made him to give him, whereupon he felt obliged. The twins stated that they had created it specifically for him. However, he was not the only one who would be able to use the spear. After all, if it's William's own spear, his replica will sell great, then they present him with the weapon, and he presents them with the name of a world hero, to which the lad immediately exploded in discontent, loudly declaring that he had nothing to be grateful to such peddlers for then. But they already appreciated his sponsorship, and if their scheme paid off, it would turn out to be a nice benefit for all of them. It is estimated that the guy will be paid for five years at the rate of one and a half million euros a year, but that's not the end of it. After all, if he fights in official and unofficial fights with these weapons, they will pay him three million euros per match. At first, William turned away, pondering the suggestion, for the hero might have turned down such an opportunity. But for him, the club owner, it was too lucrative an offer for him to turn down, and so he accepted. After a while, the twins asked the hero if he had read the contract, to which he did not hesitate to say yes. They reminded him that you can't get rid of guns, and storage is done by the person contracted. The men were also asked if he was an official superhuman battle player, to which the guy replied in the negative. Only official athletes can apply for weapons used by superhumans, but he has immunity. And this was known to the twins but the hero will not be able to pass customs, which he was very surprised, asking what to do now. After all, he has no particular desire to break through customs, but the twins immediately rushed to reassure him. But the brothers said that if a hero can't carry a gun because he's not officially an athlete, he might as well be one. After a couple more hours, Marie returned with her mom, happily announcing to her uncle that they had bought something for him. However, he only absent-mindedly asked if they were back, to which he immediately heard the girl ask him what was wrong. 
A few hours ago, the twins had told him he could register with the National Battlefield Association. Because the player rosters are each trans managed by a worldwide association anyway, so the place of registration doesn't matter. He needs to get all his French membership papers done, apply for a gun, and go through customs in peace. But William got angry at the bald shorties again, declaring that they'd been planning to pull it that way all along. Without losing hope and good spirits, they in unison began to deny it, saying it was pure improvisation. They asked him not to sound like he thought they didn't have their own interest, because the skill of negotiation is what allows them to move forward. Registering with the association will not create any restrictions or obligations. On the contrary, it will give them more freedoms. After all, there are no fans more devoted to him than the Moreau brothers, and they even have a collector's room named after William. It was 17 years ago. They had Mr. William's stuff on display there. They even bought a diary that he only kept for four days. The hero became even more angry when he learned that they were in possession of his diary, after which he rudely asked to call their agent. And so before Marie, he said that if he needed the money, he'd participate in amateur competitions, but he's registering as a player. But the girl immediately clapped her hands, congratulating him on his sponsorship contract, adding that he was now a professional athlete. However, registering doesn't mean he owes anyone anything, but how infuriating that he got involved with these two. They immediately offered him a contract with Lumiere in Paris, but the guy immediately chased them away, offering to try out a new weapon. Marie said it would be great if he became a player on the same team as her, like he and his dad years ago. The boy wondered aloud, for to him years ago were only a couple of months, for time passed in a very different way. Suddenly they heard a familiar voice asking that Mr. William had a new weapon. They were approached by Mike, who immediately offered to help him test it, not forgetting to ask his opinion on it. After all, there's a practice fight tomorrow morning, and even though the guy is still on vacation, next season is upon us. And that's why he tries to train at least twice a week, which made him want to keep company with the returning hero. William noticed that this little guy wasn't even trying to hide his curiosity, but it was completely mutual. The guy immediately asked that this was an interesting kid who would definitely not be boring to fight with, rather even the opposite, after which he clapped him on the shoulder, replying that he accepted his invitation, wanting to try and give the training a try. The next day they arrived at the clubhouse of the Paris Lumière, near which several sports cars were parked. Inside were a couple dozen people discussing the end of the vacation, saying that now was not the time to relax. That's where William and Marie, who had already changed into her gym uniform and claiming she was going to destroy everyone, came in as well. The hero answered her to relax, for if she fountains her fighting spirit, she will be taken for a simpleton. She looked like her father when he first entered the dungeon, immediately wanting to use the restroom, so focused that he fainted. She felt a little embarrassed for him, but she continued to smile, saying that the others present were as calm as Boas. Suddenly, everyone stopped talking and immediately looked in their direction, scrutinizing the newly arrived strangers. They did recognize one, however, for William was all over the news, saying he had flown to Paris. They had already begun to discuss this, that he was the strongest of the days of creatures living on the planet. And now that he was immortal, there was no doubt about it. Eventually, the owners of the club, the Moreau brothers, got him in after all, because they kept singing dithyrams in his honor. Marie wondered if they had seen her uncle and started gallivanting around. However, he appeared as her uncle, so who else could be so lucky? Suddenly, a tall, dark-skinned guy walked up to them, addressing William menacingly, trying to moralize. The hero immediately had his back to the girl, asking the stranger what he wanted, to which he replied that he was Lumiere's main tank, Chichi Lucas. However, the hero didn't care much about that, because the guy looked pretty dangerous, but let him just twitch as he immediately lay down. But suddenly, Chi-Chi smiled and slapped his palm on his chest, asking if he could get an autograph for the spot. Relieved, he painted him a sweater, then pointed to Mary who said it was his niece and she needed to be looked after. The joyful fellow immediately agreed, after which William thought that he seemed harsh at first glance, but kind of peaceful. We'll need him to tell Marie to make friends with him because judging by his abilities, this guy is a real monster. His skills were at a fairly high level and he also possessed three kinds of superpowers, among which were revival and resistance. The ace of this team is Mike, but the most important and irreplaceable force is Chi-Chi, whose strength was now being tested by William. If you work on him a bit and get him promoted, he could easily be in the top fighters like Mike or Walker, 
Also, he could still get a speed boost. It would be better if Lucas was not a tank, but a main dealer. Of course, his superpowers are closer to a tank's specialization. But suddenly, he noticed the superpower of amplifying plants nearby, and thought he liked flowers and stuff. Suddenly, Mike came up to him, asking if he had time to meet Chi-Chi, while the heroes were surprised to see him. Blondin said that in addition to his sporting activities, Chi-Chi heads a global charity organization to protect forests. Now it was clear where he got that green blessing from, after which the hero noticed that it was still morning and he was already glistening like a bald Moro. Blondin smiled, replying that when he thought his dream might finally come true, he couldn't keep his emotions under control. Afterward, he said that his dream was to surpass William, and now that possibility was quite real and within reach. After all, the hero who saved the world, for him, the superhuman of the next generation, was the only goal, the wall he wanted to overcome. However, he had died in the last dungeon a long time ago, causing the dream of competing with him to obviously be unfulfilled. But he's back in the world of the living, and standing here in the flesh right in front of him, which gave him a great chance to prove himself. To which the heroes only smiled, asking if he wanted to compete with him in strength, to which the blonde replied that man is a creature who can dream. So now, as long as he is alive, he will never give up on his dream, and today, while fighting him, he will also try his best. Such noble speeches made William eager to fight as well, telling Mike that he was interested to see what he could do. Suddenly the doors opened loudly, and the Moreau brothers walked in, with the coach standing beside them and the assistant behind them. The older man immediately smiled, clapping his hands, then said he was happy to see them, introducing himself as Coach Derek Goffin. Without wasting time, he immediately suggested that everyone split into teams, gesticulating and waving his arms vigorously. The man said that their strongest couple, Chi-Chi and Mike, usually lead each of their own group, but tonight they had a special guest. So William and Mike would be the leaders today, and they were the ones who had to get their team together. Suddenly, the hero decided to ask how he should create a team, according to position and balance, because it plays a crucial role. But Derek replied that at Lumiere they share in their own way during practice, which really interested William. But contrary to the hope for nuanced talent and interesting strategy, they are all divided by a game of rock, paper, scissors. After that, they distributed William's team first, which through luck included Chichi Lucas and Marie. While Mike's team included people unfamiliar to the hero that he knew little about and could only guess at, Afterwards, the coach smiled, stating that they were two very good teams, so it was time to start practice. Ten minutes later, both teams stood in a huge arena in front of each other, deciding to spend that time on battle strategy. Looking at the opposing team, William thought it was a spacious temple in which the opponent could be seen from anywhere. The terrain features won't help here because they just aren't there. They're clearly planning to bump him and Mike head on. The coach has given them 60 seconds to discuss battle tactics. Five seconds before the start, they will see a countdown timer. The hero used an analyzing gaze, deciding to set up his positions first, scrutinizing his new team. And he immediately announced that Chi-Chi would be the main tank, telling him to assume his usual position, which the guy immediately agreed to. After which he pointed at Goldilocks and told her that she was tanking in the attack. She should take a place between the main tank and the one on the front lines. Their team will focus on the tank that will stand on the offensive line while the main tank is actively moving. Chi-Chi was also surprised by William's professional approach to placing people in the right positions and strategy. He stated that the hero is well aware of what their team is and what he is talking about now is their normal formation. Yes, and the players he chose excellently, because he believed that the hero is quite interested in the Paris Lumière. William also asked them to act as usual and pretend he wasn't there, while he himself would try to block Mike. After all, he had no doubt that the kid had given his own similar instructions to fully enjoy a one-on-one -on -one fight. Everyone immediately realized that there was about to be a confrontation between Mike and William, and now they didn't know if they could focus on the competition. However, they understood the strategy, which means the positions are over. All that's left is to wait for the final countdown. In the meantime, you can take a look at your opponent who uses paired weapons, but during battle, this style of combat is annoying. But even with two blades, a person will utilize the one held by the leading hand more, the other hand being the support. At first glance, it seems that there is no system in this style of fighting, but there is a certain order, like the rules of breathing. 
and so the only thing left to find out was whether Mike was left-handed or right-handed, but at that very second, the countdown from five seconds began. Both teams tensed up, preparing for battle, while the hero pulled out his new spear that Moro had provided him. There was a loud voice from the coach that the contest had begun, and at that second, William smiled and activated his spear. Suddenly, the coach decided to ask if Mr. William knew that Mike is ambidextrous from birth, which is why he uses paired weapons. But he was told that unless he was specifically interested, it was unlikely, and why would he be interested in such details? But Derek said it would be quite difficult for him to fight, as Mike changes the pattern of using paired weapons to his liking. This trap has often fallen into just the most observant. They are those who are accustomed to mindlessly respond to attacks. And in addition, there is also a superpower double. And maybe this is the moment they'll get a chance to see headlines in the news where Mike defeated William. At this time, a furious battle had already begun in the arena between the two teams, who were not going to yield to each other in strength or speed. At the same time, the hero has distanced himself from everyone, hinting to his main rival that they are about to have a duel. He didn't have to wait long, as he was immediately matched by Mike, who had already armed himself with paired daggers and was running alongside him. Without thinking long, the blonde lunged towards his opponent, trying to launch an attack, forcing his opponent to retreat into defense. If there is a large distance between them, the hero will immediately throw the spear and therefore the blonde man needs to urgently reduce the distance. In the next second, the battle began, and their weapons connected, emitting sparks and parts of the aura they were imbued with. This was just the beginning, however, and Mike only needed to pick up speed to bypass the shield and reach the flesh. Fighting William, the blonde decided to make a feint, and immediately made a full turn, shifting to the side for a surprise attack. However, on the way, he met a shield that was ready for this kind of tricks, because the hero was also a hustler, as expected. In the same second, the hero decided to attack back, using a meter throw that hit past the target, right into the floor. But in the same second, pushing himself off the ground, the blonde man tried to get close to his opponent again with one jump. He realized that you can't give William a break. I need to try to completely exhaust him without stopping my attacks. In the same instant, endless dagger strikes from all directions began to rain down on the hero, coming from both of his opponent's hands. However, no matter how hard he tried, William only smiled and skillfully repelled each attack with his spear or shield. However, the hero not only defended himself, but also tried to analyze his opponent, while Mike saw a clear gap. He realized that now was the moment, whereupon the blonde swung his dagger, knowing full well that it would catch up with its target. As I suddenly came to a complete stop, putting my spear slightly in front of me, which immediately ran into the sharp blade of a dagger. For a few seconds they stood silently looking at each other while Mike tried to figure out how he had blocked it. While they got a second pause, the hero smiled and asked his opponent if he really had a good reaction. The dazed blonde realized that his opponent was calm as a boa constrictor, did not react in any way to the attacks, and deliberately opened up. The hero then swung his shield sharply and suddenly, pushing away the cunning fellow whose plan didn't work. However, his advantage is speed, if you use that you can win. However, William can hear the gears in his head working. As a consequence, the hero decided to be the first to take the initiative and go on the counterattack, which the opponent could not expect. One swing of the spear and the blonde immediately did a backflip, increasing the distance a few steps to get away from the weapon. However, this only fueled William, who rushed forward, imbuing the spear with a blue, almost black aura. Now he decided to put up a real fight after being able to assess Mike's close combat abilities. The hero was already a step away from his opponent, who was trying not to show any sign of being completely focused on defense. The lance and shield blows didn't give the blonde man a second to somehow attack or retake the initiative. The guy appreciated the pressure of the hero, who wasn't going to back down from him a single step, destroying everything he sees in front of his eyes. Mike thought that the shield and spear worked as a single organism, but when you restrain the spear, a shield strike follows, and vice versa. Even though he doesn't allow him to get out of range of his offense, he manages to keep a distance that makes it hard for Mike to attack. As expected of William, he shows a truly amazing skill that makes him the greatest hero. However, just give him the opportunity to attack, and an avalanche of blows would fall on him, which could not be allowed in any way. At first he thought he had found his weakness, but no. 
At that very second, William asked about the end of this fight. Mike was very much mistaken, and therefore alone he could not cope with him, because of which the blonde had only one way out. The guy's body began to squirm and his eyes turned pure white, which only meant that he was now using his superpower. After only a second, the hero saw two opponents already in front of him, thinking that he had finally shown himself. This was the very power of the doppelganger he wanted to look at with his own eyes and see if he could defeat it. Coach immediately cried out that William is crowding Mike, even though he is a top three superhuman, but still a hero wielding a spear like a god. The man with the glasses noticed another interesting point, that William had hardly trained or prepared in any way before this battle. He had fought all sorts of monsters in dungeons during the war, but needless to say, he hadn't had much practice fighting humans. But on the other hand, Mike is also a professional superhuman combat player, and yet these results are impressive. But if you enter the zone of superiority, it no longer makes any difference whether your opponent is a human or a monster, and William clearly demonstrates this. However, mine has activated the doppelganger, and the course of the battle may change, because it is almost impossible to predict what kind of blow Mike is going to strike. At the same time, the doppelgangers began to attack the spearmen, quickly shortening their distance, preparing to attack from different directions. Their main goal was to start cramping their opponent, making them lose concentration and finally confuse them. William watched the two of them, however, considering every possible blow from his back, which he tried to parry. The guy immediately started getting hit from different directions, not allowing him to focus on any one person. Spear and shield worked separately, trying to fend off every directed attack without missing a single one. Mike then attempted to attack head-on with the double, however it was to no avail. He thought it was the first time he'd had it, because if it had been any other player, it would have been the first time he'd have broken the distance with him. But William blocks all his attacks and prevents him from acting, even though he attacked dozens, hundreds of times, but none of the blows reached him. Opposing him fighting at the limit of his strength was almost impossible, but the hero coped with it. Mother tried to use all his strength to attack the hero in the forehead, but here he already met with a shield that did not give him this opportunity. While William reacted lightning fast to each attack, the blonde wondered if a human could possess such a reaction. At the same time, the hero even tried to counterattack, almost reaching the face of his opponent, who managed to dodge. Suddenly, William whirled around like a tornado, causing the doppelgangers to have to back away briefly to avoid being hit. Realizing that his opponent had retreated, the hero paused, then got into a stance, preparing to take more blows. Mike thought about the fact that it didn't look like he was even one step closer to victory, but he realized something. This trail he observed beneath him proves that William is having a hard time right now too, which means there is a chance of victory. He has to seriously strain, even though his skills are worse, but here's the speed superpower on the contrary, so you have to keep pushing on. The guy was worried about whether something was wrong, why the hero was so calm, maybe he was up to something, and therefore it was worth being wary. Yet he cannot but be admired, and whether one should have expected otherwise at all from William himself, of whom legends were made. But at the same time, the hero was in complete shock, although he didn't show it. But he thought that this guy was stronger than he thought. One-on-one -on -one with him could still get you, but now that there were two of them, his attacks turned into a solid storm of blades. If this continues, the fight could drag on, and the problem is that he doesn't know much about him, and the longer they fight, the worse for him. We'll have to pick apart his technique during the fight, but the hero has noticed that they both changed the leading hand with almost no delay. William forced himself to pull himself together. After all, that kid isn't some scoundrel with a knife. He's a strong, trained fighter. Maybe faster than him, and he still has no way to find a system in his so-so. But even so, there's some thought. He turned to the jersey, saying that they were now dancing a sultry Latin American tango with him, and going all in. However, the blonde didn't need to be told twice, as he had already tensed his entire aura and body, preparing for another attack. He then rushed forward, closing the distance with his opponent in a split second, hoping to make a gap. But as soon as Mike approached, the hero dodged with a slight but sharp movement, letting the blonde's forward trajectory. Not to go any further out of inertia, the blonde punched the ground with his dagger, slowing his slide and keeping William in his sights. However, the hero was faster and already stood in front of him, swinging his spear straight into his opponent's chest, preparing to end the duel. Suddenly. 
Mike's eyes lit up at the thought of William missing one small but obvious detail, namely that there were two of them. And at that very second, the blonde doppelganger was already in maximum proximity to the hero, swinging his dagger. William did miss a punch, losing his arm right off his shoulder. However, he wasn't in prohibitive pain. Derek and the Moreau brothers watched the fight dazedly and flinched at the sight of the hero losing his leading arm. The man in glasses was also in shock, thinking only that Mike could win and become the first to defeat William. In the same second, the doppelganger landed next to the original while all three watched the severed limb. But suddenly the hero said that he believed that the guy would definitely go on the attack, barely presenting all the chances so it came to him. After all, one needed to let one's guard down when delivering the decisive blow, and only then could one attack someone who was superior in speed. William then put all his strength into his left arm, crushing the blond man with his shield, driving him deep into the ground. Toward the end, he thanked the small man for his predictability. For now, the winner was certain, even despite the huge risk. As the hero suddenly realized that he had only destroyed the doppelganger while the original was watching this cruel picture. Smiling, Mike told him that the fight wasn't over, then tried to directly attack him with his dagger. But in the same second, his hand was stopped by Chi-Chi, who managed to intercept it just a centimeter away from William's face. Hero said they could settle for a tie. However, his team won, and Mike forgot that this is a team competition first and foremost. The victory still went to William's team who, as soon as he got out of the capsule, declared that it had to be harder than he had imagined. Then explained to Mike that if you're going to catch something annoying like a doppelganger, it's got to go all the way and sacrifice. Coach came up to them saying it was great and he was able to stand up to Mike one-on-one, -on -one, even when he used a double. The hero smiled, asking if they wanted to have another fight, to which the twins immediately nodded affirmatively. William thought about the blonde, ambidextrous, and wielding paired blades. Before a new battle, he should watch a recording of this one. Coach asked if he wanted to do the fight with Mike again, since he's already in training, so he can't stay away either. Derek then asked him to follow him to the match analysis room where they were met by a man who said they had done a good job today. William thought he was an assistant coach, however the man's name was Gabriel, and he helps analyze practice games. Whereupon the latter bowed politely, saying hello to the hero, to which William replied that he was also pleased to meet him. He then decided to use his analyzing gaze to view the seemingly calm man, but only saw faint indicators. Immediately he's a superhuman, but not an athlete, for his abilities as being too low for France. He then asked what the analytics department does besides reviewing videos of training battles. However, this is not just a method of some rough calculations. Analyzing fighters' techniques is done in a more advanced way. There is a program that reads and records all battle information from devices connected to the module. This is how you can know the numerical measures of ability to see individual players improve, and the data doesn't lie. William had noticed that superhumans with keen eyesight used to make a decent living pumping other superhumans or accompanying them on raids. In reality, that's what happened, but a team that uses the system is very different from one that doesn't. And all that hardware is needed to evaluate players, and everything from the software comes out to a tidy sum. If you take the best equipment, you get about 2.5 million euros, and you also have to pay a specialist who knows how to use the system. William has an analyzing eye, so he doesn't really need the machine, but his coach could use the thing. If the data is objective, it will reduce the percentage of useless crap he does, like the spirit of superhumanity. However, he doesn't want to spend 2.5 million euros just to shut Junior up, but right now he had an idea. He turned his head sharply and turned to the twins in a cheerful tone, asking if they wanted to make a deal. He wanted to give them his combat data, and they were going to give him a system and a man who could operate all that machinery. After all, his combat data would be worth about that much, to which the men pondered, for it would come in handy for those who fought in the same style. Plus, it would be a gorgeous addition to their video collection with William that they've managed to amass over the years. They couldn't miss such a great chance, whereupon their ears twitched simultaneously, foreshadowing the obvious answer. They were in agreement, because it was a great opportunity to get to know the savior of mankind better, not in return he would give his best. After that, the hero turned to Mike, asking him to get ready, because the second round will be much more interesting than the previous one. William went to wash his hands, saying he didn't fly to France for nothing. The wind has shafted some pretty useful upgrades here. 
a personal weapon, an ability analysis program, and a trainer for her, but fighting people makes it feel very different. Not because there are no monsters, rather, the fact that this is not a raid, but a sport. There is no need to kill, and death is not breathing down the neck. Who knew fighting could be so measured? It was the thing to do for a long time, and the fight with Mike came out brisk and busy. This is the first time since his return that I had to strain myself in battle, because with the likes of him, you have to calculate every move you make. Throughout his life, he has met many super people can say for sure that Mike among them is one of the strongest. However, he's still a brat, and it's somehow not respectable to lose to a small one, after which the hero looked at himself with an analyzing look. Mike's speed and strength is superior. It's foolish to deny that. However, he noticed something he never had before. He has gained a reinforcement ability that can enhance one of his parameters, or super strength. Speaking of superpowers, things are quite complicated, and accurate information on the subject is quite scarce, as many people are still trying to figure it out. But some things have been well known since the time of the first humans, as some things are just plain obvious. Superpowers are formed according to a person's personality, or due to the reaction of the aura to some experience important to the person. This means that strength can be built up in moments of emotional outburst, and the year before, after running away from the orphanage, it happened. After all, he had heard quite a few insulting phrases against him. They were like scars on his body that only healed. However, they do not disappear anywhere sound in his head until now, because of which this moment from his life had a strong impact on him. He snuck out of the orphanage, wearing a mask over his face, and you have a rock in your hand, knowing that if the director goes, will come which is the road. The boy stood on a small hill, gazing out at the road, which was lit by lampposts in the middle of the night. A few minutes later, he heard the roar of an engine, definitely knowing who was heading in his direction, for it was the principal's car. The unsuspecting man behind the wheel was not expecting a rock to fly into one of the car's headlights. Due to quite a bit of force and suddenness, the driver failed to control, and that was William's first recollection of the throw. Part of the car was left on the road, and the headlight and bumper were smashed against a tree, causing the principal to be fatally injured. There are some people who say that revenge is stupid, however. It was only by getting revenge that William was able to know he could smile for the first time. And now he heard that the next round was starting in five minutes, and so he had a little time to prepare. He pondered the enhancement, asking himself if it happened as a consequence of his extraordinary concentration during the fight with Mike. But it could also be that it's all about the willpower reading of 110, because for humans, 100 is always the limit. The moment of complete concentration coupled with this indicator could well be called a key experience that helped the new ability to develop. And now they have just the right opponent to experiment with in the next round to test the ability. At the same second, he was called by Marie, who with her suddenness and distressed look managed to scare the hero a little. He asked how it had gone with his niece, for he could not watch, for he was busy with Mike, to which the girl replied that she had flown out first. She began to tell me that she got caught up in the excitement and let her guard down. The moment she teleported, she was killed, and that was the end of it. William smiled and said that at one time someone had said such words, You teleport forward. You die. So what now? Weave behind. What's more? These guys are not the soupy bunch they are in Korea, as Lumiere is a world-class club, so you have to save the teleporter. But he decided to cheer her up by asking her not to make such a sour face, because a cowardly maned is worse than a sappert without super strength. After that, she asked if her uncle could handle it in the second round, because Mike is very strong, but the guy only called her name. Afterward, he asked if she thought he was just being called great. But Marie reminded him that he had gotten his arm chopped off in the first round. She hesitated, for compared to the doppelganger and his throw seemed much weaker, but William asked her to just watch. After five minutes, the two teams reconvened in the familiar arena to begin the second round, as the countdown was immediately heard. Mike thought that maybe outwardly he looked soft and kind, but as soon as he exposed his weapon, things changed dramatically. At the same time, William was thinking, against the two Mikes, what characteristic would he better increase? As the coach's voice announced the countdown, the boy drew out his folding spear in a confident motion, preparing for battle. In the moment of those few seconds, the heroes decided to himself that the answer was obvious. He needed to strengthen one of the skills. Then the battle began, and both teams rushed at each other, weapons bared, trying to take the advantage at the start. At this time, Marie was behind everyone. 
trying to assess the situation and not fly out first without making past mistakes. At this time, the hero was jumping from side to side, scoping out his opponent, thinking that he had used the enhancement, but no change was felt. But he decided to test what would happen directly in the fight, and in the meantime, he needed to get Mike out for a one-on-one -on -one fight. A moment later, his opponent was already standing across from him, striding confidently toward him, whom William beckoned to him. While the blonde looked at him with a cold and predatory gaze, the hero only smiled, asking to attack him at full power. At that very second, Mike went into a stance, holding his paired blades tightly, remembering to keep a close eye on his opponent's actions. Knowing he couldn't do it alone, the blonde immediately summoned a doppelganger, expecting to repeat the outcome of the last fight. But as soon as the doppelganger appeared, a spear flew towards the original at a tremendous speed, something that could not be expected here. The blonde looked at the projectile in surprise, not understanding why it was necessary to make such an attack that could easily be dodged. However, Mike's point was pretty quick, but William immediately said the guy thought about dodging. As suddenly the spear sped up and Mike bounced back, but in the same second the spear changed trajectory, heading sharply towards the doppelganger. The plan worked perfectly, and the hero said he was able to bounce back even if the trajectory of the attack changed, but the doppelganger's movement was a bit late. Blondie dazedly shifted the disappearing doppelganger's gaze to William, agreeing that he really thought so. However, he also noticed that it was a very strange attack, for that explosive acceleration in mid-flight, it hadn't been there before. In the data on William that he'd looked at before, there were definitely no instances of a spear accelerating in flight halfway to its target. He didn't realize what it was, but one thing was clear now, he would have to fight alone, which would be very difficult. Mike didn't know if the enemy had some secret, but to prevent a quick defeat, he decided to temporarily retreat. He needed to increase his distance first. After all, it was dangerous to get closer since he only had 30% of his aura left. William noticed that the kid had made a nifty move. However, the second he did, he lunged after him, pushing himself off the ground and making a leap. He said the double was over, and he summarily abandoned his pride, deciding to rely on his teammates. Swinging his spear, the hero asked if he had expected to lose his double so soon. For now, it was a little late for him to bolt. The spear was approaching its target very quickly, and William decided to call the second practice match over. As soon as they exited the pod, Mike immediately asked for a third round, addressing William, wanting a rematch. Smiling, the hero stated that he was tired, so he would like to end it there. But the blonde was not very happy with this arrangement. The guy asked for another chance, to which the hero replied that nothing will change, asking the one if he can win. After a bit of thought, he pounded his fist against his palm, deciding to make a third and final fight to settle everything. The arena once again signaled the start of the battle, after which Mike immediately summoned the doppelganger without wasting any time. William approved of the idea, because it's better to take full advantage of every opportunity than to try to look cool and limit yourself. Right now, however, the blonde was trying to be at the limit of his strength, concentrating fully on the battle. And now he was already heading towards the hero, trying not to give him room to maneuver, but the spearman was sure he could handle him. Clutching his spear tightly and infusing it with his aura, William also emitted an overwhelming power, for he too was focused on the battle. His haphazard attacks, speed and strikes in conjunction with his double, he saw anything that could pose a threat to him. The hero then used eviction and began twirling the spear above his head, not letting his opponent get too close. When they came within a sufficient distance, William decided to attack while covering herself with her shield. Mike once again decided to backfill him with attacks, forcing his opponent to back up, thereby pinning him in the corner. After that, one of the doppelgangers didn't decide to go around the hero to attack him from behind while the original distracted him. It didn't work, however, and they began attacking head-on again, using two pairs of hands, hoping to punch a hole in the defense. William respected that the guy was pressing him non-stop, but he shouldn't have let him try to come up behind him. We have to limit their maneuvering space because if one of them goes behind his back, he'll fall into the trap. So one has to keep moving all the time to keep both of them in sight, and his job is to spend the minimum amount of energy and wind Mike up. After all, he may be faster, but that's not enough to catch him. You have to be more active because he won't get close to him that way. Running around the arena, the hero tried to break and maintain long range, trying to use the time against his opponents. 
The next second, he noticed the two had already caught up to him and are right above his head, swinging their daggers. They missed their target, however, and the blades hit the floor while William was able to bounce back, peering after them. Though he still moves fast, and his movements are becoming more and more precise, but he has forgotten something important again. Whereupon the hero jumped high, doing a backflip, keeping in mind that they were having a team competition here, which caused the hero to land in the thick of his opponents, and the hero decided to shake up the mental mood of his opponents. Everyone immediately wondered why William was here, since they knew for a fact that they were having a duel with Mike right now. One of them loudly ordered to dodge, but it was too late and the hero had already thrown his spear at one of the opponents. The command sounded too late, causing the other spearman to fail to dodge and his chest was pierced by the hero's weapon. Meanwhile, Mike didn't understand what was going on and why the hero decided to change tactics by attacking his comrades. At the same time, William pulled out two more folding spears, thinking about the fact that when in a hurry, there's a gap in technique. Whereupon he looked at his chief opponent with a sly and lithe gaze, asking him if he was ready for a debauch. However, this arrangement could not suit the blonde man, who immediately rushed to the attack, preventing the hero from attacking his allies. Unleashing two spears, William infused them with his aura, causing them to fill with energy to launch another sly attack. Dodging the twin blows, the guy attacked the opponent from the opposite team again, disposing of another one. Mike only turned around dazedly, realizing they had been outmaneuvered and ignored, attacking his allies again. The joyful hero asked if he could dodge, and by saying that, he means at the gate in mid-air, which is almost impossible. In the next second, he threw two spears at the blonde while he and his double were in flight. He had no chance for maneuver, and therefore had to urgently think of a way to dodge the incredibly fast projectiles. The doppelgangers immediately realized what they had to do, and then joined their feet together, wanting to push off of each other. This helped him evade the crushing attack, and at the same time helped him land faster on the ground, which wasn't much of a problem. But in the same second, Mike realized that it was once again a trick, killing two more of his allies who were pierced by spears. At the same time, the heated battle hero praised his opponent, saying that aiming at him alone, I killed two of his comrades at once. It was great that he had evaded the attack by using the doppelganger, but now he noticed what happens when you block the view of your own comrades. Blondin is so focused on speed that he doesn't even see his partners, so he should still cover the rear better. At the same time, those watching the battle were in complete shock, as each new battle they fought looked completely different. Coach said he thought William was running away from Mike, and he sought to limit his maneuverability and speed by doing so. The Moreau brothers added that he used his opponent's attack against his own, and Mike is in too much of a hurry, as William is the best. However, Derek was confident that there was no way their ace would lose, and could still have something to show, for he had faith in his strongest player. But Gabriel noticed that it wouldn't be easy, as Mike was no longer in control, causing him to lose concentration. But more to the point, what could have even happened in such a short period of time since William calmly withstands all the attacks? All all the four observers could say was that it was all too amazing, and so they just continued to watch. However, Mike decided to push the hero away from his comrades, trying to attack him from every possible angle. After all, he is talented from birth, trained a lot and became a true master, and even after endless attacks, he is still breathing evenly. The result of hard training is paying off, for at the same time he can defend himself against William's barrage of punches. From the first to the last blow, the timing was perfect, so all that was left was to hold on until the end. However, the hero also attacked the blonde man, trying to parry his attacks and aiming to wear him down by knocking his breath away. It is very difficult to use such tactics, because the heroes are inferior to the enemy in speed, but he is helped by skill. If he manages to act like this, he is able to calculate every step at the level of vision of the future, therefore he can win. With his side vision, the hero noticed Mike's doppelganger flying at him from behind, trying to move as silently as possible. However, the hero picked the right moment to turn around and swing his spear, pointing it in the direction of the sneak. As long as the blonde was in the air, this throw could not be parried or dodged, and it seemed to be the end. But at the same second, the original jumped out in front of the doppelganger and successfully knocked the spear aside, preventing one of them from being killed. Wasting no time, they began to move quickly, wanting to directly attack the hero, who immediately began to bounce back. 
Gabriel said he wanted to show the footage to the tank fight later so they could see how to use the shield more effectively. William is driven with the new, flawless technique as soon as he senses he's falling into a trap, attacks and immediately changes position. Counterattacks at the first opportunity and even uses his shield as a weapon, which is what he was able to hit Mike with now. This blow he was able to block, but the force pushed him some distance away from the hero and he realized he was too far away. And he urgently needed to get closer, however. In the same second, he noticed that his doppelganger had already been pierced by a spear. He watched in shock as his copy slowly faded away while he himself tried to get to his feet, losing concentration. Only now did Mike realize why William, the savior of humanity, is number one among all superhumans. Invincible. That return to the world of the living after 17 years, who was now approaching him, declaring that once again, there were only two of them left. The hero walked slowly towards the jersey, smiling and slapping himself with the hilt of his spear on his shoulder. Hopefully the blonde would decide to give up. However, despite the destruction of the clone, the guy was not going to give up because he really wanted to defeat the very hero. He gripped his blades tightly and backed forward while William was completely relaxed, and this was a great chance to catch up with him. However, the hero did not lose concentration, even being close to victory, because you can never underestimate the opponent, and not cross their guns, looking each other in the eye, because none of them wanted to give the decisive victory to the opponent. After the battle, Mike held his head, grimacing that it was unbelievable, because he had been so easily smeared without leaving a chance. William praised him, though, saying he was better than Walker, and now he understands why that kid isn't in the top three. He also decided to give the blonde man some free advice, to try and hone his strength some more, as it wouldn't be out of place. The hero said that he will become even cooler, because he has room to grow. The strength index is still far from being at its maximum. While Mike was thanking him for his advice, Derek came up to them, cheerfully saying that they both fought a great fight. However, he clarified that once he thought Mike might win, but then with each new attack, William proved his superiority more and more. He then asked in a professional tone how he managed to calculate Mike's movement when he used the double. The hero thought that because of the haphazardness of this kid's attacks, he still had to exert himself, because his work with the doppelganger and his skill level were good. However, when he used the boost and improved his performance, dealing with him wasn't too difficult. He did not tell them this, however, but replied with surprise that it was because it was him, to which he received only surprised looks. Toward evening, they stood at the Lumiere gate, while Derek thanked William and Marie for agreeing to participate in the training. The hero replied that it had been fun, after which he asked to give Marie a good workout for his next visit. The coach asked him not to worry after all, they weren't the kind of people who paid such salaries to players for pretty eyes. One Marie now looked depressed. After all, she hadn't killed a single player in all the matches today. When she got smashed in the first one, she became overly cautious. Apparently, her nerves were fraying. But the outcome of the workout is still good. In the second round, she made one pass. In the third round, she made three. He stroked her head. Afterward, he smiled and told her that it was okay, because it was just a training session, so she shouldn't lose heart. But suddenly the girl flinched and loudly declared that he was right, or the first time it didn't go so bad. After which her eyes sparkled and she told her uncle not to worry, for she was perfectly fine and would practice more. He thought about the fact that it really wasn't worth worrying about, and he didn't seem to have anything else to teach her, so he asked her to be smart. At the same time, the hero noticed that he finally had some free time and therefore needed to test that thing out. When it was nearing nightfall, William stood in front of the mirror, carefully reading the description of the enhancement ability. There was one thing he didn't understand, namely the point about enhancing one of the superpowers, which sounded pretty interesting. After all, in the case of enhancing physical abilities, the effect is obvious, but if you enhance super strength, what happens? The boy smiled, eager to answer his own question, then activated the analyzing gaze enhancement. The enhanced version allowed the owner of the ability to see more stats and skills, and they also had access to videos. He immediately started looking at the video description, noticing among the characteristics of leadership and tactics that weren't there before. Reviewing his characteristics, the hero realized that now it would be much easier to look for young talents, because the information was more detailed. He then decided to test an enhanced version of the throw, which made the thrown object come back. 
William immediately grabbed his toothbrush, yelling that this was great, and now he didn't have to run for the spear, but he needed to check it out. He threw the brush and it returned to his hand like a boomerang, while his aura remained at the same level, which meant it would be a bomb in battle in general. With this ability, he would become even cooler, which means that there would be no rivals left to defeat him, but there was still something left. The last and possibly most important superpower, it was very interesting what the boost to immortality, which is already overkill, would do. After using the enhancement, the hero noticed that his limbs immediately began to be covered in aura, making them feel lighter. However, straight from the limbs and the aura began to cover the entire body of the guy, who watched the metamorphosis in amazement. A couple of seconds later, he was already floating in the air holding his spear in his hand, being completely covered in aura and not realizing what was happening. The enhanced version gave the object's body to turn into a stream of aura for two minutes. All attacks were invalidated, and you can pass through objects. The dazed hero examined himself, asking what the aura was instead of blood and flesh, giving a whole new sensation. He tried to examine himself from all angles, still in the air, asking himself how to test his abilities. William then remembered that he could pass through objects, and that was the most obvious thing to check. Without thinking long, he steered himself towards the window, hopefully not breaking it, and flying down from quite a distance. However, this did not happen. Not the heroes were hanging in the air, watching the many houses with the Eiffel Tower standing in the middle of them. Having gained flight, the guy realized that everything worked, which meant that the attacks were true, so it was useless to hit him, but he didn't know if he could touch anything. William wanted to go back and try it again with his toothbrush, as he suddenly sensed something wrong. He noticed that the source of the unknown aura was off to the side of that very tower, but the hero knew who it belonged to. There can be no mistake, this is definitely a dungeon creature, William smiled, for he couldn't confuse this aura with anything else. He rushed toward her, swinging the spear I'd brought with me to test my new ability. But now he was interested in whether those monsters had survived, and without a moment's thought, he sent his spear toward the source. The hero's mood immediately rose, for it was a reaction to the aura of the dungeon monster that was able to survive. The guy flew after the spear, sensing the freak was still around, which meant he could be caught up and destroyed. He was incredibly happy, for it would be boring if they all died, for nothing could replace the excitement of the dungeon. At that very second, he decided to continue as suddenly a notification popped up in front of his eyes that he had completely forgotten about. It was a notification that two minutes had passed and now there would be a return to the corporeal shell, after which the guy started to be pulled back. Opening his eyes, he immediately felt that he was a meter away from the floor he landed on, dropping to one knee. With anger and resentment, he shattered the wall beside him with one sweep of his hand, realizing that the target had gotten away from him. He regretted and asked why it was not possible for this effect to expire later, for it was this limitation that prevented him from finishing what he had started. He then began to wonder how long it took to regenerate the amplification, and whether it was possible to become a ghost immediately after returning to the body. So suddenly, he abruptly calmed down with a glance at his hand, after which he realized that he could no longer feel the monster's aura. At the same time, in some temple, a non-human voice said that he did not know that the task at hand would prove so difficult. He asked the third to be lenient, for suddenly the spear came. He pointed to his stomach, from which the weapon was sticking out. Reaching out a clawed hand toward him, the other cloaked creature declared that he didn't need his excuses, and there were many more willing to take his place. Then the monster said that it was not yet time, for he was waiting for the beginning of the world, which according to him should come soon. Once in his physical body, William hurried back to a state of enhanced immortality as soon as possible. There are two things to emphasize here. First, when he is in this state, he passes through all objects, no attacks do not affect him. And he himself, being woven with aura, could strike to destroy matter, which gave him an incredible advantage in battle. And two, this time he didn't feel the energy of the creature from the dungeon. There were even thoughts that he just imagined it. You could write it off to imagination. As much as he searched, he never found the spear he threw at the thing, which meant he hit after all. He hit someone who heard dragged him away in her body without leaving a trace. There is only one conclusion to be drawn from that. When it reappears, there's no way the hero will miss that moment while he's been eyeing the Eiffel Tower for a long time.
The next day, Gabriel arrived at his house, accompanied by the Moreau brothers, who immediately greeted the hero. One of the twins reminded him that in the exchange here, he had asked to find someone who could run the system. William agreed with them, to which they replied that Gabriel would go with him, since he was the one who understood the system. The hero was surprised by such a statement, deciding to check the man with an intensified analyzing gaze to see something new. All of the man's stats were weak, but aura, tactics, and leadership were noticeably higher than everything else. Also, his superpower of concentration for six hours said he was literally born to be a coach. Gabriel asked not to doubt his abilities, as he was the head coach of the Paris Lumiere reserve team three years ago. William was surprised that he suddenly decided to go with them, because YSM is a second division team, so he might regret his choice. However, the man knew what he was going for, but he had never been to Korea before much less worked with someone from the second division. But he saw him in the game. Those sharp lines to get into the Lumiere are easily explained by Mike. She will take the chance to get on William's team. He thought it would be interesting to even just watch them, to which the heroes replied that since he had made that choice, he would not be dissuaded. He would be well paid. He was a qualified specialist after all. But Gabriel just waved his hand, saying it wasn't about that. The character didn't understand anything about why he would go to Korea but not want to be a coach, to which the man replied that it wasn't enough. After all, a head coaching position or full team management is certainly a natural outcome given his abilities. But he's the only one who can at least be the head coach at Lumiere right now, so going to Korea is objectively a huge disadvantage for his career. Then he decided to suggest that YSM would move up to Division 1 within a year, and with him joining the team, they would take the top spot. That kind of explosive success would not hurt, but only help his career as a coach. But therefore, he had one condition. When he voiced it, the Moro twins, I looked at the man in shock. However, the man did not pay attention to them, asking the hero if he agreed. The hero pondered such a serious proposal for a few seconds, then held out his hand, agreeing to such terms. Without thinking long, Gabriel shook his hand, suggesting that William immediately sign a contract to go to Korea. The twins said it further links William to their Lumiere, and now it will be impossible not to mention their club when talking about the hero. In fact, they had already posted his picture on their team's official social media accounts, even though it was just a practice. After all, they have to brag, and at the same time to promote themselves, they also offer to meet in honor of the signing of the arms contract. Coming to Paris to find new players, William suddenly acquired a system, and Coach Gabriel, I also became confident in my abilities. But when he returned, his photos continued to be posted on Lumiere's official social media pages for some time to come. Then rumors leaked out that William had registered in the superhuman battle as a player. This caused the rivals to become hostile. Among them, the French club's main rival, Germany's top team, reacted most negatively. Headed by Emre Casa, one of the Seven Saviors, also commonly known as the Berlin Lightning. At the same time, there was a flurry of activity outside the YSM building, where several workers were unloading a new super forward system. Gabriel, meanwhile, oversaw the installation process, taking a full-fledged leadership role in the matter. At this time, players were watching him from around the corner, whispering asking each other if he was the new coach, not forgetting to mention the system. After all, no one in the country has someone who knows how to work with it, and it's a program not even all Division I teams seem to have. After a while, William, who hoped they had been practicing properly all this time, came to them and gathered everyone together for a general assembly. When everyone was gathered in front of him and could clearly hear him, he loudly announced that he had had a dream last night. There was an old man in it who said he was his ancestor, and that he had many hardships because he himself had no ancestors. And he also gave him six figures. At the same time, the listeners were genuinely surprised at his story, taking the principal at his word. The hero said he didn't need it and told the ancestor to fuck off, but he said those six digits right in his ear, so he got to each of them. He decided it was such a thank you from God to someone who saved the world, and he just wants the hero to win the grand prize in the lottery. One of the girls asked if he had bought a lottery ticket, but he replied in the negative, adding that he didn't do that kind of stuff. Then said his lottery ticket is them, because they are going to have to try hard this season and they have to show they are underrated. Whereupon he coughed, deciding to go further, saying that for their further growth, he had brought a man from France. He pointed his hand at the man, adding that their new coach was Gabriel. It had cost the hero a lot of effort to convince him to come. 
after which the guy added that his annual salary was bigger than theirs, so he asked them to take care of him properly. The man in glasses then decided to take the floor, introducing himself and saying that he would temporarily take over as head coach. Their current coach will be assisting him as a senior advisor, because of which he expressed his gratitude to him. Why did he start talking about new tasks? Because the goal of this season is to move to the first division, and the next, to lead in it. Everyone was shocked, but he continued, saying that if they followed his plan, they would definitely succeed. In return, three times a year, the club director will take part in the matches. He pointed his hand at William, who smiled demonstratively. Gabriel also said that it would be great if he, the principal, also participated in the competition, much to the hero's surprise. The man explained that with him in the lineup, any team would be undefeated, but if he looks at the same ones, his growth will come to a standstill. If he goes on those terms, YSM is guaranteed a move to League One, or he will be with them for one year until the championship. William took a little more time to think about it, after which he indicated with his fingers that he would perform three times in one year. But it was enough, because if he plays even just three games, this season the team will definitely move to the first league. And he will demonstrate all of his coaching abilities on the example of the games he will not participate in, which the hero agreed to. This greatly inspired William, who had hoped it wouldn't come to him, and then asked Gabriel to try harder. A short while later, they immediately began their first training session under Gabriel's guidance, starting a group hunt. In a huge old manner, several players fought skeletons, destroying them one by one, giving their best. The system perfectly analyzes the abilities of superhumans, and now each person's chart showed specific numbers of their abilities. These were pretty much the same indicators that the hero saw with the analyzing gaze, so it wasn't new to him. Gabriel pointed out three players that they utilized their strengths well. However, one guy confused him. He pointed to the unremarkable kid, saying he was bad at everything, and didn't understand why William had accepted him on the team. But the hero indicated that he was the one still pumped. However, Gabriel saw no potential for any development overall. Hero admitted that technical points can still be honed, on big progress is unlikely, and he will be the team's weakest link. But Gabriel wasn't right about something because the hero saw something very different in this guy, something the system can't see. The hero offered to train him as a second tactician, because he is always calm, collected, and his bowler cooks well. After listening to William's detailed explanations, the man summarized the overall result, after which he decided to take on his training personally. He also added that the two players he acquired recently are quite promising, as they can also be coached quite a bit. One of them uses superpower observation and preemptively dismisses unnecessary actions and acts as efficiently as possible. But here was the second player who didn't inspire such confidence, and so the man asked the director what he had his attention on. The hero only glanced at the new coach, trying to choose his words so as not to give away the true information. At this time, Gabriel said that no matter how much he watched the kid, he didn't see anything special or talented in him. But the hero knew that the system would not show this, however. He himself clearly saw one single indicator that was almost reaching the maximum. Whereupon the headmaster said that his eyes were never wrong, from which the man was better surprised. Pay attention to these words. Whereupon William asked him to wait a little while, for it wasn't long before his lottery ticket was a big score. After a while, Gabriel looked over the training plan, asking one man if he'd handled the team's business so far. He recognized that it was a real miracle that he had achieved such high results by working hard. He also clearly knew that the name of this miracle was William, who had an incredible flair for all superhumans. After that, he decided to change the training schedule, because it is necessary to lay a solid foundation before the second half of the season. The second training session under the new coach involved speed testing, with the archer in the lead. However, one of the weakest was ranked 14th, for whom it was all too quick and unexpected. At the same second, a captain ran up to him, from whom he asked if he would die from it, but the latter hastened to reassure him. The coach said he customized a training system for their level, and they have similar workouts every day. Then the captain asked him to keep up, and I myself sprang forward, leaving the younger man behind to ponder what I had heard. But unable to endure such intense running, one of the weaker ones stopped, noticing that it looked like some kind of madness. He could not catch up with them, so in desperation he asked them to run away together, but no one heard him. 
After the workout, Gabriel reiterated that it was a miracle of some sort, as he had re-watched the video of the workout so many times. The average performance and training systems are typical of a second division team, but something confused him. He didn't understand how the players were able to achieve such results in such a short time with practically nothing on them. He noted five, one of whom has started to beat opponents more often and make productive passes, and the other has established himself as an excellent main DD, while the other two have repeatedly trained sprints as track and field athletes. The latter, however, became a tank after moving to YSM, and in his new position showed an explosive increase in physical strength. Gabriel was sure that William had definitely had a hand in this, as their past coach clearly couldn't have done such a thing. Thanks to these five can already easily reach the playoffs, and also the hero himself can participate in the matches three times, so the victory is assured. However, he couldn't see the point of changing the position of one of the players, since it wouldn't have made any difference if he had stayed maimed. Once again, he decided to re-watch the training video, asking himself why the director made him a tank with his abilities. He then noticed some discrepancy and started frantically tapping on the keyboard, reeling back a bit. He's noticed that the damage output of the enemy is different from the damage the guy is taking, which meant the guy had another passive ability, and he couldn't believe William knew that, and that's why he gave him the role of tank. He immediately remembered the hero's words when he had said that his eyes were never wrong, but it was unclear how he managed it. At the same time, the very weak guy walked outside, sighing heavily, telling himself aloud that he had overestimated himself. Suddenly, William came up to him, asking him what he was huffing and puffing about, adding not to call him principal, just senior. Afterward praised him, asking him to keep it up and when he sees him, to fountain respect and joy. When they figured it out, the hero smiled and asked the younger one to tell his older one what was bothering him. The guy sighed heavily again, taking a long time deciding to say that he had the worst skills on the team, causing him to have a very hard time. After all, their captain, who is a year younger, has already taken the center position, and he can't keep up with the pace of training. But the hero decided to be a bit harsh, saying that he and he were not alike, because unlike him, the captain was initially good. Replying that it was all because of the superpower, William listened to the guy say that it might raise his speed, but he wouldn't be able to catch up to the archer. But the hero has told him many times that his superpowers develop according to the effort he puts in. He also added that there were no guarantees, but they had a bet with him, which the hero hastened to remind the crying guy. The young man remembered the argument and cringed, asking that the guy's life was some kind of joke to him. But the man reminded again that he promised to give him 300 million if the scheme fails, but that is the kind of money that should not be easy to make. But William decided that would not do, and so he grabbed the boy by his shirt and dragging him along the ground, told him to go with him. They traveled an incredibly long distance, while the younger one asked why they went into the mountains, and even without preparation. The director responded that they are changing his mindset and loser because he doesn't want to throw 300 million away. But the kid asked what adult would teach that the pursuit of success is more important than living modestly and honestly. However, the hero stated that he had prepared a place upstairs where he would pump his aura, to which he was surprised that it would be in the mountains. William replied that Aura has some peculiarities. It becomes more active when you're in the right place. After all, the director himself did not start his journey from the dungeons, so when he got there, he felt like the right person. He used to be treated like a worm and told that his parents abandoned him because he was talentless and people like him are completely useless. When he was small, he constantly listened to such things, and the director of the orphanage was not ceremonious, often beat the wards and did not hesitate in expressions. This man hated him the most, so he beat him especially often, and the smaller henchman of the headmaster treated him in the same way. The boy listened to the older man's story with shocked amazement, disbelief that such a thing could happen to someone like the great hero. But suddenly a man approached him, after which he started stroking his head, saying that everyone has mental wounds. Smiling, William added that the effects of these wounds could be overcome if one could find strength and confidence. These words really caught the guy, who for a moment even cheered up and wanted to give himself completely to the will of the director. The hero then stated that since he was a diaper loser, they would go away from human eyes, which made the boy wince. He asked what he was supposed to do there, in that remote place, to which the man asked to ask not him, but his superpower. 
After surveying the area, the young man asked how he should understand the cave in the rock, but the man didn't understand what the guy behind him was mumbling. After briefly thinking, William replied that the place where he would train was over there, then kicked him deep into the cave. After the guy lands, the hero tells him that he looks at the world with a gloomy, pessimistic outlook, so this place is perfect for him. Then he told him to settle down, because he would be out in ten days, to which the dazed guy began to ask what he would eat and how to go to the toilet. William wrinkled his face in response, saying that his elder had provided him with a marvellous place to practice, and he cared about such trivialities. He also asked him to drop his cell phone, because it would also be confiscated. The young man thought that the director had completely lost his mind. He was desperately wondering if he would die if he stayed here, and all his thoughts were telling him that he had to get away from here. But at that very second, the hero came back to him, declaring that if he tried to get out early, he would catch him and skin him. When he heard the answer of agreement, he immediately changed in his face and joyfully said goodbye to the boy, while he thought how such a man the earth carries such a man. He then fell to the ground exhaustedly, spreading his arms and legs, trying to inhale as much air as he could and figure out what he should do next. He couldn't believe it because he couldn't, because it wouldn't work, and even in school he sat on the bench all the time. And when he did get on the field, he was completely ignored, which he so desired and strived to achieve. After all, he was actually quite active and wanted to become a top-notch and sought-after superhuman battle player. But he thought it was absolutely impossible for him, but suddenly he remembered the principal's words when he invited him to YSM. Then he said that if he made an effort, he would be able to improve his superpower, whereupon the guy got up from the ground. In the same second, his mindset changed, because if the strongest superhuman in the world said it was possible, then all it took was effort. Since that was the case, instead of thinking, he should focus on the flow of aura that immediately began to surround the boy. Ten days later, William was looking at his phone screen, watching the guy climb out of the cave, asking him if he was dead. He was definitely sure that it was one of his lottery tickets, whereupon he immediately decided to activate his analyzing gaze. Without thinking long, the guy made his way outside, being completely surrounded by the aura, after which he heard the question of whether his principle was right. The young man was surprised to notice that he had been followed all this time. It was obvious here that he couldn't have been left alone for ten days. William said there is still time for the start of the second half of the season, so he should try to master his new superpower until then. Afterward, the hero promised that in his first match, he would be able to get the national attention that he had dreamed of for so long. With 31 days left until the second half of the season, in the meantime, the director paired up with Ben to return to headquarters where they were immediately greeted. William asked the former principal where Gabriel was, to which he received the reply that he was in the coaching room forming sub-teams for the second half of the season. He wanted to ask something else, but the hero quickly turned around and led the guy inside, saying that he wanted to introduce the new main character. As he walked past the offices, he could hear people on the phone saying that the club's plans did not include player transfers at the moment. Asked about it, the coach said that many teams want to take Lisa to them and the offer comes even from abroad. Things got hectic towards the end of the transfer window, with one Arab team offering millions of dollars again for the duo of Lisa and Johnny. William was shocked at those numbers, and the coach asked if he agreed, but he didn't want to sell them for such a pittance. Even if sold, only Lisa, and no way Johnny Gabriel agreed, for it was Johnny who was the real value. The guy grasps everything on the fly, even though only the basics had been explained to him. The results are already excellent, and he has a good understanding of his superpowers. And if you add the director to that, it makes for a killer tandem. Given his passion for unconventional solutions in combat, the hero also wanted to watch him in the arena at any rate, and he had already thought of a few tactics involving the kid. Also, Gabriel said that if it was about superpowers, then he would be able to analyze Daniel. However, William didn't know who that was. The coach explained that this is the world's best sappers, together with Mike and Ron, form the top three strongest players. From the German team Berlin Lightning, he may have heard of it before. Their coach is Emre Kassa, one of seven saves. He remembered the man with those names telling him that he couldn't let things go, because they were the strongest superhumans. So they gather to mop up the last dungeon, and the hero walks around with a bottle and drinks like he's out of his mind. Then William thought he'd have to set out to chop the heads off the monsters with this douche nozzle who was now the coach. 
and his team's backups are in the top three. However, Emery is the last one he's interested in, but the pats of this one should be looked at. However, the hero called out Gabriel, telling him that the roster of key players should have been changed in the second half of the season. As he nudged Ben, the coach asked his name, that not long ago the boy hadn't been of much interest. However, William hastened to change his mind, telling him that he would change his mind now, adding that he had their lottery ticket in front of him. A month later, Season 2 has arrived and the commentators have already welcomed everyone to the first match they've been waiting for. The second division was like a hurricane, and this hurricane has its own name, because today the game of the team that made a real sensation. After the introduction of YSM, talk began about their rivals, the GT Knights, who became a fatal opponent for the former lawless men. And after that, they noticed that every time they see YSM, their main roster changes, and they recently released the name of a new athlete. As far as they knew, Principal William had handpicked this guy himself, and it was interesting how he would prove himself during the game. Ten minutes ago, the man admonishes Johnny and Ben. They say this match is their opportunity to show a new side of themselves. Coach also said they have five key players, one tank, two mained, one ranger, and a support with three superpowers. Unless the match has some amazing surprises, the five of them will advance together. He then asked Johnny if he would take command of this subgroup, to which he thanked him for his confidence. The director remembered to take the floor by addressing Ben, saying that this was his first game, so he wouldn't demand much. He only asked to take care of their opponents, to which the guy only glanced nervously at the man, gathering himself. The match began while the commentators stated that the dungeon in which tonight's match would take place is an upside-down forest. In the center of the cave location hangs a huge glowing tree. This is the monster Zardlun, which spreads its vines wide and is able to suck out aura. As soon as someone gets close, they will immediately attack. Moreover, the closer they get, the stronger they are. It's said that the tree isn't actually one tree. It's several Zardluns that have absorbed just an incredible amount of aura. At the same time, the Knights GT split up in a 4-4-3. This is the best solution against YSM using containment tactics. Even if one group encounters an opponent and loses, the others will be able to advance unhindered at the same time to widen the gap. The YSM split into two subgroups, but suddenly the commentators notice another person separating from the group start moving alone. People were surprised at such a strange decision after all, hunting alone in the dungeon. Somewhere everywhere could be attacked by the boss himself. Just crazy. Commentators and spectators couldn't figure out if it was a 5-5-1 split or a tactical error after all. However, Ben confidently headed forward, immediately activating his superpower, deciding to use his new skill right away. GT's first subgroup was surrounded by Zardluns and decided they hadn't gone deep enough yet where he would attack from all sides. As an arrow suddenly landed in the ground beside them, the opponents realized that Lisa had already caught up with them, having followed them. The subgroup captain immediately chimed in that it was okay, and we should keep up the pace, because the most important thing now was to find Johnny. At the same time, the guy thought it was even better, because they were headed their way. They were in the other direction, not they had something already prepared. Rushing forward, one of the team members used perception, detecting signs of living creatures in the surrounding space. As at the same second, someone behind shouted to be careful, for they were being overtaken very quickly by arrows, but the damage was small. However, sad perception. It didn't hurt, and he found three of the YSM team that had encountered the monster, one tank, and two DDs. Another one he spotted behind a rock about a kilometer away, and he was 100% sure it was Johnny sitting in ambush. They rejoiced and immediately ran in that direction, because once they slaughtered this guy, the opponents would immediately surrender. Lisa, who was watching them, stopped attacking them from behind, that the first phase of the plan was executed just perfectly. She then relayed to the ally that they were heading in his direction, to which he replied that he had accepted everything and was starting to move out. After coming out of the ambush, he was immediately asked where he was going, so he didn't even think of running away, for they are aware that his team is now fighting. However, the guy only took off his hood, asking why he would run away from here, and it was far from Johnny who was talking to them now. The opponents immediately recognized Chambers. I don't know how that happened, because there was definitely a tank on the battlefield. At that very second, the guy's allies announced that the hunt was over, and they were returning, closing in on their opponents. 
GT immediately realized that Johnny had pretended to be a tank, thus scouting them out like little children who had so foolishly fallen into a trap. After which he and Chambers swapped weapons, returning each to their roles to continue executing their plan. The same second, the guy who was sitting in the ambush threw his backpack into his opponent's hands, sending them a small gift. Catching the backpack rather than immediately opening it, seeing the monster's seeds inside, growing rapidly, absorbing aura from the environment. The tactic was that with the battle advancing, the first subgroup gathered the seeds I had left behind by the monster. Then they packed them so that they would not sprout and sent them to their ally to wait out the attack. As soon as the backpack was opened, the roots immediately began to sprout incredibly fast, fluttering in all directions. The living plant immediately began to bind the entire GT subgroup, which could not quickly and independently break free of the Putas. Wasting no time, the YSM began to attack their opponents, for there is nothing more convenient than a completely immobilized target. Juan immediately made one kill, followed by Chamber taking two, after which Johnny also decided to take on one. At the same time, the third GT subgroup learned that the first subgroup had already been taken out, which meant it was time to change the plan. However, they needed to finish their hunt first, then regroup. He asked his allies if everyone had heard him. The team was distracted for a second, causing one of the offshoots to grab their archer, lifting him high up while he screamed. But the captain immediately became angry, ordering everyone to stand, for first they had to save a comrade who was very important. Saying nothing more, he lunged towards the offshoot, raising the hand that held his shield to use it in an attack. With one leap, he reached a thick trunk, which he was able to cut with one strong movement, thus saving his comrade. Dropping to the ground, the captain was surprised to see his other ally swinging his sword, just cutting through the air. Looking at this picture, he thought in shock that they were in a hurry, and it was incomprehensible what his comrade was doing at such a dangerous moment. However, they needed to finish off the monster first. While the commentators were saying what a desperate battle the GT Knights had, they were able to capture the monster but spent too much time fighting the thing, nearly suffering casualties. Turning his head, the captain shouted at his comrade that every second was precious right now and he knew it. So why was he hovering? Hearing no response, the guy walked up to him, grabbing him by the shoulder and asking if he had decided to fight the air, starting to threaten him. But suddenly the lad's head separated from his body, whereupon he fell to his knees, leaving the captain in utter bewilderment. The commentators shrieked that Ben got one kill, and the guy standing next to him was in shock trying to figure out how that happened. Suddenly Ben started killing one by one, while the GTs clearly knew there was no sign of anyone approaching. However, the guy from the YSM team was now right next to them, completely blending into the shadows and coming closer and closer. Going behind his opponent's back, he began to slowly climb out of the shadows, looking for the perfect moment to attack. One of the knights asked in shock how this was possible, not even realizing his assassin was behind him. In the same second, the second knight also suffered a fatal fate at the hands of the man who had been hiding in the shadows all this time. The commentators were screaming that Ben now had two kills, however the guy only cared about being spotted by his opponents. The captain looked at the shadow in front of him, in which just now the kid had simply dissolved, losing himself completely from his sight. He had never seen anything like it, which made it hard to keep track of him and figure out how to fight against an elusive enemy. However, Ben tried to get rid of the last knight as quickly as possible to deprive his opponents of another subgroup. When he came out of the shadows, the boy attacked, but the captain felt someone rushing to his back and managed to repel the attack. With a sharp movement of his right hand, which held a shield, the knight pushed the guy farther away from him, breaking the distance. After keeping himself on his feet, Ben noticed that he had a quick reaction, so it was no longer possible to act rashly. Keeping her eyes on her opponent, Harar mentally asked the older man what he should do in such a situation. Earlier, William asked what would happen if his surprise attack didn't work, to which he received the answer that he would certainly be killed. Without a drop of mockery, the principal said that he seemed to be right, actually misguided why the guy immediately wondered. There is nothing unconditional about combat, however. You have to put in an incredible amount of effort to defeat someone who is much stronger. The guy took it as the ravings of a madman, however the hero kicked him, asking him to listen to the end. Then he asked what his head was for, because now it was time to start using it for its intended purpose in the coming battle. 
The young man then asked what he needed to do and how, to which he received the answer that for starters he needed to limit his opponent's variation. Calculate their logic, because if he hides in the shadows and waits there for an opportunity to attack, the opponent will act differently. He will go exactly where there is less shadow and will probably wait for the moment of his appearance, which is a very expected action. And the vast majority of the time, his opponents will think along those lines, not giving the guy a chance. At this time, the initiative is in his hands, so you need to take advantage of this. Look for a gap in their defense with a surprise attack strategy. Whereupon, William handed him a box containing crossbows a dagger, which the lad looked at with great reluctance. Then told him that he didn't have great control like Juan, for example, so it was better to use an easy-to-use weapon. Remembering all this, the guy signaled to himself to stop reflexing, for it was now that his decisive battle would come. The crossbow shoots accurately and is easy to handle because Ben was originally a maimed, so he's good at both shooting and melee. Even so, his opponent successfully repelled the bolt sent his way, putting his shield in front of him, trying to understand his opponent's course of action. After jumping, the guy began to lower himself to the ground, immediately merging with the shadows and going behind the back of his opponent, who began to turn around. And at this rate, it's going to be hard to get an advantage in his first one-on-one -on -one battle, since not even a crossbow worked against him. Then he decided to try and shorten the distance using his dagger, though the boy thought it was all in vain. However, the hero believed in him, and knew that this is not a reason to give up, because if he does not let go of his hands, there will be an opportunity to change the layout. Attacking the captain from different directions, Ben desperately got it into his head that he needed to reduce the variation of actions. However, the knight also didn't want to just stand there and repel every blow sent at him, causing him to go on the attack himself. What no one expected happened, the young man tripped over a rock and did two somersaults and fell to the ground. The captain looked incredulously at the guy lying in front of him. I don't know if this part was pre-planned or not, but Ben had time to regain his senses and immediately merged into the shadows, while his opponent, not understanding anything, asked what that was now. Being out of sight for anyone, the boy wanted to burn with shame, asking himself how he could have tripped. Moving behind the captain's back, he told himself that if he had known this would happen, he would have just jumped, but then he heard something. Someone asked if their trump card was revealed too quickly, because he was a little surprised that the kid could blend into the shadows. At that very second, the knight caught sight of the very shadow Ben was hiding in, thinking that the little one was completely confused. However, it meant he had a chance to take advantage of the situation, while the commentators said they were watching an exciting fight. Meanwhile, the second sub-team of the Knights and the first sub-team of the YSM team are fighting each other to the death. However, the GT subgroup was finished very quickly and they only had one player left, and YSM were one step away from victory. But something prevented them at just such an important moment, for it was now that the Zardlun decided to act and went on the offensive. The seeds scattered earlier had bound the first subgroup hand and foot, and the boss had blocked their escape route completely. And by this point, YSM has five players left to join Ben. They'll have to deal with the monster first. Players trapped in the trap will have a tough fight with the monster, because if the guys lose and Ben is caught, it could turn the tide of the match. And now the outcome of the match depends only on who will emerge victorious in a one-on-one -on -one duel, although their chances are still the same. So far, neither of them had done any damage to the enemy, while the captain thought that aside from that superpower, the brat was no threat. After which, the captain abruptly turned his gaze while simultaneously swinging his sword wide, aiming towards the shadowy fellow. He was already bored with this battle and then asked to lose it, but the young man only bounced back, walking away from the blow. As he landed on the ground, Ben immediately grimaced in pain as the front of his thighs were hit by the blade. Suddenly, the knight thought, why didn't he dodge? Couldn't he hide in his shadow in which he was completely invulnerable? As it suddenly dawned on him that this superpower also had limitations, in which he could masquerade in the shadows but not become one. This is not unusual because superpowers are often bound by limitations, and because of this hiccup in the fall, he rushed and miscalculated. After that, the captain smiled evilly, realizing that there was no way he could miss such a chance, because it was a clear victory. At the same time, the young man fully realized his mistake, which had caused his nerves to be on edge now, and he tried to calm himself down. However, he was going to find a gap in his technique, and he fell, 
and now he's also stupidly set up, so it's hard to calm down. However, while he was pondering this, his opponent didn't hesitate, and in one leap was right in front of the guy, swinging his sword. The blade was coming at him faster and faster, but suddenly he told his opponent that you couldn't hit so sprawlingly. After all, you can drive the sword deep into the ground. The knight was stunned by this phrase, but did not stop. In the same second, the young man merged with the shadows, and the knight's blade went into the ground, digging quite deep as it was said. Suddenly the kid jumped out of the shadows, swinging his dagger, thanking his opponent for falling for his ruse. Ben was full of confidence now, for his opponent was almost unarmed while his dagger was closing in on its target. He purposely didn't completely hide in the shadows, but did he ever wonder if this entire location was a solid shadow? It was all because the forest was upside down, which meant it was entirely his battlefield, a victory he had just gotten. Turning around, the guy saw Knight's slashed body while the commentators chanted that Ben had three kills. For a few seconds, he couldn't believe what had happened, even forgetting how to breathe, trying to realize his victory. After which, he sat on his knees and clenched his fists, holding back a cry, before shouting loudly that he had made it through the first duel. Feeling his emotions, William smiled, saying aloud to the guy who couldn't hear him that he could whenever he wanted. The commentators kept yelling about how the new guy was able to commit three kills, while the guy himself burst into tears of joy. The first game in the second division of the Battle of the Superhumans ends with a resounding victory for YSM, with Ben being the highest scoring player. At the same time, William smiled, saying that was enough to go brag about the lottery ticket. The new shtick with Ben and Johnny is the second tactician worked perfectly, meaning promotion to the first division won't be steamrollered. He had calculated everything, of course, but it was not too easy for them to win, for he had expected some greater resistance from their opponents. But on the other hand, it would be cool to one day set a team with that kind of success a goal of becoming first on the world stage. Down a few days later, William was lying on the couch talking about how there was nothing to do at all since Gabriel had taken over. He used to at least control the pass coach and scold him periodically, but now he has been deprived of even that pleasure. At some point, new series began to race in circles, because this one he has already seen, and when he reviewed everything, there is simply nothing to do. Then the man began to flip through the channels relentlessly, pressing the remote control button harder and harder with each new one. This time the TV defeated him, causing him to just hit the power button, deciding he'd had enough viewing today. Holding the remote in his hands, the hero hummed, thinking of something to occupy himself with the incredible amount of free time he had. At the same time, a dark-skinned man approached the headquarters, while William wondered if there was nothing of interest. As if sensing his mood, the man standing outside smiled broadly, hopefully pleasing the YSM team director. Without thinking long, Eric started ringing the intercom, trying to get William to open the door for him as soon as possible. It didn't take long to wait. The door opened, and the hero with a surprised look asked who brought there, and then looked at the man in shock. This was one of their seven, with whom they had saved the world, the Red Star of France, who was called the God of Axes. The surprised man asked why he was introducing him, but the man thought it was a good time to explain who he was. But he was more interested in what wind had carried him to Korea, to which he received the reply that he had not even bothered to meet him in France. But the character told the reporter that he would meet him if he came to Paris, and it was on TV in a live interview. However, at that time, Eric was fishing somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, so we had to swim to Paris, but there was a small accident. As a result, he got a good deal from his wife, and she also temporarily banned him from fishing, from which William concluded that the man had not changed at all. He's just his wife is very worried about him, worried about this and that, even though he keeps telling her to calm down. This guy will definitely not die his death, because fate and survival instinct is a superpower that manifests itself at the critical moment. Fatum increases luck, survival instinct increases strength, agility and endurance by 30%, so Eric's vitality is on par. With such superpowers, it's simply impossible to die of old age or disease, but at the same time, Marie's mother came out of the house, recognizing the man. They immediately started chatting, asking each other how long it had been since they had seen each other, and showering each other with friendly compliments. When they entered the house, the woman stated that she didn't have time to cook much, but at least something, after which she wished everyone a pleasant appetite. Everyone at the table, 
the dark-skinned man began to say that he didn't think he would ever be able to eat at the same table with him like this again. Afterward, he asked why William was hiding that he was immortal, since everyone was so sad until he returned from the last dungeon. He didn't hide it, however, for he had gotten the superpower after his return, which made Eric wonder if he had actually been willing to die then. Why he said he was very impressed, after which he added that it was nothing special, just a little present. Digging into his bag, the man pulled out a small stone with a rune carved into it, shining in a turquoise light, the Stone of Return. William was surprised that the man still kept it. Well, the man asked the hero was more used to such things. It's useless now, because it can only be used in dungeons. They don't exist anymore. But he took the pebble as a souvenir especially for him. After asking the price, he received the answer that the stone might be worth a million ten million, while every superhuman had such a stone, so the price was low. It was cheaper than he thought, but the stones weren't needed now, so no one needed them, and this one could be activated about seven more times. The hero, on the other hand, is about the fact that now that he has the stone, he can go back to a place where he hasn't been in a very long time. He was grateful to Jackie for sheltering him, but it wasn't a place he wanted to be, even when he was doing mundane tasks. Two days later, he saw Eric off asking if he wanted to go fishing together in the Pacific Ocean sometime, but he was very busy. It didn't work out for the man to use the hero as an excuse to lift his fishing ban, because he's not doing charity work. But he offered to go on a trip with his wife, and the man decided to take note of that too, inviting him back to France. After seeing his friend off, the hero clapped his hands together, telling himself that it was time for him to take a trip too. After taking only the bare essentials in his backpack, he was already near the exit, telling the man in glasses that he was going on a trip. Then there was a question as to how long it would last. But this William could not know, which was approximately three days. He used to disappear like this for a couple days without saying a word to anyone, because he has one secret spot known only to him. Finding a backpack on his shoulders, the hero heard a question as to why the man was not aware of this. However, the man was not going to answer him. After all, he wouldn't let anyone know everything about him. After which he said goodbye, adding that they would see each other most likely in three days. Well, go outside. The hero has already prepared his motorcycle, while wearing a helmet, following the rules of safety on the road. Starting the engine, he moved on accelerating very quickly and leaving the city while traffic was almost non-existent. After reaching the mountains, the guy parked the motorcycle by the side of the road, leaving it standing lonely beside the road, and walked. Rounding a mountainous area, the hero stopped, saying that it must definitely be around here somewhere, so there wasn't long to go. He was pleased that Eric had given him the Stone of Return, for without it, there was no way out without destroying the core of the dungeon itself. There was a decent amount of all sorts of stuff accumulated here. Magical stones, skins and skeletons of monsters, a special breed of minerals and more. At the same time, he needs to raise some money for the starting capital for the winter transfer window, thanks to which he will be able to buy good players. With such happy thoughts, he decided to move forward, imbuing his feet with aura to make the jump. He began to make his way high up, and forcefully leaping and traversing an incredible distance, making his way higher and higher. A couple seconds later, the man landed on the flat surface of the mountain, creating small cracks in the ground with the weight of his body. Smiling, the hero noticed something familiar, namely a huge boulder that looked unnatural, clearly blocking the entrance. Without thinking long, William pushed him away, opening the entrance to a cave that clearly no one had visited in a long time, not even himself. The man noticed a cluster of pink-colored energy in front of him that emitted small filaments, trying to make itself known. While things were going smoothly, the hero walked towards this cluster almost without thinking, slowly reaching out to it. The next second he felt like he was sucked somewhere, then immediately thrown into a completely different place. It had been a very long time since he'd been to his secret dungeon, which he was glad to see now more than ever. He took in a full chest of air, then exhaled sharply, kicking up dust across the huge hall, recognizing this atmosphere and air. When he enters the dungeon, for some reason it's as if his body and mind are renewed, which makes him incredibly happy. But after he came back from the last one, things weren't bad, but it's now that he feels at the peak of his powers. He recalled that after capture, if one did not destroy the core use the return stone to exit, one could create a ghost dungeon. As he walked around the huge castle, he noticed that he hadn't smelled that odor in a long time, for only the dungeon made him feel alive. 
After all, after returning, the hero constantly regretted having cleaned them all out, and if he went back again, he would do the same. However, this he misses very much, for he should have died there. To the very end, it would have been a life of despair and bright colors. After all, this is the place where William got his first taste of life. Then he was told a secret at a young age that ordinary people don't know. Man is unable to defeat the creatures from the dungeon. He hasn't gone there yet, so he probably doesn't know. But only superhumans feel this. That's why when a young superhuman awakens, he makes every effort to train him properly. However, at that time, William, covered in abrasions, didn't care, for he was only interested in the dungeon. So he stood there. Well then, why did he come back to life after a seemingly perfect ending to his life? After all, this peaceful time was totally not for him. Back in the dungeon, he was only convinced of this, and when Eric spoke on the subject, it was as if he was back in those glory days. Not even the demonic scum he'd sensed in France not long ago when he tested his new ability had shown up. Then he thought he was dreaming of some heresy, but literally right now, a purple haze was hovering not far from him. William immediately took notice, noticing that the dungeon had already been cleared out, meaning it should be empty. He doubted the dungeon could have been found by another superhuman, for when he removed the stone at the entrance, he wouldn't say it had been moved recently. And that could only mean one thing, that not all of his opponents were dead, and there was a chance that he could once again have fun like before. Without thinking long, he pulled out a folding spear, thinking only that it wasn't going to be easy since he hadn't brought any equipment with him. But it wasn't a big deal, for the excitement of battle would cover that shortcoming whereupon he shouted into the darkness to come out and fight him. Preparing his spear for battle, the hero stood in a stance, ready for a surprise attack from any direction, because he could not see his opponent. At first he thought he heard what he heard, but he kept his concentration and looked at something lurking in the shadows. Suddenly he felt a familiar aura behind him, causing William to freeze immediately, trying to catch the source. He turned around, realizing that the trail was leading that way, because his instinct for evil had never fooled him before. There would only be one here, and if he was attacked during the crossing, it could only add to the trouble. However, he did not feel fear or discomfort. On the contrary, the hero was now gripped by exhilaration and impatience. Without thinking, the man threw his backpack away and rushed forward, hoping to find an enemy and have some fun with him. Before this dungeon was sealed, there was a lab here, and some demons synthesized modified other monsters here. The chambers were made specifically for the critters this infernal breeder had bred, but it was his dungeon after all. Seventeen years ago, William had cleared the underground and made it his secret place, deliberately leaving the core intact, as a storage area for various treasures, trophies, and expensive monster mascara, but he couldn't remember what else was in there. After all, he had thrown everything down there, and as he ran across the long bridge, he tried desperately to remember, but to no avail. At the same time, he was excited about the future battle that the hero had been waiting for so long, and wanted to get it started as soon as possible. He heard some kind of continuous shuffling sound, either a monster crawling on the ground like a snake or a plant. This was great for him, for somewhere out there something good was waiting for him, after which he mentally asked the creature to crawl out. And in the same second, just a few centimeters from his face, a sharp spike appeared, flying towards him. William managed to stop abruptly and bounce back while the enemy's attack traveled along the ground, passing the hero. He carefully landed back on the bridge, trying to get a good look at what kind of monster he would have to fight now. In front of him in the air was a Zardlan, whose weakness was that it would reveal a vulnerable spot when nervous or swallowing prey. And given the size of the carcass, it's no wonder his presence is felt everywhere since he decided to munch on his warehouse. If we describe this monster in one phrase, we can say that it is a demonic agricultural crop. He absorbs everything he comes across, minerals, gems, corpses and the like, why he extracts their aura and accumulates it. If you grow a flower like this, you can absorb aura from it, a practical monster that can also attack people. He remembered mopping up the dungeon. There was such a bogeyman there, but after that, thoroughly inspect the location like any other. He destroyed every single seed because the ideal is his middle name and a normal life, but during the hunt he simply has no equal. He couldn't look through the seeds, for if you left them, they would immediately begin to consume the things around them and grow to a huge size. And so, looking for seed destruction is the basic principle of the sweep, but if he's actually wrong, it's no fun at all. 
However, the monster wasn't going to wait long either and pointed its outgrowths towards the hero, wanting to satiate him. The beast grew angry, sensing that he was about to be hunted by the unknown man who was now standing right in front of him. However, William easily fended off each attack, preventing the monster from approaching from any direction and giving him an advantage. Having guessed a convenient moment, the man used an amplified throw that should have hit right on target. Bouncing off all the offshoots, the spear flew straight at the monster's head, hoping to dispose of it in one fell swoop. The weapon reached its target, creating an incredible blast of aura that should, if not kill, then greatly weaken the enemy. But the guy immediately realized that this was not the end, and therefore made a high jump, reducing the distance between the monster. Reaching forward, he began to summon his spear to bring it back, for the attack was not yet over. The weapon obeyed, and immediately began to fly back, while the hero, with a deft movement, grabbed it. But instead of retreating and changing position, the man swung his spear again, wanting to finish off the nasty creature. He began to cut through all the offshoots that whipped towards him, trying to protect the head of the Zaldron that smelled danger. However, these attempts were unsuccessful. As a consequence, the hero was already approaching, throwing it behind his back, swinging wide. The second strike was much stronger than the first, which created a shockwave, tearing the monster-like plant into pieces. Jumping back, William watched the monster fall to the ground, its offshoots lifelessly braiding his head. Sighing heavily, he thought it would be great if the demon left the seeds and took off. After all, it was harder to fight without equipment. It had been 17 years since the last dungeon had been closed, and although the demon civilization had been destroyed, those who created such monsters couldn't die. Perhaps some of the demons remained, and now they are once again planning an invasion that could mean great danger to humanity. However, the hero only mentally asked the freaks who survived to hang in there as he looks forward to meeting them. An hour later, the man was finishing up trampling the monster's seeds, deciding to take one with him just in case, putting it in a bottle. William looked around, trying to be completely sure that absolutely all of the monster seeds had been destroyed. He then turned to this potato, threatening it to try to sprout again if it wanted to die. However, he couldn't understand, after all, he was perfection itself, so could he have made such a blunder, and was it possible? But to get the answers to these questions, it's worth looking around and finding out what's going on here first, because he hasn't gotten to the main thing yet. Everywhere he looked, the monster had eaten everything, and he thought he could sell something and make a good profit. But there was nothing around. But suddenly he remembered that there was one room that Zardlan would never open, even using his seeds and all his powers. He reached a door that was sealed with golden chains. That was the sarcophagus cave where the core of the dungeon is kept. This place is built in such a way that the core is hard to get to, and then he left a lot of magic stones in this cave. And from the looks of it, the seal on the door was in order, whereupon William made some effort to remove the seal and open the door. He opened his eyes wide, seeing in front of him only a huge red core, chained together with no emitting aura. Whether the monster couldn't get in here confused him, but all the magic stones had disappeared somewhere, and there was no explanation for it. For humans, such stones are just shiny, but for demons they are like oil or coal with incredible value. And at the same second, something else entertaining caught the hero's eye. Right in front of him lay his spear in its folded form. It was definitely the one he'd gotten from the Moreau brothers, and it was very recent, which could only mean one thing. He remembered the situation that had happened to him in Paris, whereupon the man smiled, realizing that he had almost found the fugitive. No doubt, if his hunch was correct, he would come to retrieve the Zard Loon, which meant all he had to do was wait for him. But suppose the core shattered before the monster was assembled, it would become a huge loss. But one thing was clear. This core was also a local warning device that let the demons know that one dungeon remained. Suddenly, the man felt a demonic aura coming from somewhere behind him, and turning around, he waited. Without touching the floor, he was slowly approached by a very real demon with a chilling dark aura. He looked silently at the hero, who said cheerfully that he knew they were still not dead, and therefore the fun wasn't over yet. The system of changing aura color depending on the results of a hunt in the superhuman battle originates from demons who use a similar system. They are categorized into groups, and which one the demon belongs to can be determined by the hue of its aura. Red is the third level. 
And this demon was far from inferior, who at this second pointed his finger at the hero, saying something in an unfamiliar language. It was a word he had heard often, however, and so the demon definitely said man, whereupon William said he was glad to meet him too. He then said that when picking with you, it's usually customary to respond, or he's just learning to speak human language. Demons learn their language pretty quickly, but they can't learn the language of demons, it's too complicated. But suddenly the demon said the word man, separating it by syllables, while the hero rejoiced at his first word. However, the man didn't stop there, asking if the man had come alone, and the guy was surprised that he could utter a whole sentence. The demon repeated his question, to which William replied that he preferred to work alone, for he had difficulty in learning third-rate languages. His interlocutor replied that he was well aware of the language he was speaking, for it was a second-level language, the language of the slaves. Then the hero cheered up, wryly asking what it was like to speak the language of the inferiors who had destroyed the demon civilization. This made the demon mad, whereupon he said that if they hadn't been hiding in the shrine, this would never have happened. Thinking back in time, the man interjected about the shrine, for he is definitely talking about the last closed dungeon. The demon was indignant that the vile men dared to use the word last speaking of the sanctuary, but William did not let him finish. While he was able to distract the demon with chatter, he himself pointed his spear in its direction, deciding to attack without warning. However, the demon managed to dodge in time, in turn insulting the man who dared to attack him so suddenly and brazenly. And in the same second, the hero asked if he knew the demons were their prey trying to show mockery in his voice. After all, if a man hunted them, he could get wealth and become famous, so they killed with great pleasure. They used the money to eat, drink and be merry, and the dungeon, or shrine, was a gold mine for them. And right now, his prey was the demon that stood before him, and all he had to do was entertain the hero. The irritated demon stated that the humans were and still are just cattle, then asked how they even dared to go against them. But William declared that he was too talkative for one who, Rob, destroyed the very cattle he talked so much about. However, the demon was not going to stand aside, and began to summon snakes woven from the aura, which obeyed his will without question. Speaking in demonic language, he ordered the snakes to go on the attack to destroy the insolent intruder to their peace. The hero at this time was waiting for the opportune moment, letting the enemy get closer to him, staying completely focused. There was a loud explosion, leaving a small depression in the ground that was empty while where we were surprised that the guy had disappeared. But suddenly, a man raised his voice from behind his opponent, but his attack passed him by, even with the use of agility enhancement. William asked if he was aware, or if the one in their shrine was aware, that the core that was in their shrine was very huge, probably twice his size. After that, they began to continuously pelt each other with attacks, failing to deal any damage to their opponent. The demon wondered how he knew this, but the hero chose not to answer the question for now, dodging the snake's attacks. After that, they looked into each other's eyes, as suddenly the demon started to understand something, while the guy only smiled. But this only made the demon more angry, who wanted to destroy the mocking human himself. However, William wasn't going to be distracted for a second, watching every movement of the several snakes aiming in his direction. He then raised his spear above him and began to untwist it, thus creating a semblance of a shield that the snakes would shatter. And once they were done with them, the man jumped up, declaring that the demon wouldn't be able to close his mouth with such pathetic attacks. As the hero stood in front of his opponent, the latter visibly tensed, taking slow steps backward and trying to figure out who was now in front of him. The demon then stated that they had never shown the core of the shrine to anyone. The inferior races never had a chance to see it. There was only one person who could know about him, to which the hero replied that this person was William, and that was him. The dumbfounded demon immediately roared, repeating his name and declaring that the one was his blood enemy who should pay with his life. But the lad thanked him for coming to him himself, for he feared he could no longer hunt them. But that was more than enough to finally anger the demon, who gathered all his strength and sent the snakes back on the attack. However, it still wasn't enough, and making a power jump, the guy started chopping the snakes along their bodies, then was able to get as close to their creator as possible, making a punch and throwing him backwards, knocking the ability away. That hiccup was enough for the demon to lose control and set himself up for a direct hit from a focused William. 
The man made a throw that threw the demon back against the wall, leaving the spear sticking out of its chest, delivering unbearable pain. While the weapon's aura glowed, the demon's body went limp and lost any colors, rendering it gray and desiccated. However, the hero was a little disappointed because he didn't think it would be so easy and it only took one throw. But he knew that one wasn't dead yet, for they upgrade their own bodies and could maintain vitality with their aura. So he won't die until all of his aura is used up, after which William asked if he was ashamed of what he said about the inferior races. They identify themselves according to the functions they perform, thus the role of the search is to look for places to get an aura. It's a demon doing the searching which means there's nothing special about it. It's low level to me, but it's not high level either. The demon woke up, realizing the guy wasn't going to be fooled, while the man decided to ask him something, thrusting his spear in harder. The imp replied that he wouldn't answer any of his questions, but the hero was pretty sure it would be the other way around. Holding the hilt of the spear in his hand, the man asked the question if all the demons were definitely dead, wanting to know the most detailed answer possible. To hurry him up, he pushed harder and harder on the spear while the demon asked what he meant. William asked if they just hunkered down underground and licked their wounds, or if their civilization was beyond repair after the war. The hero added that the albino he had fought in their holy land was quite entertaining. He wanted to fight someone like that again. The demon didn't understand who he was talking about, but the guy clarified that his aura was glowing white, which meant he was a master. The angered demon, writhing in pain, declared that the human had been too presumptuous and their race had survived, to which William was immediately glad. The great ancestors and the primordial light continue to guide them, though the magister who heard their voices has left them. However, they are still in great order, and the guy has stated that judging by what he's muttering about, he's about to self-destruct. But the demon stated that the light had originally prophesied that the very prophet would appear on earth to lead them to the land where the light descended. The man was right, and the demon's body began to glow, and he began to shout something about the original light, and that it was too dark for him. He asked to shine his light and be led to the land where light descends, whereupon bright rays appeared from his mouth and eyes, foreshadowing danger. There was a deafening explosion, covering an incredible area with it, and when the smoke cleared, the charred demon lay limbless. While still alive, he slowly opened his eye, noticing William in front of him, who had managed to activate enhanced immortality. The dumbfounded demon thought it was a seer, after which he held out a group of hands to him, saying what a warm, glowing aura. After which he asked to lead him, unworthy, but he only asked him to die faster, which made the demon go into shock. The imp didn't immediately realize that it wasn't a prophet standing before him, but a fully alive opponent, surrounded by an aura, raised his fist for a final attack. The demon's last words were something about a prophet, which sounded very unintelligible, but after that, he let out a final sigh. Returning to his physical body, William said that he had finally died, but you had to admit, he was a tough guy. Wiping his hands clean of dust, the lad declared that he too could prophesy something, but this was much truer and clearer. Now you won't have to seek cover when demons undermine themselves, as enhanced immortality protects against any damage. When it was over, he decided to show off to himself, all because he was the strongest man in the world, no, in the universe. When he got out with the help of a rock, he said that for once he decided to get some fresh air and visit the dungeon. He remembered the words of the demon who said that the prophet would appear on earth. The hero didn't know which prophet he was talking about, or what kind of spiritual awakening he was referring to, but he wouldn't know that now. He tried to remember something like this from the past, but decided that the demons had updated their repertoire since he hadn't heard it before. Though similar nonsense had been said back when their seven went on raids, he'd heard similar prophecies before. If there really was some sort of primordial light or prophecy, then why were the demons unaware that they were losing? Suppose the prophet does show up, but it will still be extremely difficult for a demon to revive, and to me the return stopped appearing. According to researchers, it was built more than 10,000 years ago and the dungeon was a kind of mechanism. It was accumulating aura from all over the world, and one day the demons who bathed in this inexhaustible source of power lost control. Otherwise, it is impossible to understand why beings who created a high-level civilization decided to invade their world. There are several different hypotheses as to the reason why they invaded them, but no one has been able to figure out a credible reason.
From what the hero has seen, the surviving quest demon has been accumulating aura for something, but it won't be easy for them to pull it off while William is alive. And yet he'd had such high hopes for the demons he hadn't seen in so long. But this meeting was not what he'd hoped for. That demon exuded only fear and despair, a sheer doom that was fundamentally different from the confidence of before. If things were happening in the good old days, he would stall for time and call his buddies before self-detonating. But this time he didn't seem to have the opportunity to do so, which is why the hero was disappointed in this fight. He then began to walk away from the cave, telling himself that he had to get home because he couldn't sleep in a trashed dungeon. In that same second, the pink sphere that represented the passage to the dungeon began to drastically drain the aura, after which its color turned to red, hinting that the core had been completely destroyed and the dungeon would be closed. At the same time, another approached the body of the destroyed demon, saying that he was sorry, although the quest had returned to the light. But there was a problem, after which he looked at the monster's remains, saying that the Zardlun was in time and was almost ready to reap. It was also a great loss. However, this wasn't the only place to get aura. Plus, they found out that the hated William was more alive than ever. The demon exuding a white aura stated that this time, the one would definitely die, and so they would now prepare to receive the prophet. The man who looked like a man with white hair and wearing a white suit standing behind him replied that he understood his words completely. When the guy got home, Jackie said he was leaving for three days, but he came back much earlier than promised. The tired hero sat down on the couch and asked why he was rambling like that, to which he heard the question that he had come to the mountains and immediately left. Nodding affirmatively, he heard another question asking if he had brought mountain ginseng, but in fact he had brought something better. He held out the bottle to the man with the glasses, asking how much money he thought he could get for the contents. Taking the bottle and fixing his glasses, the man began to scrutinize what was inside, already recognizing the find. He noticed in shock the seed of the Zaldron, which did not move and only stared silently at the man, doing nothing. When asked where he got it from, William replied that he had grabbed it from the dungeon warehouse, but had killed the monster itself first. A concerned Jackie asked if the man knew that one such lake walker could cause the entire city to turn to chaos and devastation. After all, unless you count the superhuman players in the battle, the rest of the population are mere humans who have no idea how to fight. And even in battle, a strong Zardlun acts as the final boss, hunted by several skilled men. But the hero wondered how much he could get if he sold it, to which the man replied that if he wanted money, he would give as much as he needed. But William declared that he didn't need the money, for there must be institutions that were still studying demons to this day, and he was going to give it to them. After all, the demonic civilization is discounted early. These things couldn't die so easily, and so they wait for an opportunity to attack. To which Jackie replied that there was the world's most interested organization in demon research, and that got William interested. As it turned out, it was the International Superhuman Battle Association, which the YSM team was now competing in. At this time, Lisa drew the bowstring, releasing three arrows while the commentators said she was unrivaled in jumping. Infusing the arrows with her aura, she launched them at the fish-like monster, which immediately felt the attack from above. However, it was too late, and after brutally restraining her opponents, the girl successfully took the monster to her piggy bank. As she landed on the ground, she saw the guy from the opposing team in front of her, holding a shield and a double-sided axe. Notwithstanding such insolence, the opponent was the first to go on the attack, saying that it was very infuriating, to which the girl immediately responded. Lisa began to dodge each attack nimbly while her opponent asked her if she could stand still. However, after each at the gate, she replied that standing was not working for her, after which she asked to be caught first. After all the futile attempts, the guy stopped, barely containing his anger while the girl made a cute face, saying she was sorry. She then jumped high into the air while her opponent called her bad, for which she immediately thanked him. At this time, William watched her play, movements and tactics, smiling and rejoicing to himself at this girl's success. After all, she achieved incredible results, even though she only had high scores in speed and tactics. But if you take leadership and speed to the max, you can sell such a player to another club for a decent sum. However, she has recently become the star of the club, so he wasn't sure if he should sell her at all, since so many people come to see her. Although some had another favorite, Ben, who nimbly destroyed opponents one by one without being caught. 
Now you can't see such a spectacular fight as in the first game, because it is not really visible, so it does not cause much interest in the audience. But in terms of tactics, the kid is doing well, and he will grow seamlessly into a mid-table player when the team gets to League One. At the same time, the rest of the team was successfully dealing with the remaining opponents who were unable to offer any worthy resistance. The game was eventually ended 10-0, and with a huge lead, YSM wrapped up the second set, causing this team to advance to the playoffs. All the spectators were literally ecstatic, shouting loudly to support their favorite team, not holding back their joy. William was approached by Jackie and asked if they really made the playoffs, and the hero was surprised that he came to the district competition. The man added that he was walking by and decided to stop by because the International Battle Association is asking for Zardlun Seed, and he used to be shaking the air and telling him about the danger, however reasoned that they were unusual people, in addition to they had William. The man added that when Hero bought the team, he thought it was just for fun, but in just one year, they went from last place to the playoffs. The number of fans and ticket sales have increased tremendously, plus the number of video views of them is growing literally in front of our eyes. However, the teams they will face in the future will be stronger than all their past opponents and whether YSM can win. In response to which William smiled, and in a completely relaxed voice stated that it would happen without any problems. Jackie was surprised at how confident he was, because he thought YSM's tactics were obvious to everyone, so they would come up with measures against it. However, they now had an interview with the coach of the winning team in front of them, and at the same time, a female reporter approached the man. After saying hello to Gabriel, she said that he spoke Korean very well, and it was hard to believe that he had only recently come to visit them. She then started asking if he was worried and how he planned playoff preparation for his team. After thinking about it, the man replied that they have no reason to worry about the playoffs, as he thinks the Champions Cup is already in their hands. He also chose to clarify that the club director promised him something before he accepted the invitation to YSM. Everyone was eager to continue when Gabriel said that William would make three appearances on the team during the year. The coach also admitted that he sympathized with their opponents. At that very second, all the spectators, including Jackie, were in total shock. The man with glasses then turned to the hero, asking him what it meant, trying to get a more detailed answer. William only smiled, putting his foot back on his leg, answering that it just so happened and there was nothing he could do about it now. The next day, there was a team meeting in which William talked about being a rookie and making his debut in the next match. He has little experience in superhuman combat, so he asked to be taught everything, after which he greeted his older comrades. This will be his first official league game and he is not paid much, so he also asked for understanding. Afterward, the man smiled grimly and said that he hoped they would be an example to him, because he could trust them. Everyone who saw his face at that moment was a bit startled, not tense, not answering anything, trying not to be intimidated. Gabriel added that the director will be playing with them from now on. On top of that, the hero asked to take care of him. The coach then stated that since they were done introducing the newcomer, they should now move on to the planning meeting. The first opponent in the playoffs will be the third-place team, BC, who are very serious opponents. Lisa and Johnny debuted in a match against these guys, so this opponent is already familiar with our containment strategy. Since then, they have taken a much more cautious approach to matches, especially when dealing with opponents employing similar tactics. In contrast, BC didn't look for new players during the transfer window and ended up hiring one guy from the youth league. At the same time, William he thought that if you watch the tape rather than the live broadcast, the analyzing gaze is useless. However, he hustled up in time and watched the match with this kid to ferret out his strengths and weaknesses. This I also recognized the superpower. And that power was tracking, which gave the ability to track the location of five living objects that are within the wearer's sight. William said they're straight up openly stating their intentions by using this power, since they only took the small one for a match with them. The coach agreed, because the boy's physical stats are low, and the superpower is only one, but it poses a serious threat to the team. Ben hides in the shadows most of the time, on Johnny works from a distance, supplying the team with everything they need. Due to his abilities, the guy performs several important functions. The distance at which his powers work is limited. On the other hand, he only has one superpower, yet he can tell where a person is if he has already marked them. 
they end up with a situation where the opposing team reacts much faster than they do. In other words, the containment game doesn't make sense. One of the players raised his hand and asked that this was why the director was in their match, and they would use a different strategy. They thought the game would adjust to the director, however, they would run the game as usual, and the lead players would still be Lisa, Johnny, and Ben. Coach decided to clarify that Chuck's spot covering for him during the match would be taken by William, replacing the guy. To which the player replied that with that, and they won't be able to run their normal containment game, but is it worth using their trump card just for the sake of it? Acquainted heard the answer from the director that he volunteered for it, which made the guy visibly surprised, not expecting such an answer. He was looked at by a smiling hero who stated that he wanted to try something, so this match was the perfect opportunity. Who is the strongest superhuman in the world? This question has always been a favorite topic of discussion, and primarily compared players from the top three. They were considered the first candidates for the title of the strongest, and users from all over the world had a heated debate on the vast expanses of the internet. But Korean users in all the tracks had only one thing to do, silently watch everything from the sidelines and keep their heads down. It's probably worth mentioning that 17 years ago, after William's death, Jackie resigned to become a coach who was able to rise high. That's why he wasn't compared to other players in the comments, and he didn't become part of the holivars that passed him by. However, everything changed when William returned to the world of the living, causing Korean commentators to argue on the topic. People wrote in the comments that you their reality William is definitely the strongest superhuman, and even foreign people were in agreement. Korean users calmed down for a while, but you'd think the great hero would care. When the commentators roared that player William had destroyed all opponents, he proved that even in battle, he was unrivaled. And eventually, after the charity match, having made his debut as a player, he still decided to take to the field of play once more. After all, he is a world legend and savior of mankind, having accomplished much and accomplished much during the war with demons. No one used to pay attention to South Korea's matches in the second division, but now there were more spectators than ever, all thanks to William's participation. Looking at the players standing in front of them, the audience chanted the names of the players and the team as a whole, without holding back emotions. The hero was pleased when he heard his name. This carried from the stands, realizing how much he was popular with the people. But another player said it's great, and he'd like to get a tenth or at least a hundredth of its popularity. They then entered the arena, greeting their opponents, standing across from each other, trying to memorize those they would be fighting. The opponents thought William had carried the national team players and had no idea what he would do to them. While the YSM team was glowing with joy, because if they won, they would get into the first division, although the director alone could win the match. At this time, the hero decided to activate the analyzing gaze and view all opponents to find out all their trump cards. But just as he thought, not a single interesting player, all of them without exception did not stand out as anything interesting or entertaining. As suddenly he turned his attention to just one unremarkable guy, while the commentators asked the players to enter the modules. And while all the games were breaking up, the guy from the BC team was scouting the opponents, taking all the ones he wanted in his sights. Not in that second, William walked up to him, saying hello, wanting to have a conversation with someone that would make this match a bit difficult. The dumbfounded boy said a loud hello to the hero, while William noticed that all of his vitals remained unchanged. The hero knew that the guy was energetic, but why was she shouting like that? Because his ears were ringing, causing the guy to shriek loudly again. The man then asked if he had identified targets to track, which caused the guy to shudder dramatically as he looked at his opponent. Without thinking long, the man replied in agreement, as he took in the sight of the hero, who only smiled good-naturedly upon hearing the answer. But the next second and his smile was replaced by gloating when he said that he too had a target in the form of a guy. Hearing this, the young man tensed, not risking to even move, trying to see if they had some sort of plan to disarm him. Then the first YSM vs BC playoff game began. The location for the first game was Wizard Canyon. At this time, William asked Johnny to remember the training and work as well, to which he replied in agreement, remembering to bring his binoculars. The man gave the command to begin, whereupon all the players except him moved forward, taking their positions. After seeing his team go ahead, he said he should get ready too, and then started warming up. Commentators were saying that the YSM led by Johnny had come around. It looked like they were going to use containment tactics again. 
This sub team usually consists of six men, including Chuck. For today, William, who has been standing still, took the field instead. They all know that no monsters will show up at the starting point, and earning hunting points by staying here is obviously not going to work. All of them, including the audience, wondered what the team director was up to, who only smiled slyly. At the same time, the first BC sub-team had already fought the monster, attacking it using all their strength and advantages. That's when they were told that Lisa and Ben were approaching the second subgroup. Those two were targets for surveillance. They know they have a way to deal with the containment tactics, but decided to go with the usual pattern anyway. The BC captain stated that it was easier for them, as it would have been very difficult for them to face William directly. But they had no time to waste, and decided to proceed according to plan, asking the tracker not to go far enough to inform them of the enemy's movements. They asked where the hero was now, to which they received the reply that he was standing at the starting point and had not gone with the rest of the team. They were surprised, but the captain decided to let the raptors out of the cage if they were so insistent, for their team had a great position. Their aura is already purple, so they need to push on and drink more hunt points to make it white. He then ordered the three long-range fighters to follow him to clip the wings of the containment group and join the others. When BC learned that William would be in the match, they decided to stall for time and engaged in a hunt to improve their chances against him. The battle system allows you to accumulate hunting points and at their expense to increase your stats so that you can turn any situation in your favor. When you fight against William, it's clear how it's going to end, so BC want to improve their odds against the hero. Plus they're going to take out the YSM containment team, and that requires the team to follow three players from a safe distance. When YSM start the containment game, you need to act on the plan and avoid the hero until they reach maximum improvement. The captain was happy with the plan because it was perfect, and if everything went smoothly, they could win the first set and advance to the first division. But at the same second, the guy noticed something incredibly fast flying towards them, managing to react at the last second. He abruptly shifted his body to the side, moving away from a projectile that could have taken him out immediately, thus disrupting the plan. But in the same second, she turned around dazedly, realizing that the spear had reached its original target after all, and they had lost their tracker. They didn't realize what had happened since William was standing at the start, but in fact he had just decided to use an enhanced spear throw. He was able to hit the target without even seeing it, using not only his powers but also the other players' abilities to do so. While the commentators kept saying that William had one kill, the man thanked Johnny, who played a crucial role. Somewhere in the distance smiled a guy who used visual telepathy to communicate what he saw to another person within a three kilometers radius. The captain of the first subgroup was shocked that the spear was able to fly as far as here from the starting point the hero was now at. Panic gripped him as he realized that their most dangerous opponent was out of their range and attacking at a great distance. As suddenly, a second spear flew towards them, killing another of their comrades who couldn't expect such a thing, causing them to be unable to defend themselves. The commentators chanted that William already had two kills, while the BC subset looked at the slain comrade. Turning by radio to the second group, the captain asked them to respond, telling them that the hero attacking them was here. And in the same second, he heard that William already had three kills, yet no one in their subgroup had been hit, so she was attacking another. The second group asked how the first group could have forgotten about tracking, since right now they are being attacked by a hero of unknown origin. A spear flew towards them and killed one of the archers. Obviously, William had gotten close to them and easily straightened them out. A few days ago, the man told Johnny that he was able to hit the target even from two kilometers away. If it was visible, there would be no problem. Of course, the distance is quite a long distance, but such a throw will have a killing force and on top of all the effect of surprise. The guy was surprised by such a statement, while the hero decided to talk about his important mission, in which he will fulfill a key role. The man was referring to the part if the target visible, while Johnny tried to figure out exactly what the principal wanted to convey to him. And in the same second, it came to the guy that it was about visual telepathy thanks to which he could transmit everything he saw to William. The guy stated that with the broadcast of what he sees himself, no problem with the bow, but the hero asked him not to sweat it. Johnny smiled, agreeing with the man, saying that he would go where their opponents would be clearly visible. William smiled, lifting his index finger up and clarified that he should climb as high as possible for the sake of a good view. 
It took the young man ten minutes to climb to the top of the cliff next to the waterfall to find a suitable target. Indicating that he was on the spot, the hero immediately asked him to turn on his telepathy, whereupon the guy began to concentrate his aura. The man immediately realized the ability had kicked in when he felt something unusual, glancing forward and seeing hands that weren't his own. Johnny asked if it was far to the target, to which he received the reply that it was possible to get a little closer for greater convenience. The hero then asked what about the binoculars and if he could transmit what he would see into them, and then asked that the binoculars be sent to him. When the young man received the instrument without looking into it, he again interrogated whether the principal had better or had been able to see the target. The man agreed, after which the guy offered to give him a shot, because he himself was very curious about what would come out of it. And looking out for a tall tree that stood lonely on a rock, the hero said that their goal was the Christmas tree they needed to hit. However, the lad wasn't sure it was a spruce, but William replied that he didn't know about trees. But since it was coniferous, let it be a Christmas tree. After that, he infused the spear with aura, trying to take aim at the tree as accurately as possible trying to take into account all the little nuances. He then threw the spear, using his superpower to make the weapon circle around rocks in the way. Watching through binoculars, Johnny noticed that the spear landed a few meters away from the target without even catching it. The man noticed that it was a little different when watching with his own eyes, because he was not throwing from where the guy was standing. Even though he hit pretty close, he decided he'd get the hang of it after a few throws, then ordered his spear back. Immediately on command, the weapon stuck out of the ground it had hit, not immediately beginning to fly straight into its owner's hands. The dumbfounded young man saw such an ability for the first time, ask what it was, to which he received the answer that it was just a cool gimmick. William was capable of more than that, as he hadn't shown enhanced immortality to anyone yet, but he wouldn't do that in the game. He then focused again, trying to aim as accurately as possible, and then made a throw hopefully for the best result. This time, the spear landed a few meters closer to the tree, but was still far from ideal, as the man was much smaller than the tree. However, this only fueled the hero, who was not going to give up on his original goal, deciding to try again and again. His next attempt was almost accurate, but he missed by only 30 centimeters, causing the spear to not even scratch the bark. On his next throw, he could only hit the tree with an edge, but it was almost in the bullseye, so there wasn't much left. The information that Johnny relays, wind direction, wind speed, optimal wind speed for throwing into a corner, all have to be taken into account. But it will be enough to derive the sensory perception formula and perfect the throw. He now decided that this throw would be decisive, for he had made some pretty clear calculations in his head that made it impossible for him to miss. There was a loud crack and a small explosion that managed to separate the top of the tree from the base and throw it some distance away. The team that watched him into the monitor screen asked if he was human, comparing him to a god, for he had divine talents. Gabriel, also watching, said in French that he had a divine talent, adding that this year's success was assured. And now in the game. The commentators were chanting that William already had three kills, because he had killed three minutes spear from the starting point. At this time, Jackie asked how this was possible, to which Mari's mom replied that Johnny can communicate to another what he sees himself. The man has heard of it. The catch is that the vantage point and the throwing point are in different places. The direction of travel is different. Jackie wrote a biography of William, describing events that the author saw with his own eyes, because they are best friends. For example, when he hit the boss with a flea-sized vulnerability from 100 meters, but then readers thought it was all fairy tales. The hero's achievements were regarded as over-exaggerated, and all agreed that the author was under a great impression from what he had seen. However, it comes out that Jackie never lied, and William just proved the truth of his stories, and people will be able to see it for themselves. For what he saw for the first time, namely that he was able to get his weapon back, which had never happened before. The commentators were surprised by this too, shouting that they could not believe their eyes, for the spear he had thrown came back to him. This turn of events completely pleased the hero, who smiled knowing that he was able to surprise everyone, but he wasn't going to stop there. At this time, the second BC team was fighting the dragon, and the captain asked them to focus intently on the hunt. The team captain said that according to the first group, William hits from afar, but at that distance, the power of the throw is reduced. 
and so it only targets long-range players with weak defenses and those who don't have a shield with them to repel the projectile. He then turned around and sternly stated for all of them to protect vulnerable allies and stick to the original plan. While in the distance, the hero asked the opponents that they know a containment team is coming towards them, but still continue to hunt. And did they really think it was enough to adjust their powers a little, adding that they had been too careless? After which he pulled out his spears and started throwing them one after the other, perfectly picking out targets that I would definitely be able to hit. But this time, the man decided not to attack the opposing players, focusing on killing as many monsters as possible. Dumbfounded BC, they could believe that the behemoth they had fought so diligently was being taken right out from under their noses. But William didn't stop there, bringing his spears back, launching them at opponents and monsters again, trying to use all his strength. The man threw and returned his spears relentlessly, giving his opponent no time to regroup and take a breather. Captain BC realized that they had lost a great many wyverns, thinking about the fact that YSM had originally planned to take out the tracker first. He wanted to change position to regroup first, after all they needed a new strategy, when suddenly he was warned that the spear was flying again. All of the players successfully dodged, eyeing with suspicion the weapon that wasn't even going to return to its master. While still at practice, William called Ben over to him, who said hello to the principal, and the principal reminded him that he would call him senior. Not guilty of losing the back of my head, the guy apologized, asking if the man was trained here and why he'd called him specifically. The hero smiled, replying that the guy had to work his paycheck, and hearing this made the guy tense up, not knowing what was in store for him. And now, during the game, Ben himself was in the shadows to implement the strategy that William had told him, having discussed beforehand. The guy abruptly got out of the shadows to attack the girl, who was standing closest to the spear and couldn't expect a sudden attack. The commentators proclaimed Ben's one kill while the guy rushed forward, looking back at his fallen opponent. William said they were so focused on his persona that they completely forgot about the rest of the players, even though they call themselves pros. The remaining players informed the director that they were done, then asked that they go to the rally point and finish the game. The man smiled, agreeing with them, adding that he would delay them in long-range attacks. They would let them reel in their fishing rods for now. A little while later, the YSM players were finishing off the remaining opponents, while the commentators were saying it was a flawless victory. It was the end of the first round, and everyone had already realized who was the best player of this round. It was definitely William. When it ended, the hero awkwardly lost the back of his head, answering them that he's always great, even though no one heard him. Whereupon Gabriel came up to him and bowed low, noting what a great job he had done, coming up with such a good plan. The man asked if the spectators were happy, to which he received the reply that they were absolutely delighted, and the reaction to the game was very enthusiastic. The hero liked it, because he put on a great show, but it's time to end it, because next BC is waiting for a real massacre. The second round will take place in a dungeon known as the Thousand Bridges, on as a cylinder with suspension bridges stretching inside. They are so dilapidated that they can crumble if you only step on them, and not all of them are real. Some of them lie a visual illusion. In such a dungeon, players have to be careful, and first they have to determine which of the bridges are real, and only then move. Meanwhile, the YSM team were doing a great job dealing with the spiders that filled the entire location, not giving players a pass. However, these little guys aren't the only threat here, as there are also alpha spiders with special and nasty powers. With the help of a spider web, they capture dead their victim, but afterward, a zombie under his control emerges from the cocoon. And now they already had a few deadbeats under their control, which the players had to confront in order not to be in their shoes. William noticed that he was settling in quite nicely, collecting corpses and blowing an entrance. It was a bit of nostalgia for him. After all, he remembered how one zombie came out of a cocoon right in front of me. Then he was really scared, but not everyone appreciated his memories. After which he decided to estimate that the regular spiders in the dungeons were tentatively 4 to 50 individuals, and the alpha was 8 pieces, all his. He decided to leave the zombies for his allies while he himself drew his spears, knowing in advance how he would fight. He decided to use the throwing enhancement, then began sending several spears at once into the eight-legged opponents. Each of his weapons reached its target in a flash, giving him an incredible amount of experience for dealing with them alone. 
The entire team watched their leader in amazement, wondering what he was in all the fun, noticing his smile. A few minutes later, the man completed his hunt while the color of his aura took on a red color, visibly intensifying. The dumbfounded allies asked each other if they thought the director had done it too fast. As suddenly, the hero called Johnny over to him, asking him to share his aura with his favorite senior, to which he immediately moved from his seat. The guy could transfer his aura to another person, thus quickly revitalizing an ally in battle, which was useful for William. Pleased to have such a useful companion, he stopped him as suddenly a loud voice ordered them to stand, causing them to turn around. The voice added that there was nowhere to run. Looking closer, the YSM team noticed all of their opponents standing further away from them. North immediately asked the director what they would do, since BC had trapped them and they were now standing on the bridge at a disadvantage. The captain of the opponents thought the mouse had been caught in a mouse trap and the day would go down in history, whereupon he said that luck was now on their side. But William only smiled and waved his hand, saying how unexpected it was for them and they must have had a lot of work to come up with such a plan. Then the man's face changed to a frantic one in an instant, as he said that since they were all here, they would all experience the beauty of freefall together. The dumbfounded BC captain did not understand what the words of the hero meant, from whom neither fear nor doubt reeked as if he knew everything. But the man declared that this was the body here, after all, he hadn't gotten his spear back yet, after which he immediately raised his hand up. If you use the same amount of aura when throwing and returning, the weapon will fly back at the same speed as when it was launched. At this time, the enemy didn't understand what the man was saying, but was already visibly tense, realizing that their plan was going downhill. The spears stabbed into the ground and the floor beneath their feet began to crack, and all the players, including the YSM team, began to fly down. All of the hero's allies didn't know in advance that this was going to happen, so they shouted to their principal that there was a psycho, a maniac, and a lunatic. Before the game, the past coach yelled to the principal that he knew he was the coolest superhuman on the planet. But is that really necessary? William asked him to take it easy and listen carefully, for he must realize that he had it all figured out. Because of the specific structure of the bridges, it is easy to stumble and die from a fall, and the enemy will try to exploit this. The coach replied that if the bridge collapsed, their team would also fall down, and it was unknown whether they would be lucky enough to fall on any other bridge. After which the character spoke that bridge number 569 is an illusion, 13 is real, 121 is real, 677 is an illusion, 518 is decrepit, 428 is real and bridge number 888 is stuffed with traps, at which time the coach asked how the director was able to memorize absolutely all the bridges, to which the man only got angry that the coach chose to question his plans, then asked if he could shake up the kids. And now, during the game, the YSM team was able to land on real bridges, which didn't escape the commentator's gaze. However, the hero watched his opponents, noticing how well they were flying, but they needed a little help with that. And while all the opponents flew down, missing the bridges, illusions, the hero caught up with them by jumping on the walls, wanting to take them for himself. Smiling and picking a target, he asked who he would start with, for he didn't want all the opponents to just fall off a cliff. Without thinking long, the man took a few more jumps before abruptly tearing downward, spotting his first target. He said that Uncle William was very kind, would not let them die a foolish death, and advised them not to be afraid of striking the ground, for there would be none. The six he would definitely finish off while still in the air, and with that, he began to take out his spears and immediately put them into action. Without thinking, he began to throw projectiles, hits the target, which because of the free fall could not dodge the spear. The man was now flying alongside several rivals who were in no way able to group together in flight. Unlike the man, knowing in advance where the real bridges were, William clung to the handrails of the bridges, thereby slowing his fall and making it easier to get around. Toward the end of the fall, for the opponents was getting closer and closer, but the hero could not let them all fall just like that, so once again pushed off the wall. Wasting no time, the man rushed into action, committing three murders, followed by a fourth. The commentators were simply delighted. William destroyed his opponents one by one, listening to the voices of the commentators. I imagine what kind of show he was able to put on for the audience. It wasn't over yet, though. 
The man pushed off the handrail as if it were the edge of a ring, rushing forward incredibly fast. Closest to another opponent, the man announced that it was time for the final part of his aerial show, namely wall surfing. Inserting the spear into his opponent's chest, the hero stood on it with his feet and began rolling down the wall, humiliating his opponent as much as possible. After riding it for a short distance, the man left it on the bridge and bounced off, jumping to the bottom of the location, leaving his opponent to die. Heading to the lowest point, the man spotted several people from the opposite team who were still alive. His eyes lit up and he smiled, asking that they didn't die and even managed to land successfully, to which he was genuinely surprised. BC tensed when they saw the hero, but it was clear from their eyes that they were not going to give up, intending to fight to the end. But this further irritated the man, who smiled evilly and declared that it was their turn to follow their comrades. They all began to attack William, who held his spears in both hands, easily fending off every blow from his opponent. He circled around them, thinking they had overestimated themselves. After all, it was obvious the guys had been practicing, but that and no way to help. Proving it, William caught the enemy's attacks with his bare hands, thinking about how it was much easier to catch a human than a demon. Not in the next second, he severed his opponent's head, causing the rest of his comrades to bounce back with a spear thrust. Dumbfounded commentators shouted that William had already earned seven kills, acting alone while his team was catching their breath. However, that wasn't the end of it, after which the man, in one leap, was on top of another opponent, thrusting his spear into his chest. Another kill was added to his account, and at the same time he was being attacked from above by two more opponents who had lost all hope. Their attack passed them by, for the hero did a somersault while evading the sharp blades, but he wasn't going to get too far away. He was still in an unfinished somersault, placing his hands on the ground and bending his knees, waiting for one of his opponents to attack. It didn't take long, and as soon as the man spotted his foe, he immediately straightened his legs, hitting him right in the chin, taking him out of the battle. But he wanted to finish him off right away, but sensed another opponent getting close to him, trying to be stealthy. Coming at the hero from behind, the guy hoped to attack stealthily, thus earning at least one kill for his team. However, William's kill counter only increased as he turned around and saw new attackers who wished to massacre him. But from this, the man shivered and smiled, asking them if they knew why they were able to. But all because they are so retarded that the hero just didn't notice them, after which he decided to end a great performance. A couple seconds later, he watched the remaining opponents disappear, the commentators chanting about the 11 kills. The end of the second round came, leaving William standing alone in a spot in which he had just been surrounded by several opponents. Commenters shouted that the man was able to single-handedly massacre an entire BC team, adding that the man was not human. Well, sure, William had already shown them a clean win at a charity match, but now it was an official game. The audience and fans were excited to shout his name, that he was an undefeated legend, and they were also excited about the single-handed kill. At the end of the match, the man remarked that it was nothing special, but Lisa said it was the first all-kill in Korean League history, after which she added that so far there have not yet been any players who could easily pull something like this off. To which the hero replied that he could have beaten a team from the first division, because at the charity match there were guys from the top league. And he even felt sorry for the BC team, because they were like children who had been sent to fight with adults, and now they looked very depressed. William smiled and said he would leave them alone, to which he heard the girl ask if he was going to miss round three after all. Suddenly, Gabriel approached them, saying that the opposing team was morally broken, so he would put players who had little experience in battles. But the team director smiled, saying it wasn't a bad idea. If they were going to lose, he would go in the fifth round. To which the maximally calm coach only nodded, asking the man not to worry, for he was sure of something. Namely that it wouldn't happen, after which the man in glasses clenched his hand into a fist, showing faith in his new team. And so it happened, because the winners of the third round were the YSM team, which completely crushed their opponents even without the strongest player. After the game, William was decided to have a formal but short interview, asking him how he views his progress in today's game. The smiling hero replied that everything was great, as they were able to completely ruin their opponent's plans without much effort. He also added that they saw everything themselves, but he didn't show half of what he was capable of, which makes him feel slightly guilty. 
That is why he did not take the field after the second round, to which the reporter replied that the opposing team appreciated him for that. And then she asked if he had anything to say to their next opponent, the SP team, to which she immediately got a yes. Coughing, the hero smirked evilly, declaring to his would-be opponents, pointing his finger at the camera, that they didn't stand a chance. After the interview, they heard fans chanting their team name while the commentators announced the final score of the game. It was a clean win for YSM, and William showed the world the incredible range of his spear and made the first ever all-kill in an official match. This team is unstoppable, and therefore they were confident of their victory when the second game against SP started. And once they started, the hero's tactics were about the same as the first game, so he tried to stay away. He was making his trademark long-distance shot, which the commentators were abruptly saying, marvelling at the man's skills. For as he said in his interview, SP never had a chance, causing the hero to earn three kills and seven assists in the first round. When they went to the break, the spectator stands shouted his name loudly, and he responded to the audience with a wave of his hand. He earned eight kills and two assists in the second round before the second playoff game ends William's resounding success. The internet was all about this match, and one player specifically, and according to People, he was the strongest in the universe. At the same time, in the office of the owners of the Lumiere Club, someone was yelling that another one was not expected of him, and it was amazing. As they watched the video, the man asked how he came up with such a long-distance throwing technique and why he hid his talents for so long. Johnny is only a sapper, his abilities are definitely not great, but how William has adapted his superpowers is mind-boggling. He had no idea that visual telepathy could be used like that, and if they wanted to see William throw in their club, they needed to bring him here. But the Moreau brothers said in unison that it was a small thing compared to the opportunity to get a player like William. After all, this throwback will become a true trademark, and thanks to countless fans, they will be able to appreciate its greatness in monetary terms as well. His shot is just something with something, and they owe it to William to see him play in their team's uniform, and therefore need to give it their best effort. After all, he had once said he wouldn't take part in the battle of the superhumans, they couldn't hope to get him on the team. But now, even though it's Division 2, William still joined the professional league as an official player. Which means, and he can be recruited as a player if they are motivated enough to do so, but it will be worth it. Of course, many teams will want to invite him, but they are willing to give absolutely any money just to get the hero of humanity. And at the same time in Berlin, Germany, a man walked into an upscale building, telling an acquaintance that he was very busy and it was difficult to see him. That man was Berlin Lightning Club owner John Berman, and Emre came to him because of player recruitment. The director responded that since he was going to personally discuss the topic with him, it meant a pretty serious and major transition, to which the bearded man with the most serious face replied that he wanted to hire William, with whom he had fought side by side before. There are countless teams in the battle of superhumans, but out of all of them, three main ones particularly stand out. The Moreau Brothers Club, along with Mike and Chi Chi, are the core of the team the all-star cast creating a game that is admired by millions. Their unbreakable tandem is ready to destroy every rival who dares to lay claim to their first place. The second team is Team USA, a strong defensive team centered by Gerald, who has discovered a second wind after the shield change. Also a team coached by one of the seven saviors, the strategy Emre has developed is flawless, suppressing the opponent. All three are eternally vying for the right to be called the strongest, with Paris Lumiere and Berlin Lightning irreconcilable. And now John Berman is thinking about Emery wanting to buy William, because they can't pass up an opportunity like this. To which the director replied that he is constantly improvising during the match, and something like this will spoil their whole strategy. Plus, it's no secret that William and Emery have always been like a cat and dog who were always bickering with each other. Even when there was a raid, the last dungeon, one would say to go, to which the other would reply that it was suicide. The rest of us watched them as if they were watching a performance, for it was already 151 arguments between two people, which entertained quite well. All is well during normal times, but as soon as it comes to dungeons, these two are ready to tear each other's throats out. John said that William doesn't recognize anything authoritative, so the coach is not his boss, and therefore they will do without him. Still, they are one of the strongest teams that have been able to achieve multiple wins without resorting to improvisation. 
Emra wasn't sure about the headmaster's words, however, and tried to find an argument that could change his mind. He said the Lightning lost to Lumiere in the World Champions League in 21 and finished just second. In the 22nd, history repeated itself. They again missed the victory and ended up second, which the director already looked at differently. And before 2020 were on equal footing with them, they had the same number of wins in the Champions League. But they started to lose ground. The gap between the teams is widening, and even the New York Bears are gaining momentum, which John couldn't agree more. Because of this, Emra added that if they miss out on William, he will most likely be bought out by Lumiere, and it will go to them specifically. The director decided that the man would continue to play for Korea, as it is doubtful that he could be active in the European League. Closing his eyes, one of the heroes replied that he'd like to think so too, but William would be better off in the big leagues. He didn't doubt it for a second, and was even willing to bet the principal that it would be just as he said. Sighing heavily, the director realized what his best player was getting at, then asked what the price of the matter was. With a confident tone, the man replied that they needed to beat the Moreau brothers at the auction, so they would need 180 million euros. John lost the last drops of calm after hearing the figure Emery had given, not wanting to believe it. Whereupon he flinched and immediately jumped up from his chair, loudly interjecting the amount he had just named. At the same time, the YSM team was beginning its long-awaited season playoff finale against the Ocean Empire team. William himself was involved in this game, which made the team expect a 100% playoff win. But despite the importance of the match, there is no excitement among the players and spectators, because everyone was maximally prepared. Other teams thought it was time to prepare for next season as the battles ahead would be much tougher. Now the main question of the match was how to defeat William, who had already entered the field in the first round. And once the round was over, the hero earned 11 kills, thanks to which he brought victory for his team in the beginning. Gabriel then stated that he had had enough of one round, but he wanted to participate in at least a second round. On the coach stated that he would like to test some things. Their team doesn't have a lot of experience, so they need to get some. The hero immediately agreed with this because we must use any chance, and he himself will return after the second or third round. There have been some big changes in the main YSM lineup. You can see the field Norman is out along with Quentin, complementing each other. Norman has moved to the sub-tank position, and it is worth noting that he is highly skilled in leadership and tactics. Raised his strength to 85, surpassing Norman to become a main tank, as his agility and speed reached the limit and his aura reached 81. The resilient and powerful Quentin goes up front, while Norman is put in the back to close gaps in the defense because he sees the picture better. Thus Quentin turned into a player who could easily play in the first division of the Battle of the Superhumans. The principal was showily praising them, while the coach stated that their strengths had finally been revealed. Notice that as a sub-tank, Quentin and Mill has a stupid habit of doubting what to do, defend or attack. All because he's been a DD for a long time, and if he doesn't have a clear role, the old habit will show itself again in the worst way. The principal also wondered about Norman's reasoning, at which time Gabriel paused to ponder the answer. Overstayed on a weak team, so he thinks that if he survives, everything will be fine, because of which he plays with the principle of patience. Such moments he begins to grab only some separate important moments, they become not to think over tactics. The coach then remarked that Johnny was very suited to the role of team tactician, just as the director had read, then asked what his secret was. To which the heroes replied that he used to personally recruit his own people for each dungeon raid, and there was no permanent team. Traitors, cowards, fools, he'd seen a lot of guys, it was a fun time, but that's how he'd learned to understand people. Maybe Gabriel will also start reading people like an open book when he gains experience, but the coach only said he'll try. He also added that once Johnny has honed his tactical skills, he could be appointed as their team's chief tactician. As suddenly, the man sitting behind them raised his hand, telling the principal that he was interested in a question. They were approached by the team's past coach, which the hero wasn't very happy about, and the man didn't understand why he was being treated that way. She why he said they are getting more and more transfer requests from a lot of different clubs, but they are not selling anyone. After all, player prices will skyrocket when they move up to the first division. But the man clarified that the transfer was requested for him. William was surprised when he heard that he was to be hired by a famous foreign club, and we are talking about more than 100 billion won. 
Gabriel advised him to go to Paris, but the hero said they'd rather make a prestigious team out of YSM. Interior has stated that they must become the best in Asia, but this could well be achieved without his help. However, they will not be able to win the World Championship because it is no longer possible to win the World Tournament alone. The hero was a bit frustrated, as he admitted that when it comes to international games, he didn't have full confidence. He then suggested hiring strong foreign players, but the coach doubted that such would go to Korea. After all, there are a lot of things to consider, starting with the basics. Team level, conditions, pay, accommodation, and more. At best, they can hire a promising but still unknown player, but the chance of development in the Korean league is slim. The hero then asked what he needed to do to make Korea unrivaled in battle, to which he received Gabriel's affirmative answer. By selling it now, they will be able to secure their supply of equipment, maintain it, and allow them to attract good players. All of this would be regardless of their position in the league, but William decided that this was not a decision that could be made hastily. Especially since right now they have more important things to do, namely the last rounds of playoff games that will decide the winner. Things are going more or less smoothly, their nuggets are certainly strong, but the Ocean Empire outclasses them in skills. One round they won, but then these Aquaphiles picked themselves up and got their fighting spirit back, because of which they were able to take two rounds. They were originally a Division I team, even though they fell out of it, but the purpose of this game is to select decent players. Gabriel immediately said that the director would have to try a little harder, and the man immediately replied that he wouldn't blink an eye. Glancing at the headmaster, Gabriel noticed that he stood out in the crowd, which meant big changes were coming soon and no one knows how much the world ranking of the superhuman battle will change with his arrival. Right now, it was more important this game. After all, it will determine the winner of the playoff season, who can advance to Division 1 by getting into a serious league. William selected seven core players with the remaining candidates they recontracted. After winning the playoffs, three went to the second division, one to the first, because of which they were able to make a lot of money. Gabriel presented the records to William, saying that they had sold four players in total, for which they received a very tidy sum. The director asked that they have gotten more than they originally planned, and there is a result of them working on weaknesses, after which he stated that it was urgent to replenish the playing squad, to which the coach A began to list the necessary players. They need one fast sub-tank, as much maimed as possible, and most importantly, a range DD with high accuracy. Lisa is pretty good at this, on the damage she deals isn't that great, and in a high-level fight, every hit counts. However, the director had already made a small list, asking the coach to look at it later and complete it, and he himself would check it later. The two coaches were surprised that the hero had prepared the list in advance, which made them very curious about who he put in there. One of the men reacted calmly while the past coach opened his eyes wide with shock, stammering after which he cringed, wondering if the principal was serious about doing this and was going to hire this guy. In response to this, William only smiled, pointing his finger at the coach, then replied that this type was a great fit for them. The next day, William decided to go to meet a potentially interesting player he wanted to recruit to the team. He recalled Gabriel's words to go to Paris, because by getting a lot of money for him, they would be able to attract players. The hero realized that the coach was right, and it was pointless to argue, after which he thought about whether to go to the Paris Lumiere. All these thoughts gave him a headache, but first he needed to figure out how to promote his own team. As expected, Gabriel unmistakably pointed to the position he thought he needed, namely ranged DD. As principal, William watched quite a few games of the second half of the season and then drew conclusions. First Division, Second Division, Seventh Division, Asia, Eastern Europe and Latin America, they don't have the best attitude towards players. With all of this in mind, William's list of the most interesting players in his opinion came out. A total of 29 players were selected to play against other teams, and with that roster, William wanted to fill out the roster. He was now at Seong Hoon High School, wondering if there was a guy named Kim among their students. However, the past coach was annoyed to say that this guy had already managed to sign with the Two Star Spirits team. The hero was familiar with this team, and also knew that from them forever they are trouble, and wine, and to them their director. They crossed this guy off the list, after which William asked what about Trevor, since they're bound to wipe them out. The chubby man rubbed the back of his head, replying that this young man had already retired, which the headmaster was surprised at, since he was a high school student. 
but it was all about his parents owning a few buildings in Kanama, which made the guy decide not to be a player. After that, the hero turned around, saying that he had nothing more to do here, and therefore only waved his hand, saying goodbye to the coach. The man stared after the hero, trying to figure out what was going on in his head while deciding to address it. He asked him to wait, after which he said there was a kid he wanted to recommend to him. The guy's name was Marcus, and he graduated last year, but the heroes wondered why he hadn't gotten a job with some team. But immediately he heard the reply that he was still considering whether to stay in the battle at all. It was this statement that attracted William. The coach heard that the guy got involved with bad company but as a player he's pretty capable, the main thing is to find an approach. Scratching his ear, the hero replied that he wasn't into recycling, but they had already lost two candidates. Especially if the coach recommends it means that the guy can be made into a good player, which was a hero. Well all of a sudden the man asked if the coach realized that if the kid died in his hands, it would be all legal. The man tensed, but replied that he understood and asked him to take care of him, adding that Marcus was different from those bullies. Hearing the man's request, William decided to make an exception and step away from the list, taking a chance on trusting a co-worker. Now he can judge a player just by looking at him and immediately know if he is good, obedient, or a bully. Coach didn't back down, saying that although Marcus is at a crossroads right now due to family circumstances, he is truly talented. William asked what his position was, to which he heard he was a melee dealer. Hearing the answer, he was surprised at the pleasant coincidence. Whereupon the hero agreed and smiled, pointing his finger at the man, asking where the guy was now. At this time in the computer club, one of the attendees was shouting loudly to the entire room about how people don't know how to play at all. He was very much attracting the attention of the other visitors by swearing loudly, sparing no rich vocabulary. All of a sudden, one of the guys was approached, saying that these assholes don't know how to play at all, causing him to turn around. The disgruntled Marcus only looked away, replying that they were apparently dumb as corks, and therefore it was useless to argue with such. Suddenly, an administrator of the establishment approached one of the rowdy players, causing the high school student to look away from the game. An older man asked if he could be a little quieter here, as his shouting was disturbing others, and smoking was not allowed here. This didn't please the guy above the receptionist, who replied that they were of legal age, so it was okay to smoke. The man wanted to clarify that there was a sign forbidding it, but he didn't have time, because the guy's hand had already reached out to him. Pushing the older man away, the huge schoolboy asked if the old man was looking for death. But the man said nothing, falling fearfully to the floor. The arrogant guy said that behind his back is a superhuman, and if he goes against him, he will fly off with one blow. Hearing this, Marcus only turned his head away, asking his comrade to sit down and calm down so as not to provoke conflict. Putting out his cigarette butt, the huge high school student replied that he would sit down, because that's what the superhuman, with whom it's best not to be pulled, had asked. But along with that, he wrinkled his face and asked the old man to disappear, and not to mess with him anymore, causing the administrator to get scared. After a while, the owner of the establishment grimaced as he regarded the sore hand on which the cigarette had been brazenly extinguished. He did not know what would become of the country because of such scoundrels and when his club had managed to become a den for such rabble. He didn't hear a man come up to him and ask if this is where the bad kids hang out playing games. Upon seeing the unexpected guest, the receptionist fell into a stupor, disbelief that the very hero who could help him stood before him. In the meantime, the teens continued to play, shouting loudly, plying each other with insults and barbs. They were so focused on the game that they didn't notice a man walking up to them, who put his hand on one of the guy's shoulder. The young man didn't like being distracted in such a brazen way, but at the same time he scrambled out of his chair without waiting for an explanation. William purposely put on his helmet so no one could see his face and then examined Marcus, saying that he really wasn't bad. The dazed boy turned his head in his direction, not expecting to see the stranger, for he had not even heard him approach after which the whole company paid attention to his person. I, the most impudent of them, declared that the uncle had got something wrong. Answering nothing, the hero swung his hand, sending the mouse right into the face of the guy who first raised his voice. It was enough to make him pass out and fall face first onto the keyboard, leaving the others in shock. Without lowering his hand, the man declared that it was horrible and disrespectful, for he was no friend or brother to them. He then asked if they had decided to hit on him, while the guys asked each other where the psycho was coming from. 
Approaching them, the man said he had hoped not to attract attention, even had his helmet on, but he can't get past a bunch of rude people. He snatched a cigarette from one of the boys, nudging him with his elbow, asking if they'd been taught in school how to talk to their elders. But not hearing the answer, the hero knocked out the red-haired guy with a single blow, putting out the cigarette he had snatched from his hands. He whereupon the man pointed to a sign, saying it said no smoking, and immediately ordered them to read it. And at that very second, a kid decided to attack him from behind, swinging a keyboard, aiming right at the man's head. There was a loud slap and the keys flew apart, unable to withstand such abuse. The smirking guy who dared to attack the hero loudly declared that this would be the case for anyone who went against them. But suddenly he froze, realizing he couldn't do any damage, and the next second he was flying across the room. When William saw the young man lying unconscious, his nose bleeding, he said tiredly that he wanted to do it the right way. However, the teenagers started it themselves, and therefore it is self-defense on his part, after which he clenched his hand tightly into a fist. The boys stared dumbfounded at the man who had easily scattered their comrades, not knowing what to do. But the man only got more heated, saying that since they don't know how to choose their friends, I'll take collective responsibility. However, the boys gathered themselves together and began to unclench their fists, and one of them snatched up a bowie knife, glaring threateningly at the man. After that, two of them rushed at the hero, not even realizing what awaited them, because now they threw away the instinct of self-preservation. Nothing attacked only Marcus, who noticed the eyes under his helmet and realized that somewhere he had seen them before. He then realized who was standing in front of them and immediately decided to stop his comrades, asking them not to mess with him. For then it would be the end of everyone, but it was too late. The teenagers started swinging their fists and weapons. But such a demonstration made the man smile wider and wider, realizing he needed to be extra careful. After all, they're just kids he could easily kill if he uses a little more power than he needs to. He wasn't about to go gentle with them either, however, and then he reached up to the face of one of the guys who was swinging his fists wide. In one easy motion, the hero dropped him to the floor without even moving, showing that they were no match for him. The other guy was running at him with a knife, yelling at him to die, but there was uncertainty in his voice. The young man was already a step away from William, who had no intention of dodging, keeping as calm as possible. Just as suddenly he swung his palm in a palm-swooping motion, saying it was too easy, for it was an obvious and open attack. The knife didn't even have time to touch the hero's clothes before the guy was immediately swept away by a single slap that sent him spinning. As he fell to the floor, the red-haired high school senior lost consciousness, and the man remained standing where he had originally been. After which he removed his helmet, asked Marcus why they shouldn't chat when all barriers to this conversation have been passed. The dumbfounded guy immediately called William by name. The latter replied that he was aware of his name, after which he said hello to the guy. While they were getting acquainted, they were watched by a hidden girl who had her phone out, live streaming. In a whisper, she began to address the audience, asking them if they were watching carefully, for there was such a commotion going on right now. That guy in the helmet scattered a bunch of guys like kittens, then in an excited voice she clarified that it was William. An hour later, the man sat in the same computer club and asked the teens if they had thought about their behavior. All the guys sat in a respectful bow, shivering with fear, hoping the hero wouldn't do anything more to them. Hearing no answer, he repeated his question, whereupon all four of them broke into a commotion, answering loudly what they thought. However, William declared that it's not like they're going to become new people just because they got whipped. However, this answer did not satisfy the man, whereupon he jumped up from his chair, deciding to prescribe the young ones a couple more times. After all the teens were sprawled out on the floor, completely exhausted, William asked to take everyone down except Marcus. In the same second, he pointed his index finger at everyone, adding that they should not even think of running away from here, but kneel down and crawl. He then turned to Marcus, asking why he was allowing himself to smoke in an inappropriate place, to which he heard an apology. The man concluded that since he had something to regret, he could use a couple more lessons, but the guy didn't understand the statement. While he was trying to think of something, he was immediately hit in the stomach by a hero punch that decided to knock all the spirit out of the boy. Folding his hand into a fist, he stated that the feeling was just a plague. It was because he was more of a super than an ordinary person. While the teen tried to suck in some air, thinking the man was just crazy, 
The guy didn't understand what was going on and what this William was doing here. It was also unclear how he knew him. Coughing, Marcus tried to rise to his knees, telling the man that he thought he understood what he had come here to do. And then he asked if the coach had told him about this club, to which he heard a serious affirmative answer from the hero. Rubbing his cheek, Marcus said the man had come for nothing, and he wasn't going to join the battle, no matter how much he was urged. William listened to the guy, and then offered to talk seriously, but the guy said he didn't want to, and there was nothing to talk about. As he sat down on the table, the young man desperately wondered if the man would brazenly beat him just because he didn't want to play. But rumor has it that William doesn't resort to violence for no reason, plus he saved humanity at the cost of his own life. The hero again asked the guy to give him some time, to which he heard a negative answer and a request to leave. Such speeches did not please the man, after which he grabbed the guy by his blouse, saying that he was swatting him away like a fly. As the boy tried to justify himself, William punched him in the stomach again, throwing him back several meters. As the guy flew, he angrily thought about the fact that the dignity of the hero of humanity goes to hell because it simply does not exist. He then grabbed the guy's leg while he was unconscious and dragged him toward the exit, saying they would talk privately. Turning his head, the hero noticed a girl crawling away from him who was holding a selfie stick that had a phone attached. After seeing her equipment, the hero asked her to delete her photos and videos, adding he didn't want to waste any more energy on her. The girl guiltily replied that there were no files in the recordings because there was an internet stream going on and right now there was a live stream. He asked what her name was. She immediately replied that her name was Pretty Nari, clarifying that it was just such a nickname. When asked why she was streaming here, Nari replied that such a condition, streaming in a club with a skank, would cause her to get 10,000 stars. William didn't understand what the girl was talking about or what stars were in the speech. Then he looked at his phone with interest. When he got in the shot, viewers immediately started writing a ton of comments in his honor, including enthusiastic and funny ones. Just as suddenly, the phone screen glowed with multicolored lights, proclaiming that the beautiful Nari had been transferred 10,000 stars. The girl's eyes glazed over as she began to thank some sayonara, while the man still didn't understand what was going on. The girl then started dancing something weird, saying it was her sincere reaction to 10,000 stars. But at the time, commentators wrote that William was in culture shock and his facial expression was priceless. He then asked if 10,000 of these things were worth like a million real ones, to which he was told there was a commission. Nari also clarified that her family lives off streaming money and she does whatever she can to earn money to pay bills and eat. The hero looked in amazement at the young girl and the way she struts around talking about how she makes a living. He remembered himself as a young man and the question from the older knight as to whether he was too young to come to a dangerous dungeon. But the cocky William replied that he had nowhere else to go, for to survive he must seize every opportunity. While the girls were donating 100 or 1,000 stars each, the same Sayonara sent another 10,000, making the phone sparkle. Upon seeing this, Nari cried out, nearly fainting, in passing thanking the generous viewer for another 10,000 stars. Looking at the girl dumbfounded, the man chuckled nervously, saying that she was just crazy for doing such a thing. Suddenly, the phone screen popped up to say that the broadcast was over, and the girl thought she had run out of charge. Suddenly, there was an unexpected call that Nari couldn't have expected because it was the receptionist from America TV calling. Undeterred, she picked up the phone, quickly answering the questions the man on the other end of the line was asking her. A few seconds later, the girl shrieked, interjecting why she was blocked and not allowed to stream for three months. Her voice immediately began to shake while William looked at her in surprise, asking what was wrong. She replied that the site admin said she was blocked for three months for showing violence, which is a violation. The hero decided to remedy this situation by asking for the girl's phone for a moment while she looked at him incredulously. The man repeated the request, holding out his hand, for he wanted to help so that she would not lose her only income. He immediately snatched the phone, asking if they were running the site, then introduced himself and asked why Small was being blocked. He was told that violence was shown during the stream, after which the man asked if they were talking about a fresh broadcast, then asked again if they thought public punishment of bullies was something to be condemned for. He then added that they would have to answer for their words because he was on his way on top of which he decided to clarify his name. 
Startled, the voice replied that they held an emergency meeting and decided that the girl streaming the fight was not intentional. And so they decided to issue a warning and also asked to observe decency in the future to avoid violence. Hearing this request, William looked at the unconscious boy he was still holding tightly by the leg. Responding with firm consent, he let the young man go, politely promising to try not to do such a thing again and on live TV. As she handed the girl back her phone, she was genuinely pleased to notice her viewers started writing surprised comments again. She started to say that she had actually been issued a ban just now, but Mr. William had talked to the site administrator and resolved everything. Viewers were immediately surprised that there really would be no punishment, and the hero of humanity was able to cope with the three-month ban. The annoyed man asked why they were having so much fun. Couldn't they also laugh if it happened to them? But suddenly he changed the subject, saying that he would like to apologize for the commotion caused by his parenting methods. And with this person, they would resolve all issues in normal conversation, and he hoped there would be no more misunderstandings. He also appealed to journalists, if they watched the streamings and thought of writing an article, let them not forget to mention his apology. And why did he ask Nari to turn off the broadcast if that one also ended with explanations? The girl also said goodbye. She then thanked the man, because thanks to him she didn't get banned and the broadcast came out just fine. As they were alone with Marcus, the hero said that no one would interfere now, so he asked them to tell him what the problem was. The young man replied that he had a difficult situation in his family. The money his mom earns her barely enough for them to live on. But the hero noticed that the guy did not tell about his father, asking what he does, hearing that he drinks and gambles. Having begun to understand the whole situation, the man clarified that only his mother worked, to which he heard an affirmative answer. Then he grabbed the guy by the pecs, told him he was just like his father because, although he doesn't drink, he sits in his pants. He sits in the computer club all day long, smoking like a locomotive and playing with toys, which the boy guiltily agreed with. William didn't calm down and continued to lash out at the guy, forcing him to think hard about the truth he'd heard. Then asked if he wanted to go back to fighting and become a professional player, or if he intended to continue living his life. These words made Marcus hesitate, after which he turned to William uncertainly, trying to choose the right words. Why he shouted loudly and confidently that he had left the battle was not because he wanted to, it was just the opposite. He really misses the matches and training that made him feel really good about himself. Such an answer surprised the hero, and he decided to find out what truth lies behind the hooligan behavior of this guy. Marcus said that when he first started his career as a player, while his mom was away from home, his dad got drunk and accidentally set their house on fire. His grandparents then almost died in a fire and he had to give up training to take care of them. But contrary to such a sad story, the man asked if he always talked so much, after which he asked him to hurry up and finish. He decided to ask the ultimate question whether the guy would play or not, to which he immediately heard an affirmative answer. However, the guy had one condition. He wanted his father to quit drinking so the hero would teach him a lesson just like he taught the guy a lesson today. After finishing with Marcus, William traveled to another high school to find one very talented player. In front of him sat a young guy named Jin, who possessed two rather useful superpowers for a tank. But for a tank, he has a low strength score of barely 80 willpower 91, agility 81, stamina 88. It was exactly the fast sub-tank Gabriel was looking for, so the man asked what the guy thought its specialty was. He replied that he doesn't have too much strength, so he supplements his defense with a shield. He also has pretty good technique. The hero replied that from now on he would raise him as a mobile sub-tank representing their country. Jean excitedly exclaimed that he was joining, to which the man said they would be sure to contact him next week. Taking the signed contract in his hands, the hero headed for the exit, bidding farewell to his new player, and the latter reciprocated. The young man could not believe whether it was a dream or reality, because the offer and what a proposal from the second division team. But suddenly William came back and asked if the guy had any personal problems that needed urgent attention. He clarified that maybe someone in the family needed a good whipping or something, but he said no. The hero's next destination was a billiard club where he wanted to find one person, but not a player. Opening the door signs, he said hello to everyone, while looking around at all the similar-looking men present. Everyone immediately clamored, recognizing the hero, one of them saying that they had recently heard on the news that they were in trouble in their neighborhood. William only smiled, saying that since they had already heard everything, there was no need to explain. 
He then asked which one of them was Marcus's father, after which the men began to beckon to the very man William was looking for as well. A stupefied man came out to him, unbuttoned white shirt, who stated that Marcus was his son, and also asked what he needed. The character asked if it was true that after he got married, he ran his own business for five years. Afterward, he started drinking and gambling. He then clapped his hands, congratulating the man for making his son a worthy professional player. For a few seconds, Marcus's father tried to understand what the hero was talking about, interjecting that his son was a professional athlete. The hero then smiled broadly, saying that this was the reason he had come to fulfill the wish of such a wonderful person. Others present also began congratulating the man, saying it was worth a drink, and he should be toasting to it. Marcus's father then decided to ask what the wish was, to which he heard the reply that it was nothing special. William pulled a bottle out of the bag, saying that Marcus had asked him to pass him an invigorating and healing shake. Rushing forward, he swung the bottle, declaring that it was to stop him from making friends with the green snake. After which an incredible amount of blows showered down on the poor man, who had not expected something like this. He bravely endured each new blow, trying to keep himself conscious and not scream from the pain he was feeling. But suddenly, William smashed the bottle against the pool table, realizing he'd gotten too into his taste, but needed to finish the job. Ignited with anger, the hero stated that while he was walking, he was thinking of ways to make the man truly quit drinking. And then it dawned on him that a man must be scared to death to even just look at the bottle, much less drink it. He then turned to the rest of the audience, asking how close they were to the man, but no one understood the question. He clarified that they wanted to say they just sat back and watched their friend abandon his family and just drink and play cards for 15 years. If that's the case, they're trash like him, which means the hero will have a couple of prophylactic blows for them each. In the same second, all the visitors were startled and flushed, leaving Father Marcus sitting on his knees, alone with William. However, that was far from the end, after which he picked up a new bottle from the bar, determined to continue beating the poor man. Hero clarified that Pop was born in 77 and he was born a year earlier, then asked if he would call him Senior. The man didn't understand what William meant, but the man went to the door and closed it immediately, saying it was no big deal. Holding back a smile and grinning broadly, the hero added that he was the older man in the yard who had decided to teach him a lesson. For the next few minutes, heartbreaking screams and sounds of beating came from the room and descended on the man. A little later, outside the family father's apartment building, a dazed wife was asking what had happened to her husband. William brought the shabby man home, asking if they were the gentleman's family. The second, everyone marveled at the hero. The parents asked what he had done with their son, to which they received the answer that he had given a preventive talk about the harm of alcohol. He then put his arm around the battered man and asked if he would touch the bottle again, to which he heard an affirmative answer. But a sincere answer was not enough, whereupon William's eyes lit up and he asked if he would gamble. Scared to death and trembling, Marcus's father began to agree repeatedly, hoping he wouldn't be beaten. The hero then turned to his elder parents, saying that their son was on the verge of life and death because the latter had beaten him badly. But he was healed by a superhuman with healing ability, so nothing to worry about, he was only slightly shaken up. William smiled genuinely, saying that if their boy started getting behind the collar again, have them call him right away. A while later, the hero asked Marcus if his prophylaxis had worked, to which the latter replied in the affirmative. And whereupon the man declared that since he had kept his promise, let the fellow take the contract with him tomorrow and come to the office. The guy didn't expect it to happen so quickly, however. He hasn't played in a while, so he needs time to get in shape. Excited for a new chance at life, Marcus joyfully said goodbye to the principal that they would see each other tomorrow. At this time in the YSM office, a past coach was asking why this player was being considered by the director. Gabriel replied that he was underestimated because of his mental issues, but the kid's physical abilities weren't bad. However, one thing that kept the man on his toes was that this athlete and their principal did not get along as well as possible, to the point of conflict. That same night, an incredible number of people gathered in one of the clubs to dance to pop music. In one corner where the tables were, one of the guys clinked his glass loudly, saying he was really pissed off about the whole thing. It feels like something is missing in his life, and despite his talent, their team's performance is just awful. Two of his comrades immediately began to calm the nervous guy, saying that such a player like him still to be found. 
but then only stood up and fumbling asked to let him pass, when asked where he was going, and did not get the answer that to the toilet. They started whispering that they were afraid the jerk was going to get into something again, and even considered going after him. Closing his eyes, the blonde-haired boy walked down the corridor, cursing quietly under his breath, not understanding why he deserved such a fate. When an unknown man walked towards him, the drunken guy irritably stated that it was all because of William. After all, this asshole said to remove him from the national team. After that, everything fell apart and began to crumble. But at the same second, a man whose face was hidden by a cap, glasses, and a mask shoved the hesitant boy. Dropping him to the floor, they familiarized themselves back, quickly apologizing while the blonde-haired guy slowly got up. Seeing the stranger silently walking away while humming a motif, the guy got very angry, shouting loudly to the pushing man. Still on his knees, he ordered the stranger to stand while he obeyed and abruptly froze. In an irritated tone, the blonde stated that the man had hit him with his shoulder, now wanting to run away, then asked if the man knew who he was. But the stranger only silently turned around and looked at the drunken man, deliberately showing that his face was completely hidden. The blonde only thought irritably that he couldn't even get a good look at his face, not realizing who had let him into the club in the first place. Slowly removing his glasses, the stranger asked if he was addressing him, causing the guy sitting on his knees to stiffen. The voice sounded very familiar to him, after which the man took off his mask, saying that it had been a long time since anyone had thrown a charge at him. After all, he had already begun to forget the feeling, but seeing the face of the stealthy man, a full-blown fear immediately came over the blonde man. He recognized William but didn't understand what he was doing here, and the man stated that he could hear the screws in his head squeaking from here. However, it was time to call it a day, and after those words, a hero's fist flew into the blonde's face, which the tipsy guy couldn't have expected. It was enough to completely knock his opponent out, willing him to take him to a secluded place and have a word. But at the same second... Two men approached them and decided to call out to their comrade, but he did not respond. Whereupon they froze abruptly, recognizing William, and did not know how to act or what to do, as they suddenly heard the question whether they were with him. But without waiting for an answer, the hero firmly stated that he was taking the boy, and the matter was not discussed so as not to make things worse. The day before, as William was calmly filling out paperwork, an unexpected phone call rang, disturbing his peace. He received a call from an unknown number and wondered who else was anonymous, then picked up the phone and said hello quietly. He was immediately called by name, introducing himself as Hunter, the vice president of the Superhuman Battle Association in Korea. Then the hero asked the year of his birth, to which he heard the answer that he was born in the 65th. Well then he wondered what the vice president was calling him about, and as it turned out, it was a personal matter. However, the man needed specifics, while Hunter was surprised that the man had no clue. After all, it was about his son. But the hero only replied irritably that he did not know his son, but shut up half-heartedly, beginning to recall the past. A little earlier, he had inquired of a rather brash young man who his father was, to which the kid creased his face and asked if the hero knew the vice president of the association, whom he thought everyone should know. Hunter said they've met before and it's no secret, but his obnoxious son has teamwork issues. While William didn't understand what the point was, but the man went on to say that his son was snubbed from the national team at his suggestion. And the heroes seem to identify his son's problem at a glance, but he also understands everything. Otherwise, he wouldn't have called him. The vice president agreed with this, after all. It was his fault for raising Simon like this, since he has no mother. In the same second, the hero asked that he wanted to give his kid to him for re-education, because he called not to lecture. Whereupon the hero laughed, at once that he was not a teacher for hire, while silence hung on the other end of the wire. William was about to hang up when suddenly Hunter's loud voice announced that his son had been fired from the team today. And now Simon was awake, trying to figure out where he was, and as always he found himself, feeling pain all over his body. He began to look around, realizing he was lying under the light of a lamppost, wondering aloud at various questions. Suddenly he noticed the man in front of him who said that he barely woke his eyes and was already starting to talk a lot. He immediately recognized William and asked why he had brought him here, to which he heard him ask why they were sitting where there were no security cameras. But the guy only got more frightened, saying that he wasn't the one who started the fight, because he was the one who hid his face and pushed him on purpose. 
But the hero said the news would portray it differently, where Simon, who was kicked off the team, beat up the legendary hero. And it was all just to blow off steam. But the boy only made himself angrier by asking who would believe it. But the man wouldn't budge, saying that he was already submitting a comment about it being too much and that he was just another major. But the guy said he would tell reporters that he was framed and threatened, but he wouldn't be listened to with that reputation. William added that he had already kicked a lot of people's ass, but he had never been convicted, and it was all about one thing. He only hit people who wouldn't mind being prescribed life-giving fists, just like the guy who was sitting in front of him right now. However, his case was special, and the heroes will give him a chance to end his shitty life, but it's a one-time action. Simon shouted that he would not dance to his tune, as his friend had kicked him out of the national team and prevented him from going abroad. Interrupting the boy half-heartedly, the man gave him his trademark menacing look, asking him if he had gotten anything mixed up. Then he shouted that he was supposed to be addressed as you, and the young man received a powerful slap. The hero said he was chased out of the national team because of his unstable psyche and feisty character, and everyone knows it. But the guy should have started filtering his speech to begin with, to which he heard a question that he thought was his fault. However, the man ignored the question, stating that the guy was poking again, after which he punched him in the head. William asked how much he had to be beaten before he would start talking respectfully to his elders and not be forgotten. He wondered how much this boy would be enough, but then he shrieked that he had forgotten where he had gotten in and punched him again. The dumbfounded boy asks himself how this psycho became a hero in the eyes of mankind, and he should tell his father everything. But the man reminded him a word about the chance to end a shitty life, whereupon Simon turned his attention to him. Smiling menacingly, the hero decided to be brief, telling the guy to join YSM, waiting with interest for his reaction. The dumbfounded boy held his sore cheek and his eyes went wide, asking the man if he had lost his mind. But it was another mistake in which Simon forgot to address you, causing him to receive a fist to the head. As a huge bump grew on the top of his head, the young man thought about the fact that this guy was calling him to his team. He couldn't understand why such a suggestion had been made to him. But at that very second, William asked him to listen. People will say horrible things if the news comes out how he drunkenly beat up the saviour of humanity and his reputation will fall. And then not one team will not call him. At this time, the guy listened carefully to the hero, realizing that he was right. However, a miracle would happen. William would appear on stage and give him a helping hand, causing the guy to be even more surprised. And since he is called the hands of the Dasa kings, the public will think the young man can be given a chance to mend his ways. And then they'll hug on camera and post a picture, in which case he'll remember tonight with a smile. He also added that the rumors will get better if people see that they get along well and he will talk to Jackie personally. For a while, the kid couldn't find anything to answer, but afterward he asked what the man would do if he refused. After all, he's a real grey cardinal who has set up a tyranny here, in response to which the hero only snorted angrily in his direction. After which he said that if anyone heard him, they would think that the hero had special power, so they should be quieter. He also asked him not to blame himself for being an idiot, because the guy didn't realize how many like him he had come across during the war. But there was a bigger problem with someone at the time. Then there was an unstable girl with tremendous power. She could easily start hitting her own, and the guy just couldn't imagine how infuriating it was when the enemy was advancing. Then someone alerted William to the danger behind him, and turning his head, he saw a huge hand. But the man was not frightened, rather the opposite. He smiled broadly, for this was too expected for someone like him. But in the same second, some extraordinary magic began to cramp and wound the incredibly large monster clad in lats. The girl shouted that she would take on the big guy and let them go on to clear the last dungeon. The hero didn't want to brag, but in the end, this girl became the heroine of China, and this boy couldn't win a single league. But in spite of his bad temper, William declared to Simon that if he was with him, he would win everything. After all, he wasn't intimidated by the hardship, and neither was the guy. He had until tomorrow, and this could be his last chance. After this conversation, the guy headed to his father, who told him to go to YSM, to which Simon was very surprised. After all, the father himself had opposed the seven saviors, but the man corrected him, saying they had saved their world. He just didn't want his reputation as a hero to suffer if the national team lost, but they didn't have time to do a review. 
However, everyone knew about William's coaching skills, and in fact, he was the one who raised the national team coach. Jackie's abilities are still in question, but if he's teaching the national team the way William would teach it, that's a great joy. And his son had the opportunity to learn from him directly in front of him, so there was nothing to think about. We should go to YSM. But Simon said William hated him, to which he got the response that he had a bad relationship with Emra Casa as well. But he didn't hesitate to follow him on that last raid, and William himself even put them in his life above his own. To such speech, the boy could not answer anything, only stammering I realized that his father was absolutely right, and he had a chance. The next day, the future Hypers Club base was visited by an unexpected guest that no one could have expected. An overjoyed William waved his hand and asked if he could have coffee, turning to the very surprised man. After all, he doesn't like to beat around the bush and wanted to get straight to the point, which made the club head tense up a bit. The hero then put a contract in front of the man, offering the man one billion for Simon, whom he was ready to buy right now. The man in the suit slammed his hands on the table loudly, shrieking that it was impossible, to which he heard the reply that the suggestion was for a reason. However, the director shrieked that the Arabs were giving three billion for the kid, but that meant they had changed their minds, so there was no point in haggling. William could come again when the boy is expelled from the national team, then they could negotiate for 100 mil as well. So nothing can be done about it. Plus the owner of this club is the vice president of Future Group, who he knows. He has to be called, happily recalling how some 17 years ago he was at a banquet at the Future Hotel. Then a young man pestered the girl, offering her a drink together somewhere quiet, to which she refused. At the same second, the hero, who was already quite drunk and therefore in a great mood, looked to the side. As he glanced in their direction, he noticed the main treasure standing alone in the city, namely a bottle of expensive liquor. He strode towards her, shoving the couple away, not even paying attention to the force with which he pushed them away. The man asked them to stay out of his way, then stated that they had finally met, addressing the bottle. Several guards immediately ran up to the guy William had dropped and started asking if he was okay. The red-haired guy paid no attention to them, however, turning to William and asking if he knew who he was. The uncomprehending and inebriated hero only clarified that he was the guy sitting on the floor, thinking it was obvious. The guards immediately said that this gentleman was the president's grandson, and that people like him would not be able to set foot in Korea. With as calm a look as possible, William grabbed the stuck-up boy by the face, preventing him from moving. Enraged, the man claimed to be William, who grew up without any parents at all to whom he could snitch to. Well, after that, he grabbed the vice president and held him hostage while continuing to be intoxicated, and then forced them to donate at least 50 billion to the children's fund, which was quite a huge amount. Since then, the vice president has had a seizure every time he hears the man's last name because of which the director agreed, but William smiled, correcting himself that he'd take the kid for as much as 500 million. He then stood up and moved the contract closer to the man, making a threatening face and asking him to sign. A few weeks later at the YSM clubhouse, the old coach welcomed three newcomers that William had dragged onto the team. Gabriel said they're not bad, and though Simon sags a bit on physical stats, he has great shield control. After all, if his problem were in any other area, it would take a lot of time to solve it, but here training will help. However, he can't praise Marcus's performance as well, but that's okay since he's been idle all year. If he tried his best, he'd be a pretty good main D in Korea, and so all that was left was to get him going with intense training. The coach knew that the hero's opinion could be trusted, so he would watch his results with the utmost care. However, unfortunate as it is, none of the players, except Simon, are available right now to participate in matches. At that very second, the blonde-haired guy felt someone looking at him all the time, which made him decide to look around. Up behind him he saw William, whose face told him bluntly that he was watching his every move. Gabriel added that it looked like they needed to find more guys to make a new lineup, but it was very difficult. The director said he will be able to recruit one or two players from another country as the transfer season is still open. Toward evening, Marie walked inside the large mansion and cheerfully greeted everyone in the house. William asked why she had come, to which he heard the reply that she lived here and had come for a little vacation, then asked if she was the reason the man was going to Paris, to which I received the answer that it was difficult for someone to adapt without an uncle. But the surprised girl said that she has fit in quite well and has already participated in many matches. Hiring Marie was a good decision, 
and she had no problem earning a passing grade, which she immediately capitalized on. May the niece not qualify for a captain's position in the Paris Lumiere, the best superhuman fight club in the world. But she was often given the role of a joker when the team was in a tight spot and needed a change of tactics. Without thinking long, the hero decided to use his analyzing gaze to look at his niece again. The man was visibly surprised, for the little girl seemed to have grown quite a bit in such a short period of time. Strength has increased by six steps, from 72 to 78. Stamina, which didn't exceed 67, is now 75. And extremely high leadership, but if she pays attention to working out tactics, they will be there worse than world-class players. But he said, or what he thought, that after so many fights she must have had all the brains, and now she had sawdust in her head. This infuriated Marie, but the man did not relent, jokingly suggesting that she give him a French language test. Suddenly the door opened and Jackie walked in, saying he was home after which he noticed his daughter next to William. The hero decided to examine the man with an analyzing eye, but his vitals were noticeably worse than Mari's. While the girl rejoiced at her father's return, he asked the hero why he was looking at him so strangely and intently. Sighing heavily, the hero sluggishly replied that he just figured he couldn't jump above his head, no matter how hard he tried. After a little while, they set the table for a general family dinner in a small but cozy circle. Jackie asked if William was recruiting players for his team now, since he'd heard that he'd gotten Simon for himself. William said that he is a good fighter, although his character can be improved, but it should not be done immediately, but gradually. In view of which, Jackie replied that he wouldn't kick him off the team then, to which the hero immediately decided to agree. However, the team still needs a couple people, so William is going to look outside the country. There was no such thing in their time. Now all those with good abilities have gone elsewhere after William's death. The battle was invented and started only about 10 years ago, so Korea is suffering the consequences of a drain of talented kids. However, according to Asia's analysis, Kazakhstan has been gaining momentum recently, and their results have been steadily improving. William asked if it wasn't strange that conditions are much better in Korea, but there is no development at all for promising players. After that, he thought about Kazakhstan, and Marie asked him at that second to take her with him if he decided to go there. However, he is not going to hang out with her in Kazakhstan, to which she replied that there are many scenic and beautiful places there. As well, the girl noticed that the most respected superhuman there was William, to which the man was genuinely surprised. For this reason, there are a lot of superhumans out there who wield a spear any stance combines spear and shield. This is a very strange trend, although the hero liked it very much, after which he decided to go there after all. At this point, Jackie cried, realizing that his daughter would once again be spending more time with her uncle than her own father. However, Marie hinted to her father that this time they would be going with her uncle alone, so he could be alone with her mother. William continued eating his meal, letting the rest of the dialogue pass his ears, for the most basic thing had already been decided. However, the rest of the dinner passed in complete silence, diluted only by the soft clinking of dishes and cutlery. A few days later at Kazakhstan International Airport, William and Marie headed for the gate to the city. Turning his head, the hero immediately noticed a familiar face, greeting Timur, who had personally come to meet him. He was William's comrade during the war with demons. They met when they were mopping up dungeons in Russia. However, the hero was genuinely surprised when he asked what he was doing here, as he should be greeted by a man from the Battle Association. In response to which, the man smiled that he was the president of the association, and William joked that he was the only employee as well. There was no one to even send, but Timmer personally wanted to meet him, after which he asked why he hadn't called in advance. But the thing was, the man didn't have his number, and his old cell phone is now on display in a museum as an exhibit. He was then heard asking what brought him to Kazakhstan, and the hero honestly replied that he was looking for players for his team. Timur marveled at such a reason, after which he suggested that in that case he could start with their team, which he could demonstrate. Dumbfounded by such a statement, William could only repeat two words, namely their commands, which was what the hero needed. Seeing the surprised expression on the face of the savior of mankind, Timur only smiled broadly, glad that he had managed to surprise him. They headed towards the club while Timur said maybe it wasn't quite his level, but it wasn't that bad. In a calm manner, William replied that it was the same with his fledglings, then asked that the man was both president and director of the club. 
to which Tamur replied that he also has a soccer club after all, he once worked as Minister of Sports, and all thanks to William. When the hero decided that they could start looking at players, he immediately felt something approaching him. On instinct, he was able to dodge, intercepting the spear that was flying towards him at an incredible speed. Holding the stranger's weapon, he turned his head toward the strange girl, asking her what it was. However, the woman didn't answer anything, instead rushing forward, attacking the man with her bare hands, trying to hit him. Wanting to counter-strike, the man missed, causing the stranger to retreat, after which she clarified his name. After that, she said her name was Sasha, and then she offered to spar with her, and the second she did, she got into a fighting stance. A short while later, the girl stood with a bump on her head, while the hero asked afterward that it was Timur's daughter. At first, the hero thought she was adopted, but after hearing him say something too harsh at times, the daughter is his own. William scrutinized his friend, saying it didn't make sense, because she couldn't be his with her looks. Timur said that her beauty was her mother's, and she got her strength from him, but somehow their genes mixed too cleverly. However, this was said by someone who flew in with Jackie's daughter, which the hero immediately agreed with, as her mother's contribution is immense. After a brief conversation, the men turned their heads towards Sasha, and William activated his analyzing gaze. His eyes opened wide with surprise when he saw the vitals of such a seemingly fragile and delicate girl. All of her stats except leadership went over 70 and some because of 80, also surprised by her super strength boosting power. For a few seconds, the man stood as if dumbfounded, trying to realize the full potential inherent in this girl. Among the superhuman women he knows, she is second only to one Charlie, who is now the heroine of China. Yes, with her ability to do just that would blow Marie away, and not just her, for she had mad talent. If developed properly, it will allow a girl on different to compete with top players, with the exception of Mike and Chi Chi. He was a little interested in Sasha, causing him to ask what position she played, hearing back that she was a tank. The hero then smiled slyly, asking her if she wanted to fight him, for he was now ready to accept her offer. Slamming his fist against his palm, William told her to haul her equipment, for now there would be a duel in which he would test her. A short while later, they were ready to move into the training arena and were waiting for their avatars to load. Putting on their helmets, they moved to the test site, who stood in front of each other fully armed. And while the man stood relaxed, Sasha had already adopted a fighting stance, being fully prepared for battle. Placing the lance on his shoulder, William looked at the girl in surprise, saying that her stance was very familiar. After which he immediately realized that it was his stance that he used in all his battles when he went to dungeons. But the girl did not wait for a command or some kind of signal, immediately running to attack, wanting to be the first to strike. Swinging her spear, she shouted loudly, pointing the weapon towards the man, preparing to throw it at her opponent. The spear flew rather quickly, but William reacted lightning fast to such attacks, dodging calmly. She doesn't throw a spear, but she makes up for it with the speed of her lunges, clearly utilizing her power enhancement skill. On her own, her stats are only 72, but with the use of the ability has increased to 101, and this allows her to go over the limit. Even without having a special skill for throwing, the girl was able to throw the spear quite hard simply due to her physical strength. If she can reach her maximum strength score of 87, then a whole new set of opportunities will open up for her. Namely, using the boost, she would be able to increase her strength to 122, which was a pretty serious increase. While the man was thinking about it, he calmly beat back with his shield every attack of Sasha's that didn't stop for a second. She tried to get the hero from different angles, putting quite a bit of power into each attack, but to no avail. William appreciated that her melee combat was also on par, but there was something that was too out of place. The man then went on his own counter-attack, making a sudden movement that successfully caught the girl off guard. He swung his spear in a vertical motion, finding a gap that could only be protected by his shield. However, Sasha did the exact opposite and did a backflip, dodging the attack sent at her. William smiled, thinking that she wasn't blocking the blows, more like dodging them, coming out shield control lame. Due to the specifics of the position, the tank is more likely to be attacked, so it usually handles shields better than weapons. There are two reasons why William uses a round rather than the turret shield that many tanks use. First, relying on his superior technique, he is sure to spot his opponent's punch in time and block it. Secondly, the small shield allows it to be more mobile and agile due to less muscle mass than other tanks. 
In other words, William's outfit cannot be called a standard choice because he picked it up through experimentation. Looking at the girl, who was already a bit tired from the battle, the man issued a clear verdict that his style did not suit her. It also has great strength, and if she improves her shield skill, she'll make an excellent tank. But at the same time, it holds excellent potential for agility and speed. Our non-counting only prevents it from unfolding. If Timur's daughter continues her athletic career as a tank, the road to success will take her too long. She should definitely change her stance, but in the meantime, it's time to teach her a lesson by proving her words with action. In the next second, the hero smiled evilly and lunged sharply into the attack, swinging his spear to deliver the first blow. However, Sasha managed to dodge, immediately bouncing back, not even trying to take the blows on her shield. But the man was just beginning to pick up the pace, launching attacks from different directions, using both spear and shield. The girl decided that she would definitely stop the next attack, no matter what it cost her, because she had to win. But the hero grabbed the spear with a different grip, pressing the girl's shield into the ground, giving her no chance to dodge. Without thinking, he threw his weapon away, swinging his left hand where he held his shield to deliver a decisive blow with it. There was a loud bang as the man loomed over the girl, shaking the ground beneath her, proving his superiority. There was only a small scratch on her, however, and the entire main blow had passed near her head without harming her. Without removing his fist from her face, William asked if she had seen the last blow, but the girl said nothing to that. When the fight was over, Timmer said cheerfully, as expected of William, after which he began to ask about his daughter. The hero replied that there is potential, but Sasha was upset because she was defeated in the fight, for which she had been training for a long time. Rising to her feet, the hero asked if her father had taught her this style, guessing what answer he was about to hear. Sasha replied that given her strength, her dad made her a tank, and also said that William's style suited her. Timur added that he was the best in this country to teach fighting in his manner, but here he already faced a judgmental look. William told Sasha that he was the kind of man who held the shield and spear and distributed power between defense and offense. And he doesn't emphasize any one thing, his posture is equally designed for evasion or counterattack after parrying. However, she tends to betray her entire body instantly when attacking or defending, which makes it hard to switch quickly. But given this important feature, with his style, she won't be able to reach her full true potential. So he suggests she take the two-handed spear and become a maimed, and the shield only gets in the way, because without it, she can use the force more effectively. But while the man brooded, the girl firmly stated that she didn't want to change anything, causing the man to stiffen, interjecting. With her arms crossed and her head turned defiantly, Sasha reiterated that she didn't want to change anything because she was happy with everything. Surprised by such persistence, the hero asked that she refuse his invaluable advice with such firm resolve. This managed to make the man lose his temper, who was showing with his whole appearance that there was about to be a massacre. But Timur immediately asked him to calm down and asked him why he didn't like his daughter's styles, in response to which he heard all the arguments. However, her father stated that Sasha is not only strong but also fast, because by doing so, she definitely resembles William. But just because of her girly stats, it's better to change your stance and use a two-handed spear without splitting. In defiance, Timur raised his index finger and waved his head, saying that William doesn't understand a woman's heart. The hero interrogated what this was all about, to which he received the cheery reply that it was every tank's dream to be like William. However, this was never an argument, causing the saviour of humanity to kick his friend in the knee, causing him to jump in pain. Timur said that she had worked hard all 18 years to become like him, so he asked her not to say such words. After listening to a short speech, William repeated his age, after which he began to ponder something, briefly withdrawing into himself. Then he abruptly realized what he had heard and looked dumbfounded at the girl, unable to believe how old she was now. He scrutinized her from head to toe again, noticing her twitching slightly and only now realizing that she was 18. Walking past Timur who was kneeling, William thought only that such a thing was unfathomable to the mind. After all, at that age, not everyone was able to bat so well, because of which he had increased interest in the girl. He abruptly grabbed her shoulders, excitedly thinking that this was a rising star for whom he wouldn't be sorry to give 100 billion. 
He smiled and asked her if she would go with him to Korea under his responsibility, wanting only to hear agreement. At the same time, Marie, who was listening to their conversation, abruptly flinched and loudly asked why William had made such a decision. Media around the world immediately took notice of William's business trip to Kazakhstan. Major clubs call and offer him astronomical sums, including Paris Lumiere and Berlin Lightning. When it was revealed that William was okay with this, photos of him at the airport went viral on social media. Rumors of his move to a foreign club multiplied at an incredible rate. People's curiosity was on edge. And when the man walked out of the airport in Korea, he was immediately surrounded by reporters asking about his move to the European League. They asked which club he would choose, as many claimed that the purpose of his trip was to prepare a transfer to the EuroLeague. After finishing all the questions, the man pompously took off his glasses, pretending he was seriously pondering an answer for each one, as he suddenly smiled sharply, replying that of course it would be Lumiere, at the same time Sasha stood behind him and silently. Afterward, the hero said that he has one project that needs special attention right now, and it's more important than the transfer. A little earlier, Sasha refused to go to Korea because it is said that many famous clubs and managers are calling William. Both countries are on the same level by World League standards, so it's better to go straight to Europe. After all, what was the point of her going to a place where William himself wouldn't be there? That's when the man thought for a moment before giving her a definite answer. He smiled achidically, asked within himself, divorced he was leaving, for there was no official information about it anywhere. Although the transfer fee is astronomical, 100 million euros, if he goes to Europe, he will get a lot of money. But this girl can become a professional athlete at such a level that the price of 100 million will only make her laugh in the future. He didn't know what to choose, transfer money or a potential world-class star that would definitely pay off. There was nothing to think about, so he said he wasn't going anywhere, in response to which he got an extra trusting look from the dark-haired girl. The man added that if he ever goes to Europe, he will definitely hold her hand and take her with him. William couldn't believe he was giving up that amount of money for an incredibly talented player to whom he had already promised everything. Retell the story, the man ended up saying that it was a really great deal in which he was incredibly lucky. After listening to him, Jackie hesitantly and worriedly asked why he had travelled back without Marie, but the hero only smiled. He asked his father what he did not know for suddenly she had urgent business to attend to and had returned to France. Arriving at the YSM club, William decided to introduce Sasha to Mr. Maxime Blanco, a fencing coach from France. The blonde-haired man purred something about purring, while the hero translated that he was only saying hello to her. Saying nothing aloud, the girl only bowed low, showing respect to her two new mentors. The character translated that Maxim is a meticulous man, and she has yet to prove that she is worthy of coming to his country. Whereupon William cheerfully asked Sasha to show this frogman what incredible power she possessed. A short while later on moved to the test room so the men could personally evaluate her abilities. Through the screen, William asked her to tell him when she was ready, after which he would unleash any monster she wanted. After thinking for a bit, Sasha started warming up saying that she wanted to ask the hero something before they started. She asked who he had fought when he first engaged in battle, to which she received a surprised look from the man. Starting to remember that if you count Avatar testing as a start, the first one was definitely the death shot. Proudly walking forward, the girl declared that she would then fight him too, thus proving that she was indeed worthy. She looked at the flying monster that was creating a sphere of pure energy that was aimed straight at her. Without any warning, the sphere immediately shot out a beam that destroyed everything it touched, down to stone. The only thing the monster saw in front of him was a rather long and wide ditch from which clouds of dust were rising. I don't understand anything. The monsters let out a questioning growl, then looked up and saw the girl flying at him. She stabbed the spear right into his eye, swinging it with both hands, thus increasing the force of her blow several times. The monster was immediately pulverized and torn apart while Sasha's eyes glittered due to the use of her super strength. That was the end of the test, while Maxim blushed and watched dumbfounded at the final result of the fight. As he looked at the completely calm girl, he cried out loudly it was elegant and truly incredible. She then asked William for his opinion, to which he said that a couple things needed to be finalized and it would be fine. She started to get annoyed after all he should praise her on such occasions. Then she asked that Maxim would be doing the training now. But the man asked her not to worry, because he would just replace him while he was away. 
he had taken her under his responsibility after all. After that, he said that when the training starts, she will see that Maxim is a much better trainer than he is, and he doesn't let her down. And so when the season starts, they have a month. In that time, the two of them will make the girl a major opening star. After that, it was time for intense training and preparation for a new season in which they must win. And a month later, the commentators welcomed viewers by saying it was time for the first and opening match of the season. While the audience excitedly chanted the name of their favorite teams, the commentators chanted everything, introducing everyone. Today, BC from Seoul played against YSM, and the first team is undeniably strong, as they make the playoffs every year. But their opponents were Division I superstars who were only now able to make it to the big leagues after overcoming adversity. They say this is a game you can't miss, and whether there was a good reason or not, definitely. And that reason is the YSM players. All of the athletes on the team are notable because they were personally selected by William, who was nicknamed God's Eye. The commentators have seen a lot of familiar faces, but there are some dark horses whose release they've been eagerly awaiting. After all, they were confident that the rookies would be able to prove themselves, and they would once again get a lot of emotions from an incredible match. Looking over his new team, the hero smiled that everything was just swell, for they had almost no flaws or weaknesses. YSM's team composition was three tanks, four mains, three ranged DDs, and one supporter who had their own strategy. Ben can not only tank, but he can also play as a melee or ranged dealer using super strength or a crossbow. Quentin is another two-in-one tank and mained who was great on both offense and defense. Also among them was Juan, a melee dealer, able to switch to separate mode and back. They were very flexible players. They also got Simon Trump, who doesn't bring psychological pressure but can hit a huge area. William asked Gabriel if they could beat the Sulians, to which he heard a confident affirmative answer. But it was Sasha Akhmatova who was the main event of this match, which not more than a month ago put the whole of Korea on its ear. She left her shield behind and changed her short spear to a two-handed spear. The girl trained hard and achieved fantastic results. The higher the stats, the harder it is to raise them. Us moving to a main position, and Sasha is developing surprisingly fast. It took about three days to convince her to change her playstyle, though, and the girl refused to part with her shield. Gabriel was quite surprised, and William said that because of Sasha, he gave up 100 million euros to raise her into a star. Turning his head, the man noticed Maxim glowing with happiness, coaxing Sasha to open up like a flower sooner. The hero grudgingly remarked that if anyone heard this, they would think that it was from him that he had learned such horrors. But now there was something more important than Moxham's strange behavior, for now he would be able to look at their starlet. He asked Small Shine to not regret giving up 100 million, and the commentators announced that the first location is the Warrior's Tomb. Before the match, Gabriel said he hoped they would do well in their first game of the new league as suddenly one of the players raised his hand, clarified that they didn't hear about the strategy for this match, because it was very important. But the coach replied that she wasn't there, which put all the players in a stupor. But the man said it was time for YSM to show their power game. After all, they are already capable of doing so, and therefore must defeat their opponent in a direct confrontation using improvisation. The warrior's tomb is a place of notoriety, and until William cleaned it up, a great many had laid their heads there. The dungeon, like its counterpart, is shaped like an inverted pyramid with unusual monsters guarding the core on the bottom floor. And now the YSM team was faced with witchery and mistletoe, which were monster-like plants. The commentators said they didn't see any of them trying to play containment like they used to. And now they were openly slaughtering hordes of monsters, trying to accumulate as much experience as possible. It's progress for the team while William said it brings back fond memories of the past. He clarified that there wasn't much information about the dungeon in the old days, so he didn't even know which monster would pop out. Everyone was happy by the end of the raid, but one guy had gotten a hold of her and put down roots, and she could take control of him. As a result, the poor guy's head had to be chopped off, but he should be grateful that he died before he could feel the pain. The coach asked himself in shock that he hadn't hesitated for a second to kill the poor guy, and the principal is talking about it so mundanely. But the hero pulled the man aside, saying that both teams were finishing their hunt and it was time to face off. The first group of YSM, consisting of six people, gained enough experience through monster hunting. One of the players radioed that they were done, then asked how the rest of their comrades were doing. 
Those two finished, while BC also finished the hunt, being on the opposite side from the first YSM group. The opposing team had two groups the first, of which consisted of six people, and the second of five. One of the BC players gave the command for their group to head to the next site to continue the sweep. Just as suddenly, several arrows covered in purple aura flew past his head, embedding themselves into the floor not far from him. As it turned out, Lisa and Ben, who were quite fast and wielded long-range weapons, were already approaching them. Wasting no time, BC immediately formed up, ready to defend themselves against the sudden attack of their opponents. The girl immediately noticed how fast they were, for perhaps they knew they were being followed and watched by YSM. The opponent said the hunt was over and there was no monster here for them to steal, so they could engage in battle. He will try to hold them off and let the others try to find Johnny. If they catch him, there will be no surprises. And while the BC captain was giving instructions to his comrades, they were already being closely watched from above by an ambush. Sasha and Quentin have already arrived at the planned position to make a surprise attack that the enemy doesn't expect. Johnny immediately radioed them to wait for his signal, and his order was immediately taken by the waiting guy. BC is a top five team in League One every year, if not for the directors, or they would be in trouble in the off-season. But now they really could manage on their own. There the second the command from Johnny sounded that it was time to advance. At first Quentin wondered aloud, but when he saw Sasha rushing forward, he jumped after her right into the thick of the enemy. They decided to take advantage of the surprise effect by launching a quick attack on their opponents while they were confused. While Quentin was taking out his opponents one by one, three people decided to attack Sasha from behind at once. But the girl was ready for it, so she immediately pulled out two folded spears to use in battle. Her movements were incredibly fast, her reactions surpassing themselves as she reacted to each individual attack. In the next instant, she was already fighting off three opponents at once, parrying and fending off swords with two spears at once. The girl's eyes lit up as she used her super strength, then spun around like a tornado. By throwing her opponents away while they asked in shock what this crazy thing was doing, she was able to single-handedly scatter the three. Well, after that, she stopped abruptly and then jumped the air, tensing her whole body, starting to swing her spear. Pushing back, Sasha threw one of her spears, aiming directly at Quentin's opponent to help him. But it was a distraction, for the red-haired boy felt something sharp stab him in the back. It was Ben who came out of the shadows to make a backhanded strike, cleaving his opponent's body without letting him defend himself. The commentators were screaming all over the place that Sasha and Quentin had only come in a minute ago. One of their opponents had already fallen at the hands of Ben. This girl has gotten a lot of attention, as she just single-handedly ran three attacks and made an assist. To use throwing as a feint, the word dangerous must be imprinted in the opponent's mind when she throws the spear. The nothing girl pulled out another spear, gathering all her strength and swinging again to make a throw. She had already taken aim at who and what she wanted to attack first, for there were two swordsmen and one tank in front of her. The girl thought that if the first throw of the match went well, she would definitely finish someone off with it. Making a throw, the opposing tank noticed the spear flying in her direction, but his defense was enough to stop it. However, things were not quite as he had envisioned, for the girl lunged forward and caught the spear right in mid-air. Making a very quick U-turn, Sasha immediately changed position to deliver a crushing attack from another angle. However, the rather tense guy managed to put up a shield in front of him in time to avoid missing such an attack. The next second, the real fight began, the girl lunging at the tank, not letting him catch his breath. She was crowding him, forcing him to go completely on the defensive, while the guy was shocked by her incredible speed. Against all odds, Sasha was completely calm because she knew what she had to do, so she continued to attack. She was confident that she would break through the enemy's gap very soon, causing her spear to stab straight into the ground with force. The guy who jumped up at the last second was glad that he was able to dodge, but the reality was quite different. Sasha used the stabbed spear to bounce off of him a moment later and was already above her shocked opponent. She used the inertia as I did from hitting the ground and jumped up to deliver the final blow. Landing behind her opponent, the girl's eyes burned with the fervor of battle while her opponent couldn't believe his eyes. Sasha turned around while simultaneously putting down her spear, after which I noticed the guy I was able to overpower. The commenters chanted that Sasha had one kill, while the girl was still watching the disappearing enemy. Having dealt with the most important problem, the girl jumped up, 
targeting the next opponent with two blades. She grabbed the spear with both hands, aiming the point at her enemy to strike it with all her might, not giving it a chance. She missed slightly, and the blow went through the ground. However, she was able to knock the weapon out of her opponent's hands, knocking him back. However, Sasha knew this would happen, so while the unarmed guy was in flight, she ran in his direction. The opponent did not understand how it was even possible to resist such a thing, while the girl delivered her decisive blow. The commentators announced that Sasha had a second kill, and a shocked Johnny said the coach was right. After which, the guy shouted for everyone to stop hunting and run here right now, for they would win if they kept going. He then began to comment aloud that the girl had killed two people and hadn't gotten a scratch herself, which was surprising. William only thought about the fact that in such a short time, her agility was able to grow from 80 to 81, and her skills from 76 to 78. Can you compare an athlete with 78078 to 78097? Of course not. Skill growth depends on concentration and experience. At this point, the girl was asking herself if she looked even a little like William now, but realized that she lacked speed. She would be able to fix that, though, and right now she didn't understand why she only insisted she wanted to be exclusively a tank. After all, the dealer position was fun, too, and it was now that she could truly feel the value of her abilities. William had told her that if a teammate died while she was blind with the lust for killing, it would be a disaster. Her priority should be the team, not the last strike against the enemy because if the rookie is greedy, she gets scolded, which caused the girl to dodge her opponent's blow, turning her head and seeing Quentin fighting. She realized the guy was having a hard time, and so she ran in his direction, yelling for him to put his back up. Quentin immediately obeyed, bending forward slightly. The girl used it to fly into the air, aiming her spear at her opponent. The expecting guy saw a girl appear in front of him out of nowhere and throw a spear at him. She hit it clearly on target, while the commentators noted that Sasha had her third kill of the match tonight. This girl is new to the team. I've already put down three BC from Seoul and YSM showed great play early in the season. And the first round was won by YSM, with the team earning a fine and clean win with a stunning 9-0 score. Sasha Akhmatova showed herself magnificently. This girl is the new main dad of YSM if they understood everything correctly. She proved and demonstrated what she is worth in just one round. Not for nothing, the club director traveled a long way to Kazakhstan. They were looking forward to the next game, which is coming up very soon, and as soon as the players are summarized, the second round will begin. A little while later, Simon closed himself in the restroom stall and stared angrily into the phone, biting his nails, leafing through the tape. He read the comments people wrote in his direction, most of which were pretty negative. This really pissed off the guy, who unknowingly asked out loud how these creeps could write such a thing without knowing the whole situation. As he suddenly heard a voice nearby saying that even after moving to YSM, Simon was so-so player, he got even more angry. Two BC guys were saying that Sasha showed some good play, even though there wasn't anything really interesting during the match. Although the girl is almost like a League One player in Europe, which seems like an imbalance, but it's great that Simon isn't showing up yet. They started laughing and saying his pride was pinched, whereupon they called him a poor man, and the guy only listened. However, the last phrase pissed the guy off, causing him to leave the stall, asking those what they had just said. But they were surprised at the sudden appearance of the guy, but one of them told the other one that it was okay, after which he smiled evasively. He thought they might use his temperament against himself, thereby provoking him to rash action. He then wondered aloud what they had said wrong with calling him a wastrel, but Simon knew they would disqualify him for using force outside of a match. The boy was patient with his last strength not to throw himself at them, but managed to restrain himself, asking the two to wait for him here. Suddenly, a loud bang sounded from the stall next to where Simon was standing, which managed to startle those present a little. Then a loud, almost hysterical laugh came sharply from the same cubicle, causing the others to look around questioningly. Annoyed, Simon decided that someone else had decided to make fun of him, which made him decide to ask who was laughing. No sooner had he reached the door than it opened abruptly, knocking him off his feet, and a relaxed William stepped out of the stall. I noticed my player. The man laughed into his palm, immediately apologizing, still continuing to laugh. The BC guys froze, recognizing the hero and realizing that he had heard everything they were saying to his player, and therefore could do something about it. The man said he heard an interesting conversation, so he decided to join in. 
he really wanted to see Simon's face. After all, it's not every day he gets reprimanded on a factual basis, then asked that these guys had nothing more to say, but they only apologized. William was a little upset, but then turned to Simon, asking him to apologize to the players from Seoul. The dumbfounded lad looked at his principal, asking why on earth they were the ones who had insulted him, but the man was of a different opinion. After all, if he had lived a worthless life, he would have developed like the one yelling at those two nice guys during the competition. The hero skewered the lad, saying he was sorry that being with the son of the deputy president of the association, he had no personality. All this the man spoke on behalf of Simon, who was still unhappy with what was happening, and William gave the boys a sly look. Then he calmly led the blonde man to the exit, for they need to prepare for the next round, passing BC. Letting the boy go forward, the man froze in the doorway, saying that he had forgotten to tell them something very important, namely that they guys were lucky this time, and as he said this, his eyes and gaze filled with anger. After all, the boy was learning a new way of life now, so he would pretend he hadn't heard them talking. Then he withdrew. When he stepped away from them, he added that he would kill them next time. Along with that, he left a handprint on the wall. The YSM bench said they would split into a containment team centered on Sasha and a hunting team. Guy sees this match as a test of how effective the tactical weapon called Sasha is. He and his coach and brother are assessing how well their old school tactics will work in League One. First, the captain decided to give instruction to the containment team players, US explaining to them the nature of their job. However, Simon decided not to listen to the long speeches and instructions, instead turning his attention to the opposing team's bench. That pissed the kid off again, who thought they were standing there laughing at him but he'd still have them. The second round will take place in the Ant Hill Dungeon. It is swarming with huge and sinister battle ants. It was a huge maze formed by ant passages in which one could very easily get confused. It's a nightmarish place, and on the lowest tier is the Queen, and to get to her, players need to defeat all of her defenders. Commentators and spectators were eager to see how both teams would perform, as each team deserved to win. Everyone was wondering who would win, the brash and determined BC or the calm and collected YSM. First to hit the road was a containment team of only five people, including Sasha Akhmatova. The team of hunters watched as the fleeing team raised a column of dust, eager to get a quick start on the task at hand. Turning his head, Juan stated that since they had already left, it was time for them to leave as well since they had many monsters to destroy. The team of hunters consisted of six men, who a little while later came across a huge pack of ants. They massacred each ant very quickly without taking any damage while trying to cover their allies. The battle didn't last long, after which the sword slammed into the last ant, which gave experience to the entire team. Juan was surprised that the hunt had gone so quickly, probably all because the ranks of the dealers had been swelled with new talent. The guy then ordered to go to the next zone, but one of the players claimed one of them was missing. The guy pointed to the place where Simon should have been standing, but he wasn't there, which made everyone wonder where he had gone. At this time, the guy was running at full speed in the opposite direction from his team, wanting to reach his goal. He was sure he could show the jerks from Seoul what an explosive sphere was, and that it wasn't worth ignoring. During these pleasant thoughts, a walkie-talkie sounded, whereupon Juan asked worriedly where he was and where he was going. The guy was asking a lot of questions, asking him to come back, but Simon only turned the sound off so he wouldn't bother him. Juan irritatedly noticed the guy cut the connection, then ordered the team to continue hunting, their task still the same. Ten minutes later, Simon reached his destination finding a small group of enemies, but keeping his head down for now. He only saw four people ask why they were the only ones here, since the containment team should already be here. Simon planned to join the containment team and launch an explosive sphere from a safe location. He hadn't counted on such a thing, however, but they hadn't spotted him, so he would definitely kill one and make a quick getaway. He then concentrated his aura, creating a sphere of fire before launching it at his opponents from a long distance. Rejoicing at his big win, he asked himself how many people had been hit, hoping for a complete victory. When the smoke cleared, all four were on their feet and shouting that they expected the guy to come alone and for everyone to prepare for defense. The dumbfounded blonde asked in shock that they were waiting for him, which meant there weren't even any wounded among them. At the same second, the archer started firing a few arrows, and the other guy stated that the one was predictable and fell for the provocation. 
Everything went neatly according to their plan, while several arrows had already landed in front of the embittered guy. Simon realized that he had willingly fallen into the trap thanks to his anger and stupidity, but there was nowhere to retreat to now. In addition to the arrows, three men rushed at him, one of whom held a turret shield to cover his own in case of emergency. Instead of retreating, the guy decided to give battle, sending a sphere of fire straight at his opponents, however they successfully dodged. He was able to push back the two swordsmen, but the tank was coming closer and closer to him, closing the distance very quickly. The blonde realized angrily that if he came any closer, he'd be a goner, so he had to break the distance. Simon decided to once again use the fire orb to make the tank move away from him on its own, dodging the flames. But as soon as he held out his hand, only a faint haze came out of it, letting him know that his strength was running low. He was dumbfounded to realize that right now he was having an overheating episode that he had very badly mistimed forgetting about. Simon's explosive sphere ability made him the best ranged DD in League One and gave him unprecedented fame. However, you can use up to five spheres in a row, then need to recharge. Ability recovery time is 150 seconds. The guy bet on a quick rollback of the superpower, but forgot that using it too often causes overheating. Backing away from his opponents, he tripped and fell, while a group of BCs came closer and closer to him, saying he was busted. However, the three people didn't notice something happening behind them. The commentator stated that Sasha got one kill. Not understanding anything, the three boys turned their heads in surprise, noticing that their archer had been easily bested in the back. At this time, the girl raised her head, noticing three more guys before slowly pulling out a spear from their dead comrade. Simon didn't expect such a coincidence either, which played very much into his hands, causing him not to die. But at the same time, someone abruptly grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and dragged him back, and one of the BCs noticed his disappearance with the edge of his eye. And the opponents immediately realized that YSM had made the blonde man a decoy, while at the bottom of the cliff, the guy's mouth was covered by his comrades. But the guy disentangled himself, swiveling his head around, immediately asking Johnny how long they'd been here, because that wasn't their agreement. So he also asked why they were hiding, but his comrades told him that he was the only one here who hadn't acted according to plan. These words made him hesitate, which caused him to fall silent, for he had nothing to say to such a remark. Simon said they should have rescued him earlier, on those were waiting for the right moment, and everyone knew he was coming. Even the battle ant who risked his life to keep the nest from destruction knew this. The blonde then realized that they had been waiting for him to come, to which Johnny replied that they had been told so personally by the principal, paraphrasing his words that Simon would definitely act like the last pig and decide to go alone. The blonde listened dumbfounded to his comrade's words as well, unable to believe that the headmaster was able to read his actions so clearly. A little earlier, William had said that if he had been named the weakest dealer in League One, he would have been ashamed to hear such a thing. But Simon has to be patient, although there is not much to think about because this game is organized on the principle of find it, destroy it. And the man only scoffed, asking the guy that he wouldn't even try it, and the blonde realized that the man had been playing around the whole time. Johnny stated that Lisa, along with Ben, said that they were almost there and would be joining them soon. Therefore, they should slowly depart as well. But Simon only lowered his head, thinking seriously. Why did he rise abruptly, ask the two comrades, that if he launched his spheres from here, he could kill many? The boy realized that William could predict all his actions, for he was just like an open book to him. But now he's decided to rewrite the chapter a bit, showing what he can do, proving to William that he's not the weakest dealer. After which he began to concentrate his aura, and his eyes glowed with a blue light. But it was far from flames that came out of his hands. Simon felt that life was akin to walking on a tightrope, as he had lost the love and trust of Korean fans in the past. After all, he was abusing his superpower in an attempt to get even with those around him on whom he was projecting his personal problems. But after his move to YSM, public opinion started to change little by little for the better, and the guy felt it. He may have lost himself at some point, but he was thinking fast as always, so he made an immediate decision. Grabbing and never letting go of the rope called William, causing a long whip to escape from his hands. The next second, one guy on the BC team flinched, realizing he was tied up and couldn't move. At this time, a joyful Simon realized that he was able to overpower himself and used his new superpower. 
He then turned loudly to Sasha, and the girl immediately lunged at the immobilized foe. It all happened in the blink of an eye as the bound guy was defeated and the girl was already behind him. To help Sasha at that moment in time, Simon decided to remember about team play so he wouldn't get punched in the forehead after the match. When he realized that William had set it all up, the boy immediately went to work with Sasha. Now he didn't have to worry about him. Especially he saw how the hero cared for Sasha, because if she's the dealer he cares for, all the kills will be hers. Everyone has a desire to score points, but if you do your part well, it will help the team. However, the lad should master weapons, for he does not know how to use a sword unlike him, but he has taught him how to hold a spear. Looking at it with an analyzing eye, the hero noticed that almost everything except willpower had reached its limit. He still has room to grow, so we should chase him, but in the end it would be better to sell him and find someone abroad like Sasha to replace him. After all, it wouldn't even be in cheating, as he would personally train the boy and he would show unprecedented results. After saying those words, Simon used a fire sphere, such an opponent standing in front of him, blinding everyone around him. However, the burned guy was still alive, though he was completely defenseless and unable to do anything. But at the same second, Sasha flew up to him, finishing off her opponent with a light swing of her spear, earning six kills. The match was then declared over, as it was clear who the true winner was in this one-sided battle. As everyone expected, the winners of the first game of the new season were the YSM team, winning two sets in a row. It was their debut in League One, which come back caused all the players to even jump up and down with the joy of victory. They were all smiling and waving their arms, waving at the onlookers, trying to pose for the camera for the reporters. William and Gabriel watched them from above, whereupon the principal noticed that the children were growing up so fast. The coach stated that it was all thanks to the principal, because he had assembled and prepared a great team, and the hero agreed. He also added that after Sasha, the first one that catches his eye is Quentin, who is developing perfectly on his own. Many of his stats went up two or three notches, on endurance and willpower went up as much as five points. Then there's Jin, who although quite young, wasn't intimidated by the pro level and played both matches decently. At the same second, one of the players pulled his cheek rather hard, causing it to immediately turn red. Marcus looked at his hand, telling himself that this was all real, for it wasn't that long ago that he was living like scum. If he hadn't met William, his life would have gone downhill and things would have been much worse than before. Suddenly he noticed the headmaster keeping his gaze on him, and it was unclear what the man was thinking right now. William nodded to Marcus, showing him his approval, whereupon the man saw a mutual nod of thanks. William said they beat BC and they are a strong team, then asked who the next opponent was. Gabriel replied to him that the two star spirits were next, to which the hero replied that they were that mustachioed man's team. He and his trainer agreed that he wouldn't send him to another hospital bed and he'd sell him Quentin. William got pissed off, saying that apparently he had beaten the mustachioed man before, but how infuriating that he couldn't remember it. If they had fought, their coach was already worm-fed, but William is always oblivious to instances of manhandling. But then the director said it wouldn't work that way, and when asked by Gabriel what he was saying, the hero asked if the club was any good. The coach immediately nodded, responding that they were one of the contenders to win, and the results of the analysis showed that. Shaking his head, the hero said he'd have to pack up, but Gabriel said their players were solid competition. But William replied that to pull himself together was about him, because when they have Quentin, he doesn't want to lose to a weirder coach. After which the hero smiled, saying that they should stomp the spirit of two stars, but the coach didn't understand what was in his mind. He then said that they had agreed that he would be on the field three times, and now, as he understood it, they did not honor that stipulation. William agreed, for he was willing to make an exception for these guys, after which he joyfully banged his fist against his palm. Gabriel also smiled and said that this game would be too easy, but that was even good for them. The next day was overcast, and being at home, Jackie asked William if he had lost the Zardlun seed. Delivering the bottle that contained the seed, the hero replied that he always carries it with him without losing sight of it. The dumbfounded friend asked that he had travelled to Kazakhstan with him as well, to which he received an affirmative answer. He immediately began insulting the character by asking what would happen if the can broke, after which he immediately introduced the news. However, he saw the displeased face of William, who said that he was not Jackie, for he had hands growing out of his shoulders. 
Then a man with glasses stated that the World Association wants to buy this seed, and at that very second the hero was very surprised. But Jackie again decided to ask where he got it from, to which he got the answer that he had just picked it up. A friend stated that they had asked to keep the item intact, because if left unattended, it would sprout. They will have a lot of problems. If something goes wrong, people could die, and the two of them will be responsible for it. William only grudgingly asked what the man was rambling on about, after which he advised him to get some fresh air. Hero, I thought about how up until now he somehow had no reason to think about it, but now it's different. In fact, they even have a system similar to his analyzing eye to accurately gauge the performance of fighters. They had not even dreamed of such a thing during the war, but now William was interested in one particular question. What is it about the World Superhuman Battle Association that has this kind of technology in the first place? Suddenly, the doorbell rang at the same second, causing both men to turn their heads toward the intercom. William immediately asked the landlord if they were expecting anyone. But Jackie replied that he certainly hadn't invited any guests. The man in glasses walked confidently to the intercom to look into the cameras to see who had decided to disturb them at this hour. However, the call did not stop ringing, and whoever was standing outside was a very persistent person, endlessly pressing the button. This made Jackie very tense, who froze, staring at the screen while William asked with interest what was wrong. At the same second, a man stared into the intercom camera, repulsed by his whole appearance, still continuing to call. In an agitated voice, Jackie asked who he was. Hopefully the man wasn't some kind of crazy person. Widening his eyes, the stranger said his name was Pietro Anella, and he was from the World Superhuman Battle Association. Upon hearing where the stranger was coming from, the men immediately decided to let him in, whereupon the man once again introduced himself. A man with pale skin, a tired look and white hair put his hand on his chest, paying respect to the heroes. Wasting no time, William decided to use an analyzing gaze, that of assessing the level of the person he was talking to. His stats were rather weak, especially willpower and leadership, however he had a strong superpower. The hero thought about the fact that he was kind of human, but muddy of some sort, while Pietro held out his hand. William immediately thought that his hands were poisonous, he was gloveless, and this could definitely be some kind of trap. However, he decided to personally check things out by shaking his hand, which he supposedly should be dying of poison right now. However, nothing happened to him, which means he doesn't have any devious plan, after which Jackie also shook his hand. His ability made him see his superpower, and other people wouldn't know anything until Pietro told him himself. As the two men chatted, William thought about what this man needed if he didn't poison him. The character asked if he was a current player, to which he replied that he was only helping out with the dungeons during the war. It was quite entertaining for William, for excluding willpower, all of his abilities had reached their maximum. Superhumans age more slowly, but this little guy looks like he's in his fifties, and he also has incredibly low willpower. Another interesting point, no matter how tough a fighter is, if he doesn't train, his stats will drop. And this man has pretty much all the max stats and is able to get into the fight right now. Suddenly, Pietro opened the cases, saying they were paying one and a half billion in cash to avoid prying eyes and ears. Looking at the two suitcases of money, William said aloud that it was much more than he could have imagined. Pleased with such an amount, the hero agreed, after which he held out the bottle of seed, calmly handing it over. After accepting the bottle, the man apologized and then walked briskly out into the yard while the two men watched him. Without any words or explanation, the man from the World Association carelessly threw the bottle on the ground, but it did not break. However, this did not suit Pietro, who decided to finish what he had started with his own feet, whereupon he began to stomp furiously on the seed. William figured he'd dispensed with his poisonous scientist this time too. Well, the behavior was unusual enough now as it was. He may be under a lot of stress, but once the man was done, he said he was done with the Zardlun seed. Looking at the destroyed seed, Pietro said the president of the International Association sent them a message. They were surprised to hear that the president would like to meet with William in the near future. Jackie laughed as he asked about the head of the International Association wanting to meet the goon after which he shrieked loudly, asking that this was not a joke and the president of the International Association wanted to see him. Pietro immediately answered in the affirmative, whereupon William asked Jackie in a whisper what this president was famous for. The friend replied that so far this person has declined any offers to meet in person and doesn't even show up at events. No one knows anything about him, 
neither his gender nor his age. Only one thing is known. The president is the creator of the battle. The hero then turned his head, asking Pietro when he could meet him, to which he received the answer, any time convenient. Overjoyed, the hero asked if tomorrow was okay, while Jackie thought about club business, as the season was still underway. But Pietro replied that it was a great option, and he would set everything up, then come back tomorrow to pick it up. That was the end of the conversation, after which the association representative got into a luxury car and drove away. Jackie noticed that the hero was socially up, and he was eerily curious to know what the president of the association looked like. William, however, said with the most serious look possible, if this president was even human, but his friend did not understand him. Pietro has a good superpower, but he didn't use it to massacre the Zardlun seed, and instead stomped on it. And for some reason their guest is hiding the fact that he has interesting abilities, and that was very suspicious. Afterward, the hero told Jackie to be careful, for there was something wrong with this Pietro, but the man only made a barbed comment. But William asked him to just check it out, and tomorrow they'll find out everything, because an interesting situation is developing. The next day, they arrived in the province of Alberta, Calgary, using a passenger airplane. Coming out of the airport, William was surprised to ask that the International Association was in Canada, to which he received the answer that she was in the United States, whereupon the hero was surprised to ask what they were here for. A man with black eyes replied that they were here later, that the president was not in the main office right now. They traveled to the Rocky Mountains of Jasper National Park, where there was no hint of any office. William asked incredulously that the president lived in such a place, while Pietro nodded that he almost did. When they climbed one of the mountains, the hero asked again that they had to climb mountains to meet him. The man in the suit didn't answer anything, but after a couple of seconds, he pulled a return stone from behind his sinus. He then said that the return coordinates are aimed at where the president is at the moment. Pietro also clarified that it was a special comeback stone, as it was made here, much to William's surprise. After all, he didn't know that humans had the technology to replicate complex demon artifacts. The white-haired man then concluded that if he used it, it would get him where he wanted to go immediately. After the dungeon disappeared, superhumans no longer carry a return to me, but he has one with him. He decided to trust the suspicious man's words this time, smiling and activating the stone. He didn't know where he was going to end up, but he was sure he could definitely handle any problems that came his way. In the next second, he teleported and found himself in an incredibly huge dungeon that had no walls. The man smiled, noticing that the atmosphere was just great, for it brought back pleasant memories. As suddenly, an incredibly huge monster appeared behind his back, which was very surprised by the sudden appearance of the man. William reacted lightning fast to the attack, managing to dodge a paw that looked more like a blade. After getting quite a distance away, the man immediately used the power enhancement. After that, he took a huge leap at the monster without even taking out his spear, deciding to finish it off with his bare hands. That was enough, for a second later the hero sank to the ground, holding the head of the monster in his hands, recognizing it as a manta. It was a monster that appeared towards the end of the demon war. That's when the creatures felt the dungeon was getting smaller. After that, they threw all their strength to get to William, and the manta attacks using the absorbed and accumulated aura. But the man only smiled, saying to himself that, as he said, it was a murky type this Pietro who had sent him here. After all, it looked like he had prepared a grand party for him while a crowd of monsters looked on at the man. This time the hero decided to pull out his spear, saying that he would enjoy it wholeheartedly until he destroyed everyone. After which he smiled maniacally, said they had so many limbs that he could give them a rousing dance. After an hour, the man defeated all the monsters that were in his way, reaching one interesting door. Not wanting to be ceremonious, he decided to break in by force, shattering the stone doors into small pieces with a single blow. Then he flew inside, still holding his spear at the ready, for there were bigger monsters lurking behind that door. It wasn't quite like that, however, and the hero was genuinely surprised, laying down his spear and asking himself what was going on here. He was looking at a huge hall with a lone coffin in the middle of it. But William couldn't see the body from this spot. As suddenly a vibration went through the entire hall and the body lying in the coffin began to shake and then slowly move. The next second an otherworldly voice announced that a man had been discovered and the body lying in the coffin began to rise. An alarm was sounded after which someone announced that the annihilation process had begun, thereby throwing William off. 
covering his face with his hands, protecting himself from the gusts of wind, the hero cursed loudly, then noticed a figure floating in the air. He asked who was in front of him, to which he received the reply that he had a familiar voice that they had heard before, after which they called him by name. The dazed man looked at the figure hidden beneath the hood and said loudly that he knew her. Pictures of the past immediately flashed before his eyes, and he unconsciously went back to the time of the war. He looked at the girl I pulled back my hood, showing with all his appearance that she wasn't human. It was the Magister. The ghost-like girl agreed with the man, replying that she had once carried that burden under the name of Master. William asked what form it was, since it used to be a demonic hypostasis, but now for some reason looked like a human. She replied that their true appearance was not unlike theirs, but they changed their appearance to be more effective in battle. But the man remarked that it was an unexpected meeting, for he thought she had perished, but she had indeed fallen by his hand. She also failed in her mission to keep her demonic self from returning to the light. Someone imprisoned her in this body. This made the hero cheerful for some reason, after which he asked if the master was freaking out, feeling like he was in a cage. But she has no such feeling and the man was a punishment given by the original light to punish the outcast. But back she returned. She thanked him. At this time, the man was thinking about the fact that they would just fight right away rather than chatting. But the girl only looked at William in silence, wanting to hear some answer, but the man decided to remain silent. After a few seconds, he did ask what the hell she was talking about, to which he received only a surprised look in response. The magister then replied that there was no surprise here, for the purpose for which she had been placed in this body was to kill him. Standing up, the man stated that even so she still had her own opinion, but she stopped him. There's no reason for them to be in such a hurry, since the program only orders the kill but doesn't tell them when to do it, so they'll have a conversation. He wondered if she could control the demon as before, thinking just a moment, but he didn't see her move. Even if she's undead, it's hard to harness the power that once controlled all demons, and the one who brought her back is one of the adepts. William said sarcastically that it was great to babble about rotting corpses, to which the master asked that she had just said the obvious thing. The hero didn't understand what she was trying to say, but at times like this it's more advantageous to fight him, or else everything loses meaning. But she said that the man had fallen into a trap by coming here. He knows it himself since he came with a smile on his face. He must be wondering who did it, and even though the girl didn't know who exactly, she could help find out. She is not angry with him, for he has already defeated her once, and is even now trying to finish her punishment by fighting once more. But the man only smiled in response, saying that this time he would try to turn her into dust instead of a ghost. The Magister only closed her eyes, saying that she was certain that whoever had revived her was going to start another war. He has corrupted the prophecy of the original light and is pushing her kind toward destruction, about to set up another catastrophe. William thought she was the one who started the war, but if they wanted to live in this world, they would have to live among humans. However, the girl stated that it would not work out, because they had already learned that their existence together was impossible. Before the invasion, they watched them, watched them fight each other in the name of peace, and they said they were born in different places that they had different skin colors, that some had things that others didn't. And because of these differences, they died and killed each other. They saw it all and drew specific conclusions. Demons cannot use the aura under the sun, and even in the moonlight, only a small part of it is available to them. The sun, moon, and stars filling the night sky only hinder them and prevent them from using their power to its fullest. A didn't pose a threat to their existence, and they couldn't let that go unchallenged, so they created monsters. They were supposed to protect the demons, but by bringing an aura to their world, these creatures promote the emergence of superhumans. But because of that, all of humanity was on the brink of extinction. Then William asked why they were starting to circle around them again. Well, to explain it, you have to go back to the beginning. But the man stopped her, asking her to tell everything in three sentences. There was an awkward silence, after which the master asked if she could try to fit everything into five. Slightly surprised, the hero agreed, asking her to lay it all out quickly so as not to waste precious time. If demons die, they become souls. Gaining the position of a priest brings the ability to hear the voices of souls. What made her stand out among the others was that she could understand the ancient spirit, that is, the primordial light. Everything in their world began with a prediction given by the original light as the man suddenly retold it. 
Without hiding her surprise, the girl asked what he knew him, to which he replied that he had recently heard from a demon. In the past, it seemed to her that she was this prophet of prediction, and she saw no one else worthy of the title of prophet. Another demon, a king equal to her in power, tried to stop her, but to no avail, and soon the balance was upset. She realizes now that the harbinger of disaster then was her outstanding appearance. And when she heard the prophecy, and interpreted it as it seemed right to her, and led an army to the land. For there is a world out there where light descends, but in the end, everything led to the death of her people and herself. The man claimed it was all because of greed. In that war, many people went through a living hell, but for him it was a kind of salvation from many personal troubles. Suddenly the man realized that he didn't feel any animosity towards the demons himself, for killing them was a forced measure. Then he decided to clarify that someone had resurrected her, to which he received the answer that it was most likely the surviving adepts. The Magister was sure that they were still following this prophecy, but the hero did not understand the essence of the words spoken. As he suddenly realized that he had been sent here by the very one who had imprisoned the girl in this body, placing a seal on her. Hence, the subject of those who plan to start a new war are the senior adepts, the new enemies of humanity. And to be able to unite her clan and rule her as a servant, he must be at least an elder. William realized that the magister was not enough, and he needed to deal with the senior priests. But he had no plan. But since he's a hero, he can't just silently watch the number of villains proliferate, to which he got the answer that it makes sense. He needs to defeat the master, and the power controlling her will be gone, then she will help him with the rest of his powers. Lifting his spear up, the man smiled and stated that this was a very good idea that could work. They have delayed this moment long enough, but the girl can no longer resist the order to kill him. Well, after which she announced that they would now begin to fight, while activating the seals on their hands at the same time. A sharp stream of aura rushed out in all directions, thus pushing the man who was struggling to stay on his feet away. As long as the control is in effect, she will fight to the max even if she doesn't like it, which is why he needs to survive and win. Covering his face with his hand from the dust, he replied for that one to be careful too, for he was going to use his best punch. But the Magister replied that she knew the man had no attack dangerous to her, and therefore she was not particularly worried. However, the hero only smiled, saying with a slyness in his voice that that was before. But things were different now. After listening to him, the master began to create huge seals beside him, saying that the deadly battle had begun. She summoned the spirit of one of her ancestors. She's not in the best shape, and the spirit isn't particularly strong, but together they can tear it apart. William only replied that he hadn't seen it in a long time, but it seemed that their numbers had dwindled a bit since then. The girl agreed, clarifying that the quantity had changed but not the quality, making it still a dangerous ability. After a little preparation, the girl extended her arm in front of her, pointing it at the man, declaring fire. Beams of aura began to erupt from the seals that circled around her, sweeping away absolutely everything in their path. Anything that was touched by the rays would immediately turn to dust, making this attack potentially fatal to William. The Magister watched the huge veil of dust that had risen from her first attack, P.F. trying to make out the man's body. It seems like it was too much, but unlike the Holy Land, this place had too little space and nowhere to hide. As suddenly, the hero replied that it was nice, because she was so worried about him, because of which the girl was genuinely surprised. From the dust cloud, a hero who had used the immortality enhancement came out to her, thus surviving the deadly attack. Seeing her reaction, he smiled asking how surprised she was that he wasn't out of it after something like that. But the Magister could not believe her eyes, whereupon she asked in reply how a person could have immortality. She called him an idiot and couldn't believe he was acting so careless and reckless in his battle with her. Reaching the highest level in a human body is hypothetically possible, but aura bombardment can kill, even when intangible. Hearing this, the man froze in shock, cursing rudely to himself then decided to cancel the effect of the enhancement. But she stopped him, saying that being so about an immortal would hurt her, so he should stay that way. After which the girl advised him in a calm tone to attack and stay away from the beams. Then everything would work out somehow, just like it had back then. But the man didn't understand at all what the master was talking about. William was in a stupor for a while, after which he irritably said that they would fight in that form. 
after which he jumped up sharply, heading towards the girl, incredibly quickly shortening the distance to attack. The hero was now as focused on the battle as possible, clutching the shaft of his spear tightly, dwelling on the target. But against her will, the Magister was not going to give up so easily, reaching out her hand in front of her, creating a spell. They made contact, creating an explosion of incredible power, illuminating the huge hall with a bright glow of blue and dark purple aura. However, this led to nothing. Whereupon the girl called out to the spirit, summoning ghosts composed of a dark aura. That didn't scare William, who flew straight at them, wanting to destroy them all at once. But he had a more important goal in mind. He decided to use a peculiarity he had once tested at his home, becoming to pass through ghosts. As he thought, it worked. Whereupon he began to approach the Magister, who had not expected such a turn. She put her hand out in front of her again, wanting to stop the man with her ability, creating the beam again. But even this did not stop the hero, who could change trajectory in flight, thus dodging attacks. Smiling, he thought about the fact that compared to the last dungeon, this fight was just nothing and simple fun. After which he still managed to reach the master, but she successfully fended off each of his blows by moving all around the hall. In parallel, the man was attacked by beams from the seals, while none of his attacks were able to reach their target. But William decided to speed up even more, then rose above the girl, swinging his spear sharply. He was sure that this strike could do irreparable damage to her, but put up a transparent barrier in front of her. Thanks to him, she was able to dodge, after which she decided to increase her distance, realizing that it was getting dangerous. Looking down, the girl noticed that part of the dome she was in had been cut by a spear. But the man didn't stop there, delivering another blow to the barrier, making another slit in it. After that, he turned around, saying that fighting was a simple matter, so there was no point in dragging it out after all. It had to be finished quickly. After these words, he rushed into the attack, wanting to finally destroy the protective dome by reaching the girl. William threw punches one after another, realizing that with this kind of pressure, the master would not be able to hold on much longer. The man also noticed that the girl was beginning to lurch and weaken, realizing that he had almost achieved the result. Pausing briefly, they both noticed that the protective dome had completely cracked and was beginning to crumble. In the next second, it simply crumbled, shattering into thousands of small shards, stripping the master of his defenses. It was a decisive moment, because of which the man decided to take advantage of the girl's confusion. He pierced her palm with his spear, and in that second, the seal on her began to fade very quickly, self-destructing. The huge seals that had been flying around the girl also began to disappear, but the man did not dare to pull out his spear. But the next second they landed on the ground while the hero returned to his physical form. He then asked if the girl had gotten out of her confinement or if the order to kill him was still in effect. Dropping to her knee, the Magister replied that it was over, for his attack had destroyed the remnants of the foulness within her. Clutching the spear tightly in her hands, the hero questioned if she was sure, for this could have been some sort of deceptive trick. But to prove her point, she said she was about to crumble to dust, but it sounded unconvincing to the man. It happened because she is weakened, and a body that can't handle a spirit that is too strong begins to disintegrate. But thanks to his immortal body, their battle ended quickly, for otherwise they would have had to fight for many days in a row. As a final favor, she will take him back in time to the moment he first entered this dungeon. However, the one who had seized control of her had already noticed the abnormality of her body and would absolutely show up here. After all, he's going to have to find out what happened here because the girl's control is completely broken. Walking up to her, William reminded her that she had said she would show him the very president of the association. It is her duty to stop him from taking the dark path, but now she is on the brink of death herself. However, the master echidically stated that she hadn't said she'd talk to him, but the man didn't say anything back. In the same second, the smile fell from her face and her eyes opened wide whereupon she announced that he had come. They turned their heads to one side, watching as part of the space gave a crack, emitting a dark aura. Clawed paws began to tear open that gap, and a voice from within began to ask that the power invested in the master's body evaporate. The demon was sure she had served her purpose after all, and William was finally finished. But after these words, the elder priest froze when he saw the living hero below, causing him to be frightened. He began to ask desperately that even the master's powers weren't enough to finish him off for good. The man noticed that this demon spoke Italian, 
and he must have been the one who had sent Pietro to him. He then stated that he had already killed her once before, 17 years ago, and now she was even weaker than before, so he couldn't lose. The dumbfounded demon said it couldn't be, watching as the master and William fooled around. The hero then said that since he was here, he should greet him properly, observing the norms of decorum. After which the man stated that it looked like someone needed to be taught manners, the girl immediately agreed with his words. And in the next second, William used the immortality enhancement again, and the magister filled his hand with aura. Seeing their duo, the demon stiffened dumbfoundedly, asking how an ordinary person was able to reach the levels of immortality. He then stated that it wasn't time yet, after which he simply disappeared, deciding to run away before they simply destroyed him. The hero asked the magister if the demon had escaped, to which the girl replied yes, keeping a calm face. But that only made the man angry, who shouted that that demon had escaped and she would do nothing to catch him. Hearing the rebuke in her direction, she held out her hand in front of her, immediately revealing the stance of the demon who had gone invisible. Turning around, the senior priest turned fearfully to the magister, not knowing what to say to her to get away alive. The girl firmly stated that she would not let him go, while at the same time only reinforcing the binds holding the demon. After tying him up, she turned to him as the third, asking him to tell her if he was responsible for all that was happening on earth. But the elder priest wasn't going to give up so easily, attempting to activate his abilities to break free. For a moment he succeeded, after which he disappeared again, just as he had a moment ago, wanting to get as far away as possible. However, the magister once again revealed his location, grabbing him back into his restraints, holding the fugitive tightly. She said she didn't give him permission to leave. What was going on with her and why she was siding with this man? But she doesn't do it because she's for one with him. Because the girl has already told the demon not to get greedy and jump in over his head. Annoyed, Third asked how the undead could get someone, since she still seemed to fancy herself a prophet. Whereupon the demon shouted loudly that they had found the true prophet, not the empty one she was, but the true one. However, the magister, proudly bitching at the insults directed at her, glaring menacingly at the elder priest she thought was a fool. A few minutes later, the demon was completely covered in abrasions and bruises, but tried to stay conscious. He declared that torture would never make him talk, but the girl's patience was beginning to run out. The elder priest asked for a better way to kill him. But William said he was noisy, and so he asked to hit him again. Without waiting for permission, he swung his fist and then punched Third in the face, drinking all the crap out of him. The demon fainted. The man thought he had overdone it. But the magister hurried to calm him down, saying it was fine. She folded her hands into a lock, adding that she would revive him now so they wouldn't waste extra time waking him up. In the next second, the demon inhaled the air loudly and opened his eyes wide, trying to realize where he was. The magister offered to see how many such treatments it would take to get him to talk, and that strained the priest. Then the girl began to ask in her most serious tone who the new prophet they had found was. A little while later, the demon held his hands up and replied that it was the first high priest who had declared himself a prophet. Adding that he was both the new prophet and master in her place, but realizing the irreverence, managed to correct himself in time. The girl then asked that he could hear the voice of the primordial light, to which she heard an affirmative answer. But the magister declared that there was no such thing, and the demon, hearing this, was genuinely surprised, not sure what she meant. He asked if a priest who could hear the primordial light could lie, but the fact was that it wasn't a lie, it was an illusion. And this was even more dangerous, but the elder priest only interjected about the illusion, wanting to know more about it. After the girl unleashed a war on earth, she could no longer hear the voice of the primordial light. Therefore, there is no way the spirit could have commanded them to continue this war, and the first only shows a lust for power. Well, if he was really being addressed by a voice, then someone had tricked him and was using him. Then she asked what kind of spirit it was. Vitya was not mistaken for the original light of the wrong one, On the demon only stated that it couldn't be, calling the magister an apostate. He then shouted that the false prophet was blaspheming here, but they wouldn't make the mistake she did. William immediately entered the dialogue, saying that he was again being treated disrespectfully, after which he slapped him hard. The demon flew off into the wall before bouncing off of it and falling straight to the floor, face down but still conscious. Lifting his head, the priest stated that they would answer to him for this, for he had one last plan for such a situation. 
after which his body began to glow and turn gray and white colors, he added that he would take them with him. There was a loud screech, and clots of black and white aura began and descended from his body, as if threatening his enemies. William said he was going to blow himself up, which was very dangerous, but the master asked him to relax. The man pulled out the stone of return just in case, but decided to trust the girl who reached forward. And after that, she just snapped her fingers loudly, causing the self-destructive demon to simply disappear. The hero asked where he disappeared to, but the girl herself didn't know, and just moved him to another place to blow himself up. But now that they were done, the girl, as promised, was ready to send William back in time. However, the man decided to take his time and asked her what she was going to do herself, but she didn't understand the question. If you leave this body, it will be taken over again sooner or later, so it will self-destruct, so it won't be used as a vessel. Then the man asked that since she was going to die anyway, if she wanted to look up at the sky or something. She was surprised at such a question, and the hero added that since this was the end for her, why shouldn't she see the ground? And if she's worried about her body being used, he'll summon his familiar, and she'll sizzle her into nothingness. The Magister was surprised that William had chosen to offer her such a thing as if it were his close friend. Taking her to the land that the light falls on, it looks just like a prophet from a prophecy, which made her smile. The girl said that the man was still not right in the head, but he invited her back with him. Whereupon she agreed, touching the stone of return that the hero had long since held in his hands. They successfully teleported while Pietro talked about sending William to the dungeon without any difficulty. It ended up being pretty easy, but he had a nagging feeling to the last that something was wrong, but he tried to be careful. The man sighed heavily, adding that it was a good thing William was thinking with his muscles instead of his head, as he suddenly heard a voice. Two men flew right over his head, while the hero asked what the man had just said about him. He had no time to react, causing him to miss a blow to the head that stomped him right into the ground. Without rising, he asked how so and William decided to mock him by looking at the trembling body. He then said that he had a return stone too, as he had accumulated a lot of useful items after the raids. He also added that he had killed the senior priest, his mentor, and therefore thought he had done quite well. The hero then asked what the man had learned the divine language of demons and brainwashed himself, adding that all of them smart guys are like that. He then crouched down in front of Pietro, prepared to give him a flick and asked, followed by a loud sound, a moment later, the man found the Magister hovering a few centimeters above the ground, staring at one point. Without moving, she said that this was the blue sky and this was the sunlight. It felt like she was talking to herself. As William approached her, the girl decided to take her eyes away from the sky, glancing in his direction, waiting for questions. Stepping away from Pietro's lifeless body, the hero asked the Master how she was, to which he received the reply that it was over. Then she said that such a warm light was very strange, for she thought that this body would soon collapse, but it was only getting stronger. She thinks she'll be able to last longer, and the man asked if she was going to die, but she was already dead. The girl only said that she could look at this sky longer, because it was so warm, bright, and cozy. He asked how long she was going to lie there, to which the girl replied that not counting recently, it had been a long time since her body had moved. Under the sun, she doesn't have the ability to use her aura, and it's hard to speak as well, after which it's as if she's discharged. Increasingly annoyed, William asked the lady what she would order her to do with it, telling himself he had done a good deed. He then decided to return to Pietro's body, saying that he never met the president of the World Association. This man must have had something to do with him, so he decided to shake him. Hopefully something would fall out. A couple seconds later, a return stone popped out from his pocket, with a golden aura emanating from it. The man was pleased with such a find, however, this was the first time he had seen such a return stone, meaning it was special. And if Pale wasn't lying, and even if it's a trap, he can't blow the president. But he decided not to waste time and rely on his luck, then immediately activated the return stone. He felt himself begin to move, but the next second he was in a stupor, expecting to find himself in a completely different place. He found himself in a field that was planted with grass and yellow flowers, which didn't look much like a dungeon. But what was stranger was this, and that this field was on top of one of the ice mountains. To the man, the place felt as strange and alienating as possible, which made him hesitate to step forward. He began to tell himself that this is the top of a mountain. There are snow-capped mountains all around, but there are flowers blooming and grass growing here. 
On top of that, he noticed a small, lonely hut that seemed to be beckoning him to enter it. But William's life experience told him that even if there was a peaceful landscape around, it was still a dungeon. He gripped the spear tightly and headed towards the lodge while the sunlight that couldn't be simulated by an aura hit his eyes. He pulled on the handle of the door, which was open, causing the man to tense up more and more with each passing second. Once inside, William noticed a lone girl and also smelled tea, which had a pleasant aroma wafting through the air. The stranger raised her voice, telling the man that she was running late here, while the hero activated his analyzing gaze. The Demon Queen said she had been waiting for him for a long time while he scrutinized her features and superpowers. A dumbfounded William couldn't believe what he was seeing before him was a queen no one had ever seen before. Demons lack names. Instead, they use their role to make it easier for them to label each other. And this is the first time the man has ever seen such a name, though he has encountered an incredibly huge number of demons. Now he was looking at a beautiful girl in human form who could not tell she was a demon. The other ruler, the king, tried to stop him, but to no avail, and the ruler the magister spoke of is still alive. The monarch, who had been stripped of his power by the magister, had been forced to watch the war, and now the head of the civilization demon stood right in front of him. For a few seconds they regarded each other while the girl gave the man time to view herself. He noticed the aura of Queen 199, excluding the master. It was the first time he had seen something like that. But what surprised him even more were her two superpowers, namely prayer and the prophet's gaze, which could only be accessed by her. She can hear the original light, but the master said she hasn't heard the voice of light since the demons invaded the earth. And the superpower of the prophet's view sounds too abstract, and it's hard to figure out what exactly that ability gives you. Suddenly the queen smiled, taking a seat at the table, inviting the man to join her for a cup of tea. After which she, while continuing to smile, said that her powers he had already seen with his ability. These words once again surprised the man for he had never told anyone about the analyzing gaze. He asked what she knew of his power because of the prophet's gaze, to which he immediately received an affirmative answer. Then the girl said again that she had been waiting for him, and the hero asked with undisguised surprise what she was talking about. Taking a sip of tea, she asked if he had ever wondered how he had managed to survive the last dungeon. To me, waiting for an answer, the queen said that she was the one who had decided to send him back to Earth. This information finally shocked the man who was trying to realize the validity of her words. Fading away, he clenched his hands into a fist, asking himself what the demon had saved him for, but not realizing what it was for. The girl said that he had gained immortality on his own during the battle, but without her he would have been stuck between worlds. But William did not believe it. After all, he had destroyed a demon's holy to the land and killed a bunch of her tribesmen. She should have no reason to save him. But in fact, as they were destroying their civilization, the queen read fate, noticing something unusual. There she saw William, who was the savior, for that was the role fate had given him. It was hard to accept the fact that a destroyer was acting as the messiah, but in the name of her mission, she couldn't let the opportunity pass. A prophet who has attained spiritual awakening will appear. He will lead them to the land where the light descends. The man listened with a serious look as the queen repeated a prophecy he had already heard. However, she also knew the last part of this prophecy, which no one but she could know. Evil will enter through the open door, so the prophet must prepare a savior for a righteous purpose. The queen then fell silent, giving William some time to think about what he had just heard. Suddenly the man grinned, stating that the prophet was her, not the master, though everyone thought differently. She thought that the day the wicked went was the day they lost their holy land and fell, but then she used the prophet's view. She managed to see the savior, and he was William. But the man didn't believe in prophecy, so he asked what she needed. The queen said that the senior priests were not the ones who would enter through an open door, and William listened to her carefully. She then continued by stating that the real evil still hadn't shown itself and was in limbo. She created the superhuman battle because she hoped that with it, superhumans wouldn't forget how to fight even in times of peace. A monarch who lost his people and a woman that fights for humanity. It seems the demons appeared to him in a new light. The man clucked, repeating that he didn't believe in predictions and other nonsense, but she had saved him, so he owed her a debt of gratitude. Overjoyed, the girl asked that they would cooperate, to which the hero replied that she knew in advance that they would. Then the queen asked in surprise how he had gotten here alone, for she had personally sent Pietro to fetch him. 
The hero smiled, asking that this pale one was from her after all, after which he began to recount what had happened. Several hours passed like this while the man told her in detail everything that had happened in the dungeon. A short while later, the Magister opened her eyes, realizing that she had been transported to a place that was not Earth. She immediately jumped up, starting to twirl her head around and ask where she was, and the Queen said that the senior priest was quite strong. The hero asked her how long she had known Pietro. She replied that he was human, but helped her even though she knew she was dealing with a demon. He then asked if she could have stopped the senior priests earlier, but unfortunately that was impossible. The reason was the sacred language, but the master told the queen that she had not had such powers before. But the woman smiled, saying that she began to hear the speeches of the primordial light two years before their sacred land disappeared. It was a secret she kept from everyone for if she revealed it, she would be killed by one crazy master. The girl apologized, for she wasn't even a real master, let alone a prophet, yet turned her back to the light. She added that it was all her fault, while the man concurred, saying it was all her fault. But now she wants to help, for there is something special about that evil from the prophecy, and she was close to hearing the voice of light. Each time she sank deeper and deeper into the prayer, and one day she finally tuned in to the rhythm of the source material. The girl thought only that a little longer, and she would reach the primordial light, managing to hear it. A short while later, she heard the question that she was looking for him, causing the magister to stiffen, listening. The voice was like a real voice urging her to go to him. It didn't falter, continuing to call the girl to herself. If she didn't know what the true primordial light sounded like, she would have easily believed it was him speaking to her. The voice came from somewhere far away, but it seemed to her that if she reached out, she could reach the other side. Suddenly William rose to his feet, asking what it was that his senior priests were taking as the primordial light. The man then smiled, saying that he understood, adding that they would be able to find and destroy him. Both girls silently watched the evil smile of a man who was all too pleased with his scheme. This infuriated the Magister, who said that all he would do is wave his fists around, but they needed to figure out what this was even about first. When night fell in this dungeon, the Magister lay on the field with her arms spread out to the sides, saying that it was very beautiful here. Suddenly William came up to her, asking without much interest what she was doing here, to which he received the answer that he was counting the stars. He said it's been lying there for six hours, but the girl replied that he sees it every day, so he stopped noticing the beauty. Putting his hands on his belt, the hero agreed with her, saying that the sky was clear, the stars bright, the view really wasn't bad. But after a while, he started to get irritable thinking about how long she was going to lie here, because it was starting to get annoying. Suddenly, the magister jumped up sharply, as if she realized or sensed something, showing tension with her whole appearance. William didn't understand the reason for this behavior as the girl suddenly announced that someone was coming this way. Without wasting time, the hero immediately pointed his hand behind his back, wanting to prepare for battle by bringing out his spear. However, he found no weapon. Angry, he remembered that he hadn't brought his spear, which was much needed at this very moment. The next moment, three demons who were wrapped in red cloaks appeared in front of them, whereupon they turned to the man, showing anger and saying that this land belonged to the queen. Wasting no time, the hero used the power boost, asking who they were, to which he received the answer that it was very beautiful here. The two demon girls began to say that this is where the queen lives, this is the land where the light descends. William dispelled the reinforcement, and the magister said that these demons didn't seem to have anything to do with the senior priests. Just as suddenly, one of the demons noticed William standing next to the Magister, and the two girls were immediately startled, wrapping their arms around each other. The man noticed that these knew him, after which he said that he was the one who destroyed the last dungeon. The stake girl commented on his words, after which they began to insult each other, and the demon heard that the queen had invited them. Since he knew about it, he must have been her servant, though she was fine. Not many of them, ordinary demons, survived after which he looked at the two girls who were trembling with fear, after which he asked why he had brought these two. As it turns out, the demon found them wandering aimlessly around the world. They planned to take up residence. But he's not going to talk about it, because regardless of the fact that he was invited by the queen, he's the one who destroyed their sanctuary. The magister said there was another room prepared nearby, probably just for them. The dumbfounded demon asked why the girl was on this man's side, but she was used to such questions by now. 
whereupon she said she was long about it, so they would go straight to the main thing, for he owned the surveillance. And also this demon has a unique ability, but at the same time William decided to personally verify her words. But he activated his analyzing gaze, noticing two rather entertaining superpowers he possessed. The man thought it was an excellent ability. He is an observer and yet can create objects. Whereupon he inquired again for the watcher's name, and without waiting for an answer, he seized him by the cloak. Smiling broadly, he grabbed the demon and the master in one fell swoop while they asked what he was doing. But he didn't want to tell everything now, replying that he had a great idea that might work. After a while, the queen said she hadn't found the key to the riddle of that voice yet, but it was most likely some ancient spirit. All because they'd lost most of their history, but William said it was okay, suggesting they ask for themselves. Why did he ask the three interlocutors if they knew the people's grave dungeon, but he already knew the answer beforehand? However, he still explained that this was the dungeon where the emperor, an ancient emperor who had died thousands of years ago, rested. Before the last dungeon, there were dungeons that were thought to be impossible to pass through. There were many, such as Thousand Feet, Executioner's Laboratory, Tower of the Anonymous, Guillotine, Forest of Malice, and Fiery Crevice. But it was People's Grave that was considered the most difficult, and the full name of this dungeon is People's Grave Tomb City. It's said to be an emperor from the dungeon who ruled over demons in the past, but that was too long ago, before going to the next world, so that even after death to rule forever, the emperor buried in the tomb of 10,000 dignitaries and subjects. When the emperor was laid to rest, the people's tomb was sealed and turned into a dungeon where the living had not set foot for thousands of years. And then it was invaded by William, who was eventually able to overpower the immortal emperor. That was hardly the largest raid in human history, requiring 57 superhumans to mop up. In fact, the emperor was an even harder boss than the master who was in the last dungeon. The girl remarked that materializing the emperor and asking him was a pretty good idea since he was undead. She will summon it when the commander creates a body to put a spirit into, but they need materials to do so. But the queen smiled, asking the hero to put the spear away, for there was no need for it at the moment. After all, he could pull it all off in the virtual world, after which the woman snapped her fingers. A bright light shone behind the man, and when he turned around, he saw something that had never been here before. With undisguised surprise, the hero immediately recognized the battle module used for the game. He then looked at the demon that had come in, saying that this kid had helped in the creation of the game, and the queen had agreed to it. She doesn't think the Emperor will willingly answer their questions, but if he attacks, it will be safer in the virtual world. Taking a look at the module, the Master said she realized what the system was, but she immediately noticed a small problem. After saying that, she noticed two pairs of surprised eyes on her, and the man immediately started asking what exactly the problem was. She replied that she had a very weak soul-body connection, and when she entered the virtual world, her physical body would collapse. However, she was needed to summon the Emperor's spirit, after which she asked the girl if there was any other way. William stated that she needed a body that wasn't dead, after which suggested that she should just inhabit someone. It was doable, because during the war, research was being done on mastering the bodies of people with superpowers, but the experiment was stopped because of the reluctance to enter the body of an inferior human being. As an example, the master suggested that the man imagined that he had taken possession of the body of a monkey in order to win the war. But the girl will not refuse this time, because in front of them was just the right material, namely Pietro. He was the man who helped the magister, after which she told the queen that if she felt rejection, let her stop. Shaking her head, the woman replied that once someone had been brainwashed by the sacred language once, they would never be the same again. In that case, the girl decided to start right away, crouching over Piero's body, after which she began to say something in the language of demons. After a few sentences, the room lit up with a bright light that was able to blind everyone present. Better than that, light was even coming through the windows of the house, making it feel like something was about to explode in there. However, the light abruptly faded, whereupon the hero wiped his eyes, glancing at the master and asking what had changed. The girl replied that the experiment was successful. It was just that she had rearranged this body to match her original form. Her body was too weak and she couldn't put her aura into this body after all. The human body has limitations. However, she was pleased to feel alive again and hear her heart beating. And in the meantime, the man appraised her with his gaze. 
She had a few new abilities to which he was surprised, but the girl pushed past him. She immediately went outside, declaring that she was now free to walk in the sunlight. Without turning around, she asked William to give her the one day she needed right now badly. After all, it takes some time to get used to this body, and one day should be enough for that. A day later, William looked irritated and angry at the master, asking her what it was, trying not to snap. The noticeably better-looking girl blushed slightly, holding a snowman dressed in a hat and scarf. She immediately hid it behind her back, replying that she was just going outside to get used to it, but the man had already seen everything. He then grabbed the girl under her arm, after which he asked her to throw it away and go faster. She agreed with him. They then began to upload their avatars to enter the virtual dungeon to question the Emperor. The Magister was as calm as possible, while the hero could not contain his joy at the journey ahead. They immediately entered the People's Grave dungeon, and the man immediately asked where the monsters were, but there was no need for them. The Queen appeared on the screen and said that they had only recreated the Emperor, so they could enter the boss room as is. But they must be careful, for the temperature refused to be a great spirit, hoping to gain eternal life and was also so evil in his lifetime that he killed 10,000 of his own kind. If he doesn't make contact, she's hoping for William. She also added that she changed his avatar a bit so that he can use it without any restrictions. Rejoicing, he clarified that he could fight as much as he wanted, causing his interest to grow more and more. When William and the Master entered the dungeon, the troubled queen said she hoped everything would go smoothly. The hero asked the Master if the two of them could defeat him. She replied that if he smote the boss's soul, it would work, because the most vulnerable part of the undead is the soul, and a human who has entered the realm of spiritualization and doesn't even know it. The demons were sending a group of researchers here to study the evidence of ancient history preserved in it. A while later, they reached a huge door, realizing it was the entrance, then began pushing the doors together. Once inside, they found a huge room that was designed more for giants than humans. But then they found the Emperor before them, shod in golden armor, sitting imperiously on his throne. The Emperor's soul hovered lonely in space, declares that it is his duty to be a good ruler to his subjects. After all, only he can protect the world and its inhabitants from any evil that would threaten his empire. As his virtual body rose from his throne, he noticed two troublemakers who had brazenly broken into the hall. Without thinking, he grabbed his blades, taking a huge leap, finding himself facing the uninvited guests. Just as William thought, the man in front of them is just a shell, but he poses quite a threat. A golden aura shone around the night, which pressed very hard on the hero and the magister, causing them to tense up. But it didn't come as such a big surprise to the man, so he would easily deal with this pile of iron. While the girl must find the soul of this knight, and the hero will have to once again defeat an old adversary. The Emperor immediately understood his intention, and as a result, he pointed his blade at him, calling for battle. In the next second, they moved from their seats so fast that the human eye would not have been able to follow their movements. They crossed their guns, and William in addition repelled the knight's blows with his shield, parrying each attack flawlessly. The man marveled at how strong the knight was, but he was still tougher and was about to pummel this thug with particular finesse. At this time, the Magister, surrounded by a silvery aura, watched the incredible battle between the two monsters. However, not to waste any time, it was time for her to begin her search as well, whereupon she sat down in lotus pose, beginning to concentrate. The Emperor, the one who had more power than anyone else, the one who refused to accept death and let go of ambition. A willful tyrant that unequivocally believes in his rightness, relying on this description, the girl found what she was looking for. After which, she found herself in the spirit world, being completely weightless, and immediately caught sight of the Emperor. Surprised by the new guest, the knight asked who she was, for no one had ever approached his soul before. From quite a distance, the Magister said that she had come for you to return something belonging to him. After that, using her superpower, she created a projection that showed William's battle with his shell. With surprise, the Emperor leaned forward slightly, not believing his eyes, immediately recognizing his body, which was lost. Having spotted what he had been looking for for so long, the knight rushed forward without further question, eager to retrieve his own. The same second the hero heard the voice of a girl yelling for him to be careful, and in that same second a bright light shone. The golden beam immediately descended on the Emperor's body, creating a strong wind mixed with lightning. 
This turn of events dumbfounded the man, who noticed that some change had just occurred. Right now, the knight in front of him looked much stronger than before, emitting an overwhelming dark aura. Due to the surging power, a small crater even formed around the knight, which only proved his strength. The heroes thought that if he reacted a moment later, it would be me, so he would definitely smear him. At the same second, the emperor shouted loudly that he had returned to his body while his eyes lit up red. The knight then began to look around, noticing that the emperor was here and none of his subjects were here to greet him. He said he didn't feel any of his loyal subjects, realizing that there was no one left but him. He then looked at William, noticing that his face seemed familiar, but he had trouble remembering exactly where from. The man smiled and was glad the emperor didn't recognize him, though the girl wasn't so optimistic. As the knight suddenly claimed that this man had pierced his neck and destroyed all his troops, hearing this, the hero only swore. The emperor said he was the only person who could defeat him, and he wanted to tear him to pieces. But a strange situation is developing, for in front of him stood the priest who had entered a human shell and the man who had killed him. But he didn't know if he could survive this time too, but his speech was interrupted by the magister, asking him to tell them something. He realized she wanted to ask about the lost history, saying that everything is repeated to cover up the wrong history. The words of the original light must always be right, but the wrong ones are erased secretly from everyone. But he didn't understand why they were trying to learn anything if they were stepping on the same rake, whereupon he called them pathetic. After all, the only way for them to exist is to live under his rule, for he is the savior who stopped evil. No one but he has the power to write a story that will not be forgotten. At which time the queen turned her attention to these words. The magister said that he is now a forgotten story too, for he was destroyed many years ago and is only a monster. Enraged, the emperor asked if she would be able to talk when he ripped her throat open, then lunged at her. But the cocky girl didn't move from her seat, completely unafraid of the attack, saying they had something to learn. William was in front of the master, taking the blow on his shield while the girl wondered about the forgotten history of the past and about evil. But the knight only grinned, replying that it was the only entertainment he had left, for they had taken everything else away. Bouncing back a decent distance, the knight declared that he would tell them nothing, no matter how much they wished it. However, if they could defeat him, he might change his mind, but it all just depended on their capabilities. Accepting the Emperor's offer, the girl also decided to use the Aura Strike while William used the Immortality Enhancement. Realizing that his interlocutors agreed to such a proposal, the knight rushed forward. The hero and the master did the same. They began to step on each other, but the girl decided to help the man with long-range attacks. While William took up close combat, fending off his opponent's blows with his shield and wishing to pierce him with his spear, the Emperor became curious about the man's astral form, to which he replied that he would use it to count his teeth once more. But the knight didn't give in to the provocation, agreeing that he was surprised, ask how a man could play with it like that. This question made the hero lose his temper, for he did not understand what the emperor meant by the word play. But in the next second, he decided to personally demonstrate the difference in their strength by briefly bouncing back. The emperor activated his astral body, which changed the color of his chainmail to a dark brown. The dumbfounded hero asked that he could do that too, to which the knight asked not to think he was the only good warrior. And the next second, there was a deafening explosion outside the Imperial Hall, audible miles away. William was able to hold off the first attack, but decided to retreat while the knight chased him on his heels. Unable to catch the man, the Emperor slumped to the ground, and the hero asked how he could use such a technique. Seconds later, the hero returned to his physical form, for immortality has a time limit. He shrieked that he had not used the astral form 17 years ago, to which he received the reply that the situation was different then. And this condition is too costly to resort to unnecessarily, but he applied something else. Gripping his blade tightly, the Emperor shifted his weapon into an astral form that worked separately from his body. But the man thought that his weapon then was simply enhanced by the aura, but in the same instant, the knight silently disappeared. In the next second, he was immediately over the hero, pointing one of his blades in his direction, but he managed to put up a shield. However, this blow was of such a powerful force that William noticed his trusty shield beginning to crack, after which, unable to withstand the onslaught, it snapped in two, scattering steel shards all around. At the same second, the queen loudly ordered William and the magister down, 
but the Emperor's blade caught up with the girl. It seemed strange to the knight, for it seems he didn't even cut it. Perhaps it was because he was now a ghost. What caused him to have a bad connection to the physical shell, or is there already something else he doesn't know? At this time, William, who had returned from the dungeon, smashed his helmet with a loud clang, unable to believe his defeat. Anger came over him, and he began to angrily question how he had managed to deal with him last time. The Magister added that she was thrown out quickly as well, but if she could summon a strong spirit, she would be able to do damage. The Queen asked them not to be upset, for while they were there she found much, for the Emperor knows something of the voice and of evil. The man said he looked a little angry from the shock of being back to his old life. But if they keep fighting until he feels better, maybe something will work out. They decided to take a short break, and some time later a man called out to the Magister sitting in the field. He decided to tell her what happened after he killed her in the last dungeon, causing the girl to wonder. The walls began to crumble, and a bunch of new demons swooped in. Then the man felt his end was near. Kneeling with his shield broken and covered in blood, the man realized he didn't stand a chance. This feeling was intoxicating, and he fought then literally like a madman, because he had nothing else to do. However, it wasn't like despair, rather the opposite. He was ready to have fun and fight until his last breath. He noticed that in this, he and the Emperor are similar, because the latter wants to fight to the last man until he feels alive. He had only one joy left, swinging his sword, and they would entertain him until he himself was bored. He smiled, wondering if they could survive the evil without finally defeating it. The queen approached and said that their primary goal was to stop the senior priests and the voice as quickly as possible. The man knew that, but things don't always go according to plan. It's not like he's doing this because he just wants to fight evil. Either way, they should do their best to quench his thirst for battle and force him to lay it all out for them. After all, the hero was sure that the Emperor knew quite a bit, and this information would be able to help them. After a while, they returned to the dungeon again, and the Emperor said he thought it was strange how they disappeared. However, he knew for sure that they would return, after which he asked what magic was behind it, being intrigued, to which William only wrinkled his face and replied that it was a virtual reality, calling the Emperor rudely. Once again, preparing for battle, the hero declared that this time he would definitely have it, and the Magister activated the seals. Such speeches roused the knight, who immediately made his weapon take on an astral form and began to stand. The man once again began to take all the hits on his shield while the girl's spirits tried to overtake the Emperor. However, it was useless, because the knight had time to dodge the attacks and at the same time to cramp his opponents. The man didn't understand why it was so hard, because if he weakened his concentration while blocking the aura, the spear and shield would break. But the enthusiastic emperor began to ask if they could win if they ran away like that, for they said they were interested in something. The hero smiled in response, glad that the knight had memorized the details of their deal, then prepared for another round. The first to enter the battle was the magister, who used a spirit strike, aiming several projectiles at the emperor at once. Looking at this picture, William realized that it was useless, as they only needed to pick a convenient moment. Seeing such strength, the knight remarked that it was amusing, but it was not too difficult to repel such an attack. Following this, the emperor began to easily repel every spirit sent at him, managing to get a little bored. After dealing with the last one, he froze in the same pose for a few seconds, leaving the blades behind him. William decided to take advantage of this second hiccup to make his attack, reaching the emperor's head. However, the spear met the sword in its path, and the knight respectfully said that it was not a bad attempt. And in the same second, the knight disappeared in front of the man, ending up behind him, delivering a decisive blow to the master. The emperor said it still wasn't enough, and William, noticing the disappearing girl, realized he was in trouble. And in the next instant, the knight was in front of the hero, advising him to think of something more interesting then delivered a crushing attack with his blade, tearing the man's body into a bunch of small pieces. The fight lasted 3 minutes and 37 seconds. They lasted too short, so the second attempt also ended in failure. When there was a raid, it involved a lot of superhumans, and the boss was being damaged in a circle, with the attackers constantly changing. But back then, the Emperor was weakened after the demon expedition, and now his physical strength is at its peak, and only two people are fighting him. No matter how strong William is, the Emperor is a difficult opponent, and the problem was the performance of the two races. The difference between them was even greater than that between an adult and an infant. 
but nevertheless, he and the master continued to fight. However, the maximum duration of the fight was only 9 minutes and 41 seconds, but they still lost. After six attempts, the man was incredibly angry, cursing loudly and breaking anything he could get his hands on. The devastated magister said she had to think of something, for her spirit strike was useless, for it was very weak right now. Sitting on the floor and turning her head, she turned to the frozen hero, asking him if he had heard her musings. Without turning his head in her direction, the man calmly asked the counter question if he could do it again. However, the girl wasn't quite sure what exactly he was talking about, because anything was possible to try to repeat. William turned and smilingly clarified that he meant the weapon with the rest of his uniform. However, the girl could not respond to that. She knew about the astral body, but they don't use weapons, so she'd never seen anything like this before. The master then advised the man to ask the emperor personally to teach him the technique. After all, the man himself had said that the emperor wanted to fight until he was satisfied, whereupon she offered to imagine herself in his shoes. After thinking about her words, the heroes began to see the point of the idea, responding that it was a great idea, and it made sense. After a while, they met the boss for the seventh time, and the boss was already ready to greet the previous guests. Emperor wanted to give the fight a start, but William interrupted him by throwing his shield at his feet, discouraging his opponent. The knight thought his patience was running out because he couldn't win, but the man asked for an explanation of how he did it. The emperor didn't understand at first, but then he realized that the hero wanted him to teach him a new trick, to which William shrieked that it was the wrong battle when the opponents were not on equal footing, again asking to be taught. In response, the emperor said that the latter had seen him do it more than once, causing him to be able to figure it out himself a long time ago. But the man's patience broke, causing him to use the immortality enhancement, deciding to continue fighting like this. However, the emperor did not move from his seat, pointing his finger at him and asked the irritated hero to let go of the spear. In that second, William calmed down as he looked at his weapon, not realizing how it could help him learn a new technique. But against all odds he obeyed, dropping his weapon to the floor, making an unpleasant clinking sound that echoed through the hall. He was told that this was how it lost its astral form, and the heroes noticed that without contact with his body, the weapon returned to its original form. The emperor praised him for his observation, then instructively asked him to think about the opposite phenomenon. When only he retains physical form while the weapon is astral, that was the whole point. It would be difficult to learn it in just one night, however, but the knight was already watching the man try. Suddenly, William asked if he was lying, but the knight replied that he was not happy to share this knowledge, but people have short memories. After believing his words, the hero began to return to his physical body, saying that no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't understand. The emperor again said that was the point, but the man didn't understand the point he was now making. As if suddenly the king smiled, then asked him to get the hell out of here. And after these words, a blade began to approach the man. William got angry at him for his incomprehensible explanations, but before he left, he said that he would definitely come back. The seventh fight lasted five minutes and three seconds, and the emperor said the warrior had heard enough, and now he would just wait. However, he wasn't sure if this person could figure out and learn the rather complicated technique. It would be some time before the next battle, but the man had already begun training from his full astral form. Now he only wanted to narrow it down to his fingertips. He was adamant that he would do so by appealing to the emperor. The magister approached the hero, telling him that creating an astral body for weapons was not as easy as the emperor had told him. She then asked if it wouldn't be quicker to find another way, to which she received the reply that as soon as she found one, let her let her know. However, the emperor himself gave a hint on how to make the rest of the body for weapons only, which means he will be satisfied if the hero can. And he and the magister were the only ones a knight could fight and get a welcome treat. But the girl decided to share her thoughts with the hero, but he simply drove her away, asking her not to interfere. After all, right now he needed to concentrate so he could get at least a little closer to the point. As night fell, a passing magister heard the loud cry of a hero who was cheerfully saying what he had done. She glanced in his direction in surprise, watching as he was in astral form but his shoes were physical. She looked at him in shock when he asked her to check it out, because he was able to do partial astral projection. The girl thought of the man wielding an ancient technique that even she, a demon, didn't know, marveling at the human trait. She wondered how far this man could go while William only praised himself. 
The girl thought for a second, then asked the man to take off his shoes to check something out. He hesitated, looking down at his boots in surprise, not sure why he would do this, but reluctantly agreed. As soon as he did, he soared slightly into the air, noticing with annoyance that his legs were astral. He was infuriated by the fact that only the boots remained physical. The magister made a barbed comment. She grinned, saying that while they were indeed in contact with the body and the rest of the projections, only the boots didn't get it. He couldn't help but notice that she was laughing at him, after which he said that it was actually very hard to do. As he suddenly noticed that the astral projection action limit had increased by two seconds, which was the first progression. He decided that if he focused on the astral projection of the weapon alone, it would expend less aura, which meant he would be able to maintain his astral projection for longer, which made the man very excited about the progress. From that moment on, he gave himself completely to concentration, increasing the lifespan of his astral body with each passing hour. It took him quite a while to get to the point where only the weapon could be in the astral, separate from the body. A week later, they returned once more to the Emperor's resting place, to once more give him the battle he so desired. The knight, sitting on the throne, immediately turned his attention to them, telling the man that he had finally arrived. He noticed that he had been gone much longer this time whereupon he asked how much time had passed. Instead of William, it was the master who answered and said loudly that it had been a week, and the man only smiled. Inserting himself from his throne, the knight began to descend towards his opponents, not forgetting to bring his two huge blades. He had lived too long, but he had never thought that time could become so useless to him. But the hero addressed him insultingly, asking him to stop talking, for he doesn't want to see him like this. Hearing this, the Emperor left his sword alone and grabbed his helmet, beginning to chuckle at the man's words. As suddenly as the next second, he burst into hysterical laughter that echoed off the walls of the hall. After which, he grabbed two swords, making them astral, and then said that they managed to cheer him up a bit. Then he abruptly got into a fighting stance. In a menacing tone, he called them humorists. However, they would now put the jokes aside. The eighth battle began. But even before the battle began, the Magister asked William to hold out for ten minutes, to which the heroes replied it was trifles, for he could fight like that for half an hour, for the lifetime of the astral body had increased considerably. And then he himself gave the command to start the battle. But the Emperor, without wasting any time, was already beside him. Plunging his blades at the man, the knight laughed loudly, saying that this man had visibly grown a lot. But this time too, William was as focused as possible and tried his best not to miss any of the attacks. He did not go into a deafening defense now, trying to counterattack, but the Emperor only laughed again, calling the one insolent. Watching the fight from the sidelines, the Master said that now the fight would be interesting, but William was inferior to the Emperor in terms of weapons. Even so, he hadn't been the only one preparing for battle all week, after which wings grew from her shoulders and she herself gave orders for the souls of those whose lives had been unjustly taken by the Emperor personally to come out. The knight looked away from the battle for a second, surprised to see his late knights gathered around the girl. As the hero suddenly approached him and loudly asked him not to turn away, causing the Emperor to rejoin the fray, the Magister said that these ghosts were ordinary people and now they hate him, let him try to deal with them for it was his fault they could not find peace, whereupon she sent them forward, and they obediently rushed forward. At that same second, William asked if he hadn't told the knight not to turn his back on him, insulting him again. However, this time the man managed to dislodge one of the emperor's blades, which flew towards the summoned knights. In response to which, the emperor said that when they first appeared here, it seemed to him that this battle would take a completely different path. Just as suddenly, he grabbed one blade with both hands, completely retreating into his astral body, deciding to attack. And then the knight declared that it didn't matter all that much, since nothing changed in the end, after which he began to attack the summoned ones, destroying every spirit that got in his way. He wondered if they were thinking of distracting him with this. He reminded them that he was the emperor. But first, he would get rid of this pathetic spectacle. Then he headed for the magister. The girl was shocked by the knight's speed, but there was no way she could dodge, thinking it was too late. Suddenly, William jumped to her defense and pushed the girl away, putting his shield and spear under the blades. He succeeded in saving his comrade, but all of his weapons were chopped into many small pieces. Seeing this, the city emperor said that as expected, it was all useless as they couldn't overpower him. 
even if those learned to use astral projection weapons and brought in a ghost army of his former subjects. Looking down on his opponents, the owner of this place gave his verdict that they could not win no matter how much they wished it. After all, the only one who had previously been able to stop evil was him personally, and he was the only one who could do it. Bringing his blade behind his back, he wondered what they were going to do to him, even if they couldn't knock him down. And then he said lastly that they should have practiced more, but it was the end for them, as it was for their world. William suddenly asked if he was the only one who could handle evil, but that was what he wanted to believe. Then asked if he was trying to get rid of all the other demons that could easily replace him. Suddenly a spirit appeared behind the emperor, who first addressed him as his majesty and then as his father. Turning around, the knight couldn't get a word out. As the spirit spoke, he grew up trying to emulate his father, who was able to overpower evil. But then asked how it came to pass that he had killed him, his son, with his own hands, for he had done nothing. Suddenly the spirit erupted, shouting that he was the one who wanted to enjoy his power forever, and at the same time, William attacked him from behind. He grabbed the blade of his broken spear, then with a sharp movement he thrust it into the emperor's neck. The man then declared that this was a victory and asked the knight to hurry up and tell them everything before he went back. The emperor noticed the man on his back very late, who bounced back sharply to avoid being attacked. But the knight recognized the hero, said he had done it, and so agreed to tell him of the evil and the forsaken world. Still on alert, William and the master looked at the emperor suspiciously, wondering whether to believe his words. He began to tell them that in the distant past, their ancestors were powerful and great, but also stupid, because they decided to split up and clash in a feud to see who was better. Thus began the endless wars underground, huge reserves of aura wasted in vain. She was creating more and more powerful, dangerous monsters, the number of which multiplied day by day. And the moment came when I, these mighty monsters, stopped obeying their masters and decided to give battle. Then many demons realized their mistake, but it was too late to counteract them in any way. But still, the ancestors were able to lock them in the space of time and erased all mention of their existence. Rejoice that they had sent the monsters out, deciding that they were done with it, after which they wanted to return as soon as possible. But one of the demons was trapped with them, but he was terrified after seeing the huge monster in front of him. The beast grew angry when he saw his enemy, but he didn't notice something approaching him from behind at an incredible speed. And in the same second, a monster even bigger than the previous one decided to devour his tribesmen without separating friend and foe. The monster, being locked up like a cage, was supposed to start killing each other until they became extinct. It was like that for a while, so they were left there unattended in a place called the Abandoned World. William said that out of the calculation that it was a problem with the little one, they didn't talk about them to future generations. The emperor continued that this world was not a grave for monsters at all, for some died while others multiplied. The abandoned world was filled with creatures born in the vent of endless struggle, and these creatures evolved to kill each other. But one day in the past world, something happened that no one could ever assume, much less allow. It is unknown when exactly it happened, but a monster was spawned that surpassed the others in everything. A one-of-a-kind monster, the likes of which they had never known or thought could possess such power. This monster is the evil whose name has been extended to him alone, in view of the extraordinary danger. When the abandoned world became too small for him, he turned his gaze outward, seeking freedom from his confinement. And eventually he managed to find a way to get out, even if it took him a while. He invaded them with an army of monsters and the Emperor fought to stop him, but back then they still underestimated them. Evil evolved and incredibly quickly moreover, all the other monsters also learned a lot from fighting them. That time he managed to send him back to the abandoned world and block the passage so that the evil would never return. But creatures born to kill are trapped in a world where there is no one but themselves, and where their power finds no outlet. After that war, he was called the savior because he won, and he did it through the skill of astral projection of weapons. William was very surprised by such information as suddenly the emperor's helmet shattered into a thousand small shards. The knight continued, saying that even in his time, no one was capable of such a thing, causing him to be the only one. But now, for the first time, the emperor revealed his secret to someone else, realizing that this battle was no longer his concern. He then turned to the hero, stating that he was now the savior, but he needed to get even stronger. 
After a while, the queen said that even the emperor couldn't completely get rid of it, and now the evil was even stronger. And now he is going to trick the elder priest into opening a passage for him and his monsters into this world. The magister had noticed that the monsters they created were killed before their power became too great. For this purpose, they bred monsters devoid of intelligence, so that a good servant would only collect aura, but not use it. However, in William's opinion, evil seems to have violated all the inhibitions the girl had just mentioned. Ta agreed, adding that the ancestors had purposely removed all restrictions, for in their struggle, they were willing to do anything to win. Sighing heavily, the man said it was at least reassuring to know that the emperor in his prime years was no match for this monster. But he seriously thought he had defeated all the final bosses and would spend the rest of his life lying on the couch watching dramas. These thoughts only made his heart race, and a smile appeared on his face, where joy was mixed with madness. The queen said that they should first stop the first priest, for it was by his hands that evil was trying to open the passage. They will get on the trail of one of the senior priests and find out where their chief is hiding, but they will need William's help. The queen clarified that when they found them, they might need the hero's help, to which he immediately agreed. And then he asked where they would start their search from, to which the magister replied that she had checked the old dungeon, but there were no leads there. The problem was that priests can erase the traces of their movements, making it very difficult to catch them. Suddenly, William remembered that he had met a demon before, causing the two girls to immediately perk up their ears. Before the meeting eventually brought him here, it was then that he obtained the seed of the Zard Loon in his secret dungeon. That demon's aura was red in color, hardly a big shot, then asked if he could cover his tracks. The queen realized who they were talking about, but he definitely wasn't on their tracking list, but maybe she could find out something. If he had a red aura, it was unlikely that he could erase his tracks, which meant there was a good chance that clues would be found. The woman decided to focus on that, after which she said she would let them know if anything cleared up. Afterward, she thanked the man for his help, for if it hadn't been for him, they wouldn't have been able to get this far. The woman then asked if perhaps the hero needed anything, while he was pleasantly surprised at the possible gifts. In the next second, he began a deep thought process to decide what he needed right now. The queen said he could ask for as much money as he wanted, but the hero replied that he didn't want to get a large sum all at once. Then he went back to thinking, which as if on purpose did not want to give an answer to his question, as it suddenly hit him, whereupon he began to pat the master on the head, declaring that he would take her with him. None of the girls could foresee such a wish, causing the queen to be very surprised, stammering for a second, while the magister herself was visibly angry, asking the man what nonsense he had once again come up with. She wondered what she would do in the human world, to which she received the answer that they would play battle. She decided it was a stupid idea because once she showed her powers, everyone would realize she was a demon. William then suggested that she act differently, not in her usual manner, using only teleportation and spirit strike. The Magister really didn't like the fact that she would have to limit herself quite a bit without fully revealing herself. When asked why she should agree to such a thing, the man replied that she owed him and should honor his request. But the girl asked what the debt had to do with the fact that he had decided to ask the queen for her to which the man replied that it was like this. William added that if she joins his team, YSM could make a fortune. The man also added that it's worth it to do some training in case evil appears and learn how to fight people. With a glance at the hero, the Magister had to admit that fighting like this as a team was quite fun, and so she smiled that there was indeed reason to tolerate him around her for a while longer. But she thinks that not everything will go smoothly, because there are people who will recognize her stroke of spirit but William asked her not to think about them. But you have to have her go with him as a real person or everyone will start asking who she is. In the same second, she began to reincarnate, deciding to use Pietro's countenance through aura manipulation. A short while later, the two of them made their way to Jackie's house, who was not expecting to welcome guests again. Upon entering the house, William again decided to introduce Pietro to his friend, asking if he remembered such a man. With surprise, the man with glasses agreed, saying he was an employee of the Battle Association, then asked why he was here. He then grabbed his comrade, asking why he had brought him, for they had to finish all their business. While the hero was thinking how best to present the information to his friend, he heard Pietro's irritated voice behind him. 
He recognized Jackie right away, saying he was the one from Seven that used teleportation and pissed him off wildly with it. The man did not understand such a statement, whereupon the hero turned to the Magister, asking her to show him. As soon as Pietro nodded, his body immediately began to reshape, causing Jackie to look dumbfounded. The next second, a young girl was already standing in front of them, and William motioned for his friend to say hello to the demon master. Upon hearing who now stood before him, the man was at a loss for words and his glasses moved off his face, whereupon he asked that the hero had lost his mind. William asked what was wrong, whereupon his comrade lost the last drops of patience, shrieking that everything was wrong. After all, he offers him to live in the same house with a demon, so also not simple, and the master, but the hero asked him not to worry. And on top of that, he specified that Pietro was brainwashed and the process is not reversible, so they replaced the soul. But that didn't convince Jackie, and even if it was only him who was aware of it, if he told anyone that, they'd take him for crazy. But suddenly the man found another argument to refuse, shouting that she couldn't live with his wife and daughter. The hero thought it looked like he was reading it for bringing a stray puppy into the house. Grabbing the girl by the scruff of the neck, William asked her not to be his soulless bastard after all. It's just a house. However, their operation failed miserably, causing Jackie to kick the demon out, and with it, his comrade. But the girl said it was okay, because she didn't expect it to work out, as suddenly the phone rang. Gabriel called him to remind him that a very important match for their team was about to begin. The commentators were screaming that the divine YSM and the incredible spirit of two stars would come together in this match. The coach reminded the man that they were in the middle of the season, and he promised to participate in a game against this team. Good thing he was able to reach him before the match started, to which the hero replied that he had important things to do. Gabriel then noticed a silent man standing next to William, whereupon he asked who it was. The hero immediately introduced him as Pietro, saying that he would now become a member of their team, to which the coach was very surprised. The man agreed that it was quite unexpected, but this man had caught him suddenly and very timely. After all, they won't find another one like this, and to make sure of that, he'll show everything to the coach right after the match. A little while later, the commentators were shouting that it was stunning, as YSM didn't leave the spirit of two stars any chance. And the main reason for that is a new player, namely William who killed the entire team single-handedly in two rounds. He said in an interview that if he plays too much, he will lose excitement and plans to only participate against this team. He smirked evilly afterward, adding that he would go up against her in every round so those wouldn't slack off. As soon as the video of this match hit the internet, people immediately started writing about how strong William is. Immediately after the match, the hero walked up to Gabriel and asked him how he was doing on the walk he just showed him. The dumbfounded coach asked himself what had happened to him during that week, for it was as if the principal had stepped out of bounds. Smiling, William said that now he could let the other player finish this predictable game and they would take care of business. A little later, they returned to the YSM club, where they wanted to assess Pietro's capabilities as quickly as possible. Dumbfounded once again, Gabriel watched the man take down any monsters with ease. He asked the principal what it was, but he only kept releasing more serious critters. But they, one of the virtual monsters, could not leave a single scratch on the man, dying from his abilities. At the same time, the master in the guise of Pietro stood in place with his arms stretched forward, using his seals to attack. In all this time, he never moved, while a shocked Gabriel asked where he'd brought the monster from. In a sluggish voice, the new player asked if he could go now, looking at how the coach even dropped the clipboard out of shock. After Pietro came out to join them, William decided to introduce them first, introducing Gabriel first. He then pointed out that he was an international battle association worker, and also a super rookie who had recently become a player. With astonishment, the coach asked that he was an ordinary worker with such powers, after which he began to ask him a mountain of questions. While Pietro sluggishly but confidently answered every question posed, William stood nearby satisfied. Coach noticed that he had the superpower of teleportation, but this was the first time he'd ever seen anyone use it to move three floors down. He then asked what the attack superpower was called. The newcomer clarified that it was a summoning ability that summons a phantom to attack. The coach then turned to the principal, asking him what he happened to meet and picked up such a cool rookie. Toth agreed, clarifying that that was why he'd been gone for a week while Gabriel tried to recover from the shock. 
After all, he thought it was as if the world revolved around William, which helped him in his search for such players. William thought the other players had grabbed the opportunities themselves come to them, but the master had essentially caught and dragged him. Upon hearing these explanations, the coach stated that he was very happy that Pietro wanted to be a player at least for now. Afterward, they shook hands and Gabriel welcomed him to YSM, to which the newcomer replied that he wouldn't let him down. The coach then clarified that since this is the first time he's participating in the battle, he probably doesn't have an avatar yet, though that's a bit of a problem. The man also stated that unfortunately his two superpowers that he had just shown them had limitations. William, on the other hand, said it was nothing serious, because teleportation is limited by distance and number of repetitions. As for the draft, it's comparable to Sarah's quenching beam, but adjustments will need to be made after all. This is a sport, not a war. This caused the character to scratch the back of his head awkwardly, realizing that there was no escaping these adjustments. And after that, the hero turned to the master, saying that he had asked to control his power, but that was the minimum as it was. Afterward, he was told that he should have agreed that the power wasn't weak enough to be used. The coach indicated that registering the avatar would take some time, so we would have to ask the association president to wait. After that, the hero pulled out his phone, deciding to call him right now so as not to waste any extra time. Arriving at the association building, the grey-haired man immediately asked the hero what else he needed from him at a time like this. William replied that it was no big deal, just wanted to ask him to wait while the new player's avatar was being created. When asked if that was the only reason he had come, the heroes replied that he was going to settle things over the phone, but after all, he had called him himself. He then asked if there were any complaints to which the president got angry, saying there were a lot of complaints and showed him the paper. The man agreed to the avatar inquiry that there was another reason he had called him out. The president said that there had been an offer of an A match in Britain which he could not in any way ignore. William asked if this was a match where members of the national team were competing, to which he received an affirmative answer. But the hero didn't fully understand exactly what he wanted him to do, though he guessed that they wanted to shove him in there. He then asked what he was being offered to become a member of the national team, to which he was told that it was a condition for the match. The president said it's because they don't get many chances to play against a strong team like Britain. At first, William wanted to refuse, but then asked what he would get out of playing for the national team. After which he thought about it, asking another question, that there is a man in Britain who is now in the top three. He also wondered if he would be out on the field. The president immediately said he was, but the hero was still doubtful. He figured he could defend against evil, but just in case, we should take a look at what the powers of the best superhumans looked like. Having resolved all the issues in his head, he turned to the president, asking if there were any other suggestions. Looking into the clipboard, the man asked that YSM had started recruiting foreign players, which presented a new opportunity. Namely, if he stops in Britain after this match, it will help recruit him to the team. William wondered where to use those guys who had only fought against each other before. As he suddenly remembered Jackie's words, who had said that these days it was normal for superhumans to not know how to fight. After all, such are already considered normal humans, nos aura, and they are already more prey to help raise Zardloon. Sighing, the hero smiled, agreeing to the offer, but he asked to take over the development of the match tactics. And at the same time, in a palace-like manner in Britain, a man with long red hair sat at a table. He held his phone in his hands, looking at a video of William battling alone against the opposing team. The man commented that he deliberately went deep into enemy territory, his every move calibrated and necessary for something, and how suddenly she turned her attention to the article, saying it was written maliciously, and the headline said whether he was actually a hero or not. The real stars are just victims of the media, especially those who can't stand injustice. But against all odds, it seemed to him that William was a very intelligent, polite man. Therefore, he looked forward to their meeting. A week before the A match, William arrived at the Korean national team's clubhouse, introducing himself to everyone. All the players looked dumbfounded at the hero, asking in whispers since when he was a member of the national team. As they suddenly heard a familiar voice addressing William as principal, the two men immediately turned their heads. Walking towards them were Quentin and Ben, who were also part of the national team. The guy decided to ask when he got there. But the man answered nothing, deciding to look at their vitals, noticing that Quentin was in his seat, but not Ben. 
Their stats were very different, and excluding super strength, Ben just doesn't have the ability for the first league. He ended up on the national team anyway and got a good ride, at which time the guy looked questioningly at the principal. The man recalled that the young man said that studying was more important to him than a career as a professional athlete. He had a hard time convincing him to join YSM, offering him a generous bonus even if his career didn't pan out. Also, this guy sat in a pit a week ago to develop his skills, which ended up making him stronger. William blurted out a smile. Ask the kid that it had been a long time ago, but the kid didn't understand what the headmaster was happy about. Pointing his finger at the guy, he replied thinking of the kid who used to whine about studying and was now a member of the national team. Ben immediately became embarrassed and blushed, starting to rub the back of his head and agree with the principal, smiling awkwardly. The man held out his hand to him, telling him that he'd been looking out for him all this time and he'd shown himself to be a good boy. Unable to believe that the headmaster had personally recognized him, the boy barely held back tears as he shook hands with the hero who had accepted him. The man smiled, but thought about the fact that super strength could be used. But other than willpower, the stats don't exceed 70. And while the young man thanked him wholeheartedly, the director thought it wouldn't work in the league above, and he should be quietly sold. He stopped Ben's speech by asking where Simon was, to which he received the reply that he was in the break room. That meant they would see each other soon. Also, he asked to tell the others to come to the conference room. A little later, when all the national team players had gathered, Jackie decided to discuss strategy for the match. The players were seated on different sides, listening intently to the coach, except for Simon, who was fidgeting nervously. Biting his nails, the boy strained to think that he'd heard William had arrived, but he couldn't find him. At first he thought it was someone's joke and he fell for it like a child, but suddenly he felt someone's gaze sharply on him. Turning his head in panic, the guy flinched when he spotted the very person he had been thinking about for the past five minutes. The principal looked at him with the eyes of a hungry beast that read threat and the message that they would see each other home soon. Suddenly the man was drawn away from his amusement by another familiar voice and a hand that gently touched his shoulder. He spotted Marie and immediately asked when she arrived, but he could tell by the look on the girl's face that she wasn't in the mood. Marina pouted her lips and asked why she was called for such an important match. After all, her uncle could pick capable players. But the man said there was no one like her in Korea, for only unhappy people gathered here. It was enough for the girl to hear the first part of the sentence, then clarified that she was the one and only. The hero mentally agreed, however, if Sasha and Master become Korean, there will be dealers as Mari, but they don't have their citizenship. Marie was also excited that her uncle also wore a Korean uniform, but he only wanted to help kick the Brit's ass. The smiling girl asked what Britain hated about him, reminding him of an article that had been written about him recently. William replied that was correct, he was still considered a curmudgeon, and yes, there were no Britons in the last dungeon raid. Marie recalled that he swore the same way 17 years ago, because there was a lot of news about it then. I annoyed Hero said it didn't make any difference who got it from him, as long as he cleared the last dungeon and saved the world. The girl replied that Britain had never beaten France in a competition, and because of his words, they were called British respecters. Pensive, the man asked. So why do they look at him as a weakling? After all, they know roughly what he is capable of. However, their conversation was interrupted by Jackie who asked everyone to stop talking, then turned on the projector. The British flag was on the screen as the man adjusted his glasses and said they would be discussing strategy for the match. A lot of people know this team, but he needs an explanation for someone who doesn't. He pointed the laser pointer at William. Jackie continued by saying that the British national team uses knights and wizards tactics very often. Contrary to the tendency to reduce the number of tanks and ranged DDs, they have a very distinctive composition with four sturdy tanks. The frontline tanks go first, like the US power play. They focus on the big tanks. They are called iron armor-clad knights who rule the battlefield due to their heavy uniforms. Ranged DDs cover the rear, all of which are players with magic-type superpowers for ranged combat. Also, the second main uses a longbow, so you can consider them to have six ranged DPAs. Either way, the destructive power of each individual ranged DD is so great that they can become mains. Mages with staffs are called sky-cutting wizards who became famous for their superpowers. Seeing a familiar person on the screen, Marie, who was sitting behind William, said it was an ice mage. Jackie agreed with his daughter, adding that he caused a sensation in Britain shortly after his debut. 
In his 17th and 18th year, he was voted Player of the Year and dubbed the Ice Mage, one of the top three. His name was Roy Meyer. Jackie brought his face closer so everyone could get a close look at the most dangerous opponent. His first power is an ice wall that can instantly split a large battlefield into two. The second power is Blizzard, an ability that will snag both enemy and ally, slowing down the brook and plus an absolute zero tech that reduces the range of alien superpowers and freezes affected objects. The last power is an ice seal that seals one target in ice for 20 seconds. This ice will not break under any attack. Depending on the situation, it can be used quite skillfully as an allied defense. To immobilize William and launch an attack on the team, after those words, he pointed the laser pointer at the hero again. William thought this guy had a heck of a lot of superpowers, and the Brits had so much faith in him that they even asked to put him in the match. Objectively speaking, they can never beat them with their power, that's how they must think. The hero smiled slyly, rubbing his chin, asked himself that these Brits were going to beat them. The next day, a plane landed at the international airport to bring the British players to Korea. They were greeted at the airport exit by an incredible crowd of journalists who immediately started clicking their cameras at the sight of them. All of their stats were at a high enough level that made them players who were included in the national team. At the very end came the very same Roy Meyer, with almost all of his stats hitting their highs. News reports said that Britain's national team is currently heating up the international airport. Sitting in front of the television, William could not use the analyzing gaze because he is looking at the picture. The man then asked that they could not win, after which stated that he would simply create a good strategy. But then calmed Jackie down by saying he was joking, because it's so much nicer to win when you try so hard.